Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Care of Star Times. They said my son was killed in a drunken brawl. I know he wasn't. He was a good boy. He was murdered. Why, I don't know. If you come to 733 Winship Avenue... If you'll come to 733 Winship Avenue any time and listen to my story, I'll be grateful to you forever, Mrs. Catherine Bailey. And that was the letter to Box 13. Just a few lines. But, brother, what those few lines led to... <laughs> And now, back to Box 13. I get some funny letters through Box 13. Some don't mean a thing. Others are from people who answer all the ads. But this one from Mrs. Catherine Daly. It had a real ring to it. I get so I can spot the letters from cranks and curiosity hunters. They're full of big phrases. It's the simple ones that count, like Susie said. Well, it's short, Mr. Holliday. Uh-huh. What are you going to do about it? Well, what would you do, Susie? Mm, well... You know, Susie, I don't know how you managed to get right to the point of things so quickly. Oh, it's easy. Mm. Okay, you talked me into it. I don't know what I'd do without you. I try to make myself indisposable. The word, Susie, is indispensable. What's the difference? None, I guess. All right, Susie, I'm on my way to 733 Winship Avenue. Mrs. Catherine Daly was a little woman, maybe about 50, 60. It was difficult to tell because gray hair was pushing hard against the brown. It was her eyes that got me. Maybe not too long ago they'd been able to smile. But now they were dead. Lifeless. Something had been taken away from... From well inside. She led the way to a little living room, furnished cheaply but neatly. She sat down, pointed to a chair for me, and then... Are you serious about that advertisement, Mr. Holliday? Well, yes, I am, Mrs. Daly. I... I haven't any money. That is not much. I can afford something, if it's not a whole lot. Oh, now, look, Mrs. Daly. I'm a writer, and sometimes Fox 13 leads me to a good plot. You see, I don't take money because I get... Paid very well for the stories I get. You see, I used to be a newspaper reporter. Newspaper reporter? Anything wrong with that, Miss Phil? Arthur, my son, he was a reporter. Oh? What paper? The Evening Record. Your, your letter said that your son was killed. He was. They said he was drunk, that he got into a fight in a cheap saloon. Arthur was never drunk in his life, and he hated fighting. That his picture on the table? Yes. In uniform. That's the Distinguished Service Cross, isn't it? Yes. Okay, Mrs. Daly, start from the beginning. Tell me how you want me to help. I'm sure Arthur was murdered. Murder's a tough word, Mrs. Daly. Tough to say and tough to prove. But for a week before he was killed, he kept telling me that we could get out of this house soon, that he was going to make a name as a reporter. But he didn't tell you why. No. Then, the night he was killed, he got a phone call. From whom? I don't know. He hurried out, and the next time I saw him was when they asked me to come down and identify him. That's as much as you can tell me. It's every word. Mrs. Daly, this may sound brutal, but, but your son's dead now. Why would you rather have it said he was murdered? I want to show everyone he couldn't have died in that cheap, shoddy way. Well, that was that. I believed her. Maybe it was the way she talked. Maybe it was her eyes. I don't know. Anyway, I left her house with nothing to go on but what she had told me. And that was little enough. 
just that he was on to something would make a name for him as a reporter. Anyway, I went to see what Lieutenant Kling knew about it. About what, Harvey? About the kid that got killed in the saloon, bro? Well, that's what the records show. They show anything else? No, no, they don't. You know, I... I like you. Thanks. You can have the next dance. I'm serious. Okay, so you're serious. What about? You're not satisfied with the daily case either. What makes you think I'm not? Just the way you talk. You don't believe it's right. I believe what the witnesses in that dive said. The daily kid got drunk. Somebody said something the girl he was with. Nothing bad, but daily got mad and started swinging. And? Then he ended up in the red. You didn't arrest anybody? Look, we get a dozen calls a night from down at the hill places like that. Somebody's always getting pushed around, roughed up, killed. Some of the things don't even hit the newspapers. Run of the mill stuff. Sure, sure. But look, Kling, what kind of guys get killed in places like that? Bums, winos, characters who hang out in those joints. But not a kid like Daly. And you're an honest cop. What was that track for? For a compliment. The Daly thing bothers you because you know as well as I do that something's wrong about it. Then you tell me. I'll try. Later. Now, look, Holiday. I'm not on the case anymore. Homicide's got enough to do without running down a fight in a saloon. But, uh... But what? But, uh, I don't like it. You're right. I knew I liked you. Okay, I'll marry you in the morning. The place you want is 183 River Street. Oh, nice neighborhood. Right. The cops go in quartets down there. Thanks. See you later. And for the love of Mike, don't end up on the meat wagon like Daly did. Kling was right. It wasn't a neighborhood to raise kids or anything else. And the place I wanted was called the Riverview. Fancy name. Oh, a great place. I stepped over a couple of boarders spending the night on the doorstep and walked inside. There was a tinny piano played by a guy mechanically banging out a tune that its own composer wouldn't have recognized. The bar was set at the back facing the door. I went over to it. The bartender took a long, good look at me. I must have looked strange. I was wearing a necktie and a shirt. He walked over. Yeah? What's with, bud? How are you? Awful. You? Practically dead. Okay. Now that we know each other, what's on your mind? What do you got to drink? Arsenic. Want some? Straight. Water on the side. <laughs> Funny man, ain't you? Sure. Look, what do you want? A drink, maybe? No, you don't. That suit you got on cost maybe 150. The tie, five bucks. Any cookie comes in here dressed like you don't want a drink. All right. You in. Swell. Slumming, huh? No. Looking. For what? Last week there was a fight in here. The kid got killed. Arthur Daly. I didn't see nothing. My back was turned. Did you ever see the girl who was with Daly? I told you I didn't see nothing. Oh. All through the fight, you just kept your back turned. Yeah, I hate fights. Can't stand the sight of blood. That what you told the police? Same thing. Who are the witnesses? Look, when a fight starts in here, there ain't no witnesses. Everybody's blind. That makes it easy. You a friend of this daily character? Yeah. Yeah, a good friend. Uh-huh. I still don't know nothing. Now blow, mister. Out. Get it out. He knew something all right. But he was clammed up tight. I left and walked up the street. I was close to the spot where I'd parked my car when I heard something. I stopped. Somebody was tailing me. Following me from the saloon. Okay, somebody didn't like me nosing around. I walked past my car. Just ahead of me was an alley, and pulling out of the alley was a truck. I walked a little faster. I got to the alley, skirted around back of the truck so my trailer would lose me for a couple of seconds. Then I stepped inside a doorway. It was dark. The truck pulled away. I waited. Then I heard the steps. He didn't know where I'd gone. But if he was going to pick me up again, he'd have to pass the doorway where I waited for him. Come here. Oh, oh, oh. 
Let go. Let go. You hurt me. Shut up. Oh, please, mister. I ain't no crook. I, I wasn't going to put this thing on you. It's idea telling me. I heard you talking to Barkeep back there. I wanted to talk to you, honest. That's all. You should have caught up with me before this. Oh, gee, mister, I didn't want anybody to see me, honest. All right, talk. Oh. You want to know something, huh? Come on, come on. What do you want to say? Well, honest, I might get in trouble. Look, I, I got to know I'll get something out of this, eh? Spill what you've got and we'll see how much it's worth. Uh, maybe a fiver? Maybe. Go on, talk. Look, I could get in bad trouble. You are right now. Oh, all right. Oh, all right, make it a fiver. What do you know about Arthur Daly? I saw the fight. I saw the whole thing. Did you tell the police? Me? I don't get nothing to do with the cops. All right, tell me. This guy that was bumped, he didn't start the fight. Who did? A pug. An ex-pug named Billy Connor. The Daly guy didn't have nothing to do with starting it. It was a frame. Was Daly drunk? No, no, he had one drink. The girl slipped something in it. I saw her. She was a good looker, so I was watching her. Do you know her? Me? <laughs> me know a thing like that? Nah. All right, well, here's your five. Now, keep your mouth shut, understand? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, uh, maybe you'd like to know something else, huh? What? Oh, mister, it ought to be worth something. I... All right, here. Oh, thanks. Uh, you ain't been out of the joint down the street more than a couple of seconds when the barkeep goes to the phone. So? I heard him tell somebody that you was nosing around. Mister, something tells me that you're in bad trouble right now. And now, back to Box 13 with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, I had a few facts now. First, Daly knew something that might have got him killed. Second, the girl who was with him put something in his drink so he'd look drunk. Third, an ex-pug named Billy Connor started the fight. Why? The answer to that would put me on first base. So I asked around a little and found out that Billy Connor, a third-rate fighter down at the heels, suddenly came into money and right after the fight in the saloon. I found him in a second-rate nightclub. You the guy that wants to see me? If you're Billy Connor, I'm the guy. Who are you? Knowing that will make any prettier. Hey, you're a smart boy, huh? Maybe. But you're not acting smart. What? What are you talking about? You're making too much splash, Connor. The, uh, the boss doesn't like it. People might start asking questions about the money. The money you got for killing Daly. Me? Oh, no. I just started the fight. Then I ducked. Somebody else banged his head for him, not me. Ah, uh, that's the way it was, huh? Sure, you know. Who are you, anyway? I get it, Connor. Wait a minute, fella. Why'd you say that's the way it was? Didn't you know? Sure, sure I know. You, you ain't from them. Come home. You dirty sneak. You, you a copper? Maybe. Think it over, Connor. Hard. I left him standing there with his mouth open. I thought I'd found out what I wanted to know. But Kling told me... Doesn't mean a thing. You can't prove anything, Holiday. What if I get proof? How? You've got the name and address of the girl Daly was with the night he was killed. And you want him, is that it? You could get hurt. Meaning you won't give me the girl's name. Meaning that if I do, you're on your own. I'll take that chance. Do I get a name and address? Eileen Simmons, 4674 Roberts Drive. And I hope you get more out of her than we did. I hope so, too. I didn't like walking up a blind alley with murder at my back and maybe in front of me. I got to the girl's home, a boarding house in a shabby section, and took a look at the mailboxes downstairs. While I was walking up to her flat, something tingled the back of my neck. Something that screamed a warning. I got to her flat. She didn't answer. Then I smelled it. Gas. I stooped down and one look at the crack between the door and the sill was enough. It was stuffed with newspapers. There was only one thing to do. Eileen Simmons wasn't going to talk to anybody. The room was heavy with gas. The window I broke let in some air. Scared faces stared in at the door. I smashed open, then I yelled at them. 
You call the police. Ask for Lieutenant Kling. Come on, hurry. I took a quick look around before I left. In one closet was a fur coat. And from what I knew about fur, this one took money to buy. It had her initials embroidered in the lining. But it didn't fit with the cheap flat. Well, I thought it was about time to make a trip to the evening record where Daly worked as a reporter. Some of the boys knew me, so it was easy to get to talk to Daly's editor. I don't know, Holiday. All I know is that Daly promised me a big story. Something he was working on. Now, look, Charlie. Any idea what it was? None. The kid was close mouth. Oh, but you must have some idea. Didn't he give you any hint? Just that it was big and would blow off the top of the building when we printed it. How long did he work for you? Oh, about six months, no more. What big assignments did you give him? None. Routine stuff, he didn't have enough experience. Just out of journalism college when the war broke. Mm-hmm. Went through it. Then served at the war trials in Germany. And in the six months with you, there wasn't anything important enough to get him killed, huh? No, no, there wasn't. Oh, let's see. We sent him on a routine assignment to San Carlito and... San Carlito? What's that? Just one of those little islands in the West Indies. The paper's doing a series on Latin American neighbors and we... Anything there that might have been the big story? You mean what he was talking about? Yeah, that's it. How long after he got back did he begin to talk about the something big? Hey, just about the same day he walked in here. Where's his desk? Just outside this office. Oh. All his stuff in there? Uh, most of it. We were going to send it to his mother, but, well, you know how things are. It was too soon. We figured we'd wait. And... Come on, let's take a look. Just the usual stuff. What are these photographs? Never saw them before. Full face, profiles of men. You know them? Not from Adam. Oh, uh, Charlie, can I have these? Well, I don't know, Holiday. One ex-newspaper man to an editor. Come on, let me have them. Okay. I didn't see you take them. Uh, thanks. Now, mind if I go through the rest of your stuff? No, help yourself. I'll be at my desk. Right. I went through Daly's papers. There was one little notebook with an entry in it that read, Got to be careful. Never be alone. They won't dare make a try for me unless I'm alone. I've got proof on film. Photos of the men I recognize. Okay. So Daly's notebook gave me another lead. But where to? Well, maybe Daly's mother would know. I looked at my watch, but it was after midnight. So I figured it was too late to see her, and I decided to wait until morning. I wish I'd have gone right then and there. The next morning, I went to see Daly's mother, and I found her in the middle of an excited bunch of neighbors. When I got her alone, she told me what was up. There were burglars. They ransacked Arthur's room. Well, let's take a look. But there's nothing missing. Well, let's look anyway. They went through all the drawers. You didn't hear them? No, I slept right through it. Uh Uh-huh. Mrs. Daly, what could they have wanted? I, I don't know. There's nothing of value here. Look, uh, when Arthur came back from San Carlito, did he uh, bring anything with him? Why, well, I don't think so. A camera, maybe? His own, but he took that with him when he went. Now, now think hard, Mrs. Daly. Did he take any film out of that camera when he got back? I think he did. Yes, I remember. He hurried out with some film to have it developed. Where is it? I don't know. Did he get it back from the shop where he took it? I don't think so. I think he'd have shown them to me if he had. Then the roll of film he took out of his camera is still in the shop. It must be. Mrs. Daly, we've got to find a check for that film. The kind you get when you leave film to be developed. Come on, let's look. We looked and looked and looked. No check. It began to seem as though whoever ransacked the room found the check, and if he had, well, the thing was over. After half an hour, we gave up. But there was still one more thing to find out. Mrs. Daly, would you mind taking a look at these photographs? Do you know any of these men? Why, I'm not sure. They look familiar, but... His scrapbook, the one he brought back from the war... There are pictures like those in the scrapbook. Well, show it to me, will you? It's in my room, right next door. 
Here it is. Here they are, the pictures. But I don't see. I think I do. But I'm afraid to believe it. Look, Mrs. Daly. Whatever you do, stay with your neighbors. Don't be alone for a minute. I left the house, and the idea I had was buzzing around inside my head. If I was right, then the whole thing was fantastic. But the pieces began to fit together. Maybe I was thinking too hard. I didn't see the big black car that turned down the corner. I didn't see it until I was almost staring between its headlights. I jumped back and up in the fenders of the car, took the skin off my legs, and the car roared away. That big black buggy had my name for a license plate. It would have looked just like an accident. But it told me something. That whoever was doing the dirty work didn't have the check for the film. Because the proof of what Daly knew was on that film. And if Mr. Accident Maker had it, he wouldn't have risked another accident. I called Kling, got him on the phone. What do you want me to do? Check every Photoshop in the city for a roll of film mailed just before Daly was killed. How do you know he mailed it? Because he wouldn't have been fool enough to take it to a Photoshop. He knew they were tailing him, waiting to grab that film. So he mailed it. With a note that he'd call for it. Okay, I'll pick up the film. If I can find it. Oh, no, Kling, don't pick it up, please. But you just said you were... Kling, tell me where it is. Call my office and I'll pick it up. Look, you're asking for a cray breathe in your door. If those babies are what you say, they'll cut your little pieces. You want them, don't you? Sure, but I don't... The only way to get them is to make them come after that film. And they won't call it headquarters for it, Kling. But they will try to get it from me. I waited. Finally, Kling gave me the word. I picked up the film and printed the little finishing shop. Kling had given orders that I was to have it. I got in my car, looked in the rear vision mirror, and saw a big black sedan pull in behind me. This was it. I couldn't spot Kling in the squad car he said would be handy. Maybe something held it up. I didn't know. I got to my apartment. The sedan pulled up behind me and parked. I walked up to my apartment went over to the window and saw a man get out of the sedan. He walked slowly and disappeared into my apartment building. I sat down with the film and prints burning a hole in my pocket. Then... Who is it? The holiday. I'd like to talk to you. I took one more look out of the window. The street was empty except for the sedan. No squad car, no clink. Brother, if ever I wanted to see that big guy, it was now. I walked to the door. Mr. Holliday? Uh huh. Who are you? My name is, uh, we'd say, Stefan. Okay, you're Mr. Stefan. So what? I shall be brief. You have a roll of film and some prints. I am a, a camera enthusiast. I shall pay you a good price for the film. Hmm. How much? <laughs> you're going to be reasonable. That's fine. Shall we say 10000 That's big money for a strip of celluloid. I am very enthusiastic about photography. You know, uh, I like pictures myself. Especially pictures of some nice little Nazis who got out of Germany with a lot of money. Oh? You guessed, huh? Yeah, but Daly wasn't guessing when he recognized them in San Carlito. He wasn't guessing that San Carlito is a little island with lots of deserted coastline. Easy to land on. <laughs> yes, very handy. And they paid well to escape the trials in Nuremberg. You just talked yourself out of $10,000. Oh, now that's very funny. You would have killed me anyway, as you killed Daly to keep him from spreading the story. <laughs> You're so right. Now, Mr. Holiday. Oh, that gun didn't look nice. He had it right at my head. I sat still. Stephen came slowly toward me. The black hole in the barrel of his gun looked like the business end of a cannon. Then... Get the car, Holiday! Come! Cling, at this particular minute, you're the most beautiful thing in the world. Mr. Holliday? Well, at that moment, Susie, Lieutenant Kling landed, 
and took over. Sorry I drew it so close, Holiday, but I had to let Stefan talk a while. Yeah. But by the way, where was that squad car? <laughs> well, there wasn't any. The squad car would have scared Stefan away. I had to make it look safe. Boys and I were right next door. Had been for an hour. No, he tells me. Well, <laughs> uh, it's up to the Federals now. We're clean on this end. Gee, I sure... Oh, Mr. Holiday, you might have been killed. Oh, it's okay now, Susie. It's all over. But, but you might have been killed. And I like this job so much. <laughs> what I say? Very funny, Kling. Nothing, Susie, nothing. <laughs> Good night. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with original story by Russell Hughes and original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker and Lieutenant Kling by Edmund MacDonald. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Hey, look, boss, look at this. An ad in the Star Times, out of town newspaper. Yeah. Box 13, adventure wanted. We'll go any place, do anything. <laughs> well, this looks like the right answer, Tony. Yeah. I think I'll write a letter to Box 13. The letter was postmarked from a city in Nevada. It came airmail, special delivery to Box 13 and me. It sounded like a great chance to grab a change of scenery and maybe a little fun. <laughs> fun? Brother, how wrong could I be? Back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Triple Cross. Just run an advertisement in the Star Times, one that reads, Adventure Wanted, will go any place, do anything, and see what you get. A lot of them can be interesting, like the one I listened to Susie read. The one that came airmail, special delivery from Nevada. Enclosed is enough money to buy you a plane ticket to Los Maros. You want adventure? All right. Come to Los Maros. Register at the Paradise Hotel. Wait in your room until you're contacted. And that's all it says, Susie? That's all, Mr. Holliday. There's not even a signature, even. It's what's called an ominous letter. What kind of a letter, Susie? Ominous. Uh, you know, that means it's not signed by anybody. The word you mean is anonymous. Oh, but you could be right after all. Well, Susie, lock up the office and look for me when you see me with a new plot and a nice tan. A new plot and a nice tan, I said. Hmm. I got the plot, but the tan almost turned into a beautiful white pallor, the kind that goes well with lilies. The plane trip was smooth. The trip from airport to the Paradise Hotel was nice and easy. And the hotel itself? Well, it was the only one I could remember that looked like the ads in the travel folders. Oddly enough, there was a room reserved for me in my name. Okay, somebody checked and found out who I was. I explored the suite thinking maybe I'd get a lead on what this was all about. But it was just a fancy set of rooms, all newly decorated. I sat down, and then about a half hour later... Come in. Message for you, Mr. Holliday. Oh, thanks. Here you are. Oh, thank you. Uh, just a minute. Who gave this to you? A man, sir. What kind of a man? What do he look like? Oh, just a man, sir. Oh, I see. A head, two eyes, nose, two ears, and a mouth. <laughs> that is description? Yes, yeah, sir. That's exactly what he looked like. Good. But not knowing when I see him. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, did he ask for an answer? Uh, no, sir. He just told me to bring the envelope to you. Will that be all, sir? 
Huh? Oh, yes, yes, thanks. Well, two $100 bills. And a message that said, buy a red carnation in a flower shop and put it in your lapel. After dinner, go to the casino roulette table, buy $200 in chips and put them on number 18. If you win, walk away, wait 10 minutes and put half the winnings on number 22. After you play, wait in the casino. So with a carnation in my lapel, I had bought $200 in chips and walked to the roulette table. There weren't many players. It was a little too early for the big crowd. So I waited a minute and watched the play. Took a look at the croupier, but I might as well have been in Timbuktu. He didn't give me a tumble. Okay, the best way to see what was going to happen was to see. I shoved the whole 200 on number 18. One or two of the other players placed bets and then... No more bets, please. No more bets. Number 18, red and even. Your chip, sir. The croupier shoved the winnings across to me. I, I watched his face. If he had any expression, it was on the soles of his shoes. Well, maybe $7,000 win was coming around here. I left the table, sat down, and did a little problem in arithmetic, which figured out to be $126,000. That's what I'd have if number 22 came up. And brother, it looked from where I sat as though it would. The ten minutes went by, and I walked back to the table. Waited until the wheel stopped. Number 16, red and even. Place your bets, please, ladies and gentlemen. Slowly, I shoved 3,500 in chips to number 22. This time, the others around the wheel did look. 3,500 to 35 to 1. Then the wheel began to slow up. No more bets, ladies and gentlemen. No more bets, please. That croupier was as cold as the floor of a mausoleum. Somebody dropped a pin and I heard it hit the floor. The white ball clicked, clicked, clicked its way until... Number 22, black and even. Your chip, sir. I cashed in the chips and there I sat with $126,000 tucked away in my inside coat pocket. Somebody had that wheel fixed for a killing. I began to wish I was back in my office. I didn't like it. A crooked play. Why? Who? I made up my mind to go to the owner of the place and wash my hands of the whole thing when... Oh, there you are, Mr. Holliday. I've been looking for you. I have a message for you. Yeah? Well, it's verbal this time, Mr. Holliday. Oh, what is it? You're to go into the bar and wait. Is that all? Yes, sir. The same man gave you this message? Yes, sir. Did he still have a head, two eyes, a nose, and two ears? <laughs> yes, sir. Hmm. All right, here you are, kid. Oh, thank you. You know, if this keeps up much longer, you'll be able to retire my tips alone. Thank you, Mr. Holliday. Will that be all? Uh, how much did this character give you to forget what he looked like? Well, nothing, sir. Nothing at all. And a smart boy like you should have taken a good look the second time. Huh? Especially since I asked about him after the first message. Oh, he was big, dark... A little mustache and had a little white scar over his right eye. Would you take five dollars for that information? That's all right, Mr. Holliday. No charge for that service. Mm, good boy. I'll see you later. Yes, sir, Mr. Holliday. I walked toward the bar wondering what was coming next. I didn't like that fortune burning the cloth in my pocket. The bar was like my suite. Fancy, rich, and expensive. I climbed up on one of the stools and the bartender came over and... Yes, sir. May I serve you, sir? Got any ginger ale? Yes, sir. What with, sir? Oh, by itself. Just a glass of ginger ale. Just a ginger ale? Oh. You see, I like the bubbles. <laughs> Champagne has bubbles, too. Ah, uh, but they're still around the next day. Just a ginger ale. Yes, sir. Of course. Excuse me. Is someone sitting here? Hmm? Oh, no, no. I don't think so. Thank you. Here you are, sir. Ginger ale. Thanks. The usual, please. Okay. Yes, sir. May I? You got a light? Of course. Thank you. Don't mention it. Here you are. Thanks. Why do you drink ginger ale? I like it. 
Why do you drink martinis? Same reason, I guess. <laughs> it's a brilliant conversation, isn't it? Well, I've heard better. You're not very friendly, are you? A uh, boy scout is always friendly. And does good turns. So I hear. Do you want to be helped across the street? <laughs> All right. I'll shut up. I took a good look at her. There was something scared looking about her. And she was nervous. Well, so was I, because the minutes were passing and I still had that money. And I wanted to get rid of it. But I wondered about the girl, whether she had any part in this. I watched her out of the corner of my eye. She picked up her bag, reached for a lipstick, and then... Oh, oh, clumsy. So it's true what they say about women's handbags. You get the stuff on the bar, I'll pick up the kitchen sink off the floor. I'm, I'm so sorry. Did the powder spill on you? No, it's all right. Yeah. Here you are. The, the mirror didn't break, did it? Nope, you're still good for seven years more. Thanks. Thanks ever so much. I told you I was a good boy, Scott. You have a nice smile. Want a toothpaste commercial to go with it? No, don't be nasty. I'm sorry. I guess I'm just as nervous as you are. I... Let's talk about something else. She chattered away. It really is I listened with half an ear. Once in a while, through in a yes or a no. And the clouds began to gather. The mirror at the back of the bar went back and forth. The people got bigger and shrank the midgets. Somebody drove a plane through my head. It buzzed around and made a bad landing on my brain. And... Better now? Uh, oh. You'll be all right. Just lie there, take it easy. Sure, I... Hey. Hey, I'm in my room. Of course. We brought you here. We? I'm the hotel physician, Mr. Holliday. Oh, what happened? And just a fainting spell, nothing serious. Fainting spell? What are you talking about? They're fainting spells. Your wife told me you get them. My what told you what? No, 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 just lie back. Whose wife said What? Your wife. She's got to have a prescription filled. Now, listen, Doc, I... Hand me my coat, will you? Uh, it's better if you lie here. It's better if you hand me my coat. Give it to me. Oh, very well. There you are. What's the matter? Was my wife in this room? Of course. She came up with me. Uh-huh. Doc, what would you do with $126,000? What? A hundred... <laughs> <laughs> That's an odd question. <laughs> what would you do with it? I don't know. Because I haven't got it anymore. Now, back to Triple Cross. Another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. So there I was, 126000 in the red. If it was meant to be taken from me, then somebody was working it the hard way. Sure, the girl slipped something in my ginger ale when I picked up the stuff that fell out of her handbag. She took the money. All right, I wanted no more of it. I was going to head for the nearest exit, running, not walking, when... Come in. You holiday? Yeah. Do I know you? Call me Tony. I'm the guy who wrote the box 13. Oh. All right, goodbye, Tony. Sit down. What's the idea? Funny, I was going to ask you that. We're playing 20 questions. Let's skip the other 18, Tony. I got a big one left. Where's the dough? You tell me. Give it to me. Well, I didn't like him. I didn't like the gun he was playing with either. And I didn't like the little white scar over his right eye or the little black mustache. I was willing right then and there to cross him off my friendship list. Then I told him what happened. It's a great story. Ain't heard one like it since I read fairy tales. Well, I don't care if you believe it or not. You got no regard for your health, Holiday. Look, Tony, I'm leaving this place You'll now. You'll be too heavy to carry out if you take one more step. That's better. Now, what kind of a frame is this? Once more, you tell me. I played a crooked wheel downstairs. I don't like that. You got adventure, didn't you? I don't want anything that's crooked. Now, look who's talking. Who was the girl? Believe it or not, I never saw her before. What did she look like? I don't know. Yeah. Ever try to take a good look at anyone in that bar downstairs? It's too dark to even see a lighted match. You're smart, Holiday. 
The game with the girl is neat. Awful neat. You get the dough, play doggo. Act like the girl slipped your mickey. Later she turns up with the dough and you two split. Now talk sense, Tony. I didn't know why I came to Los Morris in the first place. I didn't know how I was going to get that money. How would I have time to dream up that frame with a girl? Yeah. Yeah, I never thought of that. Okay, Halliday, maybe you're telling it straight. Okay. Now can I go? No, no. You get that money back first, then you can go. I don't think I'll stay for the ninth inning, Tony. The game has not started yet, but you get that dough. How? That's your problem, but get it. Look, Tony, I'm backing out of this. You know I can go to the sheriff. Oh, no, you won't. Because there'll be a tail on you from now on up. One move like you're going to the law. Understand? Okay. Okay, I get it. And there'll be somebody in this room to see that you don't use the phone. You'll be covered like a pool table, Holiday. What if I can't find the girl? What if I can't get the money back? The boss will be awful mad. And? There are worse places than Los Moros to spend a lifetime. If you live. Ever have one of those dreams in which you try to run away from something you can't? Well, this one, with my eyes wide open, was really something. Tony and I went downstairs. Two other characters detached themselves from chairs when Tony nodded at them. Brother, I was covered. It looked hopeless. With Tony not far behind, I asked the doctor if he'd ever seen the girl who said she was my wife. Well, there was no dice there. Then I remembered something. I told Tony I was going back into the bar. Bar? What for? Now, look, Tony. Let me do it my way. I'm the one that's on the spot, so let me play it the way I want. Okay. I'll watch, and don't try for a quick steal, because the boys outside know who to look for. Go ahead. Thanks. What would I do without you, Tony? I don't know, because you're not going to be without me. Remember, I'll be watching. (laughs) Yes, sir. May I serve you? Well, feeling better, sir? Well, much. Where were you when, uh... When I fainted. At the other end of the bar, sir. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you were. It wasn't our ginger ale, sir. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I just have a loose head, and when I shake it, it comes off. <laughs> May I serve you something, sir? Yes. An answer to a question. Well, what's that, sir? Who is the girl who sat down next to me? I don't know, sir. Oh, yes, you do. I beg your pardon, sir. But the sir business, you knew that girl. Why do you say that? Because when she sat down, she asked for the usual, and you brought her a martini. And you said okay when she asked you. What does that prove? The martini proves you knew who she was. The okay means she wasn't a guest of the hotel. No bartender as polite as you are would say okay to a lady guest. That makes sense? Why do you want to know who she is? Does that make any difference? Yeah, because I wouldn't want to see her in trouble. I'll try to keep her out of it. I won't tell you. Ever see a picture of Alexander Hamilton? Hmm? What are you talking about? Well, here's one. And funny enough, it's on a $10 bill. In fact, there's pictures on all five of these bills. Yeah. Her name's Kathy Lee. I think she has a place at the Las Palmas Courts. Thanks. Put these pictures in frames, will you? I found the Las Palmas Courts. And, of course, Tony behind me all the way. The name list in front said Kathy Lee lived in number eight. I looked around before I turned in the walk. Yeah, Tony was closer to me than varnish on a tabletop. I found number eight and stopped for a second. Looked for a phone line, but there wasn't any. I knocked at the door. No answer. I tried it again. Then I heard Tony whisper from the shadows. Try the door, Holiday. I did. It was unlocked. Tony coached from the sidelines. Go on in. I went in and closed the door behind me. It was dark. I decided to risk a call. Kathy? Kathy? Kathy Lee? She wasn't there. I fumbled my way to what felt like a dresser and a lamp. Turned it on and... What I saw made me turn that light off fast. What's the matter? She's dead. Uh, What are you talking about? You heard me, she's dead. You sure? Well, go in and look. You go back in and look for that dope. Go on. Look, Tony, I don't know any more of this. 
That poor kid's dead. Murdered. I want you to call the sheriff. No, you don't. I said you go back in there and look for that dough. You look for it. Leave my fingerprints all over the place. Now you go back in there and hunt. Don't be a sap. Whoever killed her took the money. Don't you see that? Maybe. But we'll play this angle all the way. Now stop talking and get in there. I hated to turn on that light, but I had to. I didn't look at her. I looked through the room. Then I found something. A plane ticket to San Francisco. Leaving that night. And a boat ticket for South America. They were in an envelope, but the information on the envelope said there would be two reservations. I put it back where I found it because I didn't want Tony to find it on me. And there was something else. A locket with a man's picture in it. I took it off his chain and shoved it in my pocket when I left. Well, Helene? It's not there. I told you it wouldn't be. Stand still. Back toward it. <laughs> a frisk, Tony? You don't trust me, do you? Shut up. Well, I told you. Who killed her? Find that out and you'll know where the money went. Come on. <laughs> What's so funny? Holiday, right now I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. Tony was right. People at the casino saw me win that money and somebody must have seen the girl with me. Then I got the Mickey. The money was taken. The girl killed. Who did it? Mm-hmm. Me. Dan Holiday. Because the girl clipped me for the money. Well, this was a beautiful frame. Any art gallery in the country would be proud to hang it. But I knew something Tony didn't. The plane and boat tickets. Two seats. One for Kathy and... her murder. Somebody who left her tickets in her bungalow to make it look as though she was in on the $100,000 job by herself. Sure. Now her killer was taking a plane. In one hour. And a boat to South America. I could have told Tony, but I wanted to wrap it up myself. Besides, I wanted to get the whole thing to the law. On the way back to the hotel, I figured something out for myself. But I'd have to see the boss of the casino, and I thought I knew how to do that without Tony tagging along. The casino was full. I stopped. Tony stopped. What's the idea? What now? I've got to think. Up to your room. No. You want to get hurt? Sure, go ahead. Shoot me. Now. In front of all these people. You know, Tony, you, you wouldn't get ten feet. Smart, ain't you? Okay, what's now? I'm going to play blackjack. What? Want to watch? I sat at the blackjack table. I had as much interest in the game as that Mamie back in Iowa who never saw a deck of cards in her life. But I had an idea. And I played it for all it was worth. Look, uh, dealer, yes? I didn't like that last deal. I beg your pardon, sir. I said I didn't like that last deal. Well, we'll return your money, sir. Never mind the money. Who runs this place? Hey, what is that guy trying to do? Come on over there, it? it worked. In three seconds, I was surrounded by muscle boys, and Tony was hotter than a New York sidewalk in August. But he couldn't touch me. A minute later, I sat across the table from the owner of the casino. I told him what happened, and when I finished, he stared at me and said... You're trying to tell me somebody let you win that money on my wheel? I am? You're crazy. The wheel's straight. But you know I won the money. Sure I do. Any time a hundred grand slides across, I know it. But... Uh... But this time it was fixed. The croupier was tipped I was to win. Wait a minute. Marty, send Frankie up here right away. Huh? Oh. Okay, forget it. What's the matter? Frankie, the croupier. Went off duty just after you won. It's not back yet. And he won't come back. Now, somebody planned to take the house this evening for that money. Somebody who couldn't risk getting it himself. So I'm the logical one. No one knows me here. I'd look like just another player. Later, Mr. Fixit plans to pick up the money and beat it. Who? Someone besides yourself who could get to the croupier and bribe him to fix the wheel. Got any ideas? Yeah. One. My partner. Well, that's it, then. It's got to be. But the girl, she doped you. That was a hard way to get the money from you. Listen, I've got an idea, but I'm a little cramped for room. Some of your partner's boys, particularly a guy named Tony, are glued to me. Get some of your boys to shake them off, and I'll bring that money back to you. 
How do you know where it is? I know. Okay, Holiday. Remember, fast play and I'll find you if it takes the rest of my life. It's a deal. Now, uh, how about the boys? They won't follow you. Marty, a guy will leave my office. Some mugs are telling him. Stop him. Got it? Good. All right, Holiday. You're on first base. Go ahead. I was sure he'd be at the airport, and I wasn't wrong. He was sitting in the shadows on the outside. I walked over to him, and he looked up. Holiday. I thought you would be. Thought I'd be framed, huh, Frankie? What are you doing here? I've got a message from Kathy Lee. Kathy? She's... You ought to know you killed her. <laughs> You're crazy. Not only that, you've got $126,000 in that bag. $126,000 that looked like easy money. Shut up. That money doesn't mean a thing. It's the girl who counts, the girl who was willing to do what you told her to do. The girl you triple-crossed and killed after you double-crossed your boss who bribed you to fix the wheel. It's too bad you're so smart, Holiday. <laughs> it's too bad you led with that right, Frankie. Somebody call the police to uh, come and clean this up. was... Oh, please hurry, Mr. Holliday. I, I want to hear the ending. All right, Susie, all right. What do you want to know? Well, how did you guess that Kathy Lee was the croupier's girl? Well, her locket had his picture in it. Oh, they should have given you the money as a reward. No, thanks, Susie. They can have it. But there's one thing I don't understand, Mr. Holliday. And that's? You didn't get a tan at all. You're just as pale as when you left. Oh, $126,000. A murder and a tan, too, she wants. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. Watch for him in his new picture, Saigon. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville, with original story by Russell Hughes, and original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Production supervision is by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, care of Star Times. You advertised for adventure? I have it for you. If you will go any place, I can offer Paris. If you will do anything, you are the man I need. If you're interested, call at my office any day between the hours of 10 and 10. Any day between the hours of 10 a.m. and noon. I am at 247 Wabash Place, signed William Martin. Paris. <laughs> Adventure. What a dream that could have been. It was, but the awakening was different. <laughs> Back to Box 13, and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Diamond in the Sky. Sounded great. A trip to Paris, and adventure for the frosting on the cake. Whoever Mr. William Martin was, he must have known that waving a deal like that in front of anyone was making it a sure thing. But Susie, as usual, had something to say. I don't know, Mr. Holliday. Maybe it's just somebody kidding you. Mm, that's the girl, Susie. Get out the wet blankets, spread them around. Then again, maybe this Mr. Martin is, is beyond approach. The word, Susie, is reproach. But I've got a brilliant idea. What, Mr. Holliday? It's all very simple. I go to see Mr. William Martin at 
4247 Wabash Place. Wabash Place was one of those little streets filled with small businesses. But number 247 was by itself. No display window in front like the others. I found a bell button that had a card under it with William Martin engraved on it. One minute later, after introductions, I was looking across the desk at a short, stocky, apple-cheeked man who said, No one knows you have come here, Mr. Holiday? No, just my secretary. Oh, Oh, but she won't say anything. You're positive? I am. Good. A cigarette, Mr. Holiday? Oh, yes, thanks. And a light. (coughs) You do not like my brand, huh? All this lacks is a fuse. What's in it? (laughs) My special tobacco. Uh, But uh, here's an ashtray. (sighs) Thanks. Well, Mr. Martin, you wrote that letter to Box 13, and here I am. Ah, good. Down to business, then. He opened the drawer, took out a photograph, and slid it across the desk to me. What I saw was a picture of a diamond. But what a piece of ice. I was studying it when Martin spoke again. I see by your expression, Mr. Holiday, that you are properly impressed. Oh, I'm impressed, Mr. Martin. What is this, the Rock of Gibraltar or something? <laughs> Not quite. That is the Mirabilis diamond. Oh. You've heard of it then? Yes, yes, but how does it concern me? Uh, here. These credentials will tell you who I am. William Martin. Well, that's my name, yes, but, uh, well, you look. Martin passed me a sheet of papers with his photo on them. He was William Martin, representative of Jason Van Vandercleff. Hmm, name sounded familiar. Martin read my expression again and... Mr. Vandercleff is a diamond merchant. He has recently purchased the Mirabilis for a million dollars. That's a lot of hay for a lot of ice. I beg your pardon? <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Martin. The gem is in Paris. I am to get it and bring it over here. I see. And, uh, box 13? You will go with me, Mr. Holiday. I have reservations for you on the Oh, now, just a minute. I'm not a bodyguard, Mr. Martin, or a private detective. Please, please. Nothing so crude, Mr. Holiday. No, I have a much better plan. But first, let me tell you something. There is no jewel thief in the world who would not risk everything to get the Mirabilis. He could never sell it. No, no. But it could be cut up, and any one of the smaller stones would more than repay the thief for their trouble. Yes, I guess you're right. Okay, where do I come in? Well, it is very simple. But like all simple things, it is brilliant. I thought of it. Mm, Congratulations. Thank you. Now, you will pick up the diamond in Paris. I will go on the same plane, but we shall be complete strangers to each other. Do you begin to see Mr. Holiday? Sure. If anyone's wise that you're going over to get the stone, they'll follow you. Exactly. But I won't have it. You will. I shall stroll around Paris as a, as a tourist. Anyone following me will be, uh, shall we say, following a red mackerel? <laughs> All right, let's say it. Oh, uh, but there's only one thing wrong. Wrong? I did not think of something important? Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, me. Suppose this plan doesn't fool anyone. And I'm set up like a clay pigeon. You lose the Mirabilis, and I'm just another claim for the insurance company. Oh, no, no, I love You have no worry. Oh, maybe I worry easily, Mr. Martin. Especially if I'm carrying a million dollars worth of bait. Mr. Holiday, only you and I know of this. There can be no leak of information unless you tell someone. <laughs> oh, sure, I'll go around telling everyone that Dan Holiday's a setup. Here I am, fellas. Come and get me. <laughs> That's right. And thieves would kill to get the diamond. They have already. Why, I can tell you the history of the stone. Calcutta, murder. London, murder. Vienna, two deaths. And uh, the... Mr. Martin, skip the cook's tour of the morgue, will you? But you advertised for adventure, Mr. Holiday. You will go any place, do anything. Well? Touche. A little below the belt, but touche. And you've added one more to the population of Paris. Martin's plan was simple, and if it worked, a good way to get the Mirabilis into the United States. I said, if. Hey, who invented that word? Well, it was three days later that I was ready to leave. Passport okay, papers in order, and a phone call from Martin warning me not to recognize him when we were on the plane. I gave instructions to Susie and left for the airport. (laughs) 
years later, I was out of the Atlantic. Martin said, well, in front of me and never once looked back. So I played it his way, and beyond a quick look, paid no attention to him. Then, as I was settling down to watch the ocean go past underneath, Mr. I... Holiday? Mr. Dan Holiday? Uh, yes, I'm Holiday. I'm Irene Carson, your stewardess. Oh, how are you? I'm fine. And you? Wonderful, thank you. Good. Here's a letter for you. Letter? Your shirt's for me. Mr. Holiday, seat 19, flight 12. Check all the way through on that. All right, thanks, Miss Carson. You're welcome, sir. Oh, Miss Carson. Is there something you want? Well, just an answer to a question. Who gave you this? Well, no one. It was among last-minute letters and packages and gifts for our passengers. Oh, I see. Well, thanks again, Miss Carson. Not at all, Mr. Holliday. The letter was from Martin, brief and to the point. I was to go to an address in Paris and stay there until he called. Well, Mr. Martin was playing them close to his vest. Maybe he didn't trust me. <laughs> and who could blame him? With a million dollars worth of diamond for an ante, he wasn't dealing all the cards at once. Well, all I had to do was wait until morning in Paris. <laughs> Early next morning, we landed at the Bourget Field. I stuck close behind Martin leaving the plane, but he didn't give me a tumble, so, well, I guess my cue was to hold up at the address mentioned in the letter until he got in touch. I was trying to flag down a taxi when... Is this the last time you saw Paris, Mr. Holiday? Oh, hello there, Miss Carson. <laughs> Looks like you're having trouble. Yes, a little. Say, um, how do you get one of these rounded grasshoppers to stop? You wave in French, like this. Oh, just like that, huh? <laughs> just like that. Teach me to wave like that, and I'll be able to get a taxi in Paris. Of course, if you lend me your face. <laughs> There's nothing to it. Oh, I um, I almost forgot. I came out here to find you. Oh? Something wrong? Passport? Papers? No, or... but I believe this is yours. How did you get this? I found it on the floor of the plane just after you left. Oh? What's the matter? I... Nothing. Can I give you a lift? No, thanks. I have my reports to make out. Maybe some other time if we're still in Paris, huh? Well, I'll be for three days before the hop back to the States. Oh, I see. Well, thanks a lot, Miss Carson. I'll be seeing you. I hope so, Mr. Holliday. She walked away from me, and my hand was the letter from Martin telling me where to stay until I heard from him. I hopped into the cab, gave the driver the address, and then leaned back and said, The letter was in my inside coat pocket. Pretty hard for me to fall out of there. But my coat had been on a hanger, and I'd been away from it just long enough for anyone to pick up that letter. So, if anyone was wise to the way the game was being played, Martin was home safe, while I stood a better than even chance of being picked off a first base. A half hour later, I was sitting in the little room that the address had given me when. Yes? Uh, we? Hello. What do you think? Yes. Oh, Martin? Yes. Everything was all right? Uh, fine. Now what? You are sure no one knows where you are? Well, I... Holiday. All right, no one knows. Now what? Here is an address. Go to it. There you will pick up the package. Okay. Now, don't write this down. Remember it. Please. All right. All right, I can remember it. 45, Rue de la Guerre. 45... No, 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 no. Do not repeat it there. Just remember it. All right, all right. Please, Mr. Holiday, you understand my concern. Look, my neck's out of yard too, Martin. Of course, of course. Now listen. There is a Monsieur Corey. Ask for him. Identify yourself with these words. I've come from the sky. You hear that? I got it. Then what? There will be no question. Those words are our code. Now, I am registered at the Vendôme Hotel. Leave the package for me at the desk. Just like that, I leave a package for... I know work. what I am doing. Now, that is all. The rest is up to you, Mr. Holiday. Okay. And, uh, Mr. Holiday. Yes, what now? For your sake, I sincerely hope nothing goes wrong. <laughs> And now, back to Box 13 and Diamond in the Sky with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. The rest was up to me, Martin said. 
All I had to do was collect the marvelous diamond, see that I wasn't caught off base, deliver it to Martin, and then that was all. I hailed a cab on the street. Uh, Saint Rue de la Guerre. Pete. Governor, with an accent like that, just talk English. Oh, uh, guess it wasn't very good, huh? Are you an American? No, a Londoner from Limehouse. Hop in, sir. That was 45 Rue de la Guerre, was it? Yes, that's right. How did you know I was American? You kidding? I drove a cab three years in Brooklyn. <laughs> he wants to know how I know he's an American. Okay, Limehouse. Then you should know what this means. Step on it, never mind the tickets, huh? Blimey, I ain't heard that since the days in Flatbush. Hold on, pal. Here we go. You here, Governor? Want me to wait? Yeah, and keep that motor hot. Hey, what's that? I don't know. Something hot? <laughs> Just wait. Okay, Governor. I'll be here. I went into the house, asked for Monsieur Corre. Gave him the code words, I've come from the sky. And without a word, he went to the fireplace, lifted out a brick, and handed me a velvet case. Well, after all this, I I had to take a look. Inside the case, well, the marvelous looked like a piece of something that would make any crook risk his neck or mine. I snapped the case shut. Hooray said nothing, just watched me. He showed me out. All right, Limehouse. Bar no motel on the way. Don't bother to fly along. I don't know what this is all about, sir, but when you went in that house, that car pulled up back of us and stopped. Huh? And they kept their motor up, too. My mouse was right. It looked as though somebody had talked to not me and said, not Margaret. We pulled away, the big car tailed after us. My mouse turned his head to talk to me. They're tailing us, all right. Can you get away? With this act, the three cylinders still work and they've got asthma. We've got to make it. What did you do? Pinch the crown jewels? You're warm. Step on and do your best, will you? Did you pull a heist? No. Okay, you've got an honest face. All right, Governor. There's nothing keeping this act together but termites holding hands. But here we go. The big car in the back didn't lose an inch. Limehouse and I had to go through an empty stretch of road. So I told him I thought that's where the mugs in the big car would make their pitch. And... That's you're right. But I've got an idea. Well, I can use it. Listen, look down the street. See that turn to the right? Yeah. I'll get close to the curb as I can, and you get ready for a jump. Huh? Jump? Sure. I'll act like I'm going straight. But where I showed you, I'll turn fast to the right. You jump out. Roll in the doorway or something. Well, what about you? I'll make a U-turn back out and pull the mugs down the street after me. You got it? Got it. Or uh, here's your fare. Plus. <laughs> Ain't had so much fun since Coney Island. Okay, pal. Try for the brass ring. Nah! <laughs> Boy Limehouse. It worked. I collected a few bruises, but I still had the diamond. Farther down the road, Limehouse stopped. He had to because the boys in the big car angled in front of his cab. I waited long enough to make sure Limehouse was going to keep his health. Then I doubled back and forth until I came out on the main street. There I took a bus. I I felt like having lots of people around. I got to the Vendome Hotel, walked to the desk, and told the clerk I wanted to leave a package for Monsieur William Martin. Oh, brother, I got the surprise of my life when the clerk told me there was no Monsieur William Martin registered there. Well, I sat down to figure that one out. Then, just when I was about to give up, I... Holiday. No, no, no. Don't look at me. Martin, what the devil? Pretend that you are not speaking to me. Now, you have the stone? Yes, but I almost did that. What happened? It's a long story. You want to hear it now? No, no, no. We have not enough time. Look, I will put part of my newspaper on the sofa between us. Then when no one is looking, put the diamond under the paper. Okay, then what? After a minute, I will pick up the newspaper and leave. Oh, and I hope this ice goes with you, Mr. Martin. <laughs> it will. Don't worry. Well, that looked like it. All finished. Uh, I got a chickens that weren't there. A half hour later, I went to the room of my hotel. I just had the door open when... I woke from my deep dream of peace with a knot on my head and a distaste for the whole proceedings. And the room? Well, it was in shambles. Somebody had fine combed it after drumming on my head. The manager knew nothing about it. Well, that made us even because I... 
I couldn't figure why somebody took the trouble to slug me and search the room when I didn't have the diamond. Unless... Unless somebody thought I was still carrying. That somebody? I had an idea. Forty minutes later, I was sitting across from Irene Carson at a little sidewalk cafe. Mr. Holliday, you... You're insane. I will be after another knock on the head. But why do you accuse me? Because no one but Martin knew where I was going to stay in Paris. And you. But this is ridiculous. How should I know? The letter you said dropped out of my pocket. It did drop from your pocket. And I did not read it. Really, I, I think this is a ridiculous story. A Mr. Martin who wasn't at his hotel to, to pick up a diamond worth a million dollars. Men chasing you, hitting you, searching your room. And now, simply because I had my hands on a letter, you accuse me of a... Who else knew? You're Mr. Martin. And that's another thing. I never saw you with anyone on that plane. You spoke to no one. You got off alone. <laughs> really, Mr. Holliday, it's a fantastic story. No one saw me with Martin. Exactly. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to get back to the Bourget. You've taken up too much of my time already. I... All right, Miss Carson. But will you do me a favor? What? Confess to the whole thing? Admit I'm a notorious international jewel thief? No, I... Just get me on a plane back to the States. Look, I... uh, I apologize. All right. All right, I accept the apology. And I'll do my best to get you out of Paris. You, um... You seem to be allergic to trouble here. You're so right, Miss Carson. You're so right. After that rigmarole in Paris, New York's LaGuardia Airport sure looked good to me. I was leaving the field when... Welcome home, Holiday. Well, Kling, what a nice surprise. I've got more. Come on. Hey, wait a minute. What is this? You're a writer. Write a line for yourself now. What are you talking about? I'm talking about a pinch, Holiday, which this is. Arrested? Now, wait a minute. It didn't make sense. Nothing made sense. On the way into the city, Kling wouldn't say a word. For every question I asked, he growled. But finally in his office... Where's the diamond, Holiday? Diamond? Mirabilis, Schmirabilis. Where is it? I smuggled it in, Kling. So you got through customs. Now quit stalling. Where is it? Are you kidding? A million in ice and nobody kids. Nobody. Now, wait a minute. Why did you pick me up? I stopped in at your office to say hello, and Susie told me that you were in Paris. Yesterday we got word from Jason Vandercliff that the Mirabilis diamond he was to get from Paris hasn't shown up. We checked with the Paris police. A guy named Corey... Described me. Is that it? Yeah. Susie tells me you're in Paris. Corey describes you, and two and two make four. Now start talking. Well, I told Kling the story, starting with Martin's letter to Box 13 and ending with my return to the States. Can you prove that yarn? Get Martin and ask him. That'll be a little tough. He's dead. What? Yeah. When did you leave for Paris? The day before yesterday. Martin's body was found in the river that day. He didn't get an identification until yesterday. Vandercliff identified him. Clingy, you're, you're crazy. I tell you, Martin went to Paris on the same plane with me. Here's Martin's photograph. Take a good look. This isn't Martin. Vandercliff ought to know. His own agent. And the Martin... The Martin I went with was a fake. Yeah. He probably killed the real Martin. Took his place, used his own photo and the credentials he showed you. I... Whew. Uh, that's a brilliant remark. Uh, but the crooks who chased me in Paris, my being hit over the head after I got the diamond, I... Yeah. It's easy to figure now. Your fake... Martin sent those hoods after you to get the diamond and get rid of you for good so you couldn't identify him. That's why he wasn't registered at the hotel because he didn't expect me to show up at the diamond. And the crack over the head, your, your room, sir. Sure, sure, sure. When I got away from his boys, he sent them to my room thinking I might go back there before I went to the Bon Dome. I walked in while they were searching the room and they slugged me. I, well, don't you see, Kling? I, I'm in the clear. Yeah? How? Well, because I had nothing to do with the... the, the Holiday, the, the... you've got your story. But only Martin can keep you out of jail. Then you've got to find Martin. How? He must have taken an earlier flight from Paris. 
But how could he get the diamond through customs? I don't know. You know, Holiday, this looks like the end of Box 13 field. Martin loses himself in a city of seven million, lays low and leaves you to take the rap. What if I find him? You'll still have to make him talk. Listen, Kling. You know I've never been mixed up in anything shady. Maybe I've been roped in because I follow things through, but, but never deliberately. What are you getting at? Well, will you let me find Martin? How? You're our only link with him, and you don't know a thing about him. He could dye his hair, leave off his glasses. I know, I know, but uh, but if I don't find him, I'm in, I'm in trouble, is that right? You've never been more right in all your life. All right. If I don't find him in 24 hours, I'll walk back in here and you can do what you want with me. You've got a deal. Uh, you know, Holiday, when I was a kid, I always wanted to be a cop. My father wanted me to be a sign painter. Now I realize my father was a smart man. All right. Go ahead. A needle in a haystack. I was hunting for it. It was a pretty sharp needle. Any character who could think up a frame as neat as this one would be tough to locate if he was still in town. But I had to go ahead. It took me two hours to remember something that would help me. Seven hours more to follow it up and an hour to get hold of Irene Carson and take her with me. Then call clean, give him the setup. It was later that night that I knocked on a door. Yes? Who is it? Telegram from Mr. Benjamin Slade. One moment, please. Hello, Martin. What? I used to be a salesman. I'm good at sticking my foot in doors. Who are you? Mother Hubbard, and I've come to take a look in your cupboard, Mr. Martin. <laughs> my name is Slade. Benjamin Slade. So... You did dye your hair. And you're much prettier without glasses. I have never seen you before in my life. Yes, but I've seen too much of you. Come on, Slade, or Martin, give it up, will you? What brought you here? One of your peculiar cigarettes. I remembered I tried to smoke one when I first met you. <laughs> you're insane. Yeah? I went to your fake office in Wabash Place. There was an ashtray with some cigarette butts still in it. It took me seven hours to run down a dealer who makes your cigarettes. Clever. But I still deny ever having seen you before in my life. Oh? Okay, let's try something else. Come in, please, will you? Martin, this is Miss Carson. Our steward is on the trip over, remember? Mm -hmm. Miss Carson, is this the man who gave you the letter to give to me? I... Yes, that's the man. I did not... Oh, 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 oh. Slips count in this game, Martin. Besides, your handwriting in the letter can be identified. You're too much too clever. Dr. Carson. <gasps> oh. Okay, Martin, without a gun, you're just another sitting duck. Now, get up and come on. But, Mr. Holliday... How did Mr. Martin get the diamond over here? Hmm, he was too smart for that, Susie. He left it in Paris. Oh. He got out and planned to return later. The Paris police have found it. You know, <laughs> he was pretty silly. Silly? Oh, how'd you figure that out, Susie? Well, a million dollars. Jeepers, look at all the income tax he'd have to pay on it. Huh? Oh. Good night, Susie. <laughs> Same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. Watch for him in his latest picture, Saigon. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandell, with an original story by Sal Shore, adapted for radio by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker and Lieutenant Kling by Edmund MacDonald. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday.
You idiot, you fool, you let him get away. I did not, worker. What could I do? He was in the post office. Did he have the envelope? Of course he did. He sent them to someone. Sent them? And he's got away. Oh, Staley, you are an idiot. No, not quite. Look, I've got a blotter. Well, what good's that? Look, in the mirror. What he wrote on the envelope was on the blotter. Hmm. Well, at least you use your head. Now, see if we can read it. Box 13, care of Star Times. Box 13, Star Times. There's no Star Times in this city. Uh, but there is in the city he sent his letter to. You're right. Well, we'll find him later. But first, I think I can get what we want from this Box 13. <laughs> Back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Hare and Hound. Uh-huh. Okay, I'll see you later then. So long. Hello, Mr. Holliday. Oh, hi, it's Susie. Got the mail? Uh-huh. And I... What do you got there? Eight nice new counterfeit $5 bills. How'd you get them? Well, you see, I had my eyes closed when they were passed on to me. I'm turning them over later to the police. Now, how about the mail? Oh, here. And you know, Mr. Holliday, I had the funniest feeling while I was coming back here at the office from the Star Time. What do you mean? I, I had a kind of demolition. You mean you blew your top? Huh? <laughs> what do you mean, demolition? You know, like, like when you think something's happening or going to happen. Oh, premonition. I had it. Well, why? I, I felt like I was being followed. I felt eyes looking at me when I was in the Star Times getting the mail. <laughs> and you were followed? It felt like it. Okay, that makes you a big girl now. Let's have the mail, then. Huh? Yes, sir. Twelve letters. Slim pickings. It was such a funny feeling. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, look here. An out-of-town letter. I know. I thought... <gasps> oh! A little nervous this morning, Susie. Uh, I guess so. Come in. Oh, uh... Good morning. Good morning. Uh, uh, may I come in? Oh, please do. Uh, I hope this is not too much of an intrusion, but I... <laughs> may I do something for you? Well, maybe. Is this your advertisement in the Star Times? Adventure Wanted will go any place, do anything, Box 13? That's right. So you are Box 13? Uh, yes. <laughs> I, I had a different picture of you, Mr... Uh, Mr... Uh... Holiday. Dan Holiday. Oh, my name is Worker. Thomas Worker. <gasps> oh, I saw you at the Star Times. You were the one who was looking at me. Yes, I guess I was. You followed me. It was charming work. And, and you... Oh, thank you. May I ask why you followed my secretary, Mr. Worker? A curiosity... You see, I've been noticing your ad for weeks now. It runs day after day. Well, naturally, I wanted to see you, uh, what you look like, and, and why you put the ad in the paper. Oh, is that all? Yes, that's all. <laughs> Foolish? Mm. No. Tell me, Mr. Holliday, do you get the adventure you advertise for? Sometimes. Do you receive many replies to your ad? Usually, yes. But you cannot follow them all. Well, no. <laughs> Do you have any particular reason for asking all these questions, Mr. Worker? No, but I lead such a prosaic life myself that your ad intrigued me. I, I finally got up enough courage to go to the Star Times and wait for someone to collect the mail from Box 13. I see. And now that you've found me... I... well, perhaps you'd care to have dinner with me some evening and, and tell me some of your adventures. Oh, I'd like to hear them very much. I... I'm very lonely and... and... All right, Mr. Worker. I'd be glad to. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I must be going. Sorry to have troubled you. And I, I hope I didn't frighten you, young lady. Oh, no. It was kind of fun. Oh, oh, oh my umbrella. <laughs> One can never tell when it might rain. Well, good day, Mr. Holiday, and thank you so much. Don't bother to get up. I'll look you up in the phone book and call you. Please do. Goodbye. What a nice man. Uh-huh. Funny old duck. Well, let's open the mail, Susie, and... Hey. Huh? What's the matter? Where's that letter from out of town? It's right on top of the pile where you put it. But it's not a... Uh, 
What's the matter, Mr. Holliday? He's gone. What do you mean? Sure he's gone and... And that letter went with him. Oh, he, he took it. His umbrella was on top of the pile. Oh, what a nice old man. Gee, he stole a letter. Yeah, and something tells me, Susie, that Mr. Worker will never invite me to have that dinner with him. Sure, Worker took the letter. But why? What was in it? Why was it so important? And who sent it? Well, I kept asking myself those questions, and then three days after that little visit from Worker, Susie came bursting into the office. Oh, Miss Holliday, look. Here's another letter from the same place. I I mean, it looks like the same handwriting. Yeah, it does. Hey, Susie. Huh? You weren't followed this time, were you? Uh Uh-uh. I made sure. Oh, good. What's it say, Mr. Holliday? Listen. Three days ago, I sent you a letter containing a sealed envelope. It contained half of something which is very important to me. It was imperative that I get rid of it until I could get to safety. Gee. I'm all right now, so send the sealed envelope to 243 Marlowe Avenue, Bridgeport. Arthur Holmes. Now what are you going to do, Mr. Holliday? Do? Well, I can't send him the envelope because I haven't got it. Mm. And I can't find Mr. Worker because I've got a sneaking hunch that he'll be a little scarce. Maybe you better write to Mr. Holmes. Oh, no, Susie. This looks too good to be handled by a letter. I'm going to find out a few things by seeing Mr. Holmes in person. I went to Bridgeport, found 243 Marlowe Avenue. It was an apartment house. There was no clerk at the desk, but there was a tier of mailboxes. One of them belonged to Arthur Holmes in apartment 6B. So, a couple of minutes later... Mr. Holmes. Oh, Mr. Holmes. I tried the door. It wasn't locked. The apartment was dark. I was fumbling for the light switch when... If I say I was fresh as a daisy after that thump on my head, I'd never get to be the father of my country. I was lying on the floor... The room was still dark except for a flashing light that came from a store sign across the street. I lay there for a minute to give the room a little time to stop spinning, and then I realized I was holding something in my hand. And from where I lay, it felt like a gun. I was just crawling to my feet when... Mr. Holmes, I've come with a fresh towel. Mr. Holmes! I wanted to clear up a lot more before anyone found me. I ducked behind the door and waited. Mr. Holmes? Why did you scream? Well, who wouldn't? The room was a shambles. Someone had searched it. And lying on the bed in an alcove was a man who certainly would have no further interest in me. Or anything else. There was a hole in his forehead. And I was sure I held the gun that put it there. Sure, I was innocent. But I'd have a hard time proving that. Figure it out. I received the letter from Holmes. Instead of writing, I went to him. I didn't wait for the clerk in the building to call up first. I got behind the door when the cleaning woman came in. Maybe I should have gone to the police right away. But I was innocent. And I wanted to learn a bit more. Besides, the cleaning woman reported the murder. So, a half hour later, I was drinking a cup of coffee and an all-night hamburger That's stand. That's the late news for tonight. The next edition of the new... Oh, just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. We have a last-minute flash. A murder was committed tonight in the Roxmore Apartments. Police are looking for a man who answers this description. Medium height, white hair, wearing dark gray flannel suit, blue and white striped necktie, black shoes, carrying light tan top coat. The description of the wanted man was given to the police by the clerk, who remembers this man asking for the apartment of the murdered man, Arthur Holmes. And that's all for tonight. The next edition of the news... Hmm. Another murder. Hear it, mister? Yeah. Getting so a person can't feel safe no more. You're so right. More coffee? No, no thanks. No thanks. Pie? Cake? Nothing, thank you. Well, they ought to get that guy that done it pretty soon. You think so? Sure. He ain't gonna get far... Well, every cop in the city will be looking for a guy wearing a gray suit with blue and white. 
Yeah, you're you're right. Uh, okay, here's your dime. Yeah, thanks. What's the matter? You don't say it. What are you gonna do? Walk out of here. Sure, sure. You stay right where you are, and you won't get hurt. Just keep talking to me. Mister, I ain't got nothing to say. And don't say it. Sure, sure. If it makes you feel any better, I didn't kill that man. Well, I ain't said you did. The police said it. They could be wrong. Sure, they could be wrong. Yeah, that's right. Now stay right where you are. Don't say a word to either of the other two in here until I'm out of sight. Understand? Sure, sure. Good night, mister. Come again. Hey, that's the guy. That's the guy. Somebody call the police. Hey, taxi. Taxi. Now where the park is? Yeah, sure. Oh. Drive to it fast. Yeah. Hey, what's all that noise about? I have the least idea. Park, huh? Okay. I'd sure like to know what all that noise was about. And well, they're playing a game. Huh? Mm-hmm, sure. Hair and hounds. Ever hear of it? Oh, yeah, yeah, I played it when I was a kid. Huh. Well, I've got news for you. It's no longer a kid's game. Mistake number two for smart boy Holiday. Another notch against me. I ran from the hamburger stand. Well, that would look bad. But I've got one bad fault among others. I'm, I'm very curious. And I was so curious to know how and why the clerk at the apartment house identified me when he didn't even see me. But if somebody paid him off to enlarge this beautiful frame around my neck, well, we'd see. Hey, uh, mister, I, I've been thinking. Ain't that hair and hounds game a little young for grown-ups? I told you it wasn't a kid's game anymore. The whole world's gone nuts. We agree. Say, uh, pull up here, will you? I thought you wanted to go to the park. It's dark there. Huh? Well, it's dark all over. It gets that way at night, mister. Maybe you've got something there. Oh, pull up here by the duck stone. Hey, I'll keep the change. Hey, a fiver. Well, thanks, buddy. Now, don't mention it. I won't. Not even to the mist. When the cab drove away, I then went into the drugstore to the phone booth. I looked up the Roxmore Apartments in the book and dialed the number. Hello. Roxmore Apartments? Is Eddie there? Eddie? He's the clerk there, isn't he? Who? Charlie. Charlie who? Madison? No, Eddie's the clerk there. I... Okay, okay. Keep you, Charlie. Madison. Madison. Charles Madison. There are three Charles Madisons in the book. Okay. Maybe one of the three was the one I wanted. I left the drugstore and went back out of the street. And as I did, the cab I just got out of drove up. Hey, you. Hey, you, wait a minute. Well, this was it. Hey, you. So, you want to play Aaron Hounds, too, huh? Well, I'm sorry, but I warned you. Now, wait a minute. It's no longer a kid's game, not the way I play it. Another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, well. I was adding black marks against my name faster than I could explain them away. And I knew the police would be listening in on the Roxmore switchboard. I hope my act had worked. Now all I had to do was find the right Charlie Madison and get his story. An hour and a half and two Charlie Madisons later. Uh-huh, I'm Charlie Madison. Clerk at the Roxmore? Yeah, why? I'm... I'm a writer. I'd like to get your story. Oh, sure, sure. Come on in. You're married, Mr. Madison? No. You live alone? Sure, sure. Swell. Get your coat and hat, Charlie. Huh? What for? I'll feel safer out on the street. A, 
Away from here. I don't get it. Don't you recognize me, Charlie? What are you giving me? I never saw you before in my life. For a guy who never saw me before in his life, you gave a pretty accurate description to the police. You... You're... Yeah. Yeah, I am. How? Now, listen, Charlie. You're not going to get hurt if you play good boy. Don't try another yell. You're breaking my arm. Mm -hmm. One more peep out of you and I'll work my way up to your neck. What do you want from me? Information. Now, come on. I want to be out of here when the police arrive. Let's go, Charlie. I'm right behind you. And I've got a gun. Sure, sure. Is there a back way out of here? Uh, turn, turn to the right. What does this alley lead to? To the street. Then we go the other way. Oh, listen, I... Maybe I made a mistake. Maybe you ain't the guy I saw. I know that, Sally. There are other things. All right, stop here. It's dark enough. Ooh, what are you going to do? Nothing. You're going to talk. Now, what do you know about Holmes? Nothing. He only lived at the Rocks more two days. Just moved in? Yeah. Now, who paid you to identify me? Nobody. No? Uh, who paid you? I don't know who he was. Was his name Worker? I don't know. Honest, I don't know. The short, gray hair, little mustache? Yeah. His name's Worker, isn't it? I don't know his name. I guess you don't. But he paid you to say that you saw me go into the home department, huh? I... Uh, hey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now let me go. Oh, no, Charlie. We've got work to do. Where's the nearest payphone? Down the street on the corner. Okay, I'll furnish the nickel and you furnish the talk. I don't get it. What do you want me to do now? Help me smoke this work out into the open. What for? I told you, Charlie. I didn't kill Holmes. But I'd have a tough time making anyone believe that after the ring around the rosy I played tonight. Work is the boy I want. Now get moving. <laughs> Sure. The police will trace this call. Don't let them make you repeat anything. It's a trick to hold you here until they can trace where this call comes from. Just say what I... Hello, police. This is Charles Madison. Listen, there's something else I didn't tell you. There's another man in the Holmes murder, and... I said there's... Don't repeat. Keep talking. Look for a man below medium height. Gray hair. Little mustache... I don't know his name. But he carries an umbrella and he wears glasses. That's all. What? Hang up. Well, he didn't hear the last part. He heard it all right. Let's get out of here. Can I go home now? Oh, no, Charlie. I'm beginning to be real fond of you. What are you going to do now? Uh, you like taxi cabs, Charlie? Huh? We're going to ride in one cab after another till the morning papers come out. What for? The papers will carry the latest in the Holmes murder, including your description of the mysterious little man with gray hair, whose name is Worker. But, but Worker will come after me. Ah, now you're beginning to be bright about the whole thing. You kill me. Yes, like he did Holmes. Oh, you won't let him. You gotta let me go. You know, Charlie, I can't seem to work up a flood of tears for you. You framed me for money. I wouldn't have had a chance if the cleaning woman had seen me in Holmes' apartment with this gun in my hand. Well, I, I'll say I lied. Think a minute, Charlie. If you do that, it'll make you an accessory after the fact. What's that mean? Simply that the police would hold you equally as guilty as worker. Or me. Well, then what will I do? You know, Charlie, I'm a very curious-minded person. I could go to the police... But I'd rather play it through my way. Smoke Worker out in the open and see what this is all about. But how? Well, as long as Worker knows you can identify him, he'll try to find you. Get you. But if you don't go to the police, he'll know you're around somewhere, Charlie. By the way, Charlie, how does it feel to be another hare in the game? <laughs> All right, pull up here, driver. 
Come on, Charlie. You're tired of riding? It's almost day. Yeah. There's a stack of morning papers on the corner. There you are, darling. Keep the change. Charlie, there's nothing gloomier than a city just before dawn. Hmm. I'll get one of those papers. Well, where are we going then? Who knows? I've seen the whole city. Go on, get the paper. Tied up. Untie them. Yeah. There you are. Did you leave a nickel? Huh? You have a dishonest streak in you, Charlie. Come on, leave a nickel for the paper. All right, down this alley. Okay, in the doorway. Now we'll see what the papers have to say. Well, you're in, Charlie. Listen. The mysterious disappearance of Charles Madison has led the police to suspect foul play. See, Charlie? What else does it say? Uh, oh, here it is. Madison called the police late last night with another tip in the murder of Arthur Holmes. Madison volunteered the description of another man whose name he said he did not know. Meanwhile, police revealed Holmes... What's the matter? Why'd you stop? Meanwhile, police revealed Holmes' real name to be Albert Henning, former draftsman at the Bull Mill Aircraft Company. Henning disappeared over a week ago, and executives of the aircraft company stated that Henning was suspected of having taken micro-photographs of plans for the Navy's new twin-jet fighter. He, he was a spy. Uh-huh. And that's what he sent to Box 13. He didn't want to be caught with the photographs on him, so he used me as a hideout until he could send for them. I, I don't know what you're talking about. All I know is we got to go to the police now. You're so right, Charlie. You're so right. Come on, I'm through playing games. This has grown a little bigger than Box 13. Both of you. Stay where you are. It's him. It's, it's Worker. Yeah. Uh, don't try to use your gun, Mr. Holliday. It's not my gun. It's yours. The one you killed Henning or Holmes with. That's right. How'd you find us? Simple. You see, uh, Mr. Holliday, when I heard over the radio that you would escape from Holmes' apartment, I was a little worried. I knew you'd read or heard about this fool giving your description. I thought you might go to him and perhaps to the police. Yes, as I should have in the first place. That's right. But you didn't. <laughs> I'm glad you like adventure. So, I watched Madison's place, and I've been following you all night to see what you were going to do. And now? <laughs> do you want to guess? No. <laughs> you made it perfect for me. As perfect as Henning did when he double crossed us and tried to sell those photographs for a higher price. Perfect for you? Yes. Think of this. Here you are in an alleyway with the only man who identified you as the murderer of Mr. Holmes. Now, you still have the gun, and I'll take it. And be careful how you hand it to me. Please hurry. Ah, thank you. Now, I shoot Mr. Madison first, and then you. And how does it look? Pretty smart, but it looks as though... It's my idea. Let me tell it. It was a struggle, shooting, and both of you are dead. Oh, it has flaws, but not glaring ones. Don't, don't. I'll, I'll, I'll swear I lied to the police, Mr. Worker. I'll say, Holiday killed Holmes. Honest, I will. Oh? <laughs> Better still. I will give you this gun, Madison, and you will shoot Holiday while I stand in back of you. And then you will go to the police and say you got the gun away from him when he was going to kill you. Here. Now, once you kill our friend, Mr. Holiday, you will be a murderer, and you will have to keep your mouth shut. So go ahead, Mr. Madison. Pull the trigger. Go on, pull it. Don't do it, Madison. Don't do it. Worker can't make two shootings look right. Either you pull the trigger, Madison, or I do. It's a little better to live than to die. Hurry, you idiot. I... You won't kill me? No, no. There would be no need for it unless you talk, and you won't. Madison, don't. Get hey, you down there. Who's... The police. Get the ground, Madison. Fast. You stop. All right, you ask for it. Nice shooting officer. Very nice. All right, you two. Get up off the ground. And believe me, I'm very happy to be able to do just that. 
What's the matter with the other guy? Hmm? <laughs> Nothing. Things were a little too much for him. He passed out. Hey, that's a guy, officer. That's a guy. Sorry, Dan, yeah. Okay, okay, you guys stand back. All right. Officer, what kept you? Are you kidding? We've been tracing you all night. One taxi driver after another, one cab after another. You think you're going to get away with passing those phony fives all over town? That's right. <laughs> no, I didn't. That's why I passed them out. What? You know, officer, you have a very efficient police force. Oh, uh, thanks, boys. You mean you, you gave out them phony fins on purpose? Uh-huh. A very definite purpose. I don't get it. <laughs> you think it's funny, huh? Well, see how hard you can laugh at headquarters. Officer, I've never been so happy to be arrested. And, boys. Yeah? I'll match every phony five with a good ten. Come on, let's go. Hello? Hello, Susie. Mr. Holliday. Where are you? I was worried. You were worried? Now, listen, Susie, I'm in jail. Yes, sir. You're what? Yeah, get, get a hold of Lieutenant Kling. Tell him I've got to talk to him. But why are you in jail? That's a long story, Susie. I'll tell you all about it when I get back. But technically, the charge is passing counterfeit money. Mr. Holliday, you should be ashamed of yourself. All you have to do is open a charge account. Oh, no. Good night, Susie. <laughs> Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville, with an original story by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. Box 13 is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. Box 13. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13. Care of Star Times. We're allowed newspapers here, and by chance I saw your advertisement. I have exactly 48 hours to live. No more than that, unless you can do something which no one else has been able to do. Get me out of the death cell of a state penitentiary. I was tried and convicted for the murder of one of my best friends. I... I was tried and convicted for the murder of one of my best friends. I didn't do it. Will you try to help Martin Kirby? When I received the letter from Martin Kirby, I wondered how a man felt who had only a short time to live and knew it. Before the thing was over, when I'd stopped wondering, I knew. And now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Hunt and Pack. Gee, Mr. Holliday, what can you do about it? Susie, I wish I had an answer for you. You're going to see him, aren't you? Well, if I don't, I'd kick myself all over the city for not doing what I could. On the other hand, he was tried, convicted, and sentenced. But it could be wrong. I, I mean... It... I know what you mean. Susie sentencing a man to death is a terrible thing. The evidence against Kirby must have been pretty strong. Uh-huh, I guess it was. You're on the horns of an Aunt Emma. Dilemma. This time, Susie, I don't laugh. What are you going to do? Well, the only thing I can do, see Martin Kirby and, well, at least listen to him. <laughs> must have been a million guys in this place. All innocent. Sure, maybe. Some of them were and are. I am. I... I, uh... What 
time. I mean... I know what you mean. It's 1.30 now. I've got the rest of today and till tomorrow night at 11.30. 34 hours. I know. I've counted them, too. All right, Kirby, what can I do? I don't know. Is there anything you can tell me, something that didn't come out of the trial? The only thing that didn't come out at my trial was the fact that I didn't kill Leslie Roberts. Oh, I kept saying it, but there was too much against me. At first, when I got here, I didn't care anymore. If they wanted to see an innocent man die for something he didn't do, then it was murder on their heads. But but now, Mr. Holliday, I want to live. Sure, sure. But there's nothing you can tell me. Anything that I can go to the police with and get a reprieve, a stay of execution? My lawyers tried that a hundred times. My case has been reviewed. Nothing doing. Then what you're asking of me is to do what everyone else has failed at. I guess that's it. You know, Kirby, it's at times like this that I wish I'd never put that box 13 ad in the paper. Meaning there's nothing you'll do? No, no, I didn't say that. I'll try, but 34 hours is a short time. Look, maybe you'll go at this with a fresh slant. Maybe something will hit you that everyone else has missed. Yeah, maybe. All right, Kirby, it'll take me two hours to get back to the city, and... Well, if I'm going to do anything, I'll have to do it fast. Driving back to the city, I felt like someone who has to tell a kid there's no Santa Claus. Because I was almost sure that Kirby had no chance. What could I do? The police were no fools. The district attorney must have had an airtight case against Kirby when he went to trial. Well, I promised to help, so my first stop in the city was the Star Times. And down to the morgue to read up on the case. It was all there. Whoever covered the case with the Star Times had done a great job of reporting. I looked at my watch. It was 3.45. Martin Kirby had two hours and 15 minutes less than the original 34, and all I had done so far was, well, was to stack up a pile of newspapers. I started from the beginning, but the story of the murder of Leslie Roberts itself told me nothing. Then I got into the transcript of the trial. It took me three hours to read everything carefully. And when I finished, I could have... Well, I could have summed up the whole thing just as the prosecutor did. Julie, you've heard the testimony in this case. The state has proved the following facts. One, Martin Kirby was desperately in need of money. Two, the deceased, Leslie Roberts, was insured for $100,000. His beneficiaries being the accused, Martin Kirby, and another partner, William Morgan. A double indemnity clause in the insurance policy meant that both Kirby and Morgan would receive $100,000 each. Third point. The accused quarreled with the deceased over Mrs. Roberts, wife of the murdered man. Fourth. We have established the murder weapon. This gun belonged to Martin Kirby. True, the serial numbers were filed off. But scientific work revealed the numbers, and this gun belonged to Martin Kirby. He's admitted it. And thinking to get rid of it, he threw it into a sewer near Leslie Roberts' home. Now, perhaps Mr. Kirby believed the police of this city to be fools. Far from it. Their work has established beyond doubt that Martin Kirby is a murderer. Oh, sure, it was a good case. I stacked the papers in a pile and left the Star Times and went down to police headquarters to see Lieutenant Kling... Sit down, Dan. What's on your mind? Martin Kirby. Oh? Why? I've seen him. He wrote the box 13. Ah. Oh. He's innocent, huh? Did you work on the case? No, Inspector Rawlings handled it. Why? But you know about it. Sure. Yeah, I sometimes manage to know what's going on. Look, Kling, you're a good detective. You've got brains. I'll buy you a mold of milk sometime, but you didn't come here to hand me posies. Do you believe Kirby's guilty? Yes. From the evidence? That's what we base our cases on. It's inherent in the judicial and legal system. Now, what do you want from me? A new system? I told you I saw Kirby. Kling, he doesn't act like a guilty man. Oh, now, now, wait a second. Who's this? That's a photograph of Marion Overing. So, what am I supposed to do? Look at her. Nice and sweet, isn't she? I've never met her. Oh, but I did. Butter wouldn't melt in her mouth. A smile that would soften up the, the rock of Gibraltar. Talks like an angel. But she killed a kid to get 35 cents from him. 
Now, look, you've got a soft heart, Dan. But you've got a tendency to let it run right into your head. Maybe you're right, Clean, but... But I promised Kirby I'd plug away until time was up. I like to keep promises. And that's your business, Dan. But why did you come to me? For any help you could give me? Which adds up to a big zero. Fling, I read the transcript of the trial. Kirby was the only suspect. He had motive, opportunity. So did Mrs. Roberts and William Morgan. It was Kirby's gun that put Leslie Roberts in the obituaries. Someone else could have used it. So his defense lawyer said. But Kirby couldn't explain how it got into that sewer. But Kirby called the police when he went to Roberts' house that night and saw Roberts dead. Sure, sure. We get dozens of cases where the killer tries to play smart. He calls the police, figuring it'll make him look good. But he had to kill Roberts, run outside, throw the gun into the sewer, then go back inside and call the police. So? It's a big chance to take in case someone heard the shot and came to investigate. Killers take chances, Dan. Okay, okay. Now, the paper said there was a note from Roberts asking Kirby to come to his house that night. Yeah. That's why Kirby said he happened to go to Roberts' house that night. The only night in the week that Mrs. Roberts is always out. The police said Kirby could have typed that note. Right. But Kirby's defense lawyer said Roberts could have typed it. <laughs> uh, look, you type a note to me asking me to meet you. Then what do you do? What do you mean, what do I do? You write your signature nine times out of ten. You don't type it. So? That means anyone could have typed it. I know, I know. To get Kirby to Robert's house. That's it. So that was all brought out of the trial. The jury saw it the way the prosecution summed it up. That Kirby typed that note to make it seem as though he was asked to Robert's place. But both Mrs. Roberts and Morgan also stood to gain by Robert's death. Each gets a hundred thousand. Look, the case is closed. Too many things added up against Kirby. Sometimes things can be added up wrong. Figures and facts. You're knocking your head against a stone wall. So I'll get a headache. Mm, that's about all. Okay, I'll carry aspirins with me. But, uh... Say, could I look at that note? What for? This is a favor. Okay, I'll take care of it for you. But I'll give you six to an even that Martin Kirby will be executed tomorrow night at 11.30. Well, Clean got me the note. So I had it, and so what? All it said was, Marty, be at my house tonight at 8.30. Let's. It was typed and had been left in Kirby's typewriter at the office. Susie and I had studied it. What do you expect to get out of it, Mr. Holliday? I don't know, Susie. Gee, like you said, anybody could have typed it. Yeah, that's right. Kirby denies he did. Nobody can prove Roberts did or didn't. Not now. Maybe, maybe that Mr. Morgan or, or Mrs. Roberts did. Mm-hmm. Gee, what if either one of them did it and they're letting an innocent man be executed? Oh, it wouldn't be a comfortable feeling. Susie. What's the matter? Can I say something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe you did, Susie. Maybe you did. What? Conscience. Who's? Mrs. Roberts and Morgan's. You mean both of them killed Mr. Roberts? Mm. Give me that phone book. Here it is. Thanks. Roberts, Roberts, Leslie Roberts. What are you going to do, Mr. Holliday? Play a little poker. You're going to play cards at a time like this? <laughs> Not quite, just a bluff. I'm holding a pair of deuces. I don't get it. Hello? Is this Miss Leslie Roberts? Yes. Who is this? Never mind, just listen. Tomorrow night at 11.30, just 24 hours from now, Martin Kirby will be executed for the murder of your husband. Who are you? What do you want? Does your conscience bother you, Mrs. Roberts? What do you mean by that? Don't you know, Mrs. Roberts? Is this some kind of a stupid joke? Hardly. They're not joking at the state penitentiary. Mrs. Roberts. Yes? I know something that can make you uncomfortable, but I'm willing to talk about it. I don't know what you mean. You're either insane or completely without feeling. If you're interested, meet me at the corner of Carpenter and Pastel Place at midnight. And why should I do that? That's for you to think about. But I think you know already. Now listen carefully. I'll be wearing a light tan top coat, brown felt hat. I'll carry a leather briefcase. Goodbye. Mr. Holliday, what was that for? I told you. All I've got is a pair of deuces. 
Now, make the same call to Morgan. But first, one to Clink. I'm certainly bewildered. Mm. Don't you ever change. You're wonderful as is. What did I do? Hmm? Nothing at all. Susie, after I make this call to Kling and one to Morgan, I'll either have something to help Martin Kirby or... A what? Or a wonderful notice in the obituary column of the Star Times. <laughs> Back to Hunt and Pet, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. I made the same phone call to William Morgan that I made to Mrs. Roberts. But I tipped cling to something before I did. At midnight, I was at the corner of Carpenter and Pastel Place waiting. I'm sure, it was a bluff. But I figured all was fair in this game. Ten minutes went by, no one showed up. Then... Streetlights here. Guy could get lost easy. Yeah, he could. Yeah. Okay, thanks for the light. You're welcome. Okay, Dick. See you tomorrow, then. Good night. Maybe I played the wrong cards. Maybe no one would show up. It was 20 minutes past midnight. I stepped out of the shadows where I'd been standing. I felt pretty silly. And I knew what Kling would say. I was 20 feet away from the corner, walking slowly, looking up and down the street. There was no one in sight. The lights in the windows of the house went out slowly, one by one. I was 30 feet away from the corner when... Dick, Dick, is that you? Hey, there was somebody shooting. Oh, 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 oh
I will. Meanwhile, uh, you keep alive. Well, there wasn't anything more I could do that night. Took my punctured arm and myself home and got some sleep. Not much, though, because I knew I was right and Kling was right. Only two people knew I'd be at Carpenter and Pastel at midnight. Morgan and Mrs. Roberts. Mrs. Roberts had called the police to report my call. Morgan hadn't. All Morgan had to do now was to lay low until Kirby was executed. But he had been worried enough to take a shot at me. Then I thought of something else. The next morning in my office... Holiday? Oh, good morning, Susie. <gasps> Your arm, it's in a fling. Eh, it's becoming, isn't it? What happened? Eh, I was shot. Oh, who shot you? William Morgan, I'm sure. But never mind that now. I want you to help me. Why, sure, Mr. Holiday, but I won't get shot, will I? <laughs> Here, sit down the tab, brother. All right. Now, look, I've typed out a bunch of slips with, now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of their party. With one arm? Good enough. Now, you do the same. Go ahead. I don't understand. I'll explain while you're typed. Go ahead. Okay. The note left for Martin Kirby was typed. What I'm trying to do is to find out if the style of typing can be definite enough to pin on one person. You mean I type differently from you? Mm Mm-hmm. I use hunt and peck, and you use the touch system. Oh. You see, Mrs. Roberts used to be a secretary. She'd use the touch system of typing. Martin Kirby could type, so and so could William Morgan. Then what good will all this do you? Hmm? I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, Susie, that's enough. Now, mix up the slips and pick one at random. Then you tell me who typed it. All right. I typed that one. How do you know? It's smoother than yours. Is that the only way you can tell? Uh-huh. Hmm. Oh. Then if I type touch system... It'd be pretty tough to tell the slips apart. Oh, sure. All touch system is smooth looking. The letters are, well, they're all about the same blackness. Okay, that's another lead shot. Gee, I'm sorry, Mr. Holliday. Uh, look at that clock. Ten minutes past twelve. Less than twelve hours left for Kirby. Susie, I'm as sure as I can be that Morgan's guilty. That he shot me last night. Then why don't the police arrest him? It's dangerous for a man like that to be loose. Yes, I think you're right, but I... Susie. Uh-huh. Remember what you said about conscience? Uh-huh. Well, look, if Morgan were sure of himself, he wouldn't have tried that stunt last night. All right, because he did, it means that a little more work on him might make him break, huh? You're, you're not going to let him shoot at you again. Oh, not if I can help it. But I am going to see him. You will be careful, won't you, Mr. Holliday? Susie, I have only one life to give my work. But it so happens... I like it. Took the rest of the day, but I learned all I could about Mr. William Morgan. And there wasn't one thing that pointed at him as a killer. But I was sure he'd killed Roberts and Frank Kirby. He knew Kirby and Roberts had quarreled. He could have taken Kirby's gun from Kirby's desk at the office. He could have typed the note leading Kirby to Roberts' house. And among other things, he had been a demonstrator for a typewriter concern. How did that happen? Answer, not at all. Because Mrs. Roberts and Kirby both type touch system. That I found out when I read the report of the trial. Okay, I had one angle left. Work on Morgan. Work on him hard enough to crack him wide open. If it could be done. So that night, two hours before Martin Kirby was to die, I buzzed at Morgan's house. Yes? What is it? Mr. William Morgan? Yes. Who are you? I'm a writer. I... Uh... I have nothing to say. Excuse me. Get your foot away. Oh, just a minute. Did you receive a phone call last night? Come in. Thank you. What about a phone call? Did you have one last night? I don't know what you're talking about. But you let me in when I mentioned it. Sit down. Okay. You, uh... You hurt your arm. Yes, it uh, got in the way. You mentioned a phone call? Yes, I did. Cigarette? No, thanks. That uh, ashtray's awfully full. You must have been smoking a lot. So what? Nervous, Mr. Morgan? Now, look here. I've had enough of this. What do you want? And who are you? My name's Holiday. I called you last night. 
It was a gruesome joke, Holiday, one I didn't appreciate at all. I wasn't trying to amuse you, Morgan. Why did you make that call? Before I answer that, take a look at your clock. Well, what about it? In one hour and 50 minutes, Martin Kirby will be executed for a murder he didn't commit. Why don't you say what you've come to say? Because I'm waiting for you to say something. You mean you'd like me to say something that would... <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Why didn't you tell the police about that call? I... Oh, 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 Yes, so the police know that you made that call. Yes, I... Oh, that was uh, very bright of you, Mr. Holliday. No blackmailer would have told the police he made that call. If you knew anything and were planning to trap me, you'd have kept it to yourself, right? Morgan grinned at me. He knew I'd walked right into it. His nervousness seemed to just ooze away. He lighted another cigarette and kept grinning at me through the smoke. Then... Don't you think you'd better leave now, Holliday? Morgan, there was a note, typewritten. You typed it. Did I? Yes. Maybe you don't know this, but that note can put you in Kirby's place. Yes? How? Well, there's a way of telling who typed the note. Every typist has a different touch. And when enlarged, the touch of one typist will show up differently from another's. Kirby's defense lawyer missed that bet. But I didn't. You talk a great deal too much, Holiday. But it's interesting conversation. I don't it? believe what you said. No. Here's the note. The police lent it to me and... <laughs> That's all, Holiday. Stay sitting. You really wanted that note, didn't you? And I've got it. And that gun in your hand. It's the same one you shot me with last night. This time it won't be in the arm. No, I suppose not. <laughs> Look, Holiday. It's almost ten. In about one hour and a half, Kirby will be executed. Now, uh, you settle down and wait until 11.30. What do you mean? Two birds with one stone. Kirby and you at 11.30. Well, at 11.25, Holiday. You and Kirby have five minutes. You won't get away with it, Morgan. Why not? If I kill you in my apartment, it'll be legal. Look. What's that for? Can't you guess? Papers scattered around, drawers ransacked. It's simple. I came in, surprised you rifling my apartment, and shot you. See? <laughs> Will that gun? Why not? You know, I almost wish you would, Morgan. Because ballistics has the bullet taken from my arm, and if it matches the one that kills me tonight... <laughs> you figure it out. Why, you meddling fool. You'll be sorry. Good work, Sam. With one arm, too. You better stay where you are, Morgan. Cling. Hey, hey, Kling, the phone, the penitentiary. Oh, I... I took care of that an hour ago. You did what? Sure. I heard the whole thing from outside the window. But... But you said the case was closed. You couldn't work on it. I've got news for you, Danny boy. I'm off duty. <laughs> Nobody could tell the difference between typists. That he did, Susie. And a bluff about the bullet. Well, any bluff in a poker game, Kling. Oh, by the way, let me ask you one question. Yeah? What? Why did you hold off until the last minute? Oh, I had time. Morgan wouldn't dare kill you until after Kirby was executed at 11.30. So I looked at my watch and I figured I had time to get the headquarters, post things to stop the execution... And get back to you. Ooh. Lieutenant Kling. Uh, uh, what, Susie? Look at your watch. It stopped. Oh, that's nothing. It does that every once in a while. Just shake it and... Uh... Oh, holy cats. Oh, no. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with an original story by Robert M. Light, adapted for radio by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. Part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker, and that of Lieutenant Kling by Edmund MacDonald. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. 
Box 13 is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Carrot Star Times. I don't know quite how to begin this letter except to say that it may sound fantastic to me, perhaps even a joke. But please believe me, I am serious, and the situation is serious. A man is dying. But he has nothing wrong with him. He believes he's going to die five days from now. And so, Bart LeFay is dying. A strong, healthy man is dying because of witchcraft. I know this sounds like fun. But if you will come to Palou, Louisiana, you will see for yourself and perhaps be able to help. Sincerely, Doris Gordon. Sure, I laughed when I sat down to read Miss Gordon's letter. But the laugh stopped in Palou, Louisiana. Now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Death is a Doll. But, Mr. Holliday, you don't believe this, do you? Susie, as my old grandfather used to say, there's no such thing as a sure bet or a sure loser. I don't get it. Well, to quote the time-worn passage from Shakespeare, there are stranger things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamed of in your philosophy. Who's Horatio? That's beside the point. But Mr. Holliday, she, she says witchcraft. Now that's just, it's, well, it's imposter. <laughs> that a girl, Susie, you never let me down. You had to hunt for it, but you found the wrong pronunciation. That's beside the point. Yeah, it could be. But something tells me that Valu, Louisiana, offers interesting possibilities. Before I took off for Louisiana, I went to the Star Times and did a little research. You know, it's surprising what a person can find out about things he thought went out with the oil lamps, horse cars, and witch trials. But look at the bustle. Everybody thought it was dead. But now look. Well, just look. Anyway, what I learned made me change my mind a little about that letter from Doris Gordon, who met me at the station at Baloo. Five minutes after I got off of the train, we were driving along a dusty back road in a little car. I didn't think you'd come, Mr. Holliday. Well, I never refuse a chance to get mixed up in something that sounds different. Or insane? Mm, well, what's the difference? Automobiles and radios were different when they came along. Before that, they were insane. But this is different. <laughs> we're in the 20th century. Salem and the witch hunts are history. History? Well, to bat a cliche in the center field, history repeats itself. I know. Oh, oh by the way... No one must know why you're here, Mr. Holliday. Yes. Because <laughs> these people are fine and honest. But they're liable to resent a stranger. Oh. So what happens? I-, I want you to pretend to be my cousin. Glad to. But won't they know you haven't got a cousin? No. I teach school here. I've been here only six months. No one knows much about my personal life. They've come to trust me, like me, I think. And they'll accept you because of it. Fair enough. Now... I board with the LeFays. LeFay? Oh, your letter mentioned the Bart LeFay. Yes. He's the youngest son. And he's dying, so you said. Yes. In one month, he's become almost a dead man. Why? What did the doctor say? He said there's nothing wrong with Bart. But there has to be. That's what I told myself. I told it to Bart. But Mr. Holliday, he knows he's going to die because someone has told him. Who? Who told him? I don't know who started it. But now everyone in Baloo knows it. It's, it's been like a snowball. Building, building, building. They're in love with Bart. 
Yes, I am. All right, but, well, I don't see what I can do to... You've got to. It was only by chance that I saw your advertisement in the Star Times, a newspaper published in a city hundreds of miles from here. Remember? Adventure wanted. Will go any place, do anything. Write Box 13. I had to write to you. Just a minute, Miss Gordon. Let me ask you one question. What? Have you gone to the authorities? The sheriff, for example? Of course I have. And? Mr. Holliday, the law can't help when you're fighting something you can't see. So I was taken to the LaFay home as Doris Gordon's cousin. There was something about the house, an aura of fear that hung over it like a deadly pall. Bart's mother, his father, and his two older brothers seemed to have accepted the fact that Bart would die. Die when he said, in two days. That night, Doris arranged for me to be alone with Bart in his room. The house was located near the edge of one of the big bayous and somewhere outside of the night. A strange, eerie animal sound seeped through into the room where I sat with the sick man. How do you feel, Bart? Not fit, Mr. Holliday. Oh, now look here, Bart. The doctor says there's nothing wrong with you. Ain't nothing he knows. Ain't nothing he can know. Now, look, a man just doesn't die without something being the matter. I've got just two days now. Oh, Bart, that's nonsense. Now, snap up. You just don't believe it, do you, mister? No. No, I don't. Then why don't you ask down in the village? Ask anybody. About what? About what's happened to me. People see it happen before, and there ain't nothing nobody can do. Ain't nobody can help. The right. Doris. Doris. Doris, get some water. He can't swallow when he's like this. Uh, here, Bart. Come on. Sit up. Sit up. Let's stop breathe. It's getting worse. It's like somebody tightened the rope around my neck. So little get so tight, I can't breathe no more. Bart, you mustn't, you mustn't say that. Ain't nobody can help. Nobody. Doris. What, Dan? Where's the doctor? In the village. I'm going there. You stay here with Bart. All right, take the car. There's only one doctor? Yes, Dr. Brennan. All right. Now, don't leave Bart. I'll be back soon. I'm sorry, Holiday, but there's nothing I can tell you. There's nothing wrong with Bart LaFay. You're sure? Look, anything that drags a man down from 200-odd pounds to 150, I'd know about. Maybe I'm just a victim. Oh, I didn't doctor. mean it that way, Dr. Brennan, but, but as you say, a man can't lose over 50 pounds and look as Bart does without a cause. I know that as well as you do. Yes, well, better than I do. So let's be honest with each other. Honest? What do you mean? Because you're a doctor and because you're rational, logical, and reasonable, you won't let yourself accept the only explanation of Bart's illness. I uh, can't listen to any such nonsense, Holiday. Is Bart's condition nonsense? You're supposed to be an intelligent man. Yes, and so are you. Because I am, I, I won't think about it. You've never seen it happen before. No. But you've heard about it. Anybody who lives among people who believe in it has heard about it. All right. Now, Doctor, let's say what we're thinking. I'm not thinking anything. Bart LaFay is dying because... because he's the victim of witchcraft. You don't believe that. You mean witches, charms, potions, and that stuff? No. I'm as hard-headed as you are. But Bart believes it. Why, it's so ridiculous. To you and me, yes. Maybe a hypochondriac is, too. But to him, his imagined illnesses are real. You don't laugh at him and send him away, do you? Well, of course not. And I'll tell you why not. You know his illness is in his mind, so you play a long company. Because if you didn't, you know he'd become worse simply because he'd think he was. Uh, we're all right. Supposing you're right, Bart Bart. What can we do, Bart? You told him there's nothing really wrong. A hundred times. There's nothing else I can do. Uh, I might be able to help. Hmm? Uh, Find out who started this thing and why it continues. If we destroy the cause, Bart will get well. Do you expect me to help? Won't you? Holiday, I'm a doctor, a physician, a member of the association. If I poked around in something like that, what effect do you think it would have on my reputation? Yes, I see your point. And it's up to me alone. 
I'll help you up to a point. Beyond that, really, it's all yours. Fair enough. Now I've got to talk to the people here. You won't get very far. Why not? Because not one of them will say anything or lift a finger. Because they're scared to? That's it. Doctor, Bart LaFay has only tomorrow and the next day to live. Unless I can lick this. And I'm going to try. I left Dr. Brennan and went back to the LaFay place. I had to talk to Doris alone and later in the doctor's outside. Damn, it's too fantastic, too weird. Now listen to me, Doris. I did a lot of reading before I came down here. Know what I found out? In the last ten years, there have been over a hundred cases of so-called witchcraft. As recently as 1939, a man on trial for murder claimed self-defense on the grounds that the person he killed had charmed him. Excellent. Unbelievable. Yeah, that's what I thought. I look in the newspaper files. This is the 20th century. It could be the 120th, Doris. And still, people will believe what they want to believe. Do you believe it? No. No, there's no power on earth that can kill like that. The only power lies in the victim's mind, in his will to believe. And Bart? He believes it so strongly that he's dying. He can't die just much. Look, who started this? There had to be someone who kind of that suggestion this morning. No one. There isn't a person in the village in this whole parish who doesn't like Bart. But there has to be, Doris. It must be some horrible, malicious joke. The joke would have been called off before this. Well, I don't know. If, if I'd go to the village tomorrow... What would I learn from the people? Probably nothing. No one will come near here. I have to drive in for supplies. Oh, Bart! That was Bart! Come on. Boris and I ran into the house and the faith was standing at the door of Bart's room, staring at the closed door. Terror in their faces. I ran past him. Bart! Bart! Doris, get the lamp, hurry. Bart! Bart! He's all right. He just fainted. But why? Why? Here's your answer. What's that? Door shut the door. Keep the rest of the family out here. Wait out there, please. Blow out that lamp. Blow it out. What are you looking at? Is there somebody in the clearing outside? No. No, not a soul. I didn't expect to see you. You didn't expect? Look. This charm that made Bart scream was tossed into this window, Doris. And nothing supernatural or magical about it. It was a human thing who tossed it in. Why? To let Bart know he has only two more days to live. <laughs> to Death is a Doll, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd and Dan Holliday. It wasn't pretty, that charm. The way it was made with feathers and leather and bits of bone gave me a cold chill. I stuck it in my pocket and then took it out. It was silly, but I didn't want that filthy little thing near me. Bart came to, he made him comfortable, and I spent the rest of the night sitting by his bed. Then, the next morning, Saturday, Doris drove me into the village. While she did some errands, I went into the general store. Morning, mister. Oh, good morning. Can uh, I do something for you? Well, I... A stranger here, ain't you? Yes, I just came in yesterday afternoon. I'm Miss Gordon's cousin. <clears throat> oh, sure. Fine girl, Miss Gordon. Yes, she is. Boys, this here's Miss Gordon's kid. Cousin. Name's uh, Ed Masters. Hello, how are you? John Latouche. How do you do? Uh, Duck Wilson. Hi. In the rest of them. How are you? Staying uh, in below a spell, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh... Name's Dan. <laughs> Just call me Puck. Everybody else does. Now, so Puck here's about ten years ahead of me. Oh, <laughs> okay, Puck. As I was asking that. Uh, 
stay in long? Well, I don't know. Vacation? Sort of. Oh, staying here at the hotel? No, no. Oh, renting the old Gerard cabin, huh? Folks uh, do for vacation. No, I'm staying with the LaFays. Well, I must have said something wrong. It's one mighty good way to clear the store. Just mention LaFays. Aren't the LaFays like? They was. Was? You come in here to buy something, mister? No, I... Well, then I've got to get busy. I've got to get some stock put away. Oh, now, just a minute, Pop. I want to know something. Maybe you can tell me. Yes. Yeah, so much. I'll make it worth your while. You can uh, put away your money, mister. If when I wanted to make talk, uh, I wouldn't take no pay for it. Oh, I see. I'm, I'm sorry. And, uh, ain't staying long with the LaFays, are you? Oh, I don't know. You better know. Listen. Bart LaFay's down. Is he? You know he is. He's been ailing, not been bitten. Bob, who's doing it? I ain't got no idea what you're talking about. I think you have. You can't stand by and see a man die like that. Sooner or later, we all got. Pop, if you can tell me anything. I that... ain't no use of asking me. If, if you want advice, mister, don't stay no more at the LaFay's. I gotta get that to work. Oh, now, wait a minute, Papa. Well, it was useless to try that anymore. I went outside and stood there for a moment. Then I glanced back at the store. Staring out at me from a window was the face of a girl. About 18. And if ever a face showed fear, there it was. Before I could move, she pulled back away. Outside in the street, little groups of people stared at me. And I looked back at them. They walked out of sight. Farther down the street, I saw Doris and she was talking with a big husky fellow. I walked toward them. Dan, what did you find out? Oh, nothing. I knew it. Oh, Dan, this is Didge Lawson, Bart's best friend. Didge, this is Dan Holliday, my cousin. How are you, Didge? Bitten. <laughs> Them yellow livers were scared, huh? Mm, look like it. Look here, mister. I ain't scared. If you want any help, I'll give it to you. Thanks, Didge. But can you help? Maybe. I've got an idea. An idea, Didge? About what? Look here. Some place out in the bayou is what's killing Bart. In the bayou? Yeah. I know that there bayou like a back of my own hand. Some funny things can go on out there, mister. Like what? I see the doll once, hanging from a tree. Dressed up like a man was. Dressed up like Bill Dakin. Ain't long after that, Bill took sick. But he died. You saw that, Dick. Why didn't you do something? Me? I ain't gonna touch nothing like that. Them it touches you, they get sick and die. You think that's what's happening to Bart? Is that it, is? Maybe. Let's see. Oh, thanks for offering to help. That ain't You better be getting back now, Dan. Huh? Oh, yes, sir. Glad to meet you, Dan. See you, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll see you later. Bye, Dad. Bye. Doris. Yes? How good a friend is this to Bart? Why, they grew up together. Now, would he tell us if he knew who was doing this to Oh, I'm sure he would. Then we have someone else. I think he's really afraid, too. He'd never admit it. Do you think he'll be able to help? That depends. But what he said about that doll and Bill Dakin. Did you believe it? Yes, I did, because it's happened before. You can't mean it. You can't mean it, because it's impossible. So is the fact that Bart's dying with nothing wrong with him. But he is. Then how can you stop it, Dan? Well, I don't know yet. Got to find out today. Tomorrow may be too late. Let's get back to Bart. When we got back to Bart, I tried to get him to tell me who had told him he was doomed to die. He wouldn't say. Bart had one more day to live unless... unless we could find the evil thing that was preying on his mind. It was later that night, close to midnight. I was asleep. I was lying on the cot when I heard a noise at my window. Who's that? Who is it? What the... Don't talk loud, mister. Who are you? My name's Melissa. 
Please, mister, I've got to tell you something. If you want to help Bart... Wait up, come right on. No, no, you just got to listen. I hear you talking in the store to my pop. You want to know about Bart? How do you know? Come on, tell me. Edge put the death on Bart. Edge? If he finds out I told you, he'd kill me. He won't do anything of the kind, Melissa. Now, what do you know about this? Everything is all right till she come here. She? Miss Gordon? Her. Did you got smitten with her? Her. Now, now, Melissa, we'll fix all that up. But you've got to tell me what you know, quickly. When Bart took sick, I know there was something did you've done. I followed him out to the barn. And? Five times I followed him to Grandma Juno's place out there. Grandma Juno? Who's she? A witch. Melissa, there's no such thing as a witch. She is, she is. All right, let it go. What else do you know? He's gone out there again tonight. Tonight? How do you know? I saw him taking his bow down the shack. Mister, he's gone out there tonight to see Grandma Juno. This will be the last time. They will twist the thread around Bart's neck and tomorrow he'll be dead. Melissa, can... Can you take me out there? No, he's gone no more. I ain't. I, I'll take sick and die. Wait right there. You and I are going into town. What for? Never mind. Just wait there. I awakened Doris, told her what was happening, and took her car. Melissa and I drove into the village. Later, she... Dr. Brennan and I went out to the edge of the bayou. If a word of what I'm doing gets around, I'll be done. You've got to help them. All right. All right. Melissa. What? You sure that you can lead us to Grandma Juno's in the dark? I, I think maybe so. Come on. We're wasting time. Get in the boat, Doctor. Be careful. And for the inside, I got an MD3. Chase round in the black of midnight after a witch. Ready? I am. Go straight ahead until we come to the turn. Then go left. Oh, good. Ready, Doctor? I've got to be. All right. Now, no lights. <clears throat> be as quiet as you can. Let's go. Maybe I'll live to be a hundred. Maybe I won't. But I'll never forget that midnight boat ride. All around us, the huge cypress trees jutted up in the moonless sky. Drooping Spanish moss brushed our faces, and it was too dark to see a foot in front. But Melissa, unless she knew what she was doing and where she was going. Once or twice, the dark shape in the water bumped against our rowboat, slithered away. Then. Right up ahead. I can't see a thing. Melissa, you're sure? I know it. You can believe her, Dan. These people know their way around these files with their eyes closed. Look. Did you know? Stop wrong, Doctor. Easy. I'm going to take sick and die. I'm going to take sick and die. No, you're not, Melissa. Look. Good heavens. <gasps> Up ahead, on a little island in the light of an old lantern, were Didge and an old woman. Didge was sitting on a log watching while the old woman crooned over the doll. Crooned over it and wrapped the string tightly around its grotesque neck. Silently, slowly, we got closer. So we can hear her words. The devil's hand is clocking. Get away, get away. Come on, Doctor. He'll shoot. He's got his gun. You can't see it. Melissa, stay in the boat. Stop where you are. Don't you come no closer. Haven't you do what? Get him, get him! Come with me! He's good! Don't let him get it! Pick up that gun, Doctor. You get it for this mistake! You get it! Now give me that dog. No! Give it to me, I said. Get that dead! You like it! No, she won't. That's better. Let's get back to Bart, Doctor. What about Dick? He seems to like it out here. We'll let him enjoy it a while longer. Keep his gun. Here, let me see that dog. I... Why? It, it looks like Bart the Fair. Sure. It was Bart the Fair. Uh-huh. Never mind now. Let's get back. See? It's Dolly. It can't harm you. 
Things like this can never harm any. It's in your mind. Look. I'll unwrap the string from this throat. You'll be all right. That? That thing was doing it to me? No, your mind was doing it for it. That's all. You'll get better now. But what about you? What about me? Grandma Juno will get you. <laughs> no, she won't. Bart, believe me, there's nothing in the world like this can hurt you. So I'll go back home. The worst that can happen will be, well, will be my own fault. Sure, sure. Where's Doris? Oh, I'll send her in when I leave. I, I can't thank you rightly, Dan. Yes, you can. Just remember what I told you, Bart. No harm can ever come to you. Unless you bring it on yourself. Gee, what a nasty looking little doll. Mm, it's not pretty. And he actually believed this was killing him? Well, he knows better now. Do you feel all right? Hmm? <laughs> of course, why? Well, I just hate to think of that terrible old woman sticking pins in you. Oh, not a chance, not a chance. Now, well, let me sit down and look at the mail. <gasps> well, Mr. Holliday, what's the matter? Oh, I thought as though something stuck me. <gasps> Mr. Holliday, I... Susie. Susie. Oh, my knitting needle. Yeah. But nice. Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville, and this adventure was written by Clark Wilford. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. Part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Production is supervised by Vern Carstens. Box 13 is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount Picture. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, care of Star Times. Two days ago, I saw your ad in the Star Times. I want you to do something for me. Find someone who I know is in the city. You see, I think the man I want you to help me locate will be killed unless I find him first. If you're free tomorrow evening, you can move. We can meet at the corner of Robertson on 35th at 8 o'clock. Carry a top coat and your hat in your hand. I'll speak to you. Anxiously, Dorothy Simmons. Hmm. Sure, it sounded like a hundred other letters I'd get through box 13. But when the thing was over, I wish the mail carrier had taken a detour somewhere on his appointed rounds. <laughs> And now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, 113.5. Susie. Susie. Hey, Susie. Huh? Oh, hello. Hello. Susie, I've been here for an hour. My name is Holliday. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Holliday. I, I guess I was wool gathering. Yes, I guess you were. Hmm. Why are you staring so hard at that letter? I'm studying it. Why? Well, I'm reading a book. So? The book says you can tell character from handwriting. Oh. And what do you get from that letter from Dorothy Simmons? Nothing. Yeah, it must be a great book you're reading. Oh, I don't understand it at all. But it's fun. Yeah, I'll come back later when we can clear this up. But I've got a great idea, Susie. What? You forget about the book until I get back. Then I'll tell you all about Dorothy Simmons. <laughs> At 8 o'clock, I arrived at Robertson on 35th. 
at 8 3, a young woman, maybe 25 or 6, spoke to me. And at 8 15, we were sitting across from each other in a booth at a coffee shop. She was good looking, smartly dressed, and talked smoothly and well. But underneath that calm exterior, something was happening. I know he's somewhere in this city, Mr. Holliday. I've got to find him before before someone else does. Maybe you'd better tell me who this is we've got to find. My brother. Oh? Well, how do you know he's here? I've traced him this far. Heard from him at all? No. He's running away from something. Or someone. How do you know that? Well, the last time I saw him, three months ago, he was frightened. He wouldn't tell me what was wrong. And then he disappeared. Your letter said he might be killed. He said that. Well, any reason for saying it? No. At least none that he told me. Look, Miss Simmons, the city has a perfectly good missing persons bureau. An efficient set up to help people in your spot. Why, why not go to the police? I can't. All right, you can't. Reason? I, I don't know what my brother's done. Oh, I see. I'm not sure he's done anything wrong, but... Well, he might have him. And if we find him. What do you mean? Well, if he's been a bad boy, it'll be out of my hands. You turn him over to the police? Well, of course. You won't help me except under that condition. Well, that's about it. I... All right. I agree. Fair enough. Now, where do we start looking? I don't know. Oh, what's his name? Dave. Dave Simmons. Have you got a picture of him? No. That's great. I can describe him. Oh, go ahead. He's about five foot seven. He has Dorothy described her brother to me, and as she talked, a man who'd been sitting a couple of booths away got up and came near us. At first, I didn't pay any attention to him. Then it struck me as funny that he should be taking such a long time tying his shoelace. Wait a minute. What's the matter? Hold it. Having trouble? Huh? Are you talking to me? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I got a knot in the lace. Convenient place to get it. Huh? No, nothing. Are you finished now? What's the idea? I can't stop the time my shoelace? I have no objections. And what's a beef? None, I guess. What are you? Wise guy? Sorry. Yeah. Wise guy, that's why. Was he listening? If he'd have had his ear any closer, it would have been on my coffee. Did you ever see him before? No. No, I'm sure I haven't. Come on, let's get out of here. Look. He's looking in the window. Maybe he just likes us. He must have heard me describe my brother. Yeah, he couldn't miss. Okay, come on. He's gone. Uh huh. You sure you've never seen him before? Oh, I'm positive. Well, he must have been following you. Following me? Couldn't have been me because there was no reason for him to tell me. But why should he be after me? I don't know. Yet. Where are you staying? Oh, the the Wilmington Hotel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cab. Hey, cab. What are you going to do? Put you in a cab and see that you're not followed. Oh, but what about you? Mr. Shoelace doesn't know it, but he gave us a lead. All right, get in. When will I hear from you? Uh, I'll get in touch. Oh, no. I'll get in touch with you. Well, why shouldn't I call you? Please don't. Just let me call you tomorrow. Okay. Here's my card. Thank you. It's all right. Wilmington Hotel, driver. I waited for a cab to follow the one Dorothy had taken. None did. Mr. Shoelace had dropped out of sight, at least until the next day. It was about 11 in the morning at my apartment when... Come in. Well, hello. Hello. I see you're wearing knotless shoelaces this morning. <laughs> yeah. Mind if I sit down? No, we'll go right ahead. Thanks. I'll admit this is pleasant, but it can lose its charm. This visit, I mean. Uh, maybe you'd like me to get right to the point, Holiday. There's merit in that suggestion. Uh-huh. You wonder how I found you? No, you tailed me last night. Uh-huh. Good job, I didn't see you. <laughs> no, nobody does unless I want him to. Oh? Now, about the point you mentioned. Is it still lying around? Holiday, I'll go 50-50 with you. Well, that's generous of you. 50-50 on what? 20 grand. Now, look. We both beat our brains out if we work alone. If we work together, we got a better chance. It sounds reasonable. But if I knew what you were talking about, we could make more sense. She didn't tell you? Tell me what. <laughs> what are you trying to do? Play coy with me? No, not at all. What should Dorothy Simmons have told me? Who? Dorothy Simmons. 
What a funny man I am. Yeah, ain't you? What's the big laugh? Yeah, she said that was her name. That's right. Suppose I told you she was lying. All right. Suppose you tell me. No, I... I think you're on the level with this. All right, let's stop the funny business. Nothing doing, Holiday. What you don't know won't hurt you. And what about something I do know? In that case, look me up here. Here's my card. I might come in handy. Well, he left me sitting there holding his card. On it, I read, R. Dakin, private investigator. The whole thing was beginning to look like a bride's first cake when... Hello? Mr. Holliday? Yes? This is Dorothy Simmons. Oh? Are you sure? What did you say? That name, Dorothy Simmons. You sure it's yours? Hello? Hello? I... May I see you? Well, I'd love it. Oh, I had a visitor. Visitor? Who? Our friend last night. Seems his name is Dakin, a private investigator. Private investigator? Yeah, that's right. Now, does he mean anything to you? Can't we talk about it? I mean, not over the phone. Okay, I'll come to the hotel. No. No, I don't want anyone to know I'm here besides you. That man might follow you. Oh. All right, you name the place. Well, there's a drugstore down the street from the hotel. I'll meet you in there in half an hour. Uh, better make it an hour. All right, an hour. Goodbye. Goodbye. Whatever was going on, it was going in a circle with me riding the edge. But it looked interesting. A girl who said her name was Dorothy Simmons. A man who said her name wasn't Dorothy Simmons. A missing brother and the 50-50 cut in something that would bring $20,000. Yeah. Yeah, it had possibilities. But before I went to meet Miss Simmons, I found out about Dagan from Lieutenant Kling. Dagan was a shady operator. He'd come within an ace of having his license taken away from him on more than one occasion. But he'd always managed to slip the noose and stay in business. Okay, this looked good. So, an hour later, I was with Dorothy Simmons in the drugstore. I don't know him. I've never even heard the name Dakin before. All right. How about your own name? It isn't Dorothy Simmons. Well, what is it? I can't tell you now. Please don't ask me why. When we find my brother, I'll tell you everything. Meanwhile, I've got a ticket on a merry-go-round, and I... I get dizzy easily. You said you'd help me. Mm-hmm. But I can't fight a mist or hunt for somebody in a city that's... Dagan must know something about my brother, or he wouldn't have followed me. He must have thought I'd lead him to Dave. Well, you've got something. Please find out from Dakin what he knows. I don't think Mr. Dakin is the type that dishes out information just like that. Make him tell. Hmm? <laughs> How? Use thumb screws or the Iron Maiden? I've got to know why he's after my brother. I'd like to know that myself. And why you won't tell me your real name. Oh, there are a lot of things I'd like to know. Let's go to see Dakin. And if he tells us anything, I'll tell you anything you want to know. All right. That's a deal. Come on. Mm, looks like Mr. Dakin's not receiving. Try the door. It's open. Mr. Dakin isn't very private, is he? Dakin. Dakin. Why are the shades drawn? Mr. Dakin likes it dark, I guess. And... What's the matter? I think Mr. Dakin is also investigating anything. <gasps> Be quiet. Dead. He's dead. Shot. Who killed him? How do I know? Hand me that phone. What are you going to do? Phone the police? No, you can't do that. Look, Dakin's been murdered. I'll do a lot of things for adventure and excitement. But hiding a murder is not one of them. But... My brother, suppose he... I told you twice. If your brother... Please don't call the police. Not yet. Please. I said hand me the phone. Come on, look out. Get out of I... All right. Here. Well, that's better. Operator. Operator. Get me the police. I want to report. <laughs> Operator. Never mind. The call was a mistake. And now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's latest adventure, 113.5. Whatever Dorothy Simmons used to hit me, it was a lot harder than my head and something had to give way. 
so I did. <laughs> when I opened my eyes, Lieutenant Kling was bending over me. Well, it's nice to know you're still with us. Yes, I wake up to the strangest things. Uh-huh. Hey, why are you here? The operator reported a call from here. Two minutes later, another tenant passed here and saw this lovely tableau. You always lie down and go to sleep with murdered men. Always? Oh, what did you hit me with? Hmm, this great, big, nice, heavy paperweight. And who's she? Dorothy Simmons. I still ask, who's she? Well, I told Kling the whole story, beginning to end. And when I'd finished, I realized how silly it sounded. He looked at me and... Your name should be Alice. This is no wonderland and... Did your boys turn this place upside down? No. Uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Check on Dorothy Simmons at the Wilmington Hotel. You heard her description. Now, Holiday. She hit you and ransacked this room. Looking for something. What? You know as much as I do. Uh, that gives me a whole lot to go on. As much as I had. Uh, Brilliant. Brilliant observation. Yeah, and you're in a good spot to notice it. I don't think. Look, why don't you go to Tibet? Can I go now? Home, Tibet? Uh, yeah, get. Thanks. And when you find out about Dorothy Simmons, give me a ring, will you? Yeah, sure, sure. Now, beat it. I left the room and walked downstairs into the street. My head was still buzzing like a party line in a crowded neighborhood. But it was clear enough to let me see a big limousine that was parked just across down the street from Dakin's office building. It hadn't been standing there when Dorothy and I went in to see Dakin. Besides, a, a face looked out at me from the rear window. Then the face vanished, the car drove away. Hmm. Well, this was getting better. A limousine complete with chauffeur. I caught the license number, jotted it down in my head in between a couple of aches, and went back home. Later in my office, I had Susie check on that license number. I've got it for you, Mr. Holliday. Uh, the car belongs to a uh, Mr. Josiah Kettering. Huh? Are you sure? Sure. Why? Well, I don't get it. Kettering's one of the richest men in the state. A recluse. Now, what connection does he have with Dorothy Simmons, Dakin and... Hello? Susie, is Van there? Oh, sure. It's Lieutenant Kling, Mr. Holliday. Mm, yeah, well... Uh... Hello? Your head's still on? Oh, barely. Why? Then get this through. There's no Miss Dorothy Simmons registered at the Wilmington. Well, I told you that it might not be her real name. Look, I'm not finished. Nobody of that description is registered there. And before you ask me if I checked all the way through, the answer is yes. The dream girl simply doesn't live there anymore. Or ever. Uh, Are you there? I'm not much of any place right now. I'd better stay where we can put a finger on you. Mind if I go out on an errand meanwhile? Where? Have one of your boys follow me. Maybe I'll need a little company. So long. Hey, there's no... I can go on an errand for you, Mr. Holliday. Oh, not this one, Susie. I'm going to see what Mr. Josiah Kettering has to offer. Yes, sir? Is Mr. Kettering in? Do you have an appointment, sir? Uh... Yes, tell him I've come for Mr. Dakin. If you're waiting the foyer, sir, I'll give Mr. Kettering your message. The butler disappeared down the hall, went into a room, and a few seconds later... Uh, this way, if you please, sir. Oh, thank you. That will be all, Carl. Very good, sir. And close the door. Well, you sit down. Thank you. You, you said something about a Mr. Dakin. Yes, you know him. What do you want? Well, did you know Dakin was murdered? <laughs> Mr. Dakin was the type of person who invariably ends up that way. Some people do, you know. And some people do the killing. That achieves a nice balance. But that's neither here nor there. What have you come to tell me? Nothing. I... What are you looking at? Books. Quite a collection you've got in here. Yes. You know books. Rare ones. I don't have the money necessary to enjoy them as much as you do. Meaning what, sir? Nothing. Hey, you, you said you came from Mr. Dakin. Ha have you anything to tell me? I didn't answer the old man who sat there leaning forward, watching me like a bright but aged robin. I could swear he thought I had something. Something he wanted. I decided to play along, stall for what I could learn. His hands yellow and thin trembled and then... Well, answer me, man, answer me. 
Have you got it? Did you get it back? No. Don't, idiots, you incompetent fools. I paid you to get it back. I paid you. Now I want it. Bring it back to me, do you hear? Bring it back. Well, I don't know where it is. Then why did you come here? Because Dakin was killed. I don't care about Dakin or anything else, but my book is gone, stolen. Look, I kept its place open. Bring it back to me, please. Get it back to me. The old man walked to a bookcase. He ran his hands over the row of volumes. Then his fingers stopped at a vacant spot. What do you Turned want? back to me. More money? I'll give it to you in cash. Now, just a minute. Maybe you'd better tell me the name of the book again. I... You know. Dakin knew. Uh, Dante First Folio. Now, please... Please get it back. Well, why don't me? you go to the police? Eh? Police? Why did you say that? You're not one of Dakin's men. You're not, are you? No. You're all against me. Everyone's against me. Everyone wants my collection. Get out. Get out. Get out. Who stole that book from you? They stole it from me. They knew I couldn't go to the police. They knew. But I I fooled them, didn't I? I hired Dakin and... But you're not Dakin. You're the police. You won't let me have it back. You won't let Carl, me have it Carl. back. I tell you. I want that Mr. book. Kevin. Better take care of him, Carl. No. Quiet, sir. He'll be all right, sir. What do you know about this, Carl? Uh, nothing, sir. Who stole that book from Mr. Kettering? Uh, there was no book stolen, sir. There was. A book Kettering couldn't let the police know about because it was in his possession illegally. Is that right? Uh, sir, these books are all he has. Yes, I know. And how many of them are stolen from other collections? Just the Dante first folio. Mm -hmm. The only one he couldn't go to the police about, so you hired Dakin to trace him. Uh, please, sir. This, this won't mean prison for him, will it? It, it mustn't, sir. I don't know. Now, look, Carl. Who stole it? But there was a couple here. Mr. Kipling's secretary. No? Uh, yes, sir. What does she look like? She, she was about 25 or 6, rather pretty. Knew a great deal about books, sir. Uh, Mr. Kettering had placed an ad for someone to do cataloging. She answered. And she saw the Dante first folio. She must have at one time or another. Uh, Mr. Kettering kept this room locked, but... Uh, well, that's course... enough. You said a couple. Was the other one a man? Yes, a chauffeur. Uh, he and the girl were friendly. Mm -hmm. Okay, you'd better take care of Mr. Kettering. He, he won't go to the police, sir. He, he would kill him. I can't answer that. Just take care of him. I've got something else to do. <laughs> Cling, it adds up. The girl in the chauffeur got away with the folio. And... The girl being this uh, Dorothy Simmons. Simmons Smith Brown. What's in the name? She and the chauffeur stole the folio. The girl knew Kettering wouldn't dare go to the police. Now, why did she go to you? Now, here's my guess. The chauffeur double-crossed her, ran out with the folio. She couldn't go to a reputable private detective agency, and she didn't want the chauffeur to get sight of her. So she picked you for the patsy to find the guy. The guy she said was her brother. And it's got to be it. Okay, I'll buy it. But what about Dakin? Either she or the chauffeur killed Dakin. The chauffeur because Dakin was on to him, or the girl because she didn't want to be trailed. Ah, uh, that makes sense. And Dakin was going to cross up the whole thing. Grab the folio for himself because he knew nobody could go to the police. A nice merry-go-round with a double cross for a brass ring. And no free rides. Okay, that's the setup. So where does it leave us? Find the girl or the chauffeur. Okay. But something tells me that's going to be tough. And it was. For five days, the police dragged the city. It was dead end until a clean came to my office and... A man answering the chauffeur's description was picked up about 200 miles from here in a cheap rooming house. He made a run for it. Used his gun. And? He was killed. And the folio? He didn't have it. And he didn't sell it either. Well, how do you figure that? If he had, we'd have heard about it. And even if we hadn't, the guy wouldn't have been holed up in a joint like that. He'd have had dough. Yeah, so where's the folio? Girl? Uh-uh. The chauffeur must have hidden it. You got any ideas? No, no. What was found on him? Yeah, just this. Slip of paper. What's this? Yeah, you can read. It says 113.5. One, one, 3.5. Is all there was on him? That's all. What's it mean? Well, your guess is as good as mine. Cling someplace in the city is a folio worth $20,000. Two men have been killed because of it. Yeah. All we've got is one, one, 3.5. Just those numbers. Code? That could be. It's 
Yeah, me. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I... Oh, hello, Mr. Holiday. Hello, Lieutenant Clean. Hi, Susie. Oh. Gee, they're both looking sad. Uh-huh. Mr. Holiday, remember what I told you I was reading about handwriting? Please, Susie, well... not now, please. Oh. What's that note? One, one, three point five. Huh? One, one. Susie. What's the matter? What have you got there? Books on handwriting. Playing. Look at those books. Look at them. Huh? What's eating you? What about them? Look at them. Just look at them. Playing. I know where that folio is. I was sure I was right, but I wanted to go it alone. Playing wanted both the folio and the girl, so I had to be alone just in case. My destination. The public library. What better place to hide a book than there? I climbed the iron stairs to the stacks that towered over the main reading room. I read the index numbers on them. 111, 112, 113, decimal point. I reached out my hand for a little volume that stood between books that probably hadn't been taken out since the library was built. Thank you, Mr. Holliday. Oh, Miss Simmons, I believe. I hoped you'd lead me to it. May I have it? Good hiding place, isn't it? Way up here in the stacks, hidden between books that nobody had asked for. But let's talk about you, Miss Simmons. Hmm, you've changed. Hair a different color, dress shabbily, dark glasses. No wonder you couldn't be I'll found. I'll take that folio, please. I guess you would. After all, you killed Dakin to keep him from finding the chauffeur. That's right. And I'll kill again. I'll kill again and again to get something that will mean the end of watching other people enjoy life. Hand it to me. Miss Simmons... If you shoot, wouldn't the shot be heard? Wouldn't you have to explain? Give it to me. You have great patience. You followed me probably every day. Now, a little more patience won't hurt. Stay away. Don't come any closer. You want this, don't you? Give it to me. All right. But you will have to get it. Don't. Don't drop it over. If you do, I'll kill you. That wouldn't do any good, Miss Simmons. If I drop it over this rail, it'll drop three stories into the reading room below. Now... Still want to shoot? Please. Please give it to me. Put down that gun. No. Then shoot. But when you do, this book drops. There are about 50 people down there. Which one of them would you like to pick up $20,000? Take a look, Miss Simmons. Let go of me. Let go of me. Come on, Miss Simmons. And you'd better walk ahead of me. Somehow I wouldn't want you at my back on those steep, narrow stairs. But weren't you afraid she would shoot, Mr. Holiday? Oh, yes, Susan. But she knew if she did, I'd drop the book. And that gave me time to grab her. Gee, and to think you discovered where the folio was because I brought library books here to the office. Mm-hmm. See what reading will do for you, Susie? Uh-huh. Well, I've given up those books on handwriting, Mr. Holliday. Oh, why? Because I analyzed one sample of handwriting, and it said the person was loyal, kind, unselfish, generous. And who is this paragon of virtue? Miss Simmons. Oh, good night, Susie. Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville. This week's original story was written by Arthur Bowling. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker, and that of Lieutenant Swing by Edmund MacDonald. Bernie Parkinson is in charge of production. Box 13 is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. What? Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. All right. How about it, George? Take it out of the typewriter. Now, address an envelope. To Box 13, care of Star Times. <laughs> you know, this Box 13 is made for me. The 
letter was typed. There was no signature. And it read, Enclosed is an invitation to the Garden Charity Bazaar at the Arthur Mannering Estate this coming Thursday. Use it, and maybe you'll get adventure. Anyway, take a chance. And wear a red carnation and you'll look to hell. That was all. Four lines. But, brother, what was in between the lines that I couldn't read then? Back to Box 13 and Dan Holiday's newest adventure, Dan and the Wonderful Land. What adventure could you find at a charity bazaar, Mr. Holiday? That, Susie, is why the letter interests me. Sounds dull. Mm. Some of the dullest letters I get through Box 13 have led to some of the biggest headaches. That's fun. It was probably written by some huckster. A what? Huckster. Uh-huh. That's what I thought you said. I did. I know you did. Was it wrong? Could it be right? A huckster is a person who plays jokes. Oh, could you have meant hoaxer? You know what I meant. Takes a little while, but I get there. And I think I'll go to the charity bazaar. So, the next day I went to the charity bazaar. The mannering of state was huge. Why not? Arthur Mannering had $5,000 for every blade of grass in the place. And it was a big lawn. There were lots of people, lots of money, lots of places to spend it. I wandered through wondering what the gimmick was. Why the next? What the adventure was going to be. No one paid any attention to me. No one paid any attention to anyone. Then after about a half hour of aimless meandering, I just happened to stick my hand in my jacket pocket and pulled out a note. It read, go to booth number five, guess the number of beans in the jar as 1,862. Hmm. That was all. Somebody put that note in my pocket. Easy doing that crap. Well, the adventure that looked as though it wouldn't amount to anything was a mounting to a jar of beans. Hello there. Oh, hello. This is booth number five, isn't it? That's right. You want to make a guess? Yes, I think so. It's five dollars a guess. Make as many as you want. Oh, five dollars a guess? <laughs> it's for a good cause. And if I guess right, I win the beans. When it's all over, we'd be glad to give them to you. But you also win a prize. Mm-hmm. All right, what do I do? Here's a slip of paper. Just write your guess on it with your name. Uh-huh. Now, let's see. Does 1,862 sound like a good number to you? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, excuse me. I've got another customer. I wrote down the number with my name. Then I took a look at the others behind the booth counter. No one seemed very interested in me, and then... Are you all finished? Oh, yes, thanks. Do you take a slip now? That's right, and thank you. Oh, don't mention it. Oh, by the way, when do we find out the lucky number? Oh, in about half an hour. <laughs> okay, I can hardly wait. I wait. Another half hour, and during that time, I paid $27.50 for a nickel fan, a nickel ice cream cone, and a three-cent brass ring I wanted the fish pot. Then... Attention, everyone. Attention, please. We wish to announce the winner of the bean guessing contest. The winner is uh, Mr. Dan Holliday. Mr. Dan Holliday. Will Mr. Holliday please come to booth five and pick up his prize? Well, I went and picked up my prize. Whatever I'd won, it was big and heavy. All neatly done up in fancy paper and big ribbons. So I'd come to a charity bazaar to win a prize for guessing the number of beans in a jar. (laughs) A great adventure. Anyway, I took my prize package to my office instead of home. Oh, Mr. Holliday. See you back early. Uh huh. Thought I'd drop in here on the way home. What have you got there? Mm, I don't know, but I want it. How? I guess there were 1,862 beans in a jar. Oh, that's mm. a funny number to get. I'll ride with you on that one. Well, let's see what I've got. Okay. Mm, it's heavy. Mm-hmm. What's that? It's a lamp. 
No self-respecting lamp ever looked like that. <laughs> Adorable, but cute. So for this, I spent $32.25, all expenses included. The shade's kind of pretty. If you like oddities, yes. Hmm, it's not bad. Oh, well, it's yours. Mine? Uh -uh, I don't want it. But maybe you were supposed to win it. Susie, I spent a dull afternoon and I came back with that. Somebody's ribbing me. Oh, oh I bet that's it. If I have room to suspect, I'd send that lamp to him. Did you mean it when you said I could have it? Yes, I did. Susie, with my compliments, the ugliest lamp in the world. Now, I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, help me put it back in the box, will you? Let it take a half hour. Take it home like that. Well, I don't know about walking along the street with it. Oh, I see what you mean. But it's your problem. Oh, uh, throw the box away outside, will you, Mr. Holiday? It's, it's too big for the wastebasket, and there's a trash barrel right down the street. Oh, sure. I'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye. You know, it's not bad once you get used to it. Yeah, well, that takes a while. So out I walked with the box under my arm. I threw the box in the back seat of my car, intending to get rid of it later. But I forgot to go home with it. In fact, I carried it inside my apartment building. When I reached my floor, threw the box down the incinerator chute in the hallway. And I wished now the lamp had been in it. It was midnight before I decided to get some sleep, and I was just dozing off when... Who's that? Special delivery letter for you, Mr. Holliday. Oh. Okay, just a second. Sorry to get you up, Mr. Holliday. Oh, that's all right. Here's your letter. Sign here, please. Yeah, sure. Oh, sorry. I dropped the pencil. Here it is. I'll get it. Roll inside. Go back to sleep. <coughs> Mr. Holliday. I woke up with the night for bending over me. You all right, Mr. Holliday? Mm hmm. What happened? Well, I don't know. I was checking your room and came by and saw you lying here in your doorway. You're sure you're all right. Do you want a doctor, sir? Uh, no, no, thanks. Here, I'll help you out. Dizzy? Mm. I've been steady on my feet before. Hey, somebody went through your apartment. Yeah, from the looks of it, with a steam shovel. Burglars. Yeah. I'm going to call the police. No, wait, wait a minute. Close the door. But, but the police, Mr. Holliday. Well, let's see if anything's missing. Yes, sir. Uh, well, there's your money. And, and your watch over on the night table next to the bed. Mm-hmm. And that's all that's worth stealing in here. Well, that's funny, is it? Sure. You sure there's nothing missing, Mr. Holliday? No, not a thing. Well, gee, I... Look, it's all right of you. Better get back downstairs. I'll call the police later. Sure. Uh, maybe you'll find something missing after a while. Maybe. Thanks. I'll see you later. Holiday. At this hour? What time is it? Almost one. Oh, oh, am I supposed to be at the office? Did I oversleep? Oh, it's so dark outside. Just I... listen, Susie. Have you got that lamp? Lamp? Lamp. The one I gave you. Oh, sure. I've got it. Do you miss it? Look. Lock your door. Don't let anybody in until I get there. You're coming here? Right away. Oh, but, but I'm not there. You'll have 20 minutes to fix that. But remember what I said. Let no one in but me. Susie, your guess is as good as mine. And mine's wild. But it looks good. Did anyone see you take it out of the office? No, I don't think so. Hmm. And they thought I had it because I carried the empty box home. What's all the fuss about that lamp? I don't know. I... I wonder. What do you wonder? Have you got a screwdriver? Screwdriver? A uh, screwdriver and knife. Anything we can use to take that lamp apart. Oh, sure. Take it apart? Uh-huh. I think I've got a screwdriver someplace. I, I remember using one to fix my wristwatch. Oh, good. Let's have it. Is this one? Mm, that's good enough. Now, let's turn off the lamp and disconnect it. Gee, I don't understand all this, but it's fun. Yeah, the knot on my head that says you're wrong. Well, Susie watched. I took that lamp apart piece by piece by bit. 
I even examined the shade, but... It's, it's just the lamp, Mr. Holliday. Yeah. It's nothing inside the base, nothing in the sockets, nothing in the body. Nothing, period. Did you expect to find something? I was sent to that bazaar to get this lamp. I did. You ended up with it. But somebody thought so much of it that my head was tapped. Now, why? Maybe. Gee, maybe. Maybe. Maybe what, Susie? Maybe it's the lamp itself they wanted. Susie, maybe you've got something there. Why? What's there about this lamp? <sighs> I don't know. Look, the Mannerings are wealthy. Now, it stands to reason they've got a lot of valuable objects in their home. Oh, and the lamp could be worth a lot of money. We'll find out tomorrow. You're going to leave it here? I have to, Susie. Meanwhile, don't let anyone in. Tomorrow, we'll see what's so wonderful about this lamp. As soon as he kept the lamp, I went home and thought about it. The more I did, the less I did. Then the next morning, I picked up the lamp from Susie, took it to a dealer. Yes, sir. Can I help you, too? Maybe. This, uh, this lamp, I want your opinion on it. Mm, why? How's it work? How much would you get for it? Mm, well, if I win a good humor, two dollars. Two? Mm, two and a quarter. But I'd have to be hysterical. You're sure? <laughs> Positive. Uh, how much did you pay for it? Uh, nothing. Mm, that's fair enough. Please, take another look at it. <clears throat> Must I? As a favor. Uh, all right. Well, I'd say it was the product of a factory that turns out about two million a year. It's nothing but plastic to pass and cheap common glaze. Uh, brass base, some standard. Uh, we about 50 cents. Wiring's fairly good. And Large enough. You've convinced me. <laughs> I hope you didn't think it was an antique, sir. No, just a lamp. Exactly. Uh, did you want to sell it? No. No, thank you. Thanks for your trouble. Uh, no trouble at all. Uh, come in again, sir. Uh, without the lamp. <laughs> I was about to leave the store when I saw someone across the street. And if my eyes were good, and they are, it was the fake who got me up at midnight only to put me back to sleep. He had followed me, and he was watching the store. He couldn't see me, so I turned back to the dealer. Yes, sir. Something else, sir? Do you want to buy this lamp? <clears throat> why? I want to get rid of it. That's an admirable ambition, but uh, why to me? It's yours at any price you want to pay. Mm, when I said two dollars, that was a guess, you know. <laughs> In fact, I, I don't want the lamp. Oh, would you take it if I gave it to you? I beg your pardon? The lamp is yours. I don't want it. Well, this is very peculiar. Look, you pay me what you want. Take one, huh? Done in a hand. So. <laughs> I don't know why I do these things. Uh, neither do I. Yeah. Here's your money. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And good luck. Yeah, with that lamp, I'll need it. I can use the wire in the stock store. I left the store. I paid no attention to the man who loitered across the street. I walked to my car, got in, and drove up the street and around the corner. Then I got up. I peeked around the corner and saw my man go into the shop. A minute later, he came out with the lamp, got in his car, and drove away. I hurried back to the shop. Good morning, sir. Oh, you again. The lamp. Yeah, what about it? You sold it. Yeah. Hey, don't tell me you want it back. Did you know the man who bought it? <laughs> Mister, anyone who buys a lamp like that, I don't ask questions. It's his. For how much? Ten dollars. Well, that was a quick profit. Oh, I didn't set the price. He came in, looked around, saw the lamp, said ten dollars for it. I recovered my sanity and sold it to him. <laughs> and no questions asked? None. Why? Mister, you don't know it. But there are a million questions that could be asked, and I don't know one answer. Yeah. And now back to Dan and the Wonderful Lamp, another Box 13 adventure starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Oh, there it was. A lamp worth two dollars, a hit over the head, and a big, big puzzle. That same afternoon, I bought all the papers, took them to the office, and looked through them to see if there was a report of anything stolen from the Mannering place. <laughs> Nothing. I left the office and was on my way down the street. Uh, hello, Mr. Holiday. Huh? 
I'm afraid I'm walking, Mr. Halliday. Ooh. Got another special delivery letter for me? An even better one this time. It all depends on you. On the song of the same name. I'm not amused. Let's go for a ride, huh? On a nice day like this? Let's walk. Save your energy. You need it. I see what you mean. Nice gun you got there. Yeah, nice car, too. It's right down the street. How handy. Yes. You got the lamp I take me to. Because you go with it. Hmm? Going to wire me for electricity? That could be. All right, get in. Okay, Max. You know where to go. Well, Max is smarter than I am at the moment. Uh-huh. But you'll get smarter. But I've got a hunch you'll get much smarter before I'm finished. Mr. Holliday, sit down. Oh, thanks. Nice room. Could use a little furniture. This far out in the country? No, we don't need it. Besides, Max needs room. Hey, to move around, understand? Looking at Max? Yes. He is big and rough. Doesn't he speak? I do the talking. I'll start now. Holliday, you're smart, but you're not smart enough. Now, where is it? Where's what? Thought stall. I don't know what you're talking about. You picked up the lamp at the bazaar. At your invitation. That's right. How did you know the number of beans that would be in that jar? That doesn't matter. What does matter is I want to know what you did with it. The lamp? Not the lamp. And I don't know what you're talking about. One more chance, Holland. Where is it? I said I don't know what you're talking about. Look, uh, you want a cut in it? Uh, cut? In what? The cut. diamond. How is it? You hear me? I don't know anything about it. Where did you take that lamp last night? It wasn't in your apartment. Where'd you take it? Go ahead, Max. Max came toward me. He got bigger and bigger as he did. He moved slowly, and while he did, I had to think. If I told that Susie had the lamp, they'd go to her, and I didn't like to think about that. Poor little Susie wouldn't know what they were talking about. And it seemed that things happened to people who didn't know what was what. I had to keep quiet. Max got to me and... Well, how are you feeling? Oh. Better? Had an accident, eh? Where am I? I guess that's what everyone says in a case like this. Found you lying in the road here, mister. Had a pretty bad accident from the look of you. I don't like to think about that. Can you get me back to the city? The hospital would be better. Never mind, I can still breathe, I think. I want to get back into the city. Yes, I can take you. Good, I want to go to the Arthur Mannering Estate. I'm quick. The farmer drove me into the city and to the Mannering Estate. I had a hard time convincing the butler I had to see Mannering, but finally... This is a fantastic story, Mr. Holliday. Yes, I'll agree, but the man who had me beaten said something about your diamond. Yes, the Mannering Blue. Where is it? Here, in the house. You're sure? Of course. Would you like to convince yourself? I'd like nothing better. Very well. But um, how about you? Don't you think we'd better see about your condition? It'll keep a hope. Now the diamond. Very well, this way. Uh, it's impossible that anyone could have taken it. There were a lot of people here yesterday. <laughs> and an army of detectives, Mr. Holliday. No, I repeat, it would have been impossible for anyone to take the manor in blue from this state. You're sure. Eh? Just a second, you can look for yourself. Hmm. That's it, huh? That's the manor in blue, sir. And this is the only time. That's right, Mr. Holliday. And I give up. It's very curious, sir. This business of your guessing the exact number of beans in that jar and then... Wait a minute. Who knew the number of beans that would be in that jar? <laughs> Why, the one who puts them in, obviously. A girl? Attractive, about 23 or 4? Well, I don't know about that, but... Wait a moment. You're not suspecting Carol Marshall, are you? Is she the one on the boat? Yes, but I, I'm sure she didn't know. Why, as a matter of fact, she took the place of my secretary at the last moment. Secretary? Where is she? He. Uh, why, yesterday morning he asked to be excused. 
The bean guessing contest was his idea. And the secretary. Big, tall, yes. low five points. Yes, yes, that's scary. But the diamond's here. Is it? Go. Oh, maybe. Maybe it's not the man. Why not? The secretary will get himself excused yesterday morning. Hasn't shown up yet. No. Here's a taste diamond made up. The problem is to get the real one out of here. He bided his time. The bazaar yesterday was a perfect setup. The real mannering blue is hidden in that lamp I won as a prize. You see, he and his confederates didn't want to take any chances. Your secretary didn't want to take the diamond off the estate himself. A million things could go wrong. But, uh, but the real diamond, it, it wasn't in that lamp, you say. It had to be, but where I... I took it apart, I... Eh? What were you about to say? Look, you get in touch with the police. Here's my card. Keep in touch with me, too. Here, but Mr. Holliday, I... I got work to do. Think hard. You brought the lamp home here. Yes. What did you do then? I put it on the table where you saw it. Did anything fall out of it? No, Mr. Holliday. Think, Susie. Think. The diamond had to be in that lamp. You took it apart, Mr. Holliday. There wasn't anything in it. There had to be. I wouldn't have taken the beating I did. I think, Susie. Think. Gee, I, I am. I brought it home, put it on the table, connected it, and turned it on. And that's all? Sure. I, I remember because one of the bulbs wouldn't burn. One of the bulbs? Yes. I, I changed it because it was burned out. What did you do with the bulb? Threw it away. Why? Susie, tend to one the diamond was in that bulb. But how could anyone get a diamond in a bulb? Don't you see? Take off the screw base. Take out the filament. Cement a diamond inside. Susie. Susie, where did you throw that bulb? Oh, in the wastebasket. Right there. But, but it's empty. Sure. The cleaning woman always empties it in the morning. Where does she empty it? Mm, the trash barrel downstairs, I guess. Holy mackerel. A $50,000 diamond in a trash barrel. Come on. You say you emptied the stuff in the barrels? That's right. All the stuff I empty in them barrels. And then what happens? Well, the stuff's taken away. They uh, come and got it this morning. Okay, Susan. I've got to trace the rubbish truck to the city dump. You stay here in the office of the police call. Tell them where I am and tell them to hurry because I've got a hunch I'll be followed. Well, it was like looking for a needle in a haystack. Except this was a diamond in a trash pile. At the city dump. It ain't gonna be easy, mister. The trucks are coming in this morning dumped over there. Everything in the truck is dumped here, huh? Yeah. You're lucky we ain't started burning yet. Come on over here. This where you figure it might be? It's got to be. Morning trucks here, afternoon trucks over the other side. I'm looking for a light load. A bulb. Will you help me? Sure. What are you looking for the bulb for? Now, you won't believe this, but it's worth $50,000. Are you... 50? What are we waiting for? Here's a bulb. Break it. Nothing but a bulb. Wait a minute. Here's another one. Nothing. Uh, come on, let's look for some more. We plowed through everything in that pile of rubbish. Knee deep in trash, done, done. Until a half hour, a hundred light bulbs later. Hey, look. Here's another one. Let me have it. Thanks. Oh, Nick, well, look at that. Yeah, I see what you mean. Now, let's get out of here. Oh, oh, hey. Come on, fast. Ain't they shooting at us? It's a general idea. Where can we get undercover? Yeah, there's an old dump truck there. Come left. on, come on, let's go. Duck down here. The metal sides of the truck will protect us. Phew. Hey, mister, I thought this was a quiet job when I took it. Come out of there, come out of there. No dice. The police will be here in a minute. And you've got less time to live than you thought. He's coming this way. Hey, you got a gun? No, I never touched it, thanks. Come on, Dave. One more chance. Throw that diamond out. Hey, them three sirens. Throw it out, Holiday. They're going to hold out as long as you can. Longer. Well, I 
guess that does. Scratch one secretary with a little too much ambition. In it too, wasn't I, Mr. Holiday? Mm. Susie, you don't know how close it was. <laughs> Something funny. <laughs> I just thought of a gag. Oh, I'll sit through it. Go ahead. Well, uh, remember the story about Aladdin and the wonderful lamp and the genie? Genie? Oh, what about? All he had to do was to rub it to get out of trouble. But you couldn't. Yes, where's the gag? Well, you couldn't. And that's the rub. <laughs> Don't you get it? I got it, but I don't know what to do with it. Good night, Susan. <laughs> Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville, with this week's adventure written by Theodore Henling. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. Part of Susie is played by Sylvia Pecker, and production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. Box 13 is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Dear Mr. Box 13, care of newspaper Star Times, I am Nick Nerekios. For 20 years I own a restaurant and there is no trouble, and that is good. Now I got trouble and that is bad. One day... I look through paper, I see box 13, that you go any place, do anything, you want adventure. All right, Mr. Box 13, you come to Nick's place, 2129 10th Street. You have no trouble finding it because it is only Nick's place. So it's the only Nick's place in the neighborhood. Maybe you help Nick? Maybe I helped Nick, sure. At first I was laughing, but I was laughing with tears in my eyes. And now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Tempest in a Casserole. What's his last name, Mr. Holliday? Narakius. Oh. Doesn't seem like anything interesting could come of it, does it, Susie? Well, I think you ought to go and see him. Hmm? Why? I've had better letters than this, and you've thrown cold water on him. His place is on 10th Street. Uh, keep going, Susie. What's your point? Well, I-, I thought you could do me a favor at the same time. Uh-huh. What? Look. What's that? I ordered an earthenware pot from Caldwell's department store on 10th Street. And look what they sent me. <laughs> it's cute. A little merry-go-round. A toy. I know. But, but, but it isn't what I asked for. What did you ask for? I told him to send me a carousel. Oh, you got it. I didn't. I got this. If you ordered a carousel, you... You... <laughs> I do not think this is very funny. Susie, did you by any chance mean a casserole? I... Oh... I guess I did. The customer at Caldwell's is always right. You ordered a carousel, and a carousel you got. Will you take it back for me, please? No, sure. And even if Nick doesn't have anything interesting, I can do you a favor. So long, Susie. A half hour later, I was in Nick's place on 10th Street. A clean, neat restaurant that seemed to be doing a wonderful business. Every table was filled and the counter was loaded and crowded with people. 
I asked for Nick, and a waitress guided me to his office in the rear. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I can do you something, sir. Well, the question is, what can I do for you? Uh, what are you selling? My services. Free. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I do not understand. <laughs> Mr. Thirteen? Mr. Thirteen? <laughs> I am so glad. To please, you, you sit down, please. Eh? Oh, thanks. <laughs> I have a name as well as a number, Nick. It's Dan. Dan Holliday. Oh, good, Mr. Dan. My name, Alexander Derekios. Alexander? But I thought... Oh, sure, sure. My name, Alexander. But when I first come to this country, everybody called me Nick. One name, she's good like any other. But that is not here or any place, yes? Yes, I suppose not. Uh, Mr. Dan, you see my restaurant, you come in, yes? Yes, and you're doing a roaring business, Nick. Uh, like Shakespeare says, it's a rob. What do you mean? Oh, Mr. Dan, you, you look here, I open the door. It's still crowded out there. Uh, yes, but each one have coffee, just coffee. They sit and read newspapers, books, anything, and they drink one cup of coffee. Nothing else? Nothing. Oh, I see. And how long do they stay? All day long. I am losing money, fist over hands. Any enemies who might want that? I? Enemies? No, no, I have no enemies, Mr. Dan. I like everybody. Everybody like me. You ask all around. Everybody say, Nick Nerekios, good man. Has anyone else ever wanted this spot? Oh, sure, sure. Lots of times people come, they want to sell this from me. I, I say no. Has that happened recently? Uh, sure, only two days ago. I think that's it, Nick. This is a good spot in between Caldwell's department store and a bank. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, Nick. You put a sign on each table and on the counter. Mm -hmm. One that reads, minimum charge, 50 cents. <laughs> oh, that is wonderful. <laughs> That's magnificent, Mr. Dev. Yes, sure, sure. I do that. Yes. Okay. Now I'll be running along. Uh, look, um, any time you want, you come to Nick's place, you bring friends, all your friends. <laughs> Nick cook personally for you. Anything you want. Uh, you do that, yes? It's a deal. Well, I've got to be going, Nick. Meanwhile, don't forget the signs on the tables and the counter. So, marking that little visit off to profit and loss, I went home. Then the next day at the office... You forgot, didn't you? Huh? Forgot what, Susie? You didn't take my carousel back for a casserole. Oh, I'm sorry, Susie. I put it in the back of my car and forgot all about it. I'll do it for you, though. When, Mr. Holliday? Maybe today. All right. Hello? Please, let me talk to Mr. Holliday. I want well, to talk up? to Mr. Dan. Please, I know sorry, I'm very done. important. Uh, you wait a minute. I, I don't know who this is, Mr. Holliday. Yeah, I'll take it. Hello? Uh, Mr. Dan, Mr. Dan Holiday, I want to talk to Mr. Dan Holiday, the writer. Well, this is Dan. Oh. Oh, Nick? Yes, Nick. Oh, Mr. Dan, I am in trouble once more again. Well, what's the matter? My idea didn't work. Oh, sure, sure, fine. Work fine. Then what's the matter? My credit, it is ruined. Your credit? Uh, go slowly, Nick, and tell me all about it. Four years I buy on credit. The same as big business. All the time I pay my bills sharp on the dash. Now, all of a sudden, no credit. Mm-hmm. Sounds like someone fixed that for you. What do I do now? No wholesaler send me food in it for business. And I cannot open my restaurant. I am ruined. I now, am now, now, now. Calm down a minute and listen to me. I listen. Did you make money last month? Always I make money. Well, have you got a bank account? Four of them. All right, then. Have one of your banks call the wholesalers with whom you do business. Just reestablish your credit. That's all. Uh, that, that is all I do, Mr. Dan? Mm hmm. That's all. Oh, what a wonderful man, uh, Mr. Dan? Yes? You are not right. Uh, uh, no? No, you are a genius. <laughs> Goodbye. Susie, I am now a genius. Good, but is there a story in it? Oh, you slave driver. What a wonderful guy. Who, Nick? Why didn't you go down there then? But you heard me handle it over the phone. My casserole, Mr. Holiday. Oh. All right. Later. Well, I'm glad we had that thing put in. It keeps me awake. I'll get it, Susie. Uh, okay. Hello. Mr. Ben? Yeah, Nick? You again? Yeah, hey, Mr. Ben, the whole world is terrible. Now what's the matter? Uh, nothing like has happened since Adam and Eve. The world is upside down, topsy-topsy. 
All in a minute, Nick. We better start over again. Oh, I, I will take back the drinkers of coffee. I will pay them to come back, but this is too much. Please, please, you come to me. Help me, Mr. Dan. I, you all right, Nick, all right. I'll be there in a half hour. I hurried down to Nick's place, and before I could drive up in front, I knew something was wrong. The street was crowded with trucks and the drivers. The place was a bedlam. Horns tooting, drivers yelling at each other to get out of the way, and right in the center of it all, Nick. His hair was standing on end, his face was as white as a sheet, and his arms were flying around like a lunatic windmill. I parked in an alley a half a block away and walked toward Nick. Oh, no, no, these are not mine. I did not order ten radios and jig boxes. Now, look, you're Nick Nero. Are you Nick? I am Nick. I wish I was not Nick. Hey, Nick, what's this all about? Oh, Mr. Dan, Mr. Dan, my friend. Look what has happened to Nick. Hey, Mr., you know this guy, this Nick? Yes, I do. What is all this, driver? Yeah, just look at this bill here. It says deliver ten radios and three jukeboxes to Nick's place. Now the guy says he don't know them. No, I don't, I don't, Mr. Dan. Hey, pull that hat and ears out of the way. I gotta get in there. Keep your hands in my guy. I'm his place. Oh, Mr. Dan. My restaurant is filled with things I do not order. Look, all up the street, down the street. Two, yeah, two, I see him, Nick. Two pianos, five refrigerators, 19 beds. My customers are all gone, Nick. They are scared of the elephant. Elephant? Oh, what do you mean? Somebody send Nick an elephant. <laughs> oh, Mr. Ben, please, about an elephant is nothing funny. Okay, Nick, you go back into your restaurant. I'll take care of this for you. Oh, you do this, Mr. Ben. Nick is grateful. Yeah, sure. What sure. would I do with an elephant? Well, I did what I could. I convinced the truck drivers with the help of five cops that a mistake had been made. It took over an hour, but at last the tangle was unsnarled. Radios, refrigerators, jukeboxes, razor blades, pianos, beds, whatnots, and the elephant. Well, they were all sent back where they'd come from. Then I went in to see Nick. Oh, Mr. Ben, Nick does not know what to say. Nick is spokeless. Sit down, Nick. Oh, sure. You want some coffee? Uh, not right now, thanks. Oh. Look, Nick, you said someone had asked you to sublet your restaurant. What reason was given? They say Nick does not know how to run a restaurant. They say they make a gold mine. Yet you've been making a comfortable living. Oh, in America, I am very happy. I, I come here a long time ago now. Mm -hmm. All right, Nick, here's what you do. You sit tight. Sit tight? Stay right where you are. Don't sublet to anyone. Understand? Oh, I never give up my place. Never. That's the ticket. Whoever's doing this to you will have to give up sometime. Mm -hmm. And if anything else happens, you let me know. Oh, huh? sure, sure. I call my good friend, Mr. Dan. Swap. Uh, why you think they do this to me, Mr. Dan? I don't know, Nick. But it'll be interesting to find out. I went back home, and the more I thought about Nick and the trouble he was having, the more curious I got. Why should anyone want a restaurant badly enough to go to all that trouble? Why? I was still wondering when... Hello? Mr. Dan? Is, is this Mr. Dan? Yes, who is this? Uh, I am Mrs. Nick Narakios. Mrs. Narakios? Yes. Mr. Dan, I... Mrs. Narakios, what's the matter? It's about Nick, my poor Nick. What about him? He wants you to come to him. Where? Oh, you come, please. Please come, please. Right away. What's the address? 789 Borland Street. Please, you hurry, please. Something terrible has happened to my Nick. to Tempest in a Casserole, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. I hurried to Nick's home. Whatever had happened to him was enough to make his wife almost hysterical. She met me at the door, her face stained with tears. She led me through the clean little flat and... Nick, Nick, here is Mr. Dan. Oh, my friend. Nick, what happened? Who did this to you? Look what they do to my Nick. His poor eyes, his nose, 
my neck. Hey, Gina, you go out of room for a minute, yes? I want to talk to Mr. Ben. Make some coffee, eh? All right, Nick. All right. I make you some coffee. Nick, how did this happen? Well, tonight I leave my restaurant. Always I take the shortcut through the alley back of my place. I walk for a little bit and somebody hit me. Did you see who it was? No, I... Oh. Did you go to the police? No, no, no. I come home. I tell my wife to call you, Mr. Dan. I... But you should have gone to the police. Oh, but I am scared, Mr. Dan. I, I read in paper that men who do this will also maybe hurt my wife. I do not want that, Mr. Dan. I do not want that. Mm. Nick, I want you to sublet your place. Oh, no, no, I do not do that. I will send my wife away where she will be safe, but no. Nick, stay here, like you say, sit tight. I do not give up. You want me to help you, don't you? Oh, sure. And listen to me and do as I say. Sublet your restaurant. Sublet it and we'll see what happens. <laughs> After I left Nick, I went to see Lieutenant Kling. He listened to what I had to tell him and... But Dan, he should have come to the police. He was scared, Kling. Besides, what could he prove? The men who beat him up were hired by the person or, or persons who want Nick's place. Why? There's a bank next door, Kling. I know that, but you're not thinking those guys will drill through the walls in that restaurant to get to the bank. It's been done before. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. So you told Nick to go ahead and sublet. That's right. Look, Kling, here's the way I figured... They want Nick's place badly enough to commit man. They counted on his being scared enough to keep him away from the police. But what they didn't know was that Nick had written to me asking me to help. So? What's your idea? Let them have the place. Let them do what they want. But watch that bank. Well, Nick sublet his place to the men who had been after it. And Kling and the police watched the bank. Special alarms were set in the walls. Night and day, the restaurant was watched. And what happened? Hmm. Well, exactly what happened to Simple Simon's fish hook in the pail of water. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. One day, after a couple of weeks of this game of watch and wait, I, I was in my office. Mr. Holliday. Hmm? What's this? Did you ever look in the back seat of your car? Back seat of my car? Why? Who's there? Not who. What? Well, what's this? Twenty questions? M my carousel is still in the back seat of your car. I it's been there for weeks now. Oh, I'm sorry, Susie. I'm sorry. I, I hope I haven't held up your cooking. If you'll give it to me, Mr. Holliday, I'll take it back and exchange it. I, I wouldn't want to put you to all that trouble. Mm -hmm. No, Susie, don't be cross. I'll take it back today. I'm going to next place anyway. Promise? Honest engine and stuff. Fine. Now I can make baked noodles sometime. Good enough. I'll go right now. Oh, hello. Uh, hello, if it isn't Lieutenant Kling. Come on in. This isn't the social call. Look, Holiday, the department's pulling the men off the bank and the restaurant today. Oh, so why? Why? Because they needed someplace else. The two weeks we played, find the gimmick because you had an idea. Now we're very tired. But that's what those men might be waiting for. Yeah, look, if they're going to make the pitch, they'd have made it. But they didn't. There's no sign they won't. Okay, okay. So we know who they are in case they do. They wouldn't get ten feet before we'd have them. Oh, Dan, we can't play anymore. Sorry. I... Okay. But I'm sure they're playing some kind of a fast game. Then you get in it. So long. Eh, maybe Kling was right. But then again, maybe I was right. I hadn't been in the restaurant since the last time with Nick. I wanted to keep out of the way in case I'd been spotted then. So I thought I'd drop in before going to the department store. A waiter came up to me. Yeah? What'll it be, mister? Uh, where's your menu? We ain't got any. No menus? Our customers can't read. Hmm. It's a funny way to run a restaurant. Okay, it's funny. So laugh. Uh, well, what have you got to eat? Hamburgers. And? Onions. Nothing else? Our customers ain't that hungry. Uh, okay, bring me a hamburger. No onions. And a cup of coffee. It'll take a while. If you don't want to wait, leave. This was a great restaurant. Not like when Nick had it. I was the only customer, and from the waiter's attitude, the lack of business was understandable. What was going on? As I sat there, I heard a sound that puzzled me. I couldn't figure it. As best as I could judge, it was coming from the kitchen right in back of me. 
I just couldn't place that sound. Although I knew I'd heard it before, someplace. Then the waiter came back after a 15-minute wait. Here you are, mister. How about the coffee? Be up in a minute. Oh, uh, just a second. You put onions on this. No extra charge. But I don't want onions. This is loaded with them. Okay, okay. Don't eat it then. So I sat there and looked at the hamburger. It was fried hard. And the bread was well on its way to being toast by reason of age. And the waiter? Well, if he had ever waited tables before, I'd eat the hamburger. Which I didn't. I never did get the coffee, but waiting for it gave me the chance to look around and think. That sound puzzled me. But I couldn't figure it any more than I could get the reason for the whole setup. One thing was obvious. The management didn't care if any customers came in or not. So I left. I went next door to Caldwell's department store to exchange Susie's carousel for a casserole. And at the counter... Uh, Yes, sir, may I help you? Uh, yes, please, I want this exchange. Uh, do you have your slip, sir? It's with the carousel. You see, I'd like to get one of these uh, casseroles in exchange. Uh, for yourself, sir? Does that make any difference? Well, I thought you might have a color preference. Uh, we have them in earth brown, red, and green. Uh, green. Uh, green? Oh, uh, yes, sir. I, uh, oh, I'm sorry. We're out of the green ones. Well, it really doesn't make any difference. Well, how about the red? That'll be fine. Uh, do you like to cook? Not particularly. Well, many men do. Well, this is not for me. It's, oh, oh um... I, I see. Uh, let's see now. Uh, these are one ninety-five, and the exchange on the carousel is. Um, let's see now. Uh, you owe me one eighty-seven. Here you are. Out of five, thank you, and I'll have your change in just a moment. Hey, hey, that sound. I, I beg your pardon. That sound. Now I know. No, what, sir? The compressed air tube for sending slips and money to the cashier. Oh, lady, I love you. Really, sir? This is neither the time nor the place. Where's the manager? Yeah, you, you have a complaint? No, a hunch, and I'm going to play it. Where's the manager? Well, uh, the second floor. Office is in the rear of the building. Thank you. You change. You change, sir, and you can't roll. Don't worry, I'll be back. It was a hunch, all right. But I thought it was a good one. I called Kling, told him to get to the Caldwells right away. And to bring a certain something with him. And later in the manager's office. But uh, I don't understand, Mr. Holliday. That makes two of us, Mr. Bardo. Holliday, what gives? Mr. Bardo, has your store shown a loss for, say, the last two weeks? Loss? Are you a stockholder? No, but has it? Well, then I hardly think... Then that... get to the point. What are you doing? You call me here and tell me to bring a tear gas bomb. I think you've slipped your hinges. Listen, let's all get down to the kitchenware department. Kitchenware? All right, any place in the store. I, I want to prove something. Well, this is highly irregular, but since you've brought in the police, I must assume you're serious. I assure you I am. Come on. Conning? Miss Conning? Uh, yes, Mr. Bardo. Oh, it's you again. Hello. Miss Conning, this gentleman... Mr. Bardo, I assure you I was courteous. I... Why, why he told me he loved me. What? What's going on? It, it was a figure of speech. Look, Mr. Bardo, please ask Miss Corning to do what I ask. Really, this is ridiculous. Uh, however, Miss Corning... Uh, yes, Mr. Bardo? Make out a sales slip for, uh, for... Uh, uh, the spying tent. Here. Yes, sir. Now, here's a $10 bill. Send it along through the compressed air tube. Uh, shall I wrap the pen? No, I don't think I'll want it. Just the slip, the money, and the change tube. Go ahead, Miss Corning. Uh, yes, sir. And what about the tear gas bomb, then? Tear gas? Miss Corning. What about it, then? I will see. All right, Miss Corning, send the slip and the $10 bill through the change, too. Oh, wait. What now? Mr. Bardo, call the cashier and tell her to expect this carrier. If it weren't that the police did... Uh, give me the house phone, Miss Corning. Thank you. Extension 490. Hello, Miss Roebling. This is Mr. Bardo. In just a moment, a carrier containing a sales slip for a frying pan and a $10 bill will come to you and... Uh, 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 Mr. Holliday, why am I telling you this? Just tell her to do the usual with it. Oh, very well. Miss Roebling, handle the carrier as usual. Yes, thank you. All right, now what? Send the carrier, Miss Corning. Dan, will you tell me why I'm here? I'm on a perfectly good homicide case, and you drag me here to go through an idiotic... I think you'll see. How long will this take, Mr. Barton? Oh, a few seconds. The store isn't crowded. Business isn't good today, not at all. Yeah, that goes for me, too. 
There's a carrier. Open him, Miss Corning. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, the change is here, and your receipt for the frying pan. You... You sure? Of course. Look at it. <laughs> Dan, you just bought yourself a frying pan. Now you should go home and bang your head with it. Or let me... I... I don't get it. I, I thought I... Oh, excuse me. That's my extension. You thought you what, Dan? Uh, hello? I, I thought I had a hunch about what? that. Now, you've taken up oh, a great dear, deal yes. of our time. I, I and, and, uh, uh, Mr. Bardo. Mr. Bardo, the cashier phoned. She said she didn't get the carrier. But that's impossible. There's the slip and the change. I knew I had a hunch. Clayton, let me have that tear gas bomb. No, I give up. Here. Mr. Holliday, what are you going to do? Give me one of those carriers, Miss Coney. Thanks. Now, we'll put the bomb in the carrier. So. And gimmick it so that when the carrier is opened, the tear gas bomb will do its stuff. Okay. Send it along, Miss Corning. Holiday, you crazy? The cashier opens. That should be... She won't get it. Go ahead, Miss Corning. Send it on. Uh, Mr. Bardo, should I? Uh, yes, send it. I'll warn the cashier by phone not to open it. Mark it with your checking pencil. Good. Come on, Kling. I'll buy you a hamburger. Next door. <laughs> Think we made it? Sure. Now, just keep an eye on the front door of the hamburger, but... Here they come. Grab him, Clay. Grab him. Hey, what's the matter? Oh, the waiter with tears in his eyes. I told you there were too many onions in that hamburger. We're taking money like that? That's right, Susie. They had tapped into the compressed air tubes which ran through the walls of the department store in Nick's place. We're helping themselves to some nice, easy cash. They must have made a fortune. No, not a fortune, but enough. You see, if they had grabbed every one of the carriers, it would have spoiled the game. The store would become suspicious. Oh. But they work each city for a month, and they move on to another spot. What won't they think of next? Uh, who knows? Now, excuse me. I've got a date at Nick's for dinner. Oh, Mr. Holiday. Hmm? Why'd you get a red one? Red what? Casserole. I like green. So, a- as long as you're going down that way, will you... Oh, explain? good night, Susie. Next week, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holiday in Box 13. With Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Care of the Star Times. If you mean what you say in your advertisement, perhaps you're the one to help me. If help does not come for me soon, I will be killed. Please use the enclosed airline ticket and come to Mexico City at once. When you arrive, go directly to the Hotel Mariposa and wait. Please hurry, because every hour brings me closer to death. Because every hour brings me closer to death. Arthur Mead. Sure, the letter had a ring to it that made me believe it. And I felt sorry for him. But 48 hours later, I had someone else to worry about. A fellow named Dan Holliday. Now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Mexican Maze. Mexico City. Mmm, what a place to be. Would you like to go in my place, Susie? I sure would, Mr. Holliday. All right, I'll tell you what. You take the ticket and go. Then when you get to Mexico City, you find Mr. Arthur Mead. Then what? Then, keep him from being killed. What's the matter, Susie? Don't you like Mexico anymore? Oh, you were kidding when you said I could go, weren't you? (laughs) What makes you think that? Oh, how could I keep how could I keep anyone from being killed? What worries me is how am I going to do it? He sure sounds like he's got his back to the hall. Oh, Susie. Wall. Oh, wherever he's got it, he sounds as though he might not have it there long. Okay, Susie, close up shop. I'm off to the land of the Aztecs. Mexico 
city was routine. An hour later, after I got off the plane, I registered as Box 13 at the Hotel Mariposa and was shown to my room. The bellboy had no sooner left than... Hello? Is this the man from Box 13? Yes, I'm Box 13. Thank heavens you came. I was desperate, Mr... Holiday. Dan Holiday. Listen, I've only a couple of minutes, Holiday. I've got to talk fast. Are you there? Of course, go ahead. There's an importer here, an American. His name is Robert Lucas, and he... Hello. 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 So there I was, with a dead telephone and a name, Robert Lucas. I had no idea where to get in touch with me, and the telephone directory had no listing for him. But it had one for Mr. Lucas. And it was with Mr. Lucas that I made an appointment for that afternoon. I got there a little early and approached his office. Then I stopped. The door was open, and I couldn't help overhearing And if that's your idea of an explanation, we're through, Robert. We're finished. That's what you think, Marilyn. It's not quite that simple, my dear. Not at all. I'll make it simple. Very simple. You understand? I'm afraid I do. You didn't think I'd do that, did you? Maybe you'd like me to go to meet. Goodbye, Mr. Lucas. I ducked back out of sight and let her pass. She didn't see me. What I saw was a woman of maybe 30 and very lovely. Her heels beating a tattoo down the hall. I waited a couple of seconds then. Yes, come on in. What can I do for you? I telephoned for an appointment, Mr. Lucas. Oh, yes. You're Mr. Holiday? That's right. Please sit down. Well, thank you. Now, sir, you said over the phone that you were an importer. In a way, yes. In a way. You are or you aren't. Let's say I was imported. What are you driving at? Now, look, I'm a very busy man. If this is some sort of ruse to get in here and pester me for a job, I've no time. If you need financial help, go to the... Oh, I don't need help, Mr. Lucas. I give it. Will you come to the point? Certainly. The point is Arthur Mead. You, uh, you said Arthur Mead? That's right. Do you know him? What business is it of yours? Mr. Mead asked me to come here. He said he was in danger of being killed. Killed? The same. He telephoned me about an hour after I got in. But uh, we were cut off. Or he was. Where was he? I don't know. What did he say? He mentioned your name, that's all. Oh. That's all? He didn't have time for chit-chat. What's your connection with him? Let's say business. Mr. Holiday, I don't know where Arthur Mead is. I haven't seen him for days. What's he afraid of? I don't know. You don't seem to know very much. That makes us even. Yes, I guess it does. So you've no idea where I can find Arthur Mead? No, there are a great many places in Mexico City where a man could hide. What makes you think Mead is hiding? I I assume he is, since neither of us knows where he is. And I guess our little chit-chat is over. It would seem so, Mr. Holliday. Well, I may call on you again. Oh, please do. We'll talk about the importing business. Perhaps we may even talk about exports. I didn't like the way Lucas said exports. He could have met me. The second thought convinced me he did. But he knew plenty about Arthur Mead, which gave him aces against my deuces. But I had an ace, too. A girl named Marilyn. Now all I had to do was find her. So I started right away. And the first stop was the elevator man in Lucas's office building. Si, sí, senor, si. Sí, I know the senorita. <laughs> she come here many times. Uh, who is she? What's her name? <laughs> Why do you want to know this, senor? Well, she's very pretty. <laughs> you like her, see? If you want it that way, yes. <laughs> bueno, bueno. I'm going to tell you. She's senorita Marilyn Cooper. Oh, an American. Si. Sí. Um, where can I find her? I do not know where she lives, senor. Oh, I see. But I know where she works. Oh, that's better. Where? <laughs> She's a dancer in the club de la Tres Flores. Uh, where's that? El Calle Alameda. Alameda Street? Sí, <laughs> Oh, thank you. And here. Oh, gracias, senor. Muchas gracias. You're welcome. In Spanish. <laughs> Oh, 
I went to the Club of the Three Flowers. It was closed in the afternoon, so I had to wait until the evening. My Spanish being somewhat on the rusty side, I had a little trouble getting to see Marilyn Cooper. But I managed it, and ten minutes later, I was sitting across from her at one of the tables. I, uh, I don't know you, do I? No, you don't, Miss Cooper. You're an American? Mm Mm-hmm. So are you. Uh Why'd you come to see me? Two reasons. One, Arthur Mead. What? The other, Robert Lucas. Who are you? I'm the man who always pops up to scare people with things I'm supposed not to know. So I'm not scared? No. How... How do you know about Mead and Robert? Why do you call Mead by his last name and Lucas by his first? Does that make any difference? No, except that I happen to overhear your little spat with him today. Well, I... Please, please don't get up. I didn't mean to. But you were talking in something more than a soft whisper, and I... Then you know what he did. If you mean that slap, yes. (laughs) What's your name? Ben Holliday. Do you know Arthur Mead? (laughs) No, I'm beginning to think I'll never know him. I... What were you going to say? If I tell you where you can find Arthur Mead, what'll you do? That all depends. You'd better find him before Robert Lucas does. Oh, why? Listen, I'll talk fast. I'll say it once, because Robert's capable of having me watched and getting even with me. Go ahead. What have you got to say? Robert's got Mead tied up. Mead's only chance to get back on his feet financially is a deal he's got on the fire with a man named Barnes. What kind of a deal? I don't know exactly. Something to do with the export business. Robert's trying to prevent that. That's one more question. What? Tell me how you know where to find Mead. I got friends, too. I found out. Uh And we're going to make Lucas pay for the information. What do you think I am? Someday we'll go into that matter. Right now I'm going to find Mead and get myself straightened out. If possible. I left Marilyn Cooper and I was firmly convinced that a nicer pair of characters than Marilyn and Lucas I'd never meet again. No tears shed if I didn't. I took a cab to 34 Alvarado Drive and when I got there, a clerk told me Senor Mead was in number 107. I walked down the hallway then I stopped. The door to Mead's room was open and I heard... I looked in. Waited a second, and then... Aren't you far from home plate, Mr. Uh, Lucas? You! Let's not be hasty, Mr. Lucas. Take your hands off. Let's go inside. Take your... Inside, please. Uh, where's Mead? Do you see him? I'd like to. Take a look around. You'll see what I saw. Empty drawers. Empty closet. Empty room. That is, except for you and me. Brilliant. Elementary. Now, where's Mead? I don't know. How do you know he lived here? This afternoon you told me you didn't know. It's none of your business. You were searching this room. For what? Expect to find me tucked away in a drawer? Holiday, you're meddling in something that's none of your business. Now let me out of here. Not until you... Let me out. <laughs> is that loaded? It is. Now get away from the door. Certainly. It's all yours. You show good sense, Holiday. Good night. First trick to Mr. Lucas. And I still wanted to know what became of Mead and what I was doing in the game. I was sure Lucas didn't know where Mead had gone. I looked around the room. Nothing was left in the drawers, the closet. Mead had cleared out, clean. Then on on the battered telephone table, I found a bus schedule. The departure time of a northbound bus had been ringed in red. I wondered if Lucas had seen it. If he had, I had to beat him to the bus depot. As I opened the door... ¿Qué tal, amigo? Uh, I speak English. So do I. You will please to sit, senor. Please to sit. Aren't you in the wrong room? Senor, when I'm a little muchacho, I have learned to throw a knife. Very good. I have not forgot. You like to see me do it with this knife? Uh, no, thank you. Then you will be pleased to sit. Ever come face to face with a big toothy grin holding a knife in your face? Well, it isn't pleasant. I sat. Does this make you happy? See, si. <laughs> Bueno. Look, I'm afraid you've made a mistake, senor. I... Oh, oh, no, senor. You make the mistake. Ay, es muy triste. Uh, it's very sad. What do you mean? Nada. 
<laughs> Nothing, senor. I have only come to kill you. He said it so calmly, so matter-of-factly, but he... But he meant it. His grin got wider, and the knife that glinted in his hand looked very, very sharp. Then... I am paid to kill you, senor. I do not have something against you. But business is business. You will please to stand, amigo, with your back to me. Now, listen, I... With your back to me, senor. I like your face. And I do not wish to see it when I do with the knife what I am paid to do. And now, back to Mexican Maze, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. I turned my back on the grin. It wasn't easy to do. I saw his reflection in the window I faced. He came toward me. The knife fell straight out in front. Then he... Then he did something I couldn't understand. Until later. Much later. He stopped and spoke. Amigo, I liked your face. How much you pay me not to kill you? Uh, what did you say? A face was a face, amigo. If I did not like your face, I would kill you. But, <laughs> since I like your face... I will make the bargain. How much do you want? How much uh, it is worth uh, your life. I haven't got that much with me. I will take what you have. Turn around. Do not try the tricks, no? Oh, no, don't worry. Uh, give me what you have. All right. Ah, bueno. Uh, the little coins you keep. Now, amigo. Adios. Ah, and uh, por favor, do not try to follow me. I would not like to break these bargains. Adios. I didn't get it. Why didn't he kill me? I stopped thinking about it because I had to get to Meade. It was too late to get to the bus terminal before Meade's bus left. The next best thing was... Bueno. Hello. Uh, give me the Mexico Central bus terminal. Sí, señor. Gracias. Hello. I want you to page one of your passengers leaving on the 1018 bus for the north. His name is Arthur Mead. Gracias. I waited. I waited and wondered if Lucas had beat me to the punch then. Hello? Mead? This is Holiday. Where have you been? Never mind that. Why did you ring off this morning? I had to. Listen, Holiday, I've got to leave Mexico City. I think Lucas knows where I'm staying. Uh, I know he does. He was here. Yeah. Where are you? 34 Alvarado. He did know. Look, uh... What's all this about? Holiday, I've got everything arranged. Go to the Hotel Del Grado. Register there in my name. Your name? Please, I'll miss this bus and I've got to leave. Just listen to me. Go to the hotel. Register in my name. A package will be delivered to you. Later, a man named Barnes will come to see you. Give him the package. It contains money. He'll give you an envelope. Keep it until you hear from me again. Have you got that? Yeah, all right, but, but how will I get in touch with you? You won't. I'll contact you. And Holiday. Yes, what? Protect yourself. Because Lucas will do everything he can to keep that deal from being closed. Even murder. Meade hung up and left me hanging. Way out on a limb. Sure, I could have taken a plane back home. But I owed something to Mr. Lucas for sending the grin after me. I was sure it was Lucas who'd done that because only he knew I was in Meade's place and I... Only he and... Marilyn Cooper. I left 34 Alvarado with no regrets. Went to the Hotel Del Grado and registered as Arthur Mead. I signed the register and no sooner had I done so when the clerk said... Ah, Senor Mead! There was someone here earlier this evening. He left this package and asked that it be delivered to you. Oh, uh, thank you. Just a minute, please. Is he, Senor Mead? Has there been a Mr. Barnes asking for me? Barnes? Uh, Barnes... No, no, Senor Mead. No one has been asking for you. Well, who left this package for me? It was delivered by messenger, Senor. Mm, I see. Oh, thank you. It is a pleasure, Senor Mead. I hope your stay here will be very pleasant. Pleasant, he said. I didn't know what he was saying. I just turned away from the desk when I caught sight of Marilyn Cooper. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw her go toward the back of the hotel. I waited a moment and went out another entrance. Cut through to the back of the hotel and ducked into a doorway where I couldn't be seen. 
Marilyn Cooper was waiting for someone. She hadn't long to wait until a bellhop came up to her. Senorita? Here I am, Tomas. Uh, si. Here's the bottle and the note. And the money, senorita? You'll get that when the job's done. No, senorita. I want it now. I said when the job's done. Now, senorita, or there will be no job. How do I know you'll go through with it? I have made a promise, senorita. A promise? It is a very bad thing to kill a man with poison. You're being paid. Now. I... All right, here. <laughs> Gracias. You know what you're to do. Si, you si. take the coffee to Senor Me. With what is in the little bottle in the coffee. That's right. Senorita, it will kill quickly, see? Si? Yes. Now just listen. When you've done that, wait outside his door until you're sure he's drunk the coffee. And go inside. Put the note I gave you on the dresser in the room. You understand? Si, si. It is quite simple. All right. Yo, senorita. Wait. Si? You'd better not slip up, Tomas. If you do... I do not make the slips. Hasta la vista, senorita. Now, here was a twist. Marilyn Cooper paying to have Meade poisoned and the note left with his body. And a cold chill hit me. I just remembered I was Arthur Meade. I went back to the front of the hotel and was just about to go inside when I saw Robert Lucas leaving a car. You come with me, Ernesto. Ernesto was none other than the grin. He and Lucas went into a telegraph office next to the hotel. I looked into his car. There was luggage in the rear seat, lots of it. I sauntered toward the car, trying to keep one eye on Lucas in the telegraph office and the other on the car. I ducked back. But not before I saw something dangling from the key ring in the ignition lock. What I saw made me blink. Then Lucas and the grin came back out. I twisted away and out of sight. They drove off and I went into the telegraph office. I found the pad of message blanks Lucas had used. I tore off the top and ten minutes later I showed it to Lieutenant Casadro, Mexico City Police. But, uh, Senor Holiday, I do not understand. You say you did not send this message? I did not, Lieutenant. Lucas sent it. That's the impression of the telegram he sent. Simple kid's trick. Just run a soft pencil over the sheet and the writing comes out. If the writer pressed hard enough when he wrote it. And Lucas did. Box 13, care of Star Times. Uh, that is a newspaper, senor? Yes, yes. R read the message. Uh, I've finished work in Mexico City. Going to Criotas for a vacation. Take care of things, Susie. See you soon. Dan. I happen to be Dan. But why should senor Lucas send this? To play out this little game, we'll know. He wanted this, uh, this Susie to think you had gone to Criotas. That's it. But why? Lieutenant, if you'll send a wire to the United States asking about Arthur Mead, I think we'll have part of our answer. Oh, very good. I will send it. Then what? Then you'll be in the hotel later. I'm in room 512, and I'll be lying on the floor with an empty poison bottle and a suicide note. Senor Holiday, this is a Chinese puzzle. Senor Lieutenant Casadro, this is a Mexican maze. But I think we're going to come out of it. On top. Now, here's what we can do. I need your help. Send the wire to the United States. Then come to Hotel Come in. Say you me. Here is coffee. Coffee? <laughs> I didn't order it. I know, senor, but it is the custom of the hotel. It is very good coffee, senor. Uh, Americans like coffee, see? Uh, yes, we do. Oh, no, thanks. Put it on the table. Ah, uh, si, senor. I'm going to pour for you, see? Mm, please. Ah, senor. You just right to drink. How bad it is. Okay, here you are. Eh? Muchas gracias, senor. Hey, uh, it is that I hope you are going to sleep well. I'll just bet you do. Good night. I listened for a moment, then I made with a coffee cup. Then I went into my act. Bellhop came back in, put the note on the dresser, and then... Andale! Andale! Help! Help! The senor me! He is dead! The senor me! Please! Please, please. muchacho! Oh, policia! Uh, uh, senor lieutenant, uh, el senor me, está muerto! ¡Muerto! Silencio! What's the matter? Oh. Senorita, you know this man? Well, yes, it's Arthur Mead. And you, senorita? 
Marilyn Cooper. Uh, uh, what is it? What's the matter? Uh, Good Lord. Mead. Come no closer to the body, senor. You know this man, too? Yes, I know him well, Arthur Mead. He's dead. Very dead, senor. It is... Oh, uh, no. A note? Uh, I can no longer face the world after what I have done. This is the best way out. Arthur Mead. Oh, um, poor Mead. Robert, please, take take me away from here. Why so fast, Robert? <gasps> Why? Holiday. Lieutenant Graben, have you made get that bell up? Oh, One moment, no. Senor Lucas, Senorita Cooper. I do not wish to fire this gun. You idiot, you said it was safe. Fool. Shut up. Shut up, Mary. Well, this looks like a real argument. Not like the one you staged for me before, Lucas. Or Mead. No matter what you call yourself, your name's Mud from now on. Senor Holiday, it was a great pleasure. All mine, Lieutenant. Uh, but will you please explain? We have no time before, and uh, there are my reports to be made out. Sure. Well, Meade was an ambassador. You see, my telegram to the United States verified that. So the trail was getting hot. Now, the one sure way to make the police stop hunting for you is to... Well, is to be dead. But uh, sooner or later, we would have received a description from the United States. Mm-hmm. Even so. You'd have wired the States that Arthur Meade had committed suicide down here. You had verification that I was me, Marilyn Cooper, Lucas, or, or me, and the hotel clerk. And the big deal Meade was going to have? A fake. A blind to keep me from getting suspicious. There's the envelope that was supposed to contain money. <laughs> Full of cut-up newspapers. Ah. Hey, but one more point. Why did not the man kill you at the 34 Alvarado? Because he wasn't supposed to. You see, that was a stall to keep me from getting to the bus terminal before Lucas did. The red mark on the bus timetable would make me think we need to take in a bus. But Lucas had to get there before I did. Or at least in time to answer my call if I had him paged. Oh. Senor, if people spent as much time making good things instead of bad things like this, what a wonderful world it would be. It's not so bad, Lieutenant. But it has a hard time keeping ahead of the Meads and Marilyn Coopers. Holiday, I didn't know what to think when I got that wire saying you were going to take a vacation in Creosote. Uh, Susie, Creotis. Anyway, you were supposed to think I'd gone there, and well, it would have been a dead end. Just think, you might have been killed as Arthur Mead. I might have been killed as Dan Holiday. Oh, oh, oh wait a minute. There's one more thing. Mm, what's that, Susie? You said you noticed something dangling from the key ring in, in the ignition lock of Lucas's, uh, uh, of Mead. Well, well, in the ignition lock. Oh, it was a tag, Susie. A tag attached to a key, and the number on the tag was 107. 107? Mm-hmm. Mead's room at 34 Alvarado. Now, I ask you, why would Lucas have had that on his keychain if he hadn't have been Mead himself? Cheaper. Now, that's the kind of adventure I like. When are you going again? Oh, good night, Susie. <laughs> Next week, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Team Care of Star Times. I have a proposition for you. One that will bring you $10,000 if you go through with it. But you've got to make up your mind fast. I'm at 658 Carson Street. I won't be there after tomorrow evening. So, if you're interested, come to see me. Bring this letter to identify yourself and come to flat number six. Remember, you've got to hurry. Huh. That was it. No signature to the letter. Just that sense of urgency that made me feel as though the writer were, were afraid. He was. And later, I was. <laughs> Now 
back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's latest adventure, Sealed Instructions. Well, Susie, what do you make of it? He's in an awful hurry, Mr. Holliday. Mm, that he is. And he mentions $10,000. Uh-huh. And that, as they say in books, is a lot of gold watches. He doesn't even sign his name. I bet he's an income tax invasion. A uh, what? He's an income tax evasion? Susie, evader. Well, one or the other, he's got $10,000. Uh-huh. Okay, Susie, it looks like the best letter of the bunch for this week. So my address for the next hour or so will be 658 Carson Street. <laughs> Carson Street ran through one of those neighborhoods where the houses sat one on top of the other. Crowded, dirty, teeming with people, trucks, and more people. I found number 658, knocked on the door of flat number 6. Yes? Who is it? Who is it? Box 13. Oh, got the letter with you? Uh, yes, I've got it. They put it under the door. Okay. Here it comes. Stand under that light across the hall so I can see you. Yeah, all right. Come on in. Hurry. Yeah, sit down. No, no, no. Keep away from the window. The shade's down. No one can see you. Keep away from it. You've got enough bolts and chains on that door to hold off a tribe of Indians. I know what I'm doing. Now, let me get a good look at you. In the yellow light that came from the one globe dangling from the ceiling, the man looked at me. And I looked at him. He was about 50. His face was drawn and pinched. His hands shook and his eyes squinty and sharp slid over me. I didn't like him. Then he seemed to be satisfied and sat down on the chair opposite me. So, you're after adventure, eh? That's right. Did you see anyone following you here? Not that I know of. Why? Expecting someone else? I'm always expecting someone. I'm all... No, no, I'm not. What do you want with me? Are you free to go anywhere? That's what my ad says. We'll go any place, do anything. <laughs> I usually do. Would you be willing to go as far as the Philippine Islands? It's a man-sized errand. Would you go? That's all I want to know. Would you go? Well, that all depends on what I've got to do. If there's anything crooked, the answer is no. There's nothing crooked. I want you to go there and bring back something that belongs to me. Something I've got to have. What's stopping you from going yourself? Look at me. I'm sick. It could be. But you're sure there's no other reason? What do you mean? Well, the bolts and the locks on the door. That fact that you said in your letter you wouldn't be at this address after tonight. The shades drawn. You were afraid I was following? Two. So, two and two are four. And the four in this case comes out to... You're afraid to show your face. They, they have enemies. The ordinary kind? Or the kind that would kill you? They kill me. I see. Now, what's your name? You have to know that. It's a little peculiarity of mine. I like to know the people I'm dealing with. My name is Krell. Joseph Krell. Does it mean anything to you? No more than mine would mean to you. Holiday. Dan Holiday. There's $10,000 in this for you. Oh, I don't care about that. Uh, oh, huh? Oh, the money doesn't interest me. Doesn't it? Money doesn't... <laughs> <laughs> well, I must have said something very funny. You did, Holiday. You did. You say $10,000 doesn't mean anything to you. Oh, no, it doesn't. I'd better explain. You see, I'm a writer. The stories I get in response to that Box 13 ad you answered... Well, they pay me amply for my efforts. Uh, there's one born every minute. But will you go? And do what? I'll give you the name of a man. From you to contact in Manila. That's all you have to know now. Mm -hmm. Then what happens? Uh, that will take care of itself. What do you want me to bring back? I told you, something that belongs to me. Something I've got to have. Something that means life or death to me. That important? So we're wasting time. Will you do it? It's adventure and... And when you get back, I'll give you $10,000. Do anything you want with it. I don't care. But bring me what I want. When do I have to leave? As soon as you can. Oh, uh, one more question. Uh, what? Where are you going to get the $10,000? Well? I... I'll have it when you get back. I see. 
Do I come here? No, I, I won't be here. I've got to keep moving because he... He? Never mind. When you get back, put another ad below the one for box 13. Just see your back. I'll get in touch with you. And the name of the man I'm to meet in Manila? You'll find him at the address on... on this slip of paper. He's expecting someone from here. And, uh... Yeah. Take this envelope. Don't open it until you get in touch with the man. <laughs> Sealed instructions, huh? Yes. Holiday. Take good care of that envelope. Hide it. <laughs> if he knew you were carrying it, he might kill you. And with that little gem as a bon voyage from Krell, I left him. When I got home, I took the envelope he'd given me and had it sewn into the lining of my jacket. Four days later, I was in Manila after a nice pleasant trip on the plane. I went to a hotel and registered. Later that evening, I took a cab to the address of Krell's man. It was a tiny, ramshackle place in the street that was so narrow the cab couldn't get through. So I had to get out and walk. And right there is where I should have said quits to the whole thing. That old, familiar feeling began tingling my spine. As usual, foolishly, I paid no attention to it. I got to the house. There was no answer. I tried the door. It was pitch black inside. I closed the door behind me. I stood there for a couple of seconds trying to see through the blackness when... Stand right where you are. Who's that? Just stay where you are. The light went on and facing me was a man with a gun. And from where I stood, the muzzle was neatly in line with my third rib. The man looked at me for a moment, then... Turn around. Back to me. What's the idea? I don't know yet, but we'll see. Okay, face me. Who are you? Never mind that. Who are you? Dan Holliday. Doesn't mean a thing. Lieutenant, he's... Oh? Yeah, we got company, Sergeant. So I see. Sergeant? What is this? Sit down. Look, I came here to see someone. Uh Uh-huh. What's the name of the person you came to see? I don't know. If you don't know this man, why did you come here? Come on, talk. I don't see any reason why I should. Would it give you a reason if I told you we're police? I don't know. (laughs) You don't know much, do you? Why did you come to see this man you don't know? Uh, on business. What kind? I was sent here. By whom? A man named Joseph Krell. Krell? Well, well, well. Evidently, that explains a lot of things, doesn't it? It could and it couldn't. You say your name is Holiday? That's right. All right, Mr. Holiday. Step over to this other room with me. Come on. Open the door, Sergeant. See, Lieutenant. Go ahead in, Holiday. Oh, uh, do you have to keep that gun on me? It's better that way. Now, want to see your man? Yeah. I'd right, look on the floor, behind the bed. Now you've seen him. Who killed him? We'd like to know that, too. You didn't think I did? Maybe you'd like to talk now. Tell us why you came here. Why you had to see Carlos. Carlos? Yeah, the name of the deceased. All right, Lieutenant... Lieutenant Keith, Manila Police. This is Sergeant Enrique Cotus. Okay, I was sent here by Joseph Krell. I was to see this Carlos. Why? I don't know. I was to give him an envelope. Where is it? At the hotel. Now, we'll find out about that later. Now, this uh, Krell, why did he send you? And he couldn't come himself. But whatever it was he wanted me to bring back, he said it meant life and death to him. He offered me $10,000 to get it for him. What was in the envelope? I don't know. Is that your stock answer? Now, look, I'm telling the truth. If you don't believe it, check with the police in the States. Verify my identity. Uh, We will, but first, let's get something straight. Well, that would be a pleasure. Krell sent you for something that was worth $10,000 to him. Did anyone else know about it? Well, hardly. Why, Hardly. Because Krell said I might be killed. Mm -hmm. And you didn't talk to anyone on the plane about it? No. Okay, we'll go back to your hotel and check on a few things. Sergeant? See, Lieutenant. Stay here. No one in or out. Meet me at headquarters as soon as you can get away. See. Now, Holiday, we'll see how much trouble you're really in. On the way back to my hotel, Keith didn't say much. Neither did I. 
But I was doing a lot of thinking. Suddenly it hit me. Something Keith had asked me. Something he had no right to ask. And something he couldn't have asked unless... I looked at him. He was smiling to himself. Okay, I had to take a chance. Oh, by the way, Lieutenant. Hmm, what? That, that building over there. Where? Oh, uh, just to your right. Look out the window. What building are you talking about? Uh, Driver. Driver, stop the cab. What is it? What's the matter? Oh. oh. My uh, friend, he met with an accident. Uh, he's hurt. We should maybe go to a doctor. No, I don't think so. But when he comes to, uh, ask him a question for me, will you? Question? But... Yeah, just ask him how he knew I came to Manila on a plane. And now back to Sealed Instructions, another Box 13 adventure starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. So there I was, out in the middle of a big puzzle and a murder. Sure, Keith had killed Carlos to keep me from getting to him. Keith must have followed me from the States. Oh, it was smart of him not to play his cards on the plane or, or as soon as I got to Manila. He waited until I tried to contact Carlos. Then he planned to get the envelope away from me without any more fuss or bother. Now, I had to get back to the hotel and get that envelope before Keith came too. Because when he did, he was going to be very, very nasty. So back at the hotel, I had a bellhop go to my room and bring down the jacket. Is this the right one, Mr. Holliday? Hmm? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's the one. Here you are. Oh, thank you, sir. Will that be all? Yes, sir. Uh-oh. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, sir? Come here behind this pillar. Something wrong, sir? Yeah, there is. Look over at that entrance. Do you see that big man standing there? White hat, gray suit? Yes, sir. I, uh, I don't want to meet him. Oh, I see. Look, you go through the lobby paging me. He'll follow you to see where I am. Lead him a merry chase, got it? <laughs> I got it, Mr. Holliday. Okay, get going. Paging Mr. Holliday. Mr. Dan Holliday. Paging Well, the Holliday. bellhop did it up good. Mr. Dan Holliday. Keith fell for the gag and followed the bellhop Mr. just Holliday. far enough behind him so that he could surprise Mr. me if he saw me. But he didn't. I ducked out of the entrance and took a cab to police headquarters. There. Uh, let me get this straight, Mr. Holliday. You say this Keith pretended to be an officer? That's right, Lieutenant Marinos. But why? So he could get this envelope away from him. He'd already killed once to get it. But maybe he thought killing me would attract too much attention. But this envelope, where is it and what is in it? Uh, we're going to see that right away. Have you got a knife? Uh, yes. Here. Oh, thanks. Well, this was a good jacket. There it is. Uh, open it. Mm, sure. Well, what's this? May I see it? Mm -hmm. Here you are. Hmm. This is very curious, Mr. Holliday. It looks like, like a map. It's half a map, Lieutenant Marinos. Carlos had the other half. Of course, of course. But a map of what? And to what? To whatever Krell wanted. Cre Krell? Yeah, that's the name. Why? You did not mention his name before. Why not? Well, I didn't think it was important. To the Filipinos, it is very important. I don't get it. Why? During the Japanese occupation of the islands, Joseph Quayle was a collaborator. Oh, no wonder he didn't dare come back. But the rest of this business, how does it fit in? I do not know as yet. However, I think I have an idea, Mr. Holliday... Yes, what's that? Before the war, before the Japanese invasion, Krell was a gambler. It was known that he ran a gambling house with a partner. A partner? Keith? That could be, although Keith was not his name then. So, what's the rest of your idea? The partner fled when the Japanese came. Krell did not. Now, I think the partner would like to find Krell. Mr. Holliday, we must find the other half of this map. Well, Keith has it. I know that. And find Keith. That would be much easier said than done. Unless... Unless, Lieutenant? Unless you help, Mr. Holliday. 
I do not think that Keith will suspect that you have come to the police. If he followed me from the States, he must think I'm in with Crow. If he thinks that, then he'd think I wouldn't dare go to the police. Exactly. So? Uh, oh, I see. You want to tie me out as live bait, is that it? It is the only way to get him. Because he will come after this half of the map. Uh-huh. Of course, you can refuse. And I do not say that I will blame you. No, I guess not. But, well, you've got yourself a piece of live bait. And I hope it stays that way. It was the only way to get you. Besides, I was very curious as to what that map meant. And why getting something meant life and death to Joseph Krell. So I checked out of the hotel and with one of Lieutenant Marino's men following at a distance. I took a room on the other side of town and waited. An hour passed. Two. Then when it was beginning to look as though our Mr. Keith was smarter than we figured... Come in. Well, hello. Mr. Holliday, you've given me a lot of trouble. You don't want an apology, do you? No. All I want is the other half of that map. Oh, sure. You knock on the door, I say, come in, give you the map, and that's that. Very simple. Yeah, very simple and very smart. Mm -hmm. But you don't think I'd have the map on me, do you? Maybe not, but you know where to get it. Let's go. Oh, wait a minute. What for? Why, uh, why don't we make a deal? What kind? Well, neither half of the map is any good without the other. And I'm sure you haven't got yours with you. Oh, but I have. Mm, I see. Was it very hard getting it from Carlos? No, not very. No harder than it will be to get the half you got. Oh, look, we can still make a deal, Keith. Or whatever your name is. Keith will do. Okay. How about it? <laughs> Maybe you're smart at that. Okay, let's go. After you, Holiday, and don't forget this. It's loaded. You make it easy to remember. Yeah, I can make it very easy to forget by pulling the trigger. No, no, the back way, Holiday. The back way. Back way? Holiday, how dumb do you think I am? Or how smart do you think you are? You forgot all about Enrique, didn't you? Oh, the sergeant. Yeah. Here, this door. You see, Enrique followed us away from Carlos' place. He knew you slugged me in the cab. Enrique seems to have done all right. Just perfect. Get in this car. Go ahead, Enrique. Looking for your cop friends, Holiday? Cops? Yeah. You see, when you pulled that bellhop trick at the hotel, Enrique was outside. He followed you, saw you go to the police. It's too bad, Holiday, but there are no police. Oh, I see. Enrique took care of him, is that it? Enrique has been very busy. Now, let's have that half you got. I told you I haven't got it. Quit stalling. It was to be bait for me, wasn't it? You and Marinas were so sure you'd have me, you didn't bother to leave the half at headquarters. Let's have it now. He looked at me. Sure, he knew he held all the aces. And he held the gun right at my head. Well, there was nothing to do but drag out my half of the map and give it to him. He looked at it. Held it against his half. They matched. All right, Holiday, this is the end of the line. You get off here. What do you mean? What do you think? Take the next turn right on, Ricky, and slow down a little. Mr. Holiday is leaving us. For good. Keith meant it. Enrique started to take the next turn to the right, but I had a different idea. I grabbed the handle of the door, twisted it hard, and jumped. Took a full ball on my shoulder. Rolled over into the ditch on the side of the road. Keith jumped out of the car, started toward me, shooting as he came. And then... You are not hurt, Mr. Holliday? No. No, I'm not, Lieutenant. Oh, I am glad. We are a majority of two, Lieutenant Marinos. But Keith... He is taken care of. Whew. How did you get here? <laughs> By putting two strings to my bow, Mr. Holliday. The one man I had for you was, how shall we say, a decoy? Well, let's say it and be very happy. Is he all right? Oh, a little lump on his head, but all right. You know... This was very close. Oh, yes, I am very sorry, Mr. Holliday, but I did not expect Mr. Keith to have a car. However, all is well that ends well, hmm? Yeah, sure. 
Now, how about that map? Come, we will see about that now. For the two halves of the map, we went to work. Krell had hidden something in the hills back of Manila. Hidden it before the Japanese invasion. Three hours later, Lieutenant Marinos and I sat on a box and watched his men digging into the earth. And Marinos talked. You see, this Carlos was Krell's servant. When Krell left the Philippine Islands, he left half the map. Mm Mm-hmm. In case he was caught, a half-map would do no one any good. That is right. Keith was Quail's partner. He left. Quail stayed to become a collaborator. Uh, playing two games at once. The Japs won, he'd been with them. The Allies won. Well, he'd have what he hid here. Exactly. Lieutenant! And... Lieutenant Marinos! We have found it. This. Oh, a box. An iron box. Sergeant, break the lock. Yes, sir. Mr. Holliday, you may have the honor of opening it. Oh, thanks. I lifted the lid and unwrapped a large package done up in waterproof oil silk. It is quite a lot of money, yes? Quite a lot of money. Perhaps half a million, Mr. Holliday. From the looks of it, yes. And it all belongs to Mr. Quail, a man who betrayed my people and his country. We shall be happy to hold it in trust for him until he cares to come and claim it. Yeah, yeah. I think I'll take him back something else, though. Something else? What? That. That what? That over there. (sighs) Mr. Holliday, you are a poet. I left Manila the next day with Lieutenant Marino saying goodbye. With me was the iron box I'd come across the ocean to get. But in it was something a great deal different from what Krell expected. Back in the States, I put an ad below my Box 13 ad. I waited, and then... Here it is, Mr. Holiday, right below the Box 13 ad. It, it says, Holiday, come to 1256 Chickering Place. K. That's it, Susie. But why don't they arrest Mr. Krell? Arrest? I think we've got something much better, Susie. Much better. Who is it? Holiday. Let me in. Have you got it? Did you get it? Yes, here it is. Oh, that's it. Yes, that's it, Holiday. I've waited so long for this. So very long. I know you have, Crow. And I'm very anxious to see what you think about it. You didn't open it. The lock looks like it was open. Why don't you look inside, Crow? Yes, yes. I've saved this key. Oh, your ex-partner is dead. Oh. Now you won't have to worry about him killing you for double-crossing him. Good, good. I... I, I pay you well, Holiday. I, I pay you well. I... Well, what? With this. With this. Uh, uh, Surprised? Uh, it's gone. And there you... You took it. But I brought you something in place of the money, uh, uh, The flag of the new Philippine Republic. The flag of a people you betrayed. You... You... I... I kill you. I, I, uh, You're very sick, aren't you, Crow? Very sick. You'd never live to stand trial. But you could have lived well in all that money. Please. Please. Please give it to me. Certainly, Crow. Oh, here's the other half of the map, which is why you wrote to me originally. I've not double-crossed you. You can have your treasure any time, Crow. Any time you want to claim it. Where is it? In Manila. And any time you want to go back and claim it, I think the people there will be very glad to see you. A half million dollars. Wow. Who who does it belong to, Mr. Holliday? It's Mr. Krell. But I don't think he'll ever claim it. 
Gee. But what about him? Where'll he go? Well, what'll he do? I don't know, Susie. And I don't think I really care about a man who would double-cross his own country. Well, anyway, it was exciting for you. You know, I wish I could take a plane trip like that sometime. A plane trip? <sighs> Good night, Susie. <laughs> Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville, with this week's original story written by Charles Burnett. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. Part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. Box 13 is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. Box 13 with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Hello, Susie. Come for box 13 mail? Uh-huh. Is there any, Connie? Sure, a lot of it. But here's one that's different. Yes, sir. How? Well, look at the paper. And it didn't come by mail. It was just put on the counter here. That's funny. I wonder why. Yeah, it was funny, all right. That was the letter that said... Box 13. I've been watching your ad appear in the Star Times day after day. You want adventure? Very well, I think I can offer that. I'm going to find out who you are. And when I do, I'm going to kill you within four days. That gives you four days to find out who I am. If you learn that, you may stop me from killing you. But if you don't, at least you will have four days of different adventure. Now back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Find Me, Find Death. If you learn that, at least you will have had four days of different adventure. Oh, gee... Maybe you'd better go to Lieutenant Kling, Mr. Holliday. Why, Susie? Well, you don't want to be killed, do you? I'll try my best to avoid that ugly possibility. You think it's just a, a just a gag, don't you? Well, it could be. And then again, I'm oh, Susie. What, Mr. Holliday? Know why this letter was delivered to the Star Times by hand rather than through the regular mail? No. So whoever wrote it could see who picked up the mail there. <gasps> and find out who you are. And you. <gasps> You worry? I am now. Gee, it it could be a psychic killer who wrote it. Psychopathic, Susie. Anyway, I don't think we should take it too seriously. Yeah, that's what I said. Don't take it too seriously. I didn't. At first. I'd almost forgotten about the letter until that night when I went home. I... Walked into my apartment building and was passing the desk when the clerk called out to me. Mr. Holliday. Oh, Mr. Holliday. Huh? Oh, hello there. How are you? Fine. Say, you certainly were deep in thought when you came in. Yes, I guess I was. Here's a letter for you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Is anything wrong, Mr. Holliday? I don't know. Who gave you this? No one. No one? What do you mean? Well, it, it was on the floor just inside the lobby door. I thought maybe you dropped it. No, I didn't. You didn't see anyone who might have thrown it on the floor? I'm sorry, I didn't, Mr. Holliday. I've been at the switchboard all evening, and I can't see the entrance from there. Oh, I see. Is... is anything wrong? I mean, bad news, anything like that? Well, here, read this. I'm ready, Mr. Holliday. Are you? <laughs> That's a funny kind of note. Mm-hmm. Very funny. Has there been anyone here asking for me? Not a soul. At least not since I've been on duty. Since seven this evening. Any calls? None. You're sure no one came in? Well, not that I saw. 
You look worried, Mr. Holliday. Huh? Do I? Okay, forget it. Good night. Good night, Mr. Holliday. Uh, oh, if there are any calls, do you want them? Yes, ring me in my apartment. Sure will, sir. Good night. Good night. Maybe it was a joke. A little gruesome, but nevertheless a joke. I went up to my apartment. I don't know why I did it, but I tried the door softly and carefully before I put the key in and unlocked it. I stood there for a moment in the dark. Then I switched on the lights. I told myself I was being a little silly, that this was a joke. I walked to the window and opened it. I stood there, looking out and down the street below. The pavement in front of the apartment building was empty. No one there. Then I... I went to the phone. And I made a dozen calls and got a great reputation among my friends for being... Well, a little off the rails. But no one admitted the joke. Maybe... Just maybe... Because it wasn't a joke. Good morning, Mr. Holliday. I... Gee... You look as though you haven't slept. You look tired. Oh, I slept. But badly. Oh, did you have insta... Insta... Um, couldn't you sleep? Hmm. Where's the mail, Susie? Oh, right here. Oh, thank you. What's the matter, Mr. Holliday? Oh, nothing, Susie. I'm just getting a little angry, that's all. At me? Oh, no, Susie. Not at you. I... What is it? The same paper. Same handwriting. Huh? What is? This letter. But this time, it was sent through the mail. Mr. Holliday, what's wrong? Here, read it. Oh, sure. Dear Mr. Holliday, now I know who you are. You must know it because you got my message last night. But what I didn't tell you in my last letter was that if you go to the police, you won't get four days. I'll kill you as soon as you make a move to contact them. Play the game fairly, Mr. Holliday, and you'll have four days. Good luck. Let me have that letter, Susie. What are you going to do? Pay a visit. To the police? Oh, but Mr. Holliday... No, it... no, not to the police. I'm just going to satisfy myself about something. Will you come in, Mr. Holliday? Oh, thank you, Doctor. Please sit down. Thanks. Now, the nurse said that you seemed rather anxious about something. I don't usually see people without appointments. I know, and I appreciate this. Oh, uh, here are three letters, Doctor. I'd like you to read them and, well, as a psychiatrist, tell me what you think about them. Letters? Let me see. Can you read while I talk? Oh, certainly. Go right ahead. Well, here's my advertisement in the Star Times, the one mentioned in the first letter you're reading now. Mm -hmm. I'll explain about the letter later. But first, would any person be liable to write such letters as those? No. No normal person, Mr. Holliday. But an abnormal person might. Have you thought of the possibility of a prank, a joke? No, oh, I have. No one admits it. Well, no one would if it is a joke. Doctor, what kind of a person would write letters like those? Leaving out the gag angle, I mean. <laughs> Mr. Holliday, if I try to, well, go into motives thoroughly, you'd be here all day listening to me. However, there are people who, to all appearances, the external appearances, seem perfectly normal. Yet those same persons, once the stimulus is applied, the motivation furnished, will do terrible things. Even commit murder? Yeah. Our records are full of such case histories. Why? <laughs> Mr. Holliday, what little we know about such things tells us that these persons need, even actually crave, the bolster to their egos. Now, if the person who wrote these letters really kills you, as he says, then he feels superior to you and the rest of the world. Well, that's oversimplifying it, of course, but basically that's it. And then why pick on me? Well, look at your advertisement, Mr. Holliday. Box 13, adventure wanted. We'll go any place, do anything. You mean that ad is a challenge to the person who wrote the letter? Exactly. You supplied the stimulus, the motivation for this person. <laughs> in other words, barring a joke, I'm in trouble. Why don't you go to the police? You read the third letter. If I go to the police, I'll be killed before the four days are up. I think you've got to take that chance. Uh, maybe. Look, Doctor, can this be kept confidential? Well, if you want it that way, yeah. For a while, anyway. <laughs> now, thanks very much. Oh, would you send your bill to my office? Oh, no charge. On one condition. Condition? What's that? Come to see me after four days. Doctor, I'll be very happy to see anyone after four days. <laughs> That night, I tried to sleep. 
but I couldn't. I told myself a million times that it was stupid and silly to let this get me. It was a joke. It had to be. But I heard Susie reading that letter. Now I know who you are. I'll kill you. Those same persons, once the stimulus is applied, the motivation furnished will do terrible things. I'm going to find out who you are. And when I do, I'll kill you within four days. Look at your advertisement, Mr. Holliday. That man is a challenge to the prisoner of the matter. Kill you within four days. Do terrible things. Don't go to the police. Why don't you go to the police? I jumped out of bed as though I'd been shot. I thought I had. But it was a car backfiring in the street below. Well, that made up my mind for me. I was going to the police. I got dressed and went downstairs. Going out, Mr. Holliday? Yeah, for a little while. Can't sleep? It's a little tough. Yes, sir. Pretty noisy outside. That car backfiring woke me up. You were sleeping? Well, just dozing, that's all. You're supposed to stay awake. Anyone could get in or out. Well, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Holliday. I just... Oh, I, I, no, I'm sorry. I, I'm jumpy, I guess. Forget it. Oh, if there are any calls, I'll be back in an hour. Yes, sir, Mr. Holliday. Good night, sir. Good night. I walked out of my apartment building. There were a lot of people in the streets, coming home from shows, maybe going out for a bite to eat, or to the store for a package of cigarettes. I looked at their faces. They were the same kind of faces I saw every other day. Except now, now they were different in a subtle way. I wondered which one might be... Hey, Bud. Huh? What? You got the time? <laughs> I scared you, huh? You looked like you was a million miles away. Oh, I wish I were, mister. I wish I were. Oh, here you are. Hey. Hey, I asked for the time, not a handout. It's all right. You're welcome. Hey, Cap. Cap. Take me to the nearest police station. Make it fast. <laughs> Keep the change. The street in front of the police station was empty. The tail light of the cab I just left receded in the distance and then disappeared. The headlights of a car coming down the street were yellow and misty. I started toward the stairs, but stopped to watch the car coming down the street. It slowed up a little, and then an envelope hit the pavement. I picked it up. The car from which it had been tossed disappeared down the street and around a corner. I tore open the envelope. The note was in the same handwriting. It was short, sweet. Mr. Holliday, if you try to go into that police station, a bullet will kill you before you can get inside. <laughs> Back to Find Me, Find Death. Another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. I didn't go into the station. Somehow, I, I believed that note. Then the next day at the office, Susie and I talked it over. Please, you'll be careful, won't you, Mr. Holliday? Careful? <laughs> yeah, sure. But how? Look, Susie knows where I live. He knows every move I make. But I haven't got the slightest clue as to who he or, or she is. You've got to find out. Yes, I know, but how? I'm no Superman, Susie. I've only got two more days. Maybe if you left town, Mr. Holiday. Oh, that wouldn't do any good. He'd be sure to follow. He'd be... What's the matter? Did, did you think of something? No. No, you did. I did? Yes, you. Susie... Leave town. That's the answer. But you just said he'd follow you. If it's not a joke, you will. Now, wait. Let's think this out. I train? No. Too many people to check on the train. I'd never be able to narrow the choice down. Go by bus, Mr. Holliday. Bus. That's it, Susie. Bus. Not a big one. But one of those small lines that make only about a three or four hundred mile run. Uh, how many people can get on one of those? Mm, maybe... 20 or 30 at one time? Sure. 20 or 30. And I've got an idea. Come on to the station with me, Susie. Me? Or four? You'll see. Hand me that small bag. Oh, you gonna pack? No, the bag will be just a prop. Now, come on, let's go. Now, look. 
Look, Susie, I'm going to buy a ticket on that bus, the one marked on the schedule leaving in five minutes. Uh-huh. I'm going to buy a ticket all the way through to the end of the line. Then what? Then I'm going to get off that bus before the end of the line and come right back here. Gee, it sounds all right, but I don't get it. Don't you see, Susie? If he's following me, he'll buy a ticket all the way through. And he'll have to get off before the end of the line to keep track of me. Well, so long, Susie. I took a good look at my fellow passengers on the bus. It wasn't crowded. There were only ten beside me. I wondered which of the ten, if any, was the person who was after me. Then... Excuse me. Hmm? Oh, yes. Would you do me a favor, please? Oh, if I can, sure. What is it? This is my little boy, Harold. All the seats next to the windows are taken. He likes to look out. I wondered if you'd mind if he just... Oh, kept... certainly not. Here you are, Sonny. Climb in. Oh, thank you. Harold, be careful of your lo- lollipop now. Don't get it all over the nice man. <laughs> like to ride, Sonny? Hey, it's pretty out there, isn't it? Kid don't talk much, does he? Hmm? Oh, no, not much. Going all the way? Yes, all the way. And you? Mm-hmm. All the way. You want one of these books to read? Help pass the time? I... Oh, thank you. No, it's nothing. Here's a good murder mystery. You like murders? Hmm. Nothing like them. <laughs> Most of the murderers in them books are sure dumb. Now, if I was going to kill somebody, nobody would even know I was going to do it. I bet I could kill somebody and get away with it. That is, if I wanted to kill somebody. And do you? Sometimes I do, mister. Sometimes I do. Well, I'll let you do your reading. Harold, you can come with me now. Well, thanks for your kindness, mister. There's a seat next to the window up front now. Harold, where's your lollipop? Oh, here you are. This is it. Oh, thank you. Where was it? Oh, I just ran my fingers through my hair, and there it was. Oh, thank you. Come on, Harold. The rest of the passengers sat silently and quietly in their seats. Some reading, some just staring out of the window. Then I saw one man who was just looking at me with a little smile on his face. The smile widened, and I smiled back. He came over to me. Mind if I sit down? No, not at all. Thanks. <sighs> you meet all kinds of people on a bus. That's why I like to ride on them. Huh? Do you make a habit of it? Well, I guess you could say I do. How about you? Well, I don't ride buses as a rule. I see. You on a business trip? Well, I... I guess you could say I am. Salesman? No, I'm... I'm a writer. What? A writer? <laughs> oh, is, is that funny? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, so am I. A writer, I mean. Is that so? Well, my name's Trevor. William Trevor. Well, mine's Holiday, Dan Holiday. Well, I'll be... A mystery fiction writer, aren't you? Yes, that's right. Oh, my stuff runs more to the scientific, but uh, I get a lot of material on these buses. You do? For example? Well, uh, a couple of years ago, I rode on the same bus with a man who killed three men. Oh? I talked with him. I had a cup of coffee with him at a stop. And I would have thought of him as a killer. I mean, he was no different from you or me or that fellow who gave you the book a few minutes ago. Yeah, I suppose lots of people who appear normal aren't really as normal as they seem. I guess not. Going far, Dan? Yes, all the way. Well, I'll leave you to your reading. Oh, murder mystery. You like them? Mm, Sometimes I do. It all depends on how I feel. (laughs) What you mean? Well, I think I'll try a little nap for a few minutes. I'll see you later. He went back to his seat. I sat, pretended to read. But no one else spoke to me or paid any attention to me. And the bus went on, on. The bus made its first stop after an hour's ride. I got off as did the rest of the passengers. Everyone took a stretch and then... Boat! All aboard, please! All aboard! I ducked behind a post and waited. Waited until the bus pulled out. I looked around. I was just going to board a return bus. Hey! Dan! I thought you were going all the way. Oh, I uh, changed my mind, Mr. Trevor. Oh. I thought you were going all the way. Did I say that? I don't think so. Uh, I may have imagined it. I could be. I, I know I didn't say it. Look, this is the stub of my ticket. It's punched as far as this stop. He was right. His ticket was punched only as far as it stopped. 
I looked at him. He must have seen the expression on my face because... Hey, don't you feel well? Yes, I... Uh, I'm all right. Why? Well, you had a kind of funny look on your face as though you expected... Oh, expected something to happen that didn't. <laughs> or maybe I'm imagining things oh, now. You going back to the city? Yeah, sure. Come on, there's a return bus. Looks like we'll be able to get a seat. <laughs> Hey, Trevor. Trevor. Hmm? Oh, we're back, huh? Well, short trip and a merry one. A merry one? <laughs> that could be. Say, I, I wonder if you'd come to my place some evening for a chit-chat. My wife would love to meet somebody who's successful with his writing. What's the matter with you? Oh, I'm afraid I'm not the picture of the successful writer. I've had a lot of disappointment. Oh, I see. Well, I'll be glad to. Could you make it tonight? Well, I don't... Look, we're having some people over. My wife would get a big kick out of having a real live writer. A good one, that is. Oh. Come over to the house. All right. If, if I find I'm free, I'll be there. Well, hey, here. Here's my name and address. Gee, my wife will get a kick out of this. Here. Now, oh, please, try to make it, will you? Sure, sure, I'll try. Okay, I'll see you later then. And, and thanks. He got off the bus ahead of me and walked away. I wondered... I wondered about a lot of things. Trevor had been the only one of the original passengers who had taken the return bus with me. Yet, his ticket was crunched for the first stop. If he'd wanted to keep track of me, he would have bought a ticket all the way through because... Well, because he couldn't have known I'd get off. I decided to accept his invitation because... Well, I had to find out sooner or later. And so that night, I stood on the doorstep outside... Trevor's home. Inside, a radio was playing. I could hear people laughing, talking. I rang the doorbell and waited. Hey, holiday, you did come. Huh? Are you surprised? Oh, sure I am. You know how those invitations usually work out. Nobody goes anyplace. Come on in and meet the gang. Oh, I'll be glad to. Oh, look, old man, if those goons in there start chewing your head off with questions and you get bored, you just give me the high sign we'll break it off, okay? Mr. Trevor, you have no idea how glad I am to be among people. Huh? What do you mean? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. I just like people, that's all. <laughs> I see. In here, Holiday. Surprise, Holiday. Your wife. And some guests, huh? <laughs> I'll turn it off. That's an excellent record. It's used for sound effects and radio, I believe. Open that door. <laughs> no, not yet. Sit down, Holiday. Trevor, listen to me. You're a fool even to try to get away with this. Oh, I've gotten away with it before. Five times, to be exact. Now, don't force me to shoot you yet. Sit down. Five times? Yes. <laughs> but this one is the most exciting. Sit down, Holiday. That's better. Now, I must say that that bus trick of yours was very good, Holiday. But my trick was a little more so. You actually bought a ticket as far as the first stop. Of course. If you'd gone on, it would have been a simple matter for me to pay the difference in fare. <laughs> but you are clever. Trevor, listen to me. You're not well. Now, let's stop this not nonsense well. right now. Not well. I'm well, all right. The rest of the world is made up of fools and idiots. But I like you, Holiday. So much so that I'm going to give you a chance. Chance? What kind of a chance? You sit at one end of that long table. I'll sit at the other. Go ahead. Now what? Now neither of us can reach the other. I have two guns here. One for you and one for me. You're, you're going to give me a gun? Exactly. Did you ever hear of Russian roulette? Uh, I see you have. I'll put one bullet in each gun. One and only one. I'll spin the cylinders on each revolver so that neither of us knows in which chamber the bullet is. Now, the bullet in your gun may be in the chamber under the hammer. Or it may not. The same for mine. Get hatch. Trevor, for the last time, let me out of here. No! Oh, you play the game. Point the gun at me, Holiday, as I point mine at you. So... If your bullet is under the hammer, you'll kill me. If mine is under the hammer... <laughs> Ready? Squeeze the trigger, Holiday. Because I'm going to. Trevor, stop it. Another time.
tired holiday. This may be the end. When I count three. One. Two. Three. <laughs> We're both lucky. All right. Once more. There was one long chance. To my right was the only light in the room. A student lamp on a small Ooh. table. I waited until Trevor counted to three, then dived for the lamp. What? It was dark. I heard Trevor moving then. Holiday! Holiday! Stay where you are, Trevor. <laughs> Don't try to get out the door, Holiday. I know exactly where it is now, fire. I've got a bullet, too. <laughs> Have you? You think I'm a fool? You've got a fake in your gun. You try it. <laughs> Oh, this is more exciting than I ever imagined it would be. Holiday, you may as well take it now, because you'll never get out alive. Go ahead, fire at me. <laughs> when do you think you'll get the loaded chamber, Trevor? I'm going to kill you. I must kill you. The next chamber's the one, Trevor, and you'd better hit me. I'll wait. I'll wait until I can see you. Will you? <laughs> then you'll have to wait until morning. By that time, I'll be missed, and my secretary knows where I've gone. Then they'll come here, Trevor. They'll come here and take you away. No. They'll put you where you'll get better because you're sick, Trevor. Very sick. No, no, no. Think of it, Trevor. Long nights and days where you shut can't up. get out. Shut up, shut Long up, nights shut up. and days. They'll come for you, Trevor. They'll come for you in the morning. Holiday? 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 <laughs> You, you poor devil. You poor devil. I'm sorry. Locked up in that dark room with him. Yes, yeah, Susie. It wasn't nice. But now he's locked up. Or he can't harm anyone or himself. You know what, Mr. Holiday? You need a nice long rest. Oh, say it again, Susie. Say it again. You sure do. Why don't you take a nice bus ride someplace? But <laughs> Good night, Susie. <laughs> Next week, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Kev Star Times. I'm a betting agent in my state where betting agents are legal. I'm one of the many who are being taken for plenty. I think there's something haywire, but none of us have been able to figure it out. Now, since you'd be a stranger here, we figure you'd have a better than even chance of knowing. Nosing around and finding out how we're getting clipped. If you do, we'll pay. If you don't, maybe you'll have yourself an adventure anyway. My name is Bert Hendricks. Look me up at 6729 Sierra Way. Enclosed is enough money to take care of immediate expenses. Have a look, huh? <laughs> yeah, I had a look all right. Right into the muzzle of a nasty 25 automatic. Back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Much Too Lucky. Are you going to be gone long, Mr. Holliday? Well, I don't know, Susie. That all depends. On what? On what happens. Oh, what could happen? Where I'm concerned, anything. Oh, yeah. Sometimes I get worried about you, Mr. Holliday. Sometimes? Most times. It's just like a nomination. Oh? Uh, what am I running for? 
Huh? <laughs> Nothing. I just had a premonition. What's that? What you didn't have. I don't get it. Hmm. Well, you work on until I get back, Susie. I'm off to the races. <laughs> It was quick and pleasant. And eight hours after I said goodbye to Susie, I was talking with Bert Hendricks, a big, nice-looking fellow, but with a worried look on his face. After we had introduced ourselves, Hendricks let me know what was putting the wrinkles between his eyes. Oh, it's got us roped and tied like a Christmas package, Dan. Huh? How much are you losing? Plenty. Runs into four or five figures every week. Uh, maybe somebody's being lucky. <laughs> to be that lucky, a guy would have to be born with a silver horseshoe in his mouth. Look. Yesterday, I paid off on a long shot at 40 to 1. The clip ran to the tune of 20,000. And that, as they say in books, is sugar with a capital S. It'd buy a lot of coffee. Anyway, we figure we're getting it the wrong way. Cliff, bamboozled. Well, why don't you go to the police? With what? Troubles? That's not the answer. Mm. Have you tried to find out? Are you kidding? We ran ourselves into a lather trying to catch the angle. No dice. Dan, somebody in this town's plenty smart. Smart enough to know our boys. And that brings me in. That's right. You're a stranger. They won't take a second look at you. I caught your ad in the Star Times and played the bet. Well, here you are. Hmm. With nothing to do. How much do you want? Well, believe it or not, Bert, I do this for nothing. Yeah, I heard you say that before, but I don't get your dodge. My what? Your gimmick. Dodge, racket, angle. Oh. <laughs> well, I figure if the plot's good enough, I can use it in the story. Okay, but... But no dough? I'll tell you what, Bert. If I figure this, will you turn over what you'd give me to any charity I name? Here. Here's a blank check. Fill in the amount, I'll sign it. But try to catch the capers that are putting the shellac on us. Well, there's nothing to start on. I've got a job. Ah, they're smart. Plenty smart. What they win is over and beyond the run of luck or chance. Any ideas? Yeah. One. Now, what's that? I got a guy with a crystal ball. <laughs> That's the best you can do? Come on in the wire room with me. See if we can catch anything. Well, up front? Uh-huh. This way. And we're getting ready now for the third race today. The We've got a radio back here, here broadcasting zero. direct from the track. One Comes over a local station. Here. Oh, and where are the best places? Mm, right here, or by phone. And mm, I see. And you take bets up until the time the horse is at the post. Mm, that's right. But once the race starts, no more bets. Uh, listen to the race. Now he's in place. We're ready, and they're off. Hiya, Bert. At the Hi, Billy. How's it going? Somebody called up and got a century on party line. Oh, the 20 to 1 shot? That's right. Oh, Billy, this is a friend of mine, Dan Holliday. Hi. Hello, Billy. Party line wins, Bert. It's the fourth long shot this week that's played off. Yeah, yeah, I know. Each one was bet on. Is that it? But heavy. I still say there's one of them guys who's doing it by telepathy. Listen. As the half this mine owned by Apple Angle over Cantilever, Rocket is third and falling back with old Joe. As Party Line still swings wide and moves up on the outside. Coming into the turn now with mine owned by Head over Cantilever and moving up fast on the outside is Party Line in third. There he comes. Who made that bet on Party Line? Mike took the ball. Okay. Get me the name of the guy who made the bet. Sure. Right away. Listen to that. It's mine owned by a half over Party Line. And it's a driving finish with mine owned in front by a nose. Party Line getting up the whip and moving up. Up and across the finish is party line by a head over my own. Oh, 20 to 1. Uh-huh, and 100 dollars at 20 to 1. Don't say it, don't say it. Come on, let's go back to my office. Oh, Dan, I don't get it. How can they pick long shots like that? Is it only long shots? No, no, not always. Sometimes it's the favorite, but it's always a winner. And I say no guy can pick a winner every race. Especially every long shot. Come in. Want to know who placed that hundred on party line, Bert? Yeah. Here's the tab. Oh. Her again. She's awful lucky. Yeah, too lucky. Who is it? Name's Vaughn. Terry Vaughn. Singer at one of the clubs here. She's done this before, huh? Yeah, she's done it before. Twenty grand today, five last week. Why doesn't she retire and leave here? Well, she can. Look, Dan. We've got this betting narrowed down to about 20 people. 20? Yep. The most consistent winners. They never lose. Oh, a ring. Is that it? That's right. But not one of them is ever at the track. You mean they, they just don't go? That's right. Never. I don't get it. <laughs> Neither do we. Oh, Billy. Yeah? 
This call from Terry Vaughn came in just before the horses were at the post, huh? Sure. We take bets up to the break. What are you uh, thinking about, Dan? Mm, I was just wondering if there was any way of getting advance information on a race. <laughs> you kidding? Not a chance. This is a business with us. Legitimate. On the level. We know every angle and dodge. There's no way anyone could know before the race that a long shot like party line was going to nose across first. Uh, you've got yourself a problem. All right. How about taking a slice of it, Dan? What I said about that blank check still goes. Mm. Okay, you've got yourself a boy. Good. I don't know where I'll start, but as they say in books, everything has a beginning. So, why not start with Harry Vaughn? <laughs> Waiter. Oh, waiter. Oh, uh, yes, sir? I wonder if you'd deliver this note for me. Certainly, sir. Where to? Miss Terry Vaughn. <laughs> I'll see about it, sir. Uh, will this make you see any better? Oh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh, and tell Miss Vaughn I'm a journalist. Newspaper man? Yes, I guess that's it. You see, I'd like an interview. Well, I, I'll see what I can do, sir. I'll do my very best. I waited. I didn't know what Miss Terry Vaughn could tell me or wouldn't tell. But it was a chance. She didn't know me, so she wouldn't be suspicious. It was ten minutes later that the waiter came back to my table. Miss uh, Vaughn will see you, Mr. Holliday. Oh, how did you know my name? Uh, on the card you sent with the note. <laughs> Simple, isn't it, Dr. Watson? Uh, I beg your pardon? Oh, never mind. Now, where's Miss Vaughn? Oh, she'll be here in a moment. Oh, okay, I'll wait. Yes, sir. They're glad to have been observed. I waited, and I'll admit the wait was worthwhile. Miss Terry Vaughn glided across the floor of my table, smiled five thousand dollars worth of teeth, tossed a million dollars in red hair over her shoulder, and put ten million dollars of the rest of her in the chair across from me. You're Mr. Holliday. You're Miss Vaughn. Mm -hmm. Your note said you wanted to interview me. That's fine. Right. Well, I'm flattered. Uh, I imagine that's a fairly common situation with you. <laughs> What paper are you with, Mr. Holliday? I have a connection with the Star Times. Oh, you're a big city boy. Mm, I didn't know it showed. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you want to interview me? Oh, lots of reasons, Miss Vaughn. Name one. Well, I heard you were very lucky today. Lucky? How? Or do you win 20000 every day? What does this have to do with an interview? Well, it's human interest stuff, Miss Vaughn. Very human and very interesting. I see. But, uh... Why pick on my lucky streak? Because, well, because it was so lucky. Oh, I've always been lucky. Well, I can understand that. Oh, how did you happen to pick uh, party line today? I like long shots. Always? When I feel lucky. Do you ever lose? Sometimes. Why? Oh, I'm just asking. Mr. Holliday, this is a peculiar interview. Oh, I don't think so. Just pleasant. What paper did you say you were with? The Star Times. And what are you doing here? Vacation. When is it over? A couple of weeks. I see. Well, Mr. Holliday, as far as I'm concerned, it's over now. Have a nice time. Oh, wait, I'm... I'm sorry. Please stay here. Why? I feel that I owe you an apology. For what? For being so curious. <laughs> All right. We'll forget it. Mm. Let's do Let's forget all about $20,000, long shots, and lucky streaks. And what shall we substitute? Terry Vaughn. Do you mind? Hmm. I don't mind if I do, Mr. Holliday. Well, it was a pleasant way to spend an evening. But when it was over, I was just as smart as at the beginning, which was zero. Maybe Terry Vaughn was lucky. But how lucky can you be? The next day, I met Bert Hendricks, and he had more trouble. Well, somebody did it again today, Dan. Not quite as big as Terry's play yesterday, but enough. Enough. One of the same 20 people you've had? Yeah, one of the 20. If it weren't for the fact that it's those same 20 people all the time, it could be just luck. Yeah, could be. You saw Terry last night? Yeah. You, oh, yeah, I saw Terry. And? A very lovely girl. <laughs> I wish I had her money. It's mine. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Bert. I don't have to ask if you've watched those 20 people. Oh, sure we have. They don't talk to anyone connected with the track. As far as I know, they don't even know anyone there. There's got to be a gimmick. Yeah, that's what I keep telling myself in the head. 
Look, Bert, let's try to figure it out logically. You say every one of those bets is placed just before the race is run. That's right. And each of those 20 people picks a winner. Yeah. Not only with me, but with all the other agents who have the same setup I've got. Then how could they get advance information? They can't. They've got to, Bert. Dan, we've been all over that. Yeah, maybe there's an angle you've overlooked. Okay, name it and I'll buy it. Is there, is there any particular race or races they always bet? Hmm? What races do you lose the most heavily on? Wait a minute. That is an angle. Do you think of something? Maybe. Wait a second. I'm going to check. I think I'm right, but I'll make sure. Hello? Hello, Billy. This is Bert. Yeah? What race is being run now? Time for the sixth. Do you have any big bets? No. Were there any of the 20 on this one? No. Which ones did they hit? Third, fourth, fifth. That's all? Yeah, why? Nothing. See you later. Well? Third, fourth, and fifth. That's what I thought. Never the first, second, or the sixth, seventh, or eighth. Always the third, fourth, or fifth. That's right. But where's the gimmick? I don't know. But hand me the phone. Oh, here. Thanks. Now, what's the phone number of the club where Terry Vaughn works? No, I don't know. It's in the directory. But why? What's that got to do with this? Bert, I don't know yet. But I'm going to ask the lovely Terry Vaughn if she'll go out with me tomorrow afternoon. Afternoon? What are you getting at? Your money. I hope. Hand me the directory. And now back to Much Too Lucky, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, I had an idea. Not a big one. And not one that made sense. Yet. But I was going to play it. So the next afternoon, I met Miss Terry Vaughn for lunch. I arranged the time so we'd be together just about the same time the horses went to the post for the third race. We sat in a little cafe. I was really surprised that you called me, Dan. Oh? Why, Terry? Oh, I don't know. Maybe because you seem more interested in my luck than in me. Mm-hmm. The two go together? No, I suppose so. Uh, do you ever play the races? No, I, uh, I never have. But there's always a first time. <laughs> That's what they all say. Why do you ask? Got something good? As they say in the vernacular? Oh, I never get tipped. Ah, but you win. Occasionally. Mm-hmm. What's your secret? What makes you think it's a secret? That was just a figure of speech. Let's talk about something else. Oh, what time is it? Hmm? Oh, 2.20. Why? Thinking of leaving me so soon? No, but I have something to do around 3. Oh, uh, important? To me, yes. I see. Well, shall we take a walk? Yes, I'd like to. Okay, that's it. So we walked. Harry was very charming. I was beginning to wonder about my hunch. Maybe it was luck after all. Then a few minutes after three... Dan, will you excuse me for a few minutes? Oh, your important three o'clock news. <laughs> That's it. I have to make a phone call. Want me to wait? Yes, if you want to. Oh, I do. I'll make it from this drugstore. All right. I'll wait right here. I won't be more than a few minutes. She went into the drugstore and straight to her phone booth. I slipped inside, went to a counter. The clerk came up to me. May I help you, sir? Uh, oh, yes, yes. Let me see a pair of those binoculars, will you? These? Uh, uh, they're not very good. I accept for children, just toys. Oh, I like to play with toys. <laughs> May I see a pair? Certainly. Here you are. Thanks. If you point them outside, you'll get a better idea of what they'll do. Oh, getting a good idea right here. Excuse me, I'll be right back, sir. Uh-huh. I watched Miss Terry Vaughan in that phone booth. The binoculars weren't very good, but I saw the numbers she dialed and remembered them. She spoke for a few seconds, hung up, dropped another coin, and dialed another number. I got that one, too. Then the clerk came back. They work all right, sir. Oh, they're marvelous, just marvelous. Uh, how much are they? Two ninety-five. Uh, here you are. Shall I wrap them? Got any kids? Huh? I mean, uh, why, yes. Well, here's a present for them. But uh, you just bought them. Well, you see, I like your kids. You take these. But, but sir, I, uh, I can't take these. Or, or can I? I walked back outside and got to the pavement before Terry Vaughn finished her second phone call. I was standing there when she came out. Well, there we are. All set. Make a call, all right? Yes. 
Now, how'd you like to see the town? I'd love it. Come on, let's go. We spent a pleasant afternoon, but my mind wasn't on my work. I was trying to keep those phone numbers straight in my head. Then Terry had to go to the club for rehearsal. As soon as she left me, I headed for a phone booth and dialed the first number she'd called. Hello, Bill. Bill, what number do you want? Is Bill there? Uh, there's no Bill here. I'm sorry. You're sure there's no Bill there? Uh, you got a wrong number, bud. Wrong number, huh? Maybe, maybe not. I dialed the second number she'd call. Hello? Hello, who's this? Hendricks, who's that? Hendricks. This is Holiday. Holiday? What's up? Listen, did Terry Vaughn place a bet this afternoon? Yeah, on the fourth. Did she win? She had 50 on the winner's nose. Look, she was with me when she made the bet. You heard her make it? No, she was in a phone booth. Was that the only bet she made? That was enough. How many winners did you have in that race? Six of the other 20 people had the winner. How about the other races? Third, fourth, and fifth. All winners among the 20 people. Uh-huh. You got the gimmick? Eh, uh, maybe. But I've got to prove it. Listen, just sit tight, Bert. Don't open your mouth and let out a peep, and above all, don't try to see me. But, Dan, if you know anything, please... I don't know whether I know anything or not, but I'll find out tomorrow at the track. Later that evening, I made a purchase, a very important one. Then I called Terry Vaughn and asked her to go to the track with me the next day. It took a little persuasion, but she finally said yes. So the next afternoon, with my purchase in the pocket of my top coat, Miss Vaughn and I went to the track. And up in the stands... Do you know, Dan, this is the first time I've been here this season. Oh, I thought you liked racing. Oh, I do, but... Well, being at the track makes me nervous. Nervous? Why? Oh, no reason at all. Oh. Which horse do you like in this race? Oh, I'm not going to bet. Oh, now, with your luck? <laughs> I don't want to force it. I see. Well, I don't blame you. Why don't you go ahead and bet? Mm. All right, you pick a horse for me. Think my luck will rub off on you? Uh, could be. Go ahead. Pick one. Well, let's see. How does this one sound? Bright Angel. Bright Angel it is. In the third. It's almost post time. Uh-huh. Well, These are good seats. Mm, yes, they are. I reached in my pocket and took out the important purchase I had made the previous evening and started to unwrap it. What's that, then? Oh, I just bought this. A portable radio. I wonder if I can hear the race on it. Don't turn that on. But why not? Put down that radio, Mr. Holiday. Put it why, down. Why don't you want me to turn it on? You're just a little too smart, Mr. Holiday. This is a gun in my purse. You're getting out of here. Go on. I carry radio. You carry guns. Hmm. You're well equipped. Go on. Lead the way. Huh? Okay. She was as cool as an Arctic winter. And she handled the gun nicely. Kept it in the small of my back under her handbag. Somehow I knew she'd use it if she had to. We got to her car, and a half hour later, she marched me into a room where a man sat wearing a pair of headphones. He looked up as we came in. Ah, oh, hello, Terry. Who's this? A smart boy, Tim. I'm leaving him with you. Smart boy? Mm-hmm. He's wise. How he got that way, I don't know. But after the fifth race cleanup, we're leaving town. Well, it's about time. We couldn't run this racket forever. You know, Mr. Holliday, you're lucky you didn't come along sooner. Yes, I know. Before you made your take. That's right. How did you figure it? Through a 295 pair of binoculars. I saw the numbers you dialed yesterday. Oh. You should be with us. Hmm. Let's see. That thing there is a wire recorder. You tap into the broadcast line that runs from the track to the radio station. Without the station's knowledge. You record the broadcast. Then play it back into the broadcast line. Two minutes after the regular airtime. You are smart. And those two minutes give you enough time to place bets on sure things. You already know the winners, but the bookmakers don't. Correct. But you only pull this on the middle three races of the card, so that latecomers and those who leave the track early won't catch wise by listening to their radios. Right again. The broadcast is delayed two minutes. The race is already over before the bookmakers even think it started. Sit down, Mr. Holliday. 
Watch him, Tim. Yeah, okay. I'm going to clean up a few odds and ends. Goodbye, Mr. Holiday. Oh, we'll see each other again. Oh, I doubt that very much. Goodbye. And be very happy that some of my luck did rub off on you. <laughs> smart dame, smart dame. Nose angles. Yes, I can see that. And we make a take here and then move on. Now, you just sit still, bub. I got some work to do, but uh, I can still watch you. I watched him, too. The wire recorder was spinning. He flipped the switch and I knew what happened. The third race, the track was over. But the broadcast of it was going over the air now. Two minutes later. Then... Uh, now, now, we sit tight for a while. Say, that wire recorder, I've never seen one before. Uh-huh. Great gadgets, yeah. Great. <laughs> I make recordings of my own voice all the time. Oh? You mean all you do is talk into that little microphone and your voice is recorded right away? Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, you uh, want to say something? Hey, you're obliging. Oh, sure. Anything to pass the time. It gets dull in here. Go on, say something, and we'll play it back for you. Go on. Well, what'll I say? Oh, anything. First thing comes to your mind. Well, my name is Dan Holliday. I'm being held prisoner at 758 Condo Street at the point of a gun. Please help. Oh, ho, 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 great. Just great. <laughs> Don't you wish someone on the outside could really hear that? Yeah, I guess I do. Now, you mean that thing will play right back, huh? Sure. Just got to switch from the record to playback, that's all. He turned his back for a second, flipped the switch. I flipped the switch, too, and waited. Well, my name is Dan Holliday. I'm being held prisoner at 758 Condo Street at the point of a gun. Please help. <laughs> See? That's all there is to it. Well, well, well. What do you know about that? Isn't science wonderful? <laughs> yeah, it sure is. <laughs> Too bad you had to come along and spoil this racket, mister. But I guess we made a big enough take and Keep your hands up, mister. I can shoot and answer the phone at the same time. Yeah? Tim, what happened? Happened? Nothing. Why? The guy is Listen, still... get out of there fast and take him with you. We'll take care of him later, but get out of there fast. Uh, Terry! T uh, Terry! Something wrong? I don't know. Get up and move out. Go on. I did. But I did something else first. We walked out of the place, a gun in my ribs. I hoped what I'd done would work. We walked up the street a piece, and then... That's cops. All right. Duck in here. Go on, in this hallway. Now, ah, just keep quiet and let him go past. <laughs> guess they won't find nobody there, will they? No, I guess not. Well, what now? Now, well, wait for a minute, and we go. All right. Now get in front of me and stay there. Go on. Drop that gun. What? What? Who? Better drop it. There's a lot of cops. Oh, okay, okay. Don't shoot. Dan. Dan Halliday. You all right? Sure, Hendricks. Did you hear my broadcast? Yeah. Your voice cut in right in the middle of the regular broadcast. Huh? I don't get it. I don't get it. How'd they find us? How'd they trail us? Oh. <laughs> Look on your coattail, Tim. You didn't know it, but when we left that room, I hooked the end of the wire from the recorder on your coat. You see, Tim, you were wired for sound. Sure was a clever idea they had, Mr. Holliday. Uh-huh. And you were clever, too. That wire left the trail right to you and that man. Yeah, uh, he was wired for sound, Susie. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, and I'll bet you got a racy story out of it. Uh, what, Susie? No, oh, don't you get it, Mr. Holliday? I made a joke. Racy story. <laughs> get it? Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville. 
for this week's original story by Robert M. Light and Mr. Sandville. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. Part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker, and production is supervised by Bern Carstensen. Box 13 is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd and his latest Paramount picture. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. William. William. Yes, sir, Mr. Mallory. We're ready to leave at a moment's notice, aren't we? Yes, sir. Very well. Please put this in the mail for me. Very well, sir. Oh, uh, you'd better take it ashore and post it there. <laughs> I'm rather anxious to see who this Box 13 is. The letter I received was short and to the point. Enclosed with it was a plane ticket and another ticket. First class on the biggest luxury liner afloat. And the letter read, Be at the end of Pier 9 tomorrow night at 8. Please be prompt. That was all. A command, not a request. When I received it, I wondered who'd written it. Well, I found out. Now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, One of These Four. But, Mr. Holliday, do you want to go on another trip? Oh, not if I can help it, Susie. But someone paid for these tickets. Mm -hmm. First class on the biggest liner afloat. And no name or address. Mm, you can't send it back. But I can bring it back. You mean you're going to Pier 9 tonight? Like it says here, Susie, I'm going to Pier 9 tonight. I got to Pier 9 promptly at 8 o'clock. There was no liner there. There was nothing but a cold fog that penetrated to my skin and made me shiver in the dim, hazy light from a half-hearted street lamp a block away. I looked at my watch. It was exactly 8. Are you Mr. Holliday? Uh, yes, I'm Dan Holliday. Do you have the letter that was sent to you? Huh? Who are you? My name is William, sir. I'm a steward. Steward? On what ship? If you'll be so good as to show me the letter, Mr. Holliday, we can talk later, if you please. I, uh... Okay. Here you are. Very good, sir. If you'll come with me. Where? There's a boat waiting, sir, to take you out to the yacht. Yacht? What yacht? Look, what about this ticket? That will be explained later, Mr. Holliday. Now, would you come with me, sir? He stood there waiting for me to follow him. I wanted whether to or not. <laughs> well, I'd advertise for adventures and who blames whom in a case like this. Then... You coming, sir? I think you've talked me into it. Okay, William. Lead the way. Ten minutes later, I was aboard a yacht. But what a yacht. It was sea-going, and from what I could see in the bad light, ready to go anywhere and do anything. William led the way along the deck. We go down this companion way, Mr. Holliday. And it's nice to know we're going somewhere. Your cabin, Mr. Holliday. Mine? Yes, sir. I think you'll find everything in order. Pajamas, toothbrush, everything that you'll need for the night. Oh, now, wait a minute. If, if you... you're hungry, there are sandwiches and coffee. Good night, sir. Hey, now, just a minute. You... Hey, open up. Come on, open this door. William? William? And that, as they say, was that. I was locked in. I thought of breaking in the door, but one good look put that idea out of my head. The door was iron. There was one porthole in the cabin. <laughs> I couldn't have crawled through it if I'd been dehydrated. Well, I sat down to figure this out. Then it was figured out for me. The yacht was moving. I ran to the porthole. The lights of the city had already been swallowed up by the darkness. Mr. Dan Holliday was going on a trip. But where? And why? Mr. 
Mr. Holliday. Mr. I won't despise, funny man. I always hide behind doors that people lock on me. Now talk. My arm, sir, it breaks easily. I'm glad to hear that. Now come on, talk. This will do you no good, Mr. Holliday. We've been underway all night. Maybe you're right. Well, oh, thank you, sir. I hope you slept well. Oh, sure. Now, what's all this about? Breakfast is being served in the main dining salon, sir. I get great answers to my questions. You'll soon find out, sir. Now, if you please. Go ahead, I'll follow. As you wish, sir. Down this way, Mr. Holliday. I followed him down the passage, then into the dining salon. And there, seated around a table, were two men and a woman. They looked up as I entered, and one of the men spoke. Look here. Just what's the big idea? You talking to me? I certainly am. If I may have a word. Go ahead. All four of you are in the same position. You mean each of us was kidnapped? No, sir. Invited. Invited? My foot. I was locked up in the cabin. So was I. And me too. Well, well, well. And when do we learn why, William? As soon as Mr. Mallory wishes to tell you, sir. Now, breakfast is served. I shall lock the salon door. Well, I'll be... I wonder what the gag is. Oh, if it is a gag. We may as well get acquainted. My name is Holliday, Dan Holliday. I'm Stanley Ware. How do you do? I'm Philip Clayson. Hello. My name's Lansing, Catherine Lansing. Well, it's all we know as much as we did before. We've got to get out of here. Obviously, this is some... Some sort of insane joke. I, I wonder if it is, Larry. Well, what person in his right mind would kidnap four people like this? What do you say, Clayton? Well, I don't know. Well, take a look out the porthole. We're obviously far at sea. <laughs> How well can you swim? Well, maybe we could get to one of the lifeboats. I don't think so. Oh, well, why not? Something tells me the rest of the crew are like William, the steward. I don't think we'd be able to get to a boat even if we got out of the salon. Oh, I guess you're right, Holiday. Well, what do we do? Mr. Waring, I suggest we have breakfast. I think better on a full stomach. One hour later, William came and unlocked the salon door and took us back to our cabins. I caught sight of some of the crew. They paid no attention to us, but went on with their work. Lunch was the same, locked in the salon, then back to the cabins. But at dinner time... Good evening, Mr. Holliday. Uh, hello, William. I see the dinner jacket fits you, sir. Very thoughtful of someone to provide the correct size. Dinner is being served, sir. Thank you. And will we be honored by Mr. Mallory's presence this evening? I can't say, Mr. Holliday. Perhaps. <laughs> hey, William, where are we? I'm not a navigator, sir. I have no idea. Uh, there's still a notion under us, isn't there? But I last looked at the sir, sir. Hmm. I'll lead on, William. Thank you, sir. Good evening, Holiday. Hello, Aaron. Miss Lansing. Oh, good evening. Say, look, we've got to do something about this. We, we've got to. What do you suggest, Clayton? Well, I, uh, I don't know, but we've got to think. What are they going to do with us? Why did they bring us here? Dinner is served. But why, you yeah. I'll choke it out of you. Let him go, Clayton. Come on. Come on, let him go. Let him go. Choke, choke, choke him out. Let him go. What good will that do you, Mr. Clayton? Huh? Ah. Mr. Mallory, sir. That will be all, William. You may go. And turn that thing off, will you? Very good, sir. You're an impetuous man, Mr. Clayton. So you're Mallory. Sit down, please. We'll have dinner. Uh, just a minute. Before we have anything else, we'll have an explanation, are we? You're a uh, holiday, aren't you? That's right. <laughs> Fix your vital, aren't you? What's that got to do with this routine? Please, sit down. Miss Lansing, on my right, please. Mr. Wearing that chair, Mr. Clayton, on my left. Mr. Holiday, sit at the other end, facing me. Please, you want an explanation. I promise you'll get one. After dinner. Or would you rather wait another night and another day? I'll sit down. Thank you, Miss Lansing. All right. Yes, the explanation had better be good. Oh, it will be, Mr. Clayton. And, uh, Mr. Holliday. Yes? I'll wager you've never written anything to match it. <laughs> well, we sat down. Mr. Mallory enjoyed his dinner. We didn't. I watched him a big man. His huge head was covered with a shock of iron gray hair that matched the mustache under his sharp thin nose. And he was charming and cultured. <laughs> in spite of the fantastic situation, we found ourselves listening to him after oh, dinner as we sat in the salon. The 18th dynasty was Egypt's greatest. Its pharaohs conquered and reconquered. Its art reached a beauty and subtlety never before or since reached. 
Ah, yes. Great people. But uh, maybe I'm boring you. Not at all, Mr. Mallory. You're very kind. And now, Mallory, the explanation. Of course, Mr. Waring. Well, Mallory? I'm choosing my words carefully, Mr. Clayton. They'd better be good. They will be. Miss Lansing, gentlemen, I investigated each of you before inviting you aboard my yacht. Mr. Waring? What? You advertised in the paper for a job, preferably in a foreign country, but you had no family. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. You answered my ad. Correct. Miss Lansing? Yes? You advertised for a companion position. You, too, have no family. I... No. I... And, Mr. Clayton, you ran an ad offering your services in any capacity. You're a uh, sort of a soldier of fortune, if you want to call it that. I shall. Lastly, Mr. Holliday. Box 13. Adventure wanted. We'll go any place, do anything. Yes, that, that's my ad. Now, does any one of you see a striking similarity? Oh, please, you must have. You mean the prolonged absence of any one of us would go, well, would go unnoticed? Exactly. All right, you're clever, Mr. Mallory. We'll admit that. You've got us in a spot where you could do anything. Now, would you mind telling us why? Mr. Holliday, you're a fiction writer. Have you ever written a story about a perfect crime? Crime? Don't be alarmed, Miss Lansing. Well, Holliday? No, I've never written one. But there have been perfect crimes, murders in which the killer has never been caught. Yes, I suppose so. Yet suppose someone knows the killer in such a murder. Then uh, it would no longer be perfect. What are you driving at? Just this. One of the four of you is a murderer. <laughs> what? A murderer? I use the word murderer in the sense that it can be either masculine or feminine. You know that? I do. One of you here is a killer. Twelve years ago, a man was killed. A friend of mine. The killer was never caught. I worked on it. I now have proof who that person is. Why didn't you go to the police? <laughs> Ten years ago, I would have. But now I'm in a position to enjoy myself. To watch the murderers squirm and wriggle. You're insane. What's to prevent us from jumping on me? My crew is well paid, loyal. They've been with me for years. Money is an effective silencer. You're a beast. Perhaps. Look, Mallory. The killer knows you've learned who he is. Or she. I'm not. Perhaps not, Miss Lansing, but uh, you were saying, Holiday. The killer knows you know his or her identity. What's to prevent him from killing you? My attorneys in the city have an envelope. In that envelope is the name of the person and all details. If I do not return within a certain time, that envelope will be opened. What's the time limit? Wouldn't you like to know, Mr. Waring? Oh, just a minute. I have a question, Holliday. Yes, I don't think you've finished your explanation. <laughs> I haven't. Here it is. In three days, we will dock at Havana. If by that time the killer's identity is not known to the other three of you, I will release all four of you. And the killer will go free? Yes. What if we do learn? I'm sure the killer will do all in his or her power to prevent that. How can we find that out? I will give clues. You will have to recognize them. Mm, I see. And if the killer realizes he's being trapped? Then he or she may kill to prevent that knowledge from getting out. And, Miss Lansing, gentlemen, I shall not lift a finger to prevent it. Do you think you can get away with this? Why, of course he can. You're very wrong, gentlemen. No one can prove you came aboard this yacht. No one knows. You'll stand by and see three people killed? The cleverest will survive. Now, here's your first clue. Are you ready? The Roman god, Janus. Janus? The Roman god? Yes. And now, good night. And may the cleverest among you live to see Havana. And now, back to one of these four. Another Box 13 adventure starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. So, there we were, the four of us. And one of us a murder. That's what Mallory said. Was he lying? If he wasn't, then he'd cook up a fantastic situation. After dinner that same night, I went to my cabin and sat down trying to figure out what the Roman god Janus had to do with a killer when... I'm in. May I come in, Mr. Holliday? Huh. Please do, Mr. Mallory. It's your yacht. Mind if I sit down? It is also your chair. 
<laughs> I like your sense of humor. I like yours. It's just like an open grave. Don't you think you could get a story out of this, Mr. Halliday? What else will I get out of it, Mallory? Do you believe my explanation? I don't know. Here. Take this. What? Here, what? take it. Take it. It's loaded, too. <laughs> Why the gun? To protect yourself. Against what? A whom? Against the murderer. <laughs> it is loaded, isn't it? Yes. Yes, and it's pointed right at you. So I see. But strangely enough, I'm not worried. That's to prevent me from forcing you to order the shot back to land. Your sense of adventure, your own willingness to see this through, your desire for a good story. Aren't you placing too high a value on your ability to judge people? I've made no mistake in you, Holliday. That's why I gave you the gun. You mean you're actually going through with this incredible thing? Yes. One of the other three is the killer. Miss Lancy, Mr. Waring, or Mr. Clayton. Suppose... Suppose none of us learns who the killer is. I intend to keep my yacht on the high seas until you do. But you said we'd be in the van in three days. We don't have to be. You had better be. Holiday, I have my own reasons for this incredible thing. I've come to you because I've watched you, listened to you. Of the four, you are the one who seems the most resourceful. You alone acted with calm and sense at dinner. Thank you, Mr. Mallory. Not at all, Mr. Holiday. Now I'll leave you alone. And, uh, Mr. Holliday, the cabin doors are no longer locked. They cannot be locked because the keys are gone. Good night. And that was that. Mallory's statement that the cabin doors were no longer locked meant that the killer, if there was one, could go and come freely. And whoever it was would be watching, waiting. Oh, Mallory was clever. He was safe because of that envelope with his attorneys. And the rest of us? Well, we'd have to do something to protect ourselves. It was midnight when I got up from the bed. I hadn't undressed. I'd kept my eyes on the door. Then I thought again about Janus. Janus, the Roman god. What kind of a clue was that? Well, I decided to find out. There were books in the main salon. Maybe, maybe I could learn something from them. I stepped into the passageway. It was dark. Not a light showing. I groped my way along the passage toward the main salon. I opened the door. Who's that? Mr. Holliday, is that you? Yes, what are you doing in here? I was afraid. I was in my cabin. I was afraid. I had to get out. It was so small, I felt as though... as though I'd smothered. But why did you come in here? I don't know. Why didn't you turn on the lights? Well, I tried to. I, I couldn't find the switch. Did you see anyone else? No. No one. You'd better get back to your cabin. No, I can't. I won't go back there. Mr. Mallory said the door couldn't be locked. Oh. Mr. Holliday, I didn't kill anybody. I didn't know some... Please. Please, get me off the shot. In the middle of an ocean? We can get a boat. We got to. You wouldn't have a chance in the world. Oh, but we'll, we'll all be killed. Come on, come on. I'd better get you back to your cabin. Come on. Oh, no, I won't go. I won't go. Now, don't get hysterical. That won't help. Please, please, help. No. What makes you think I can? You? You mean you won't help? I, I didn't say that. I... Oh, you. You're the murderer. You're the one. Oh. Oh. Quiet. Good advice, Miss Lansing. Be quiet. Mallory. The lights will go on in a moment. Turn them on now. I can't. The main switch is off. I had it turned off because... Ah, there we are. All right, turn off the main switch, Mallory. Added protection and... What's the matter? Who is that screaming? Ah, oh, Mr. Waring. Did Mr. Clayton come with you? Uh, yes. Yes, I'm here. Uh, what happened? Well, it seems that Mr. Holliday and Miss Lansing... Holliday? What about it, Waring? What were you doing in here? Yes. What were you doing in here? Perhaps he couldn't sleep. Just a moment. I walked to the bookshelves, wanted to for a moment while, while they all watched. It's still there, Mr. Holliday. What's still there? A book of mythology. Mythology? What are you talking about? Mr. Mallory gave the Roman god Janus as a clue. Now, Janus would appear in a book of mythology. Mm -hmm. Here it is. You're very clever, Mr. Holliday. Would you mind looking in the index for Janus? J-A-N-U-S. I can spell. Here you are. Page uh, 86. Turn to it. There, there's no page 86. That's right. Someone tore it out of here. Exactly. And that's the only book of mythology on board. 
It's obvious the killer took it out to prevent the others from finding the clue. In other words, the killer knew that reading that page would give him away. Yes, provided the reader was sufficiently acute. But uh, the killer forgot one thing. Yes, forgot what? He or she is the biggest clue of all. What do you mean by that? I mean, Mr. Waring, there's something about him or her that gives away the show and ties in with Janice. What is it, Mother? Find that out and you'll have the person, Mr. Clayton. Look at one another and remember what I said. Good night. Which one of us took that page from the book? He did. Now, read it deliberately so he could go on with this preposterous game. I wonder. So there was someone in here when I came in. You don't know who it was? No. I left the door open when I came in. I couldn't find the light switch. I I think someone slipped out when I came in. And you, Holiday? You were here? Yes. Yes, I was. What of it? What do you think? What were you going to do here, Holiday? I came here oh! to... Just turn off the lights again. I don't think that anyone should move. We'd better get back to our cabins. I don't like being in the dark with a killer. <laughs> The next morning on deck, I saw Waring standing at the aft rail. I stopped because he looked around as though seeing if anyone were near. Then he raised his arm and threw something into the sea. I wondered what it might be, and he turned quickly and came toward me. Oh, oh, hello, Holiday. Hello, Waring. Nice day, isn't it? I hadn't noticed. Has anything happened? I don't know, has it? <laughs> What's the matter with you? What did you throw overboard, Waring? Throw overboard? Me? Nothing. Look, Waring. We're all in this together. We've got to cooperate. One of us is a killer. I won't cooperate with anyone. Now, oh, let me get past. All right. All right, go ahead. You left me standing there. I walked toward my cabin down the passageway and opened the door. Clayton. For holiday. Well, I, I thought you were on deck. Well, I'm not. What are you doing in here? Well, I, I, I just... I wanted to see you. You can't find me in that drawer. <laughs> well, it, it was open when I came in. It was not? All right, it wasn't. So what? That's my question. What were you looking for? The missing page from that book. Stop lying. Uh, where did you get that gun? What are you going to do now? Please, don't. Get out of here. Go on, get out. I'm going to tell Mallory that you have a gun. Sat down. Things were moving fast. I thought about Catherine Lansing. She had been in the salon. I thought about Waring, who had thrown something overboard. And what he had thrown hadn't been paper, so it wasn't the page from the book. And I thought about Clayton searching my cabin. Hmm. Which of the three was the killer? By now, I believe Mallory's story. Then, then I remembered something, something about Janice. And it tied in with what Mallory had said. Tied in with the killer and something I'd seen. I left my cabin and hurried down the passage. I was almost to the end when... Oh! Any better, sir? Uh, who hit me? We don't know, Holiday. Uh, whoever hit me took the gun you gave me, Mallory. You, Mallory? You gave him the gun? What was the idea? Well, where is it now? That's what I'd like to know. Obviously, Mr. Holiday, the killer has it. That's right. <laughs> This is going to be an interesting lunch. You may serve, William. Very good, sir. Uh, Mallory, I... I know who has that gun. Of course you do, Mr. Holliday. Who is it? Miss Lansing, when were you born? What month? Month? <laughs> go ahead, Holliday. Go on. Well, Miss Lansing? Well, July. Why? Is that right, Mallory? That's right. Clayton. Uh, what is this? Answer the same question. Uh, December. He's telling the truth, Holiday. And Waring. When were you born? September. Is that right, Holiday? No, I don't think so. Waring, you were born in January, the month named after the Roman god Janus. Be careful, Holiday. What you threw overboard was a ring. A ring with a dark red stone. Your birthstone. A garnet. That's perfectly true, Holiday. Keep your hands on the table, all of you. And thank you for this gun, Mr. Holliday. You are not welcome. What do you intend to do, Waring? Kill all of us? I'm not that stupid. You killed my brother. Yes. But I'm not going to have Fan or anyplace else on this yacht. Now stay where you are. I'll shoot the first person who gets up from that tape. And I'll shoot to kill. Hey, William. No. Sit still. Let him go. Let him go? Yes. The crew has instructions to let anyone go. 
They won't see him take the lifeboat. They'll let him go. But he'll get away. I don't think so. He'll be picked up. You see, Miss Lansing, we haven't been many miles from shore. Now, shall we go on with our lunch? Miss Lansing, Mr. Clayton, you've been put to a lot of trouble. I hope these checks will make you feel happier. I think they will. Mr. Holliday, you got a story, I hope. Oh, yes, I did. You see, Mr. Holliday, I had to do it this way. I had no proof that Waring was the murderer. I spent ten years getting evidence, but no proof. I had a hope that he would break, put him under tension. But that envelope with your attorneys. Mr. Holliday, there was no envelope. <laughs> They picked up that wearing, huh? Yes. Mallory radioed the police. Hmm. If he'd kept quiet, no one would have known. Yes, I know. But Mr. Mallory is a very clever man. So are you. Well, thank you, Susie. Okay. What about that ticket on the liner? Oh, I never thought about that. Hey, Susie, maybe I can still use it. Here it is. Uh-oh. Mr. Holiday. Huh? What's the matter? Look. The date. The boat sailed yesterday. Oh, fine. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville, with this week's original story by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. Part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker, and production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. Box 13 is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, care of the Star Times. I should like very much to see you and offer a proposition which could be of mutual profit to us. Of course, there is some danger involved. But then, your advertisement asks for attention. So if you are interested, perhaps we could have lunch tomorrow afternoon. At one of them. at one o'clock, the Golden Arrow. Ask for Mr. Waring's table. <laughs> There's some danger involved, he said. Yes, that's what the man said. And, brother, that's exactly what he meant. And now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Daytime Nightmare. This letter invites you to lunch, Mr. Holliday. Uh-huh. Lunch and then what? Danger, it says. That sounds exciting. Mm, it always does. You know, Susie, someday I'm going to walk into one of these things and not walk out. Then follow up one of these other letters. There's one that asks for a babysitter. The woman says her children are an adventure. <laughs> oh, no, thanks. I'll take Mr. Waring's letter and his proposition. Then you'd better hurry. It's almost 12.30 now. Oh, don't push, Susie. Don't push. What time will you be back? Probably this evening. But don't wait for me. Just lock up the office and take off. So long, Susie. Golden Arrow is one of those ultra-ultra dining and luncheon spots where you can get a swell dollar lunch for five. I asked for Mr. Waring's table, and the waiter showed me to a nice secluded corner. A small orchestra was playing. A couple were dancing. And Mr. Waring was just sitting there. I took a good look at him before I sat down. He was big and handsome. 
Maybe about 50. The diamond he flashed on the little finger of his right hand was spelled with 1,500 capital dollars. He looked up, saw me standing there. How do you do? You're uh, Box 13? Yes, that's right. Go on, Mr. Waring. And you're right. Please, sit down. I've ordered lunch. I hope you approve. Oh, thanks. I'm sure I will. You're younger than I expected. Oh, disappointed? No, no, please. <laughs> Tell me, is uh, Box 13 the way you make your living? Oh, not quite. Yeah, I read your advertisement several times. Adventure wanted, go any place, do anything, write Box 13. <laughs> Is that said with disapproval? No, not at all, Mr. Uh, Dan Holliday. Huh. No, not disapproval, Dan. Just regret. Regret that I hadn't the nerve to do such a thing when I was your age. Well, sometimes the regrets are mine. Huh? Oh, oh, I see. You mean once in a while you get something that's hard to handle? That's it. But you've always come out on top. Well, I've had a lot of luck. Is there uh, any of it left? Do I need some? If you do what I ask, you will. What's on your mind, Mr. Warren? First, we'll have lunch. Then we'll talk. Will that be all right with you? If you say so. Yes. Good. Charles, you may bring our lunch now. Now, let's enjoy ourselves. There's lots of time to get serious after lunch. Well, Waring was a very good conversationist. I learned he was an attorney, an attorney for one of the biggest estates in the country. He kept leading the conversation around to that every time we got on something else. Then when lunch was over. Yeah. Enjoy it, Dan? Very much. Cigar? Oh, no, thank you. Now, if you'll come with me. Come with you? Well, I thought we were going to talk. Oh, I'd rather have more privacy. You'll understand why when I tell you what I have in mind. Oh, it's that important. Would you say $10 million was important? Mm, it commands attention, yes. <laughs> then please come with me. We left the Golden Arrow. The doorman saluted Waring and signaled a big limousine that sneaked up along the curb and purred to a stop. Please, get in, Dan. Uh, oh, pardon me. Where are we going? Oh, for a ride through the park. Uh, oh, wait, wait a minute. I, uh, I, I want to know what this is all about before I go into it. <laughs> You're not very trusting, are you, Dan? Yeah, it's not very. <laughs> uh, something wrong, Dan? Uh, yeah. I... Get in the car, Dan. A little air will make you feel better. But... Go on, get in. All right, Bert. You know where to go. I'd been drugged before, so I knew what it felt like. It felt exactly like this. I came crawling out of the long, dark tunnel with a buzzing in my ears, my mouth dry as cotton. I was lying down and I reached out my arms. I, I was on a cot. A nice white cot in a nice white room. I sat on the edge of the bed, looked around. There was a window. But there were bars over it. I went to the door. Hey. Hey, open up. Open this door. Open this door, somebody. Come on, open the door. Get away from the door. Get away from it. Open it up, whoever you are. Move back away from it and I will. Go on. I moved back and away. There was a pause and then... Well, Mr. Stokes, you've awakened at last. Stokes? What are you talking about? Come on, get me out of this gag or I'll break my way out. Samuel, you go. Huh? Now, Mr. Stokes... You don't want Samuel and Hugo to take care of you, do you? What is this? Sit down, Mr. Stokes. Please. Sit down. I won't sit down. Where's Waring? He'll be here in a moment. If you want to see Mr. Waring, I'm sure that can be arranged. Well, that's better. And call off those mastiffs in white coats. Wait outside, Samuel. Hugo. And close the door. Go ahead. I'll be all right. Stay where you are, Mr. Stokes. Look, if this is a gag, let's run it off the boards and put a tag to it. Gag? <laughs> Why, Mr. Stokes, you sound almost rational. Rational? What are you talking about? Just that. I've no doubt that in a year, perhaps a little more, we can discharge you. You mean... You mean this is no gag? No, it's not a gag. You're Edward Stokes. Remember that. You're Edward Stokes. Where's Larry? He'll be here to see you with your wife. 
My wife. Of course. I wonder if you remember her. I don't know what you're trying to get away with, but if I have to play rough, I can play. Samuel, you go. I think Mr. Stokes needs to be quiet. Take care of it, Samuel. Get them away from me. When you've decided to be more calm, Mr. Stokes, we can have a talk in my office. Until then, I shall take precautions against your homicidal tendencies. Well, it's no gag. Samuel and Hugo were too big for games and they played rough. Samuel left and Hugo sat beside the bed to watch me. I knew now where I was. In a sanitarium. Why? Why was I called in the I had to find out, so I turned to Hugo. What? Oh, Hugo, these straps are hurting me. <laughs> no thanks, Mr. Stokes. I can't loosen them for you. Look, uh, get my clothes, take out my wallet, take the money that's in it, and just let me get to a telephone. I'm sorry, Mr. Stokes. You know that's against the rules. Who was the man who spoke to me before? That's uh, Mr. Cordell. Mr. Not a doctor? Well, yes and no. This here's a kind of a... Uh, rest home. Huh. Does everyone get as much rest as I do? <laughs> You're all right, Mr. Stokes. That's pretty funny. Yeah, I'm dying. <laughs> Where are my clothes? No, 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 no. We'll get them for you later. Look, I'm not Edward Stokes. I'm Dan Holliday. Get it? My name's Dan Holliday. I'm a writer. Hmm. Well, swell. I'll, I'll bring you a pencil and paper. Later. Hugo, go to a phone. Call the number I'll give you and ask for Susie's. Has she uh, got a sister for me? <laughs> now, listen, you big lummox. This is a frame-up. I'm not Edward Stokes. I don't know who he is. I never even heard of him. I'm Dan Holliday, a writer. Yeah, okay, okay. I believe you. Once I took care of a man who was Shakespeare, I believed him. I also took care of Michelangelo, Dante, Spinoza. Why, I... Look, had... I, I want to see Cordell. What for? I want to talk to him. What about? Does that make any difference? Yeah, because if it's not important, they'll get mad at me. All right. Tell him... Tell him I remember now that I'm Edward Stokes. It all comes back to me. Now, did you go to him? Yeah, uh, okay, but please, Mr. Stokes, don't try what you did before. I... I hate to get rough. All right, I promise. Ah, it's a good boy. And keep on being a good boy, and you'll be allowed visitors this afternoon. I'll be very happy to see them. Very happy. All right, Mr. Stokes, I brought you to see Mr. Cordell like you asked. Now, promise you'll take it easy? Oh, sure. Thanks, Hugo. Uh, it's nothing. Uh, here he is, Mr. Cordell. Good. Close the door and wait outside, Hugo. You sure you'll be all right, Mr. Cordell? I think Mr. Stokes has learned his lesson. Mm, sure. Please be a good boy now. Yeah, I will, Hugo. So, you've become reconciled, Mr. Stokes. I know I can talk myself blue in the face to Hugo or anyone else around here and not get anywhere. But I want you to tell me what this is all about. I'll be glad to. You're Edward Stokes. You're here for a rest. You were formerly at the Millhaven Sanitarium, but your wife thought this would be a better place. Don't you remember? Really? Oh, of course I do. You've made it all so clear. Good, good. Oh, uh, by the way, you're looking so much better than when I saw you last, Mr. Stokes. Would you like to see how much better? What do you mean? There's a mirror on the door of that closet to your right. Open it and see how you can prove. I looked in the mirror. I didn't see Dan Holliday. I saw a stranger... Cordell's voice came to me from a million miles away. There's some gray in your hair, of course, but that's to be expected. As a whole, it's still a nice, deep, rich black. My hair's been dyed. Has it? I'll bet you think it was once blonde. I imagine you think your name was once Dan Holliday. Take a good look at yourself, Mr. Stokes. Get acquainted with your new personality. You'll be with it for quite a while. Cordell smiled at me. Then I knew for certain this was no joke. I was Edward Stokes. My hair dyed, clever touches of makeup here and there. Even Susie wouldn't have known me. Do you know why you've become Edward Stokes? Why, Mr. Cordell? Because Mr. Edward Stokes is dead. <laughs> Back 
to Daytime Nightmare, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holland. Well, there was a twist. I was a dead man, yet I was alive and being kept alive. But for what? Later in my room, I thought of making a break for it. But there was always Samuel and Hugo. Then later, I was taken again to Cordell's office. This time, Hugo went in with me. Cordell wasn't alone. With him were Waring and a woman. The woman looked at me as I entered. Edward. Oh, Edward, darling. Would you mind just calling me Dan? Oh, please, Edward. You remember me? Of course you remember your wife, don't you, Edward? Oh, hello, Waring. I must buy you lunch sometime. Lunch? Oh, oh, of course, of course. I told your wife and Mr. Waring that you were so much better, Mr. Stokes. But now you've disappointed me. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Cordell. Hugo, please wait outside. I'll call you if I need you. Sure, Mr. Cordell. Hey, he does look like Edward. Must you say it so loud, Philip? Oh, sorry. How long does this go on? Not much longer. Of course, it all depends on you. Yes, how? We'll leave that until later. Clarice. What? You've got to sign those transfer papers. They're all right? Of course. Oh, uh, Edward, it might be interesting for you to watch yourself being committed. I'm warning all of you. I'm going to get out of here. And when I do, I... And when you do, what? Where's the real Edward Stokes? How does he know about Edward? Cordell, did you open your mouth? What's the difference? He can babble his head off and no one will pay any attention. Suppose something goes wrong. How can it? It's all too perfect. Of course it is. Sign the papers, Clarice. Get it over with. Good. Now let's go. Nothing can go wrong. Not unless you double-cross me. You've got your money and you're in as deeply as anyone. You better see that everything goes all right. It will. Fine. Now goodbye, Edward, and good luck. Come along. Well, Mr. Stokes, you're now officially in my care. That should make everything just ducky. Oh, it will. If it's not asking too much, what happens now? My dear Mr. Stokes, if you knew, you wouldn't like it. What's to prevent me from reaching across this desk and knocking your head off just for the fun of it? This gun will prevent it. You wouldn't dare use it. No, not directly. But suppose you did try something. Suppose we struggled and the gun went off accidentally. Suppose it did. And killed you. Who would be your witness? Not you. He would be dead. Not Hugo, because he saw you attack me this morning. Cordell leaned back in his chair and grinned. Then he laid the gun on the desk. It was so close to me. So close. He knew what I was thinking because his grin widened. But I had to take the chance. I jumped. Stay right there, Cordell. All right. Now that you've got the gun, what will you do? Hand me that phone. Certainly. Here you are. Keep your hands on top of the desk. With pleasure. Uh, whom are you going to call? The police. All right. Go ahead. Hugo! Hugo! Stokes. Be careful, Hugo. He's raving. Hugo, you've got to believe me. I'm not Edward Stokes. I'm Dan Holliday. Give me two minutes to put through a phone call. No, 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 Mr. Stokes. You don't want to do anything with that gun. Better give it to me like a good boy. Hugo, please. Please stay back. Careful, Hugo. He may shoot. Stay back, Mr. Cordell. I can handle him. Hugo, listen to me. Listen to me. Give me two minutes on that phone. Just one minute. Mr. Stokes, give me that gun. Come on, give it to me. Wait, Hugo. Wait, I don't want to shoot. But I'll have to do it if you come any closer. Better not. Hugo, I'm in a spot. The real Edward Stokes is dead, Hugo. He's been killed by his wife and his attorney. Listen to me. Stand still and listen to me. Easy. Easy, Easy Mr. Stokes. Easy. The real Stokes has been killed. He was taken from the first sanitarium and killed. I was brought here, Hugo. Brought here to impersonate Stokes. Cordell wants me to shoot you, Hugo, so I can be killed legally. Sure, the Stokes. Sure. Hugo! I know all that, Mr. Stokes. But, but if you'll just... <laughs> Hugo. Hugo. I'm afraid you killed him, Stokes. Cordell, you shot the poor devil. Of course I did, Mr. Stokes. You shot him with another gun you just took out of that drawer. That's perfectly true, Mr. Stokes. Ballistics can prove which gun killed Hugo. That's true, too, Mr. Stokes. But who would think of ballistics in connection with a maniac? <laughs> Cordell stood there, smoking gun in his hand. 
Oh, it was a beautiful frame. In a second, the rest of the people in the place would crowd into that office. What chance would I have? None. I could sort myself into a ladder. Cordell put the gun back onto his desk. Well, Mr. Stokes, what now? I... I can prove I didn't shoot this gun. Think you'll get the chance? I'll be back. Get on the way. Be careful, all of you. Don't say after him. He's got a gun. He killed Hugo. Stay back. Let it go. Stay out of general alarm. I ran up into the night out into the rest of my nightmare. I cleared the grounds of the rest home and took to the woods. There was only one thing in my favor, the darkness. I stayed in the woods. But I had to get to a phone. <laughs> I don't know how long I walked. Maybe an hour, maybe two. Then I saw a house. There were lights in it. I hesitated, but I had to get to that phone. Did you worry? Yeah, yeah, it's me. A minute. Don't. Don't scream, please. Get back. Please. Please don't. Look, I'm not going to hurt you. I... I want to get to a phone. Have you got one? No. Uh, there's no phone here. Uh, where's the nearest one? The filling station down the road. Uh, have Have you got any men's clothes here? In, in the closet. Uh, would you mind getting them out? Go away, please. I, I won't tell anybody you've been here, but don't hurt me, please. Do, do you know who I am? The, the radio, they said. How long ago? Oh, half an hour, maybe. Get those clothes for me, please. Uh, get them. Uh, all right. It won't fit you. They're too small. I don't care about that. Throw them on the table there. Just trousers and coat. All right. I pulled the trousers and coat on over the pajamas I was wearing. The woman watched me and she watched the door. She was expecting someone. Wally, probably her husband. Then... Please, please go now. How far is that filling station? Oh, it's about two miles. Oh, there's no phone closer than that? No. All right, you stay in here. You're not going to get hurt. Just stay in here until you're sure I'm far enough away. Do you get that? Yes, sir. I won't move. Good. I'll return the clothes later. She screamed. I could hear her scream fading into the night as I ran. I had two miles to go, two miles to the brush and woods. I couldn't risk getting to the road. Then I heard something. I ran. I ran until my legs were torn by the brush. I ran until my breath choked in my throat. Then I saw the station, but I couldn't get to it. I crept close and lay down in the mud-filled ditch. I knew then what a fox must feel like with the hounds tearing at his heels. I listened. I heard Cordell's voice. To begin with, he's dark-haired, wearing pajamas. But he may have picked up some clothes somewhere. Well, I haven't seen anybody. Better be careful of him, Clay. He's got a gun. Already killed a man back at the home. Don't take no chances. Shoot to kill. I will, Sheriff. Thanks for warning me. Okay, Clay. Oh, uh, got a gun? Sure, always keep one in the station. Good. Keep your radio turned on, too. We're running bulletins on the air. That way you can tell if he's headed this way. Sure. See you later, Sheriff. Remember, he's dangerous. A homicidal maniac. Take no chances. Okay, Mr. Cordell. Thanks. Go on. I watched the attendant crate go back into the filling station. I watched him take a gun from a drawer and shove it into his pocket. I cut across the road. My stomach hurt from pressing it close against the concrete. Pate came out of the station, looked up and down the road. Then he turned off the lights and locked the door. Don't take another step. Don't look around. Don't reach for that gun in your pocket. What are you going to do? Nothing. You won't get hurt. I want to use the phone in the station. It's out of order. You're lying. I'm not lying. Why don't you try it? Where are the keys to the door? In my pocket. Keep your hands out of that pocket. You want the keys, don't you? Keep your back turned. I know that gun is in your coat pocket. The keys, does you? No, in my trousers. Reach in. Get them off. But be careful. Now, unlock the station door and go in ahead of me. Mind the license? Look, why don't you give me your gun? You haven't got a chance, fella. The roads are crawling with prowl cars. They were here just a minute ago. Yes, I know what I saw them. 
I reach in that coat pocket. Back to me. Reach in and take out that gun. All right. Hold it by two fingers and drop it on the floor. Go on. Now, stand over there while I use the phone. It's out of order, I told you. Stay where you are. Hello. Hello. I told you. What's another phone? The nearest one's about five miles down the road. You're lying. Like I was about this phone? Look, please, why don't you give up? Give me that gun, we'll go into town. Please. They'll shoot you down on sight if, if you leave here alone. I've got to take that chance. No, you don't. I want to give you a break, fella. I want to give you a break because... Because? Once I saw a dog shot. A dog they all said was mad. It wasn't mad. All it wanted was water. But they shot it without giving it a chance. Please, give me your gun. Look, if I tell you a story, you won't believe it. I know you won't. Maybe I will. Go ahead. I'm... I'm not Edward Stokes. I'm not the man they're hunting for. He's dead. Killed by his wife and his attorney. What? I think because they want his estate. If I'm killed as Stokes, they'll identify me as him. Please, give me the gun. You... You don't believe me, do you? I believe only that if you leave here and get out on that road, you'll be shot down. I... I... You're hurt. Never mind. Get me to a phone. I can't. All right, here. Take the gun. Take it. What's the way, fella? Now you've got the gun. I want you to do one thing. Get me to a phone. Let me call the police. Let me identify myself, will you? Come on. I've got a car. They got me to a phone. I called Lieutenant Kling and told him the story. And less than an hour later, the sheriff, his men, Clayton, and I walked into Cordell's office. Ah, you've got him. Good work, Sheriff. Yeah, we got him. Uh, I'm surprised you took him alive. Yes, yeah, so are we. Mind stepping over here a minute, Mr. Cordell? Uh, what, what for? Get over. What is this? You'll find the gun that killed Hugo in that drawer, Sheriff. What? What? Well, 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 this man's mad, Sheriff. I heard different from the city. Look out. Hey, take you easy, Cordell. Get that gun, Sheriff. Get it here. Yeah. That's the gun that killed Hugo, not the one I gave Clayton. <laughs> you were right, Mr. Cordell. No one would have thought of ballistics to see which gun had killed Hugo. And now I think I need a bath and a nice long rest. <laughs> were arrested on suspicion of murder. Police are searching for the body of Edward Stokes. Gee, Mr. Holliday. Well, it wasn't nice, Susie. But let's forget it. Sure. I know what you mean. Oh, oh say, I have to remind you. Uh, of what? You've got a luncheon appointment today at... Luncheon? The... Oh, no, Susie. Next week, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Dear Dan, knowing your Box 13 angle, I hope what I have to offer is intriguing enough to tempt you. At least I think it can be interesting. As a matter of fact, Dan, this thing has got to the point now where it's becoming downright vicious. It scares me a little. What the thing is, I'll tell you when and if I see you. If you can drag yourself away from town... Consider this letter an invitation to join me at the country home of Bernard Trendler, my cousin. Enclosed are the directions for getting there. I'll meet you at the station. Wire me first, as ever, Alex. Yeah, it sounded harmless and simple. Two words I'd never apply to murder. And now, back. 
back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Death is No Joke. I don't think you should go, Mr. Holliday. And why not, Susie? Well, every time you accept an invitation like this, something bad happens to you. Susie, every time someone reads that ad in the Star Times, it means trouble. <laughs> but here I am, still alive and kicking. You just better watch out. You're not intolerable, you know. Well, thanks, Susie. But did you mean intolerable? Well, sure. Uh, like Achilles was after he was dipped in the river Sphinx. Oh. <laughs> it was the sticks, and you mean invulnerable. Oh, intolerable, invulnerable. You could get hurt. <laughs> okay, we'll see. Oh, by the way, did you send that wire to Alex? Oh, of course I did. Oh, good girl. Well, expect me when you see me. So long, Susie. Alex, how are you? Dan Holiday. So you're still alive. Huh? Oh, why not? It's a good idea. <laughs> is this your luggage? Oh, yes, yes. Just that flat. Good. My car is just around the other side of the depot. This way. Am I supposed to ask what you let him in? Or do I wait until you get ready to tell me? Wait till we get into the car. That's it. Blue convertible. Well, you've done all right. <laughs> There's no motor under the hood. <laughs> Hop in. How's Ruth? Oh, great. Any children yet? No, not yet. Oh, now, look, I thought you'd have about five by now. <laughs> Maybe. What's on your mind, Alex? You're worried about something. Yeah, I don't know whether I am or not, Dan. Look, uh, maybe asking you to stick an oar in this was, well, presuming upon friendship. That's what friendship's for? Yeah, it's up to the point. Okay, let's get to the point. Well, it's practical jokes. I knew you'd look blank at that. Uh, I'm glad I didn't disappoint you. But what's the angle? Practical jokes. Go ahead. Ruth and I are guests at Bernard Trendler's. He's my cousin. You ever heard of him? Oh, yes, yes. Showed up not too long ago to claim a fortune, didn't he? Yes, that's right. He ran away from home when he was 17. He was gone 15 years. Now, recently, his father, that's my uncle, he died and left the entire Trendler fortune to him. If he hadn't been found, it would have been divided among the rest of us. But he showed up and claimed it. So, where did the practical jokes come in, and why? Ruth and I have been here for a week and a half now. Every day, there have been two or three practical jokes played. At first, they were ordinary, not very funny, just amusing. But... But what? And now they're getting vicious, mean, contemptible. Well, how do you mean that? Just that way. Hmm. Who's the funny man? We don't know. Any idea? No. Nope. That's why I've asked you to come up. Oh, and look, Dan. Don't let on I told you. Let me do the talking when I introduce you and take your cues from me, huh? I see. I'm to be the silent observer. Is that it? Well, figure it out for yourself. Could I or anyone else call in the police? No. Because no one's been hurt. Yet. Hey, you say that as though you expect trouble in large chunks. I do, Dan. I do. Somebody's going to get hurt. And badly. Alex drove on to the Fenwick place. There was nothing else he could tell me about the practical jokes. Then we pulled up before we got to the house. Because a tall, thin man was walking down the drive. Alex stopped the car and spoke softly to me. There's Bernie Trendler coming down the drive. Uh, what do I say or do? How do I explain my presence? I'll leave that to me. Just take the cues as I throw them. Uh, Bernie! Hey, Bernie! Alex? Is that you, Alex? Yeah. We'll get out of here. I'll pick your back later. I've been looking for you, Alex, and, uh... Oh, I beg your pardon. Bernie, I'm afraid I'm guilty of a guest's worst crime. Dragging in a friend. Oh, nonsense. Don't talk like that. <laughs> Dan, this is my cousin Bernie Trendler. Bernie, Dan Holliday. How do you do? Fine. You? I'm sorry I barged in like this, but I, but I haven't seen Alex in quite a while. Dan's a writer, Bernie. I thought he might, uh, well, stop over a day or so. He's, um, he's going away soon. That right, Dan? Huh? Oh, yes, I'm going away. Oh, of course it's all right. Plenty of room. Oh, well, thank you. It's very nice of you. Uh, that's all. Now, uh, if you'll excuse me, I've got to see the gardener about a couple of things. Uh, Alex, have Elsie show Dan his room. Sure thing. Thanks, Bernie. Not at all. Uh, glad to have you, Dan. So that's Bernard Trendler. Why do you say it like that? Like that? As though you didn't believe it. Oh, I gave you that idea. Well, I don't know. Any man who's inherited a $20 million fortune has no right to look that worried. He has. Huh? What's that mean? There are two people in this house who hate him. Hate him enough to kill him. <laughs> Well, with that, 
that, Alex took me into the house. The maid showed me to my room, and, well, I saw no one else until later that afternoon. Then I walked into the library on the ground floor. There were two people seated there. I stopped at the door. Well, hello. <laughs> Who are you? Oh, my name is Holiday, Dan Holiday. I'm looking for Alex. Oh, he's looking for Alex, Martha. All right, let him look for Alex. Have you tried looking under some rocks, Mr. Ruck? Uh, Mr. Ruck? Oh, Holiday, Dan Holiday. Oh, did you just arrive? Just after lunch. Too bad. The lunch was horrible. You didn't help it, Martha. I didn't try to, Henry. You don't have to try, my dear. Well, I suppose we may as well introduce ourselves. I'm Henry Trendler. This is my wife, Martha. How do you do? I'm Bernie's cousin. Oh, I- I've met Mr. Trendler. Isn't that nice? Henry, I'm going down to the lake. Well, don't go out too far, my dear. I don't know how to swim, my dear. Yes, I know that. Goodbye. Uh, nice to have met you, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh... Holiday. Oh, she remembers Mr. Holiday. It's just one of her irritating little tricks. Oh, oh, I see. She's an attractive woman. Is there any chance you might fall in love with her? Fall in love with her? Why, I... Why do you ask that? I'll agree to a divorce immediately. Am I supposed to laugh at that? <laughs> Anything you like. You staying long, Holiday? One or two days. That's quite enough. Of course, with such lovely people around, I may decide to postpone my departure until this evening. <laughs> oh, you love us once you get used to us, Holiday. How glad it takes a little doing. Hello there. Well, I see you two have met. Yes, we've met, Alex. Oh, where's Martha? Well, she's gone to the lake. Well, I think I'll take a little walk. Nice to have met you, Holiday. Thank you. See you later. Well, then, charming people, lovely people. In fact, I've never met two such delightful personalities. <laughs> Means you've met Martha, too. Oh, yes. And, um, what do you think? Well, if I'd known, I'd have brought my two-edged sword, the big one. Dan, maybe you'd be a little sour if you had 20 million slip away from you like we have. Ah, if Bernie Trender hadn't shown up, you, Henry, and Martha would have had the whole watermelon. Seeds and all. But now, Ruth! Dan, that was Ruth. Miss White, where is she? I left her in her room. Come on, Ruth! Ruth! Miss White! At the end of the hallway. Ruth, darling, what's the matter? My closet in there! Stay with her, Alec. I'll see what it is. Now, dearest, it's all right. Please, it's all right. Alec, come over here. No, don't go, Alec. Don't go. Stay with me a while, Ruth. Look. Ew. Dan, kill it. No, it, it, it's harmless. It's a black snake. Harmless? Close the closet door until we can get a sack for it. Ew. Alex, is, is this the kind of practical joke you meant? This is the kind they're getting to be. I see. Ruth. It's all right now. Come on, let's get out of the room. Well, well, what's all the fuss? Take a look in that closet, Alex. Let her look. I'm willing to bet she put it there. You're more incoherent than usual, Alex. Mr. Holiday. What? What's in the closet? A snake. Really? Well, how nice for Ruth. I'll slap that smirk off your face. Bravo, Alex. I've been thinking about it for years. Well, Henry, this is the first indication I've had that you could think for years. Oh, stop it. Stop it, Alex. Get out of here, Alex. Hurry. Come on, darling. Now, what's all the excitement? It seems that Ruth found a snake in her closet. Oh, I, uh... I thought you went to the lake. You do a great deal of thinking, don't you? When I have to. Then stop thinking about me. Did you put that snake in there? I never touched the thing. Sorry. Were you at the lake? That, Mr. Holiday, is none of your business. I'll leave you to your snake. <laughs> oh, does something strike you funny, Henry? Yes. You should feel really flattered, Holiday. Flattered of I. My wife remembered your name. <laughs> lovely household. Hate dripped from the rafters. I could feel it. Well, why should anyone take it out in stupid, vicious pranks such as that snake in his closet? Why? It was before dinner that I decided to take a walk with Alex. He talked. I listened. First, it was amusing. A frog in one's bed, clothes missing from the bathhouse at the lake, wild, incredible phone calls for all of us. How long has this been going on, Alex? It's just about a week now. Have you any idea who it is? None. But why, then? Why should anyone want to frighten Ruth out of her wits? Does Martha hate Ruth? Martha hates everyone. Martha's a chronic congenital hater. What does she have against Ruth? I said, not a thing in the world. 
Has everyone been a victim of these pranks? Yes. Then they've got to stop. Yeah, I can see what you mean. Oh, how's Ruth? Yeah, she's all right. We changed rooms. She won't go near the one we had. Uh, it was a harmless snake. Obviously, no one meant to harm Ruth. Oh, no. Just frighten her after that. How don't you leave, Alex? As a potential heir, that'd be a little ridiculous, wouldn't mm-hmm. it? I see. What about Henry and Martha? <laughs> they won't leave. Not as long as they can stay here free. Mm. Well, look, you say these things started about a week ago. Are you sure? Yes. They started just like that. No warning, no talk of pranks or jokes. No. And they're getting worse. Vicious. I give up. No, Dan, please. Well, what do you want me to do? Obviously, the person or persons doing these things won't admit it. Apparently, he or she intends to go on with it until... Go on? Until... Until what? Until the person gets to the real reason. The real objective of his viciousness. Who, Dan? Who? The person he or she means to kill. And now, back to Death is No Joke. Another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Maybe I was right. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe no one wanted to kill anyone. And there was nothing we could go to the police about. What do you say in a case like this? Somebody's playing jokes? Now, what about my host, whom I hadn't seen since my arrival? Well, I saw plenty of him that same evening after dinner. There were five of us in the library. Alex and Ruth, Henry and Martha and myself. What little conversation there had been was down to an occasional cough. Everyone was as jittery as a rookie pitcher facing the Yanks for the first time. Then... I'm glad all of you are together for a change. Oh, Bernie, how nice to see Sit you. Sit still. What's the matter, Bernie? You look mad. I am. What's all that? A book and some pictures. Oh, oh hey, where no. you are, Henry? Oh, very well. This evening, when I went to my room after dinner, I discovered someone had been there before me. Oh, Bernie. It could have been you, Cousin Martha. Oh, please, not in front of Henry. Oh, what difference does it make? Shut up! What are you getting at, Bernie? Look, this is an old high school annual of mine. Oh, no, not that. Next, you'll bring out the albums. If I remember correctly, you were the only baby who managed to look positively gruesome lying on a table. I said shut up. Sorry. What about that annual, Bernie? Every single picture of me has either been defaced or cut out. What? Well, let's see. Keep your hands off. Yes, but I only want... Now, look, Bernie. All right, then. Every picture. Cut out or the face. That's right. And these pictures were hanging in my room and in the study. Look. Oh, you've been cut out of all of them. And I want to know who did it. Now speak up. Which one of you was it? I swear if I find out, I'll tear his throat out. No one moved or said a word. Bernie Trendler's face was as white as a sheet. His eyes crinkled into slits that glared from one of us to the other. I looked at the others. They were scared. Yes, even Martha was afraid to open her mouth. Then after a few seconds... I warn you, I warn you, whoever's doing this, unless it's stopped and stopped immediately, I'll do something about it. Do you hear? I want to stop! Bernie, please, you're frightening me. Uh, I'm sorry, Ruth. I I think I'm going to bed. If you're doing these things, Martha, take my warning seriously. If I were doing them, Bernie, they'd be worse than they are. Good night. And if I find any snakes, I'll let you know. I want to get out of here. I want to go home. Ruth, everything will be all right. I can't stand any more of this. I want to get out of here. All them hating each other. Ruth. It's true. Maybe she's got some. I have. You hate Bernie. You hate my... Ruth, stop it. Stop it. Take her upstairs, Alex. Go ahead, please. All right. Come on, Ruth. Come on. Well, I guess the party's over. I'll turn in, too. Just a moment, Henry. Yes? I hope you know I meant what I said. (laughs) Why, look at me. Get out of here. Go to your room. Thank you. I will. Good night. And close the door after you. Uh, I'm sorry for that display of temper holiday. This nonsense has been too much. I don't suppose you have any idea who's behind it. No, but this is the last straw. I wonder if there'll be any more. Why do you say that? I wonder if this is the last joke. It had better be. Suppose it's not. Then I'll send for the police. And tell them what... That someone's been playing jokes. They're facing and ruining these books and pictures is vandalism. They meant quite a bit to you, didn't they? Of course they did. High school annual and photographs. 
Oh, when were the pictures taken, Bernie? Oh, years ago, 15, 16 years ago, when I was in high school. Why? I was just thinking. It's very strange that only those photographs of you in athletic costumes should have been destroyed. What? Let me see. You're right. Odd. Very odd. Oh, uh, here's one of you that hasn't been destroyed. Well, let me look at it. <laughs> 17 years old. What happened when you were 17, Bernie? What do you mean? Just that. Nothing. Nothing that I can remember? But something that someone else could remember. What the devil are you talking about, Holiday? I don't know yet. Maybe I'll find out. Not being able to sleep, I went for a walk in the moonlit garden. Suddenly I heard voices. A man's and a woman's coming from the garden house. I walked closer. I don't know why I agreed to meet you out here in the first place. Oh, you don't. Yes, and I think so. What do you want? Just a small, tiny cut of the 20 million. What makes you think I'd give it to you? What makes you think you won't? Lots of things. <laughs> How big a fool do you think I am? That's up to you. How big a fool can you make of yourself? Not quite as big as I can make of you. I saw that venomous mind of yours. Money. I don't mean that. Oh, 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 you were a fool, Bernie. A fool to bring that book and those pictures downstairs tonight. Oh, I was a fool. Why? Don't forget that I used to visit this house as a child. I remember lots of things my stupid husband doesn't. And things other people don't remember. Such as? Well, let's put it this way, Bernie. Let's say, in those days you were more ghosts than you are now. Why, you told us to kill you for that. You would try to kill me, wouldn't you? With pleasure. But don't try it, Rennie. Because if you do, you'll be found out. What do you want? I told you. Think it over, cousin. You have until tomorrow morning. She left the garden house and passed me. I stood in the shadows and watched her. There was a little smile on her face. Then I looked toward the garden house. Barney Trendler stood in the doorway. A shaft of moonlight struck across his face. And if ever a face showed murder, it was his. Why don't you tell me where you're going, Dan? I can't, Alex. I, I can't until I'm sure of what I think I know. What's all the mystery? Oh, snakes and phone calls and torn out pictures. You want to ride into town, is that it? Uh, yeah, uh, that's right. Just drive me in. Okay. Let me in on something, will you? You have to let me in on something first. What? Had anyone seen Bernie Tendler before he showed up and claimed the money in the estate? Not for 15 years. Why? Who identified him? The lawyers. He had all the necessary stuff. You know, papers, letters to my uncle. I see. Now, uh, where's the high school he went to? We're just outside of town. What the devil are you getting at? Where had Bernie been before he showed up to claim the estate? South America, he said. Uh-huh. Okay, take me to that high school. What's the matter? I... Dan, something's wrong with the brace. Try the emergency. No good. Dan, we're picking up speed on this hill. Try to shift him to second. Compression of the engine will hold it back. Stay close to the left. Don't get near the embankment. What if someone's coming up the hill? We've got to take that chance. Where's the nearest side road? Yeah, there isn't any. No turn-offs. Keep your hands on the wheel. That emergency's no good. Have you got any pedal at all with the foot brake? None at all. Look, scrape the side of the hill on the left. Go in easy. That'll slow us down. Yes, but Dan, we... Do it. It's our only chance. Okay. Again. Keep close and keep scraping. Dan, where are you going? Look. Someone cut through the brake fluid lines. What? But well, Dan, you're crazy. Why should anyone want to cut through Did the brake? Did you tell anyone we were coming to town? Sure, everyone knew it. Oh, that's great. Alex, you stay here and warn people away from this. Where are you going now? I'm going to high school. Well, I was right. I had to be right. 
After I left the high school with the information I'd found, I went to the sheriff's office. Told him my story and piled into his car. Pick up Alex on the way back and then... Friend of the house. Here's Ruth. Ruth! Ruth! Better stay close, Sheriff. Alex, you're going so long. Never mind that. Where's Bernie? Bernie? Well, I don't know. Why? Hello, everybody. What's all the fuss? Hi, you, Sheriff. What are you doing? Henry, where's Bernie? Bernie? He and Martha went out on the lake. The lake? Yes, they went rowing. She can't swim. She's in a boat. She doesn't have to swim. That's what you think. Alex, is there a boat we can use? There's a speedboat tied up at the wharf. Well, come on, let's go. What you told me? I'm positive. We've got to get to them before there's a murder. A murder that looked like an accident. Now, there they are. Get more speed out of this. I can't, Dan. Barney? Barney! Look, he's going for shore. Cut in ahead. I'll try to. Cut him off. Where's Martha? Lying in the boat. Cut in faster, Alex. Faster. That's it. Don't let him get to shore. Get on. Get on here, Mr. Kill. Get on. He's jumped for shore. Now, what if he gets away? Buddy, we can be picked up later. Get to Martha. Martha! Martha! Keep this boat alongside. You all right, man? Yeah, it's just knocked out. He got away. Now he can't get far. Bernie. Oh, Bernie, don't. I... I don't want to tell him. It's all right, Martha. He's gone. Oh. Martha, Martha, you're all right now. He was going to kill me. Yes, I know he was going to kill you. Because you knew he wasn't the real Bernie Trembler. He hit me. And I... I saw him start to... But I... I couldn't do anything about it. Are you uh, all right now, Martha? I mean, uh, are you all right? She's all right, Henry. I'll get it. It's probably the sheriff. I Hello? I suppose I should oh, thank yes, you, Mr. Holliday. Well, it might be nice. All thank right, you. Goodbye. They got him. Alive? Yes. You're right, Dan. Will someone please explain all this? The real Bernie Trendler is probably dead. Killed by the man who passed himself off as the real Bernie. Uh... Isn't that right, Martha? I don't know anything about it. Martha? Oh, all right. I knew he wasn't the real Bernie last night. And you realized the pictures were defaced, cut out? Yes. Bernie Trendler was left-handed. What? Of course, that's right. Why, I remember now. You see, all those practical jokes were leading up to the destruction of the pictures. He couldn't get rid of them without attracting attention and suspicion. So he took the elaborate way out. The jokes would have stopped once he'd destroyed those pictures. But what about the high school, Dan? I, uh, I saw pictures there of the real Bernie in a baseball uniform with a baseball glove on his right hand. But well, how could he hope to get by with a fraud? Well, he did. Remember, the real Bernie was missing for 15 years. But what made you think of it, Dan? I mean, the left-handedness. Well, uh, let's say the real Bernie was gauche in those days. Oh, what's the matter, Martha? Uh, nothing. Nothing at all, I hope. Oh, gauche is French for left, isn't it, Martha? Yes. Yes, it is. Well, is there anything else to tell? Why are you two looking at each other like that? Well, I... I was just wondering how much I have to thank Mr. Holliday for. Well, let's say you've already thanked me for everything. Place and someone tries to kill you. Mm-hmm. Tried to by cutting the brake lines because he thought I'd guess. Oh, and just think, those two nasty people will get all that money. Oh, not all. Alex will get his share, which is all I care about. And you didn't tell what you heard in the garden house. Now, why should I, Susie? Well, I think that's carrying Chevrolet too far. Chevrolet? 
<laughs> Good night, Susie. Next week, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, care of the Star Times. If your advertisement is on the level, I think you'll find this worth your time. Be in the Quan Hai shop in Chinatown at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Pretend you want to buy some jade. Reject the first two pieces offered, then mention the Hang Lee piece in the window. Buy the Hang Lee. This will be worth a lot of money to you. Remember, it's the Quan Hai shop. Quan Hai shop in Chinatown. That was the letter. No signature. It sounded interesting, and it was. If you like murder. And now back to The Treasure of Hang Lee, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. I don't get it, Mr. Holliday. Why should you reject the first two pieces? Ah, that's what makes the letter interesting, Susie. Why reject the first two pieces and then mention the Hang Lee piece? All right. Why? Hmm. I think I've got an idea. What is it? Pretty obvious, Susie. Look, the letter doesn't say anything about identifying myself, does it? No, it doesn't. Well, if I follow instructions, follow them exactly, I'll be tipping myself to someone in the store. Do you get it? Oh, sure. Whoever wrote the letter will be there, too. Waiting for you to follow instructions. That's a great deduction. And I did it all myself, too. You sure did. Okay, Susie, I'm going to make like Marco Polo and visit our Chinese friends. It took me a half an hour to drive to Chinatown and another ten minutes to find the shop of Quan Hai. I looked in the windows. There was the usual line of stuff. Back scratchers, Quan Yens, bamboo trinkets... Red lacquer bowls, but only one piece of jade. It was roughly square and seemed to have been broken. It, it looked like a part of a bigger piece. So I went into the shop. There were six or seven other people besides myself, and, well, they were looking at curios, and no one paid any attention to me. Then a young Chinese clerk smiled and came over to me. Oh, yes, sir. Can I help you, please? Oh, yes, I, um, I want to buy a piece of jade. Yes, sir. You want a certain color? Well, I don't know. This is a very nice piece, sir. It is what we call the mutton fat color. It's very nice, but not quite what I want. A ring, perhaps? Cough links? A snuff bottle? Mm, I don't know. You see, it's for a gift. Oh, this piece is very fine, sir. And the carving is excellent. But it is not very old. Oh, uh, there's a piece in the window. The only piece. What is that? The piece in the window, sir? Yes, it's a hang leaf piece, isn't it? Well, if you will please to follow me, sir. This way, please. If you please, sir, in here, I will send for Mr. Kwan. You will please excuse me now, sir, the other customer. Yeah, sure, thank you. It is nothing at all. He went out, and I heard a key turn in the lock of the door. For a moment, I was left alone in a room that was different from the rest of the store. Very different. Instead of the usual junk that tourists buy, this room was a treasure house. Rose quartz, wonderful jade screens, beautiful porcelain bowls that seemed to be lighted from inside. Lacquerware that shone like satin in the dim light. I was looking around me when... Good afternoon, sir. Oh, oh how do you do, Mr. Kwan? I am Mr. Kwan. Please to sit down, sir. Thank you. May I help you, Mr... Mr... My name is Holiday, Dan Holiday. I am honored, Mr. Holiday. Uh, your clerk told me I'd have to see you about that Hang Lee jade in the window. Yes, that is true. You want that piece, Mr. Holiday? Yes, I'd, I'd like to buy it. One moment. It is strange. That Hang Lee piece has lain in the window for two weeks now. You are the first to ask for it. I, uh, well, I saw it and liked it. Of course. You are a man of excellent taste. 
It is a very fine piece. Incredibly ancient. Uh, the Hangley piece, Mr. Kwan. Thank you, love. That is all. Yes, Mr. Kwan. Does he always lock the door when he leaves this room? There are very valuable things in this room, Mr. Holliday. Oh, I see. But the Hang Lee piece, is it valuable, Mr. Kwan? Yes, Mr. Holliday. So valuable that there is no price on it. Odd that you should ask for it. You have no idea how odd. It is a piece of a larger work, a 12 inches by 12 inches to be exact. This is only one third of the original. May I see it? Certainly. Hmm. It looks like a wonderful piece of jade. Do you know what Confucius said about jade? Well, I seem to have heard quite a few things Confucius was supposed to have said. But I doubt if any of them would fit the bill just now. Uh, y yes. But Confucius said that jade is like truth. It gives out a bright rainbow. And it shows a pure spirit among the hills and streams. Truth gives out a bright rainbow. Mm -hmm. That's a very pretty figure of speech, Mr. Kwan. Yes. Truth is very often a figure of speech. Is it not, Mr. Holliday? Yes, I'm afraid you're right. But about this piece? Ah, yes. You will note the carving. Very beautifully done. These are Chinese characters, aren't they? Yes. It is too bad the other two-thirds of the entire piece are missing. Oh? Why is that? I mean, beyond the fact that it seems a shame to ruin such a magnificent thing. A uh, foolish old Chinese legend, Mr. Holliday. It says that he who translates the writing will be led to a treasure beyond all price. But you'd have to have all three pieces? You would need all three pieces. And where are the other two? I do not know. Mm, I see. Well, Mr. Kwan, how much for this piece? Mr. Holliday, it has no price. You mean it's not for sale? It is not for sale. But I don't understand. It was in the window. And yes, I... and no one inquired about it. Perhaps because collectors would not be interested in a broken piece. That could be. But that still doesn't explain why you had it in your window. And yet, not have it for sale. Because, Mr. Holliday, the piece is yours. I beg your pardon. What did you say? The hungly piece is yours. There is no price on it. But I can't take it without paying for it. You ask for it? Of course I did, Mr. Kwan, but I'm prepared to pay for it. I am sorry. There is no price. The piece is yours for the taking. Hmm. Well, suppose someone else had come in and asked for it. Would you have given it to anyone? Only to one who asked for it by name, as you did. I don't understand. Truth, Mr. Holliday, is a figure of speech. I have told you the truth. The hungly piece is yours. Please take it. Now, if you will excuse me... Just a moment, Mr. Kwan. Suppose I refuse to walk out with this. It is a matter of indifference to me. Then, as a matter of curiosity, how much is the piece worth? That depends upon who has it. And that means what? That is hard to say. To a collector, the Hangley piece would be worth uh, perhaps no more than a hundred dollars. To you, it is worth what you make it. To me... To me, it is priceless. Ah, here is Lun. Lun, please show Mr. Holliday to the door. His business here is concluded. It will be great honor, Mr. Kwan. Just so. Well, goodbye, Mr. Holliday. And may the bat roost upon your roof. May the what rest for where? The bat is a Chinese symbol for good fortune. <laughs> goodbye. Please to come with me, Mr. Holliday. You're sure you won't change your mind, Mr. Kwan? About what? The Hangley piece. It is yours. Perhaps we shall meet again, Mr. Holliday. Oh, wait. Just a minute, Mr. Kwan. I... He is gone, Mr. Holliday. Now, if you will please to follow me. All right. Thanks. Is there anything else you wish, Mr. Holliday? Yes, I think there is. And that is? I wish someone would tell me why I advertise for adventure and get mixed up in things like this. Oh, goodbye. So, with the Hang Lee piece tucked under my arm and a great big question mark tucked under my hat, I left Quan Lee's place. For a moment, I stood in front of the store. No one followed me out, although I knew that whoever had sent me the letter was watching. So I drove home and waited in my apartment. 
I didn't wait long. Hello? Miss Holliday? Yes, it is. I'm the one who sent you the letter. Bring the Hangley piece to 721 South Ferry Street, room 6. Oh, uh, just a minute. How do you know I've got the piece? I was in the store this afternoon. Mm-hmm. And why didn't you ask me for it there? You're wasting time. Please bring the Hangley piece. You won't be sorry. Oh, was that address again? 721 South Ferry Street, room 6. And the name? You've got all you need to know. I'll be waiting. Well, well, well. All right, Mr. South Ferry Street. We'll see what you have to offer. Please go back in, Mr. Holliday. Oh, I've got company. Please go back. Sit down. I, uh, I just got up. Sit down. Oh, thank you. Won't you? You're... You're much younger than I thought you'd be. Oh, is that so? Well, keep pointing that gun at me and I can age ten years. You have quite a sense of humor for a murderer. Murder? Well, this is news. Go on, Miss... uh... Loring. Greta Loring. How do you do? Doesn't the name Loring mean anything, Mr. Holliday? Beyond the fact that it belongs to a very pretty girl holding a very ugly gun, I'm completely at loss. Lying seems to be another of your doubtful accomplishments. Oh, yes, I'm very talented, but I'm no good at puzzles. You see, I give up too easily. I had a hard time finding you, especially since you changed your name. No, this is news. I'm a murderer, a liar, and I'm living under an alias. This afternoon you gave yourself away by getting the Hangley Jade from that shop. Sooner or later I knew I'd trace you through that piece of jade. Oh, so you were there too? I've watched that shop for days waiting for you to get the Hangley. And now that I've got it? I'm going to take it. Then kill you. In uh, that order, I suppose. Give it to me. It's right there on the table in front of you. It was a long time ago that you killed my father. I was a little girl then. Lady, how you've grown up, complete with a gun and a murderous desire to kill me. I've had that desire for a long time. Ever since I found my father dead. Murdered. Go on, Miss Loring. What then? You know as well as I do. And being charming and flip won't help. Now look, Miss Loring, maybe you've got the wrong man. Have you thought of that? After all, you said I seem to be much younger than you thought I'd be. All I know is that you went after the Hangley Jade. No one else in the world but you would want that piece. No one else would know what it means. That's circumstantial evidence, Miss Lawrence. Stay where you are. We're through talking, Mr. Holliday. Or shall I call you Benson? You can call me anything you like, but think before you squeeze that trigger. I've thought quite a lot. Now, I'm going to take the Jade. All right. Here. Take it. Giving it to me won't solve everything. Stay there. No, don't. <laughs> With a slam of the door, Miss Loring was gone. So was the Hangley J. And so was a piece of my coat where the bullet from her gun ripped through it. But I had the gun. Maybe it could be traced. But first, I had to see a man about a piece of jade at 721 South Ferry Street. Yes, who is it? Holiday. All right. Just a minute. Come on in. Now, give me the Hangley piece. I'm sorry, but you're about a half hour too late. What are you talking about? Well, I haven't got it. Maybe this will show you I don't like jokes. Now, look, whatever your name is, take the gun out of my ribs. Developing an allergy. Give me the Hangley piece. What have I told you a girl who called herself... Greta Loring took it away from me. Well, Loring? You have that name right? I have every reason to remember it, but good. Where is she? I don't know. Well, you... All right. Turn around, face the window. Now, look, fellow, this... Turn around. Now, where did that girl go? I told you I don't know. How did she find you? The same way you did. She was in Quan High's shop this afternoon. Uh-huh. Okay, Mr. Holliday. Thank you for running that errand for me. And now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, The Treasure of Hang Lee. This is a nice hit. 
over the top of my head. When the birds and the bees left my skull, I sat up. The room was dark. I started to get to my feet when... You're feeling better, Mr. Holliday? Huh? Mr. Kwan. Oh, I'm flattered you recognize my voice. But you are feeling better? Except for a new head, I couldn't ask for anything more. I'm sorry I did not arrive in time to save you that inconvenience. Mm -hmm. But now that you are here, why? Why am I here? I came to see your friend. Today I have no friends. Wait a moment. I shall turn on the light. Well, I could use some. Here. Most on what's going on. Yes, here. You gave our friend the hungry jade. Now, wait a minute. I... Just a moment. Before you answer, you had better look in this little alcove. <laughs> look, Miss Holliday. Who? Who's that? He's dead. Yes. Quite dead. Stabbed in the back. But he's not the man I came here to see. I'm afraid not. I wish he were. Well, then who is this? One of the men I have been seeking for ten years. Ten years? Look, Mr. Kwan, I have a large headache. You're no aspirin with your your Chinese puzzles. The man you came to see was named Benson. That doesn't help. The dead man there is a man named Fisher. And what about a man named Loring? Oh, you know a man named Loring. I, uh, I met his daughter today. Ah, his daughter. Now I am beginning to see. But I presume you gave Mr. Benson the hungry jade you got from me today? I did not. Mr. Loring's daughter relieved me of it. She has it? You know she has I have only your word for that. That's all you're going to get, Mr. Kwan. I think you mean that. Very well, Mr. Holliday. I shall have to leave now. Oh, no, you don't. There's a murdered man here. How do I know you didn't kill him? That is a reasonable question. You have only my word that I did not kill him. You'll go with me to the police. Uh, yes. Oh, it's funny, huh? N no. I was thinking of something. A proverb. And being Chinese, I am permitted one proverb. I've got one for you, Mr. Kwan. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Right now, you're the number one bird. Very good, Mr. Holliday. But my proverb is more to the point. Two men of different minds must soon say goodbye. We're going to the police, Mr. Kwan. You leave me no alternative but this. Would, would you use that gun? I'm afraid I would. If you try to stop me. But please, do not blame me, Mr. Holliday. This is the fault of my ancestors. Your ancestors? They invented gunpowder. Goodbye. And so there I was. But where? I called the police and reported the murder without putting my name. I didn't want to stick around because I had other things to do. I had a bullet hole through my coat and out of my head and a big burning desire to catch up with Mr. Benson and Miss Loring. Not to mention a certain Mr. Kwan. The only lead I had was Greta Loring's gun that I'd taken from her. If she had bought it in the city, it would be registered. So I made one more phone call and found out what I wanted. Her address. There's an apartment in the building. And her apartment was number eight. I pressed the buzzer. Yes, who... Good evening, Miss Loring. How did you find me? Oh, I had to. I always return things that I borrow. I believe this is your gun. What are you going to do? Play questions and answers. Please, get out of here. This afternoon you, you call me a murderer. Why? I... I thought you were someone else. Who? Benson? Yes. Oh, but I'm not. I know that now. Oh, now she tells me. After she puts a bullet through my coat. You know, Miss Loring, two inches higher and you'd have had yourself a corpse. <laughs> Me. I dislike being a corpse. Now you'll talk. Benson killed my father in China ten years ago. Seems he also killed a man called Fisher. D David Fisher? David or not, he's just a number at the morgue by now. Then... Then Benson is still alive. I think he is. And you came here. Well, of course, why not? Oh, don't you see what you've done? Done? Think about it. Oh. He wouldn't know where to find you, but I told him I'd met you. And he'll keep track of me. And come here. Listen, have you still got that hang leaks, Jade? Yes. Well, he wants that. If you give it to him, maybe he'll go away. My father was killed because he had the hangley piece. What is there about that piece? 
There were three pieces, all part of the same screen. It was something about a treasure. Mm -hmm. And the carving on the screen would lead to the treasure. Yes. You have one piece. Benson has the other two. One he killed your father to get, the other he killed Fisher to get. And he'll come here after this third piece. Hey, come on, we've got to get out of here. Wait, where's your phone? Well, right there, but... Uh... I'm going to call the police. Not yet, Mr. Holliday. Juan. Yes, I followed you, Mr. Holliday. Then, because I feared Miss Loring would not extend her hospitality to me, I came up the fire escape. Juan. Juan, my father told yes, me... Miss Loring, yes. Your father... Fisher and Benson killed an old Taoist priest in China to get the Hung Lee screen and its secret. My father never killed anyone. I'm afraid he did. But there are three pieces off the screen. Yes, Mr. Holliday. The three men did not trust one another. They broke the screen up into three pieces. One valueless without the other two. Why? Why did they do that? Because they had to leave China and go their separate ways. They arranged to meet later. Mm -hmm, but, but Benson killed Loring. Yes, but Loring did not have his piece of the Hung Lee. I got it before Benson got to him. And you, you put the piece in the window to trap Benson. Why, Mr. Kwan? Why? The Taoist priest was my honorable father. Oh, I didn't know. I, I didn't know that. I'm sure you did not. I have been all over the world, waiting, waiting, hoping that sooner or later... The murderers of my father would trap themselves. Two are dead, and the third... Benson? Yes, Benson. He... Must be Benson. You let him in, Mr. Holliday. Let him in, are you crazy, Kwan? He's a killer. I said let him in one moment. I will take that gun you put on the table, Mr. Holliday. Give it to me. Take it. Thank you. Now I have two guns. Mr. Benson probably has one. Let him in, Mr. Holliday. If you think I'm going to open that door and let him in, you're crazy. two guns. Are you afraid, Mr. Holliday? I... All right. Slowing it back. Next to the wall. No. Hugh, get back in there. Better not come in, Benson. Move away. Who's that? Come in, Mr. Benson. Come in. Holiday, stand in front of me. Right where you are. All right? Go ahead and shoot. I would hit Mr. Holiday. That's right. I'm sorry, Mr. Holiday, but you seem to have been caught between the dragon and the tiger. I want that Hang Lee piece. I... I'll give it to yes, him. Yes, do that, Miss Loring. Give it to him. Benson, you've already killed two men. The third won't make any difference. The Hangley piece, Miss Loring. On the table. There. Take it, take it. Good enough. All right, Holiday, move in front of me. Always in front of me. Now stop. Hand me the jade. You, Miss Loring, hand it to me. <laughs> That's it. Now I'm going to move back toward the door. If you shoot, Holiday gets it. Stop right here. Mr. Holiday, my life means nothing because I have devoted it to this moment. But I regret this inconvenience to you. Come on, think what you're doing. Benson won't get away. The police will have his description and be picked up within an hour. Nice dreaming, Holiday. Mr. Kwan, don't. Stay where you are. I regret, Mr. Holiday. Twist away quickly, twist away! <laughs> Mr. Holiday. I'm all right. I got out of the way. But... Mr. Benson has gone to his ancestors. Mr. Kwan, are you all right? Yes. It's quite all right, thank you. Go ahead. Miss Loring, call the doctor fast. No, 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 please. The three pieces of the screen. Give them to me. You will find two of them in Mr. Benson's pocket. Look, Mr. Kwan, you're hurt badly. You've got to have a doctor. No, that would do no good. Old Chinese proverb. Greatest coward is he who fears death. I'm sorry, Mr. Kwan. They humbly pieces. Please, put them together. All right. There they are. The treasure of Hongli right here. Treasure? But... Not gold. My people learned centuries ago that real treasure is not gold. Treasure of Hong Lee is written here. Jane. But happy is the man who is contented with his lot. Mr. Kwan. Mr. Kwan. 
It's all right, Miss Lorne. Mr. Kwan is contented. You mean that was all there was to the treasure, Mr. Holliday? Just, just that proverb? That's right, Susan. Maybe it's the best after all. You see, we beat our brains out going after something, and when we've got it, the thing on the other side of the hill always looks better. Happy is the man who is contented with his lot. Gee, you know something, Mr. Holliday? Hmm? What, Susan? I can't think of anything silly to say. That's as it should be. Good night, Susan. <laughs> Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, care of Star Times. I need your help desperately. Johnny Tide was released from the state penitentiary this morning with murder in his heart. I don't know any of the details, but I'm sure that he'll be back here in Watertown by nightfall at the latest. If you mean what you say in your ad in the Star Times, be at the Watertown tonight. at the waterfront tonight and stop him. Remember, if you fail, Johnny Tide will kill or be killed by morning. And that would be wrong because there's lots of good in him. I know. I love him. Janice Reed. Yeah, that's the way it started. Just a girl worrying about a boy. But before it was all over, a lot of people were worrying about that boy. They had to, if they wanted to live. <laughs> Back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Design for Danger. Jeepers, Mr. Holliday, an ex-convict on the prowl in the toughest section of the city. Uh Uh-huh. That part of the city doesn't get the carriage trade, as the expression goes. Well, do we accept the challenge, Susie? We? Oh, hey, I'm only your secretary, Mr. Holliday, and I... I was using the editorial we, Susie. Oh, well, in that case, Mr. Holliday, I don't know what to say. Frankly, I'm trumped. Susie, the word is stumped. Oh. The word is stumped. But maybe you've got something. What? I don't know. i tell you what. Suppose I get down to Watertown and those around the blue. Why? Oh, I don't know. Maybe to see what's doing. It was called Watertown not because it was a separate city, but because it was a separate and different order from the rest of the town. But tonight, there was none of the usual rowdy noises. None at all. Watertown was quiet. Too quiet. I could feel a peculiar tension in the air as I walked, as though Watertown was waiting for something to blow up. The people I saw hurried along, vanished in the dark doorways and shuttered houses, afraid. A place like Watertown lives within itself. The news travels fast. Then I heard two men talking. I stopped. Stopped in the shadows and listened. I know what I'm talking about, Fatty. Tide was sprung this morning and he headed straight for here. Oh, uh, maybe he ain't in Watertown. Maybe he'd be afraid to come back. Oh, Johnny Tide, afraid of what? Of you, Fatty Ralston? You know he ain't afraid and he ain't forgot. Oh, shut up. You talk like I had to be afraid of Johnny. <laughs> Don't you have to be? You guys make me sick. That punk's headed for someplace else. He ain't coming back to Watertown. Well, just the same. If I was you, Fatty, I'd pull a blanket over me and hold up some. I'll go on, beat it. Get out of here. <laughs> you ain't afraid much. Oh, not much. <laughs> I ain't afraid of Johnny Tide. I ain't. Why not, Fatty? Uh-huh. Or why should you be? Uh, who are you? Well, what are you doing here? I just wanted to ask you a question, Fatty. You don't know me. I don't know you. That's fine. Run along and mind your own business, mister. I've got business here. I just want to know... 
Who is Johnny Tide? You had your ears open, didn't you? Yeah, wide open. So you want to know who Johnny Tide is, huh? That's right. Oh, okay. You want it? Here it is. I'll say this for Fatty. He was quick with his fist. By the time I got my breath back, I saw his 300 pounds disappearing around a corner. So if I wanted to know anything about Johnny Tide, Fatty was the boy to ask. I got up and followed I saw him duck into a place that had a sign above it, Patty's Pool. I slipped inside, stepped into a dark corner and waited. All right, everybody. Clear out. I'm close enough for the night. Clear it. You heard me. Look, look, look. Nobody owes me nothing. Now, that ought to make everything all right. Clear out. Come on. Come on. Turning in early, aren't you, Patty? Yeah. Oh, you again. You don't like lessons, do you? I don't like the way you teach. Now you're going to tell me about Johnny Tide. Was I? What makes you think that? I had an idea you might. There's another idea with details, starting with this cue ball. It's your window, Fatty. Now beat it. Stay away from me. I asked you a question outside. I didn't like the way you answered it. Uh, you a cop? No. Stay away from me. Stay away. My arm! I go! Sure. But who is Johnny Tide? The uh, punk kid, that's all. Anybody can tell you that. I like the way you tell it. Come on. He's up with it. That's my arm. I know it is. It was my stomach outside. Uh, look, Tide's a punk kid. Just finished a five year stretch for sticking up my place. This place? Yeah. Yeah, he robbed me of four grand. Four thousand dollars? <laughs> Try it again, Fatty. I doubt if you ever had $4,000 in this place. That's what it was. And why are you afraid? If he robbed you and served time, why should you be afraid now? He said he'd get me. Don't let me go. Sorry, Fatty, but your story doesn't make sense. In the first place, like I said, you never had $4,000. Not in this place. You're smart, ain't you? Just medium. But I can smell a bad story. What's your stake in this, anyway? Who are you? An hour ago, I was just a curious bystander. I wanted to know who and what is Johnny Tide. But I took a punch in the midsection, and now you're telling me a lie. Well, that makes me more than curious. It gives me a personal interest. Yeah. You let me go when I tell you? It all depends. Go on. All right. All right. I'm only telling you because i got to get out of here before Johnny gets here. Oh, so there is a reason for you to be afraid of him. Maybe. But Johnny was framed. Rick Martin. Rick Martin? The Rick Martin? Yeah, big shot. Boss of Watertown. He gave me four grand, then he told Johnny I was a pushover for a stick-up. Oh, and Rick Martin also told the police. Yeah, that. he did. Johnny was framed, like I said. Why should Rick Martin want to put that frame around Johnny Todd? Because Rick liked the girl. So did Johnny. So Rick took the easy way in love and war. Now let me go, will you? I told you everything. i got to get out of here before Johnny comes. You were in on the frame? Maybe not exactly, but Johnny won't believe I wasn't. You know, Fatty, somehow I can't blame Johnny for that. How did Johnny find out he was framed? Somebody talked. Somebody that don't like Rick Martin. Uh-huh. Now, is the girl Janice Reed? Yeah, yeah, that's... Uh, Johnny thinks she was in on the frame, too. Now, please, will you let me go? I gotta get out. Yeah, yeah, sure, Fatty. You can go now. I gotta go far away, because Johnny Tide will go for Rick Martin, and then me, and then Janice Reed. So that was it. Johnny Tide was coming back to settle old scores. But where was he? How could I help? I was thinking about it. Oh! No! Stop! Stop, you crook! You hold on! Stop! He did it! He broke my showcase window. Who did? That no good Johnny Tide. I saw him! He broke my window and took a gun! So, now Johnny Tide had a gun. He was close. Very close. But it was also out of my hands and into the hot little hands of Lieutenant Flynn. Now, look, Holiday. I know that Tide was released from prison this morning. I know that he's in Watertown tonight. I know he intends to kill Rick Martin before morning. But I also know that all of this, including that pawn shop he just knocked over, is none of your business. How do I make myself clear? Yes, you do. But before I go back to my typewriter, one question. What do you know about a girl named Janice Reed? Very little. Only that she's a singer over at the Blue Chip, Watertown's most exclusive nightclub. Now, anything else, Danny boy? No, nothing else, Lieutenant. Good night. Maybe I made a mistake when I asked Kling about Janice Reed. Because up until then, I was convinced that the Lieutenant was right. I didn't belong in this mess. 
But now, well, I couldn't just step out and forget the whole thing. Not without talking to the girl anyway. I got a table at the blue chip without too much trouble, and ten minutes later, Janice joined me. She was younger, prettier, much more upset than I had expected. Mr. Holliday, what have you found out about Johnny? Well, rumor has it that he intends to commit a few murders tonight. So, oh, incidentally, you're on his list. I don't believe that. Look, Mr. Holliday, I know Johnny. I grew up with him right here in this neighborhood. But Johnny and I and Tyler Bennett were inseparable. Please, Mr. Holliday, you've got to believe me. Uh, maybe I do, Janice. But let's start off slowly. First of all, who's Tyler Bennett? My boy. He owns this place. He and Johnny and I used to play together as kids. Why, we even had a secret clubhouse under the pier. All that kind of stuff. And how Johnny loved it. You know, that kid used to climb the old water tower over the clubhouse every day and pretend to sight pirate ships on the horizon. He'd get mad if we said they were just barges. Which adds up to what, Janice? That Johnny was never really a bad boy, Mr. Holliday. He just craved excitement, that's all. But what about Rick Martin? How do you explain that? Well, Rick meant action and fast money. And Johnny liked both. He was young and he made a mistake, but he's paid for it. He served his time. Don't you see, Mr. Holliday, he needs help. He needs it badly. You certainly got a lot of faith in him, Janice. But what about you and Rick Martin? Go out with me? Once in a while. I... I have to, to keep my job. Don't forget, Rick Martin runs water time. That might be hard to explain to Johnny Ty. No, it won't. Believe me, Mr. Holliday, if you can find him, you can talk sense into him. I know that. Well, I'm not so sure. But you'll try. Okay, I'll try. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, pardon me, but you're on in a minute, Janice. All right, Tyler. Oh, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Holliday. How do you... Hello, how are you? Excuse me, I'll only be a few minutes. Janice was telling me how you two grew up with Johnny Tide, Mr. Bennett. Oh. Have any idea where he might be? Well, if I did, I'd go directly to the police with the information. Johnny was a good kid once, but that was a long time ago. He's dangerous now. He's very dangerous. Janice won't buy that. I know. She was in love with him five years ago. She can't believe he's changed. But mark my word, Johnny Tide will kill before this night is over. I only hope he doesn't get to Janice. <laughs> I left the blue chip, I knew that in spite of both Kling and Tyler Bennett, I was on Janice's side. Now, my only problem was to stop Johnny Tide, if I could find him. I walked around aimlessly for the better part of an hour before I got a break. I stopped to look up at the sky, and I found myself staring at the remains of a rotted water tower. For a moment, the jumble of old boards didn't mean a thing, but suddenly it struck home. Johnny Tide used to play pirate on that water tower, and there was a secret clubhouse below. It could be just the spot for a hideout. I felt my way through the blackness when... You move one more step, fellow, and I blow your head off. Who are you? My name's Holliday, Dan Holliday. I'm not a policeman, and I don't work for Rick Martin. Your open is okay. I'll keep talking. All right. Here it is. You're uh, Johnny Tide, huh? Maybe. Keep talking. Well, Johnny Tide, you're the world's biggest sucker. Yeah. You waste five precious years in prison, and on your first day out with a clean slate, you get into a jam that'll either mean a chair or a pine box. And what's that to you? Personally, nothing. But I'm around because a friend of mine believes in you. A girl named Janice Reed. Janice? You, you've seen her? That's why I'm here, leaning against that forty-five in your hand. Tide, why don't you get smart? That girl's in love with you. But what about Rick Martin? Oh, forget him. Sooner or later, the cops will catch up with Martin. They'll put him away for keeps. Sure. Sure. Meanwhile, what's to keep Martin and his boss from coming after me? I'll do what I can about that. But to play it safe, why don't you get out of town? Away from here for a while. <gasps> what's that? Holiday. Holiday, if this is a trap, you'll never leave here alive. <laughs> then we've got a deal. Because that was probably a stray cat. Now, listen to me, Johnny. Do what I say, will you? Forget Rick Martin. Get out of town for your own sake and for Janice. Yeah, yeah, sure. Forget the whole thing. Forget I was framed and went up for five years. That's a long time, Holiday. An awful long time. I know it, Johnny. But it's done now. Yeah, done. Me with a record. You can't wipe that away. Suppose... Suppose we fix it so that everybody finds out about the frame. How? Well, first give me that gun. Then get out of town and let the police take care of Rick Martin. Patty Ralston can be made to talk. How? 
He talked to me because he was afraid of you. He'll talk, Johnny. And when he does, that record of yours will be wiped off. Come on, now, what do you say? Well? Eh. Here I'm a set. A gold-plated 14-carat set, but... But here... Nah, that's a good boy. Now, go someplace where you'll be out of the way. You leave this to the police. Sure. But so help me, Holiday. If I get another loop thrown around me, if anything slips, Johnny Tide will be back for you. When I left Johnny, I was sure everything was going to be all right. I put his gun in my pocket and started up the street for Rick Martin's place. I wanted to be sure that Martin would let Johnny get out of town under his own power. I took a shortcut through an alley. Brother, how foolish can you get? I hadn't gone ten feet when I heard footsteps behind me. I tried to duck, but I wasn't quick enough. Uh Uh-huh. Mr. Dan Holliday in his usual position after sticking out his neck. Come on. See if we can get up. Oh, Kling, we ought to do something about these buildings around here. <laughs> They've fallen, people. Yeah, somebody slugs them. You know, I gathered that. And that isn't all you gathered. Hmm? What are you talking about? Three guesses. Just take only one. It's all you'll need. I still don't know what you're talking about. But I know one thing. And that is? Don't worry about Johnny Tide anymore. I, I had to talk to him. So you talked Johnny Tide into being a good boy. You let that fast talking little... Holiday, while you were lying here asleep, tied got to Rick Martin and killed him. And now back to Design for Danger, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holiday. The moment Lieutenant Kling told me that Rick Martin was shot to death, I plunged my hand in my pocket for the forty five I'd taken from Johnny Tide. But it was gone. Looking for this, maybe? The gun. Yeah, we found it next to Rick Martin's body. Holiday, you were taken in by a fast-talking clunk. The only way you look at it, your name spells sucker. Yeah, you're right. Johnny Tide sang a free lullaby, and I went to sleep. Forget this, Kling. Before the sun comes up, I'm going to plant Rick Martin's murder right in your lap. <laughs> Well, sunrise was only six hours away, and that meant I had to move fast. I remembered Fatty's warning that he and Janice Reed would be next if Johnny Tide ever got to Rick. So I lost no time in getting to the girl's apartment. What? Mr. Holliday? What are you doing here? Rick Martin's just been murdered, Janice. Yes, I know. Tyler Bennett called me a few minutes after it happened. Look, Janice. That Johnny's off on a killing spree, and you and Fatty are next in line. No. No, I don't believe that. Johnny isn't the killer. Rick Martin wouldn't say it that way, Janice. Now, listen to me. I want you to lock this place up tight and stand to cover. But I can't. I've got to be back at the club for the late show. Call Tyler Benner when it's time. He'll take care of you. But where are you going? To find 300 pounds named Fatty Ralston. It cost me a $50 bill and a lot of legwork, but I finally located Fatty out on an old oil barge anchored off the end of a deserted pier. I took off my shoes, stepped to the waist, and quietly swam out to the barge. Once on deck, I could hear the voices of two men coming from the cabin. One of them was Fatty. I couldn't see the other man. I edged closer, and then... I banged against the steel drum, and the noise it made shattered the silence. The light in the cabin went up. Who's that? Come on, who is it? Just an old friend, Fatty. Huh? You again. Let's go in the cabin, Fatty. I'm, I'm a little wet. <laughs> sure. Why not? Come on. Light the lamp. Anything to oblige. See better now? Not yet. Who was with you? Nobody. Where's Johnny Tide? I said, where's Johnny? He ain't here. Don't give me that. <laughs> Where did you look around? Put on that gun first. You're mixed up, fella. I give the orders. I got the gun. That's right. Give me a cigarette, will you? I don't smoke. No? Not even Egyptian cigarettes? Huh? 
This cabin's thick with smoke. Some Egyptian cigarettes. Maybe you better go. Now, hand me that towel, Patty. I'm a little chilly. Here. Thanks. Stop that gun, Patty. Drop it. You're breaking it. Stop that gun. All right. Move back. Okay, now I give the orders. I've got the gun. Listen, don't do nothing. Go, please. No, I'm not. I'm going to stand perfectly still and listen to you talk. Okay. Okay, I'll talk. You see? Whoever fired those shots couldn't have missed any. And whoever it was got off the barge and into the boat that was tied on the opposite side. I ran over. I stepped once on the oil cover deck and the motorboat made for shore. I had to stand and watch Johnny Tide get away. Get away after killing Fatty. And that made two down and one to go. And the one was Janice Freed. I swam back, slipped into my things, got to a phone, told the police about Fatty. Then I headed for Janice Freed's apartment. It was dark, deserted. I found an unlocked window and got inside. And I had the sickening feeling that I was just one step behind Johnny tied in his gun. Then, I knew it wasn't Janice. She'd use a key. I moved to the door quietly. What the... Get your hands off me, Holiday. Uh, I'm Mr. Bennett. I'm sorry. I thought you were Johnny Tide. Obviously. I came to take Janice to the club. Where is she? I don't know. I was just going through the place when I heard you at the door. Here, I'll switch on the light. Come on, let's look in the bedroom. Well, there's nobody in here. I guess I'm too late again. Wait a minute. This memo pad. Here, near the phone. What about it? What does it say? It's written with an eyebrow pencil. Here, 42, at 130. Sure, that girl's just crazy enough to keep a rendezvous with Johnny Todd. What time is it now? Uh... Ten after one. Why? What are you going to do? Maybe three's a crowd, Mr. Bennett, but I'm going to be there when Johnny Tide and Janice get together. I'm going to... What is it, Holiday? What are you staring at? Look. They're on the rug. Those smudges. That's oil. Oil? I don't follow you. What does it mean? The Tide's been here already. Those are his tracks. What? Yes, you see, he was out on the oil barge an hour ago, and the deck was slick with that stuff. I know. I slipped myself. Well, then, couldn't those be your footprints? No, I left my shoes on the pier. I swam out. But why would Johnny make an appointment with Janice and still come up here? I don't know. Only Johnny can answer that. Just like he can tell me where he gets those smelly Egyptian cigarettes he smokes. I took a cab to within the block of Pier 42. Then I got out, walked quietly to the rendezvous spot. Janice was already standing in the soft light of a street lamp, waiting... I ran back to the phone and called Lieutenant Clayton. But well, the girl set up like a clay pigeon. I didn't want to take any chances. When I got back to Janice, it was 1.30 on the button. And a second later, a man stepped in the side door of a warehouse. It was Johnny Tide. I moved closer as Johnny went up to Janice. Johnny. Johnny, darling. Hello, Janice. Oh, Johnny, it's been such a long time. Yeah. Yeah, five years. An awful long time, Janice. What? What's the matter, John? Aren't you glad to see me? Sure. Sure, awful glad, Janice. Awful glad. But what's the matter? Johnny, why are you looking like that? I... I'm just trying to figure out something. Oh, never mind now, Johnny. Look, you've got to get away. Wait a minute. Listen. Cops. You did it again, didn't you? Johnny, you... no. I might have known I was going to give you a chance to explain Johnny. it. Now. Hold it, Johnny. Holiday, you. She didn't call the police either. I'll get both of you later. I'll be back. Yes, I'll be back. Johnny! Johnny, don't run away. Don't run away. Holiday, Jen. You there? Right here, Clay. Where is he? He ran into the warehouse. Okay. Put a ring around that warehouse. Spotlight, here, Jen. No. Don't let him alone. Let him alone. Okay, boys. Let's go. I'm going with you, Clay. Be careful. Come on. It's no use, Johnny. The police are here. You're licked, kid. Come on, give up. Not me, Holiday. Me and the law just don't seem to get along. But, Johnny, it's your only chance. Will you give up? Answer me, Johnny. 
You heard that? Just, just on your shoulder, Mark. There he is. Up there on that right. The Kennedy. You're right. Standing up there. There he goes, Lieutenant. Get it. No, don't cling. Don't shoot. Hey, I'll you crazy, Holiday? Not quite. Kennedy, shine your light up behind you. Up there. Higher. There. There's your man, Kling. What? Well, who is that, Holiday? That lieutenant is the man who killed Rick Martin and Fatty Ralston and tried to frame Johnny Tide for the whole thing. The name is Tyler Bennett. Well, how are they? How are you this morning? Oh, pretty good, Kling. The doc says I'll be out in a couple of days. Good. Well, like you figured, the whole thing's a scheme of Bennett's to kill Rick Martin and take over as number one man in Watertown. Yeah, and with Tide framed for the murder. Tyler Bennett would also have had a clear field with Janice. And he was the one who knocked you out just before Rick Martin was shot, huh? Uh-huh. He must have followed me from the blue chip to Johnny's hideout, where he heard me talk Johnny out of his gun. From there on out, he was in the driver's seat. But I still don't see why Bennett killed Fatty out on the barge. Because Fatty was Bennett's sidekick in this frame. And when it looked as though you might get the truth out of him, Bennett was forced to shoot one of you. You were lucky. Fatty made a better target. But now I've got one for you. The jackpot question. When you were in the warehouse, how did you know that Johnny Tide was innocent? Well, I found that out the hard way. You see, I was facing Johnny when I was shot. In the back. <laughs> You certainly had a long night in Watertown. But there's one thing I don't understand. And what's that, Susie? Why did Tyler Bennett follow you down to the pier? Oh, he had to because of the oily footprints in Janice's apartment. You see, once I got to Johnny Tide and found out that he didn't have oil on his shoes, I would have realized the footprints couldn't have come from anyone but Tyler himself. Oh. Besides, I would have also found out that Johnny didn't smoke Egyptian cigarettes. But what about Johnny? Now, I mean. Oh, he's on probation for stealing the gun. Everyone knows he was framed for the other deal. Hey, you know, Mr. Holiday, I wonder if I would have thought of that Egyptian cigarette thing. Nope, I guess I wouldn't. Why not? Because I don't know a single Egyptian. Oh, good night, Susie. Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holiday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with this week's original story by Gene Levitt and Bob Mitchell. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker, that of Lieutenant Kling by Edmund McDonald. Production is supervised by Vern Carson. Box 13 is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Care of Star Time. I saw your ad in the paper and I wondered if you'd help me. I can't go to the police and I have no money for a private detective. But my father is in trouble, I'm sure, and when you find out who he is, you'll know why I can't go to the police and how I must have help. know why I can't go to the police and why I must have help. This is Sheila Corbett, 356 Waring Avenue. It didn't sound like much, this letter, but I did find out who her father was. I found him dead. Then learned he was alive. Sure, it sounds impossible. But that was it. And now back to... The Dead Man Walks, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. I wonder why she can't go to the police. Susie, if I knew that, I wouldn't have to go to see Mrs. Corbin. 
Hey, Mr. Holiday, it sure sounds like a wild goose chase. It'll probably turn out to be a dub. Oh, is that the word I wanted? Susie, only you can get the answer to that question. Well, once in a while I get a word right. Well, don't I? Oh, sure, sure. That's what makes it so interesting. When you do get one right, I don't know what you're talking about. Kind of makes it the sight of life, huh? Two strikes and before you foul tip the next one, I'm leaving for... What was that address? Oh, um, uh, 356 Waring Avenue. 356 Waring Avenue. Mm -hmm. So long, Susie. <laughs> It wasn't a very nice neighborhood, 356 Waring Avenue. But the flat I entered was neat, clean, scrubbed, and polished. And the woman who asked me to sit down was as neat and clean as the room. I waited for her to start things, and she did. Ah, uh, I'm Mrs. Sheila Corbett. Yes, I guessed that. And I'm Box 13. My name's Dan Holliday. Well, I... I don't know how to start, Mr. Holliday. <laughs> the beginning's always a good place, Mrs. Corbett. Saves time and trouble. I want you to find my father. You said you couldn't go to the police about it. Why not? Because, uh, Because my father is a paroled convict. Do you understand? Are you afraid he's done something? No, I know that's not true. He, he swore he'd go straight when he came home. But you think he hasn't. I didn't say that. But the fact that you're afraid to go to the police says so. Look, Mrs. Corbett. If he's done nothing wrong, there's nothing to be afraid of. Yes, I know. But there'd be questions. I have two children, Mr. Holliday. A husband who is wonderful to me. No one in this neighborhood knows about my father, so... Well... All right, Mrs. Corbett, I'll give it a whirl. But first, when did you last see your father? The day after he was released on parole. He came here. Was he all right? Uh, I don't know. You don't know? Well, I'll tell you what happened. He'd come home. He was here, maybe two hours, when the phone rang. Sheila? Sheila, telephone. Answer it, will you, Dan? All right. Hello? Oh, yeah, it's me. Why'd you call up? Look, I said nothing doing. I meant it. I'm straight now. I... Nothing doing. You won't get him, and I won't say where they are. Let me alone, will you? Just let me alone. Dad. Dad, who was it? Uh, uh, just a man I used to know. Who? Nobody you know, honey. Well, what did he want? Nothing. You were afraid. Why? Why were you afraid? It wasn't anything, Sheila. Dad, if there's something wrong... There I... ain't. You're on parole. I and... know it. Don't you think I know it? I'm sorry. No, uh, that's all right. Sheila. What, Dad? Yeah. I want you to keep this for me. What is it? Just a piece of paper. Put something on it. Put it in a safe place. Keep it for me. Keep it for you? Dad, why do you say that? There's nothing to worry about, Sheila. Nothing at all. Now just forget all about it and don't worry because there ain't anything to worry about. You said there wasn't anything to worry about, Mr. Holliday. But... I was worried. He didn't come home that night. For the next day. And you don't know where he went? No. May I see the piece of paper he gave you? Yes, here it is. Is this all? That's all. 517 Slack Street, S. Thomas, 945. Does this mean anything to you? No. Do you know the address, 517 Slack Street? Not at all. And the name, S. Thomas? I never heard it before. Hmm. Do you mind if I take this? No, of course not. Do, do you think you know what it means? No more than you do, but I'll try to find out. How? By going to 517 Slack Street and seeing if there's a Mr. S. Thomas there. The piece of paper with a message on it seemed like it might be a reminder to meet Mr. S. Thomas at 945 at this address. But when? What day? Why? Was S. Thomas the man who called Mrs. Corbett's father on the phone? You know, a guy can ask himself a lot of questions and get no answers. So I drove to 517 Slack Street. It was a pawn shop. With everything from gold toothpicks to elephant heads. And clocks. Lots of clocks that ticked off little punctuation marks into the silence. Hello? 
Hello? Anybody here? Holy mackerel. Holy mackerel. Hey, what the... Out like high button shoes. You wake up, come on. Mm. That's the boy. Come on, sit up. Sit up. Without my head. Look, fella, parking on the side of the road isn't allowed. Who are you? State trooper. Who are you? Uh, I'm Dan Holliday. Welcome to Hamilton County. Hamilton. What did you say? Look, are you drunk? Did you say Hamilton County? That's it. When he saw your car, looked like there wasn't anybody in it. Stopped to take a look. And found me. You're no Easter egg, but brother, all that lump on your head needs is a shell. How far is it to the city? About 70 miles. <sighs> Thanks, I'll be going now. Oh, no, maybe you better come with us. I... <laughs> all right. Get in touch with Lieutenant Kling. I'll identify myself and tell him a nice story. He won't believe it, but I've got a lump on my head to back me up. That's happened from the beginning. You don't believe me, do you? You saw a dead man on that porch. Then somebody teed off on me for a hole in one. When I woke up, I was out in the country. Out in the next county. In your own car? In my own car. What time did you go to the porn shop? It was 2.15. That's five now. That's better than three hours. And no dead bodies have been reported. I keep in touch with them. I tell you, I saw one. Whose? I didn't ask. What did he look like? Medium height, gray hair, blue suit. Oh, that's about all I can tell you. Gray. Nothing else? I didn't get the county's teeth because the roof fell in. Look, I've got a knot on my head. Doesn't that prove anything? I guess it does. But you're sure you didn't recognize the man you saw lying dead? No, I never saw him before. And you went there looking for... I... I'll be doggone. What's the matter? I didn't ask her his name. Her? Who? This is Sheila Corbett. What? Does that fence strike a spark in your iron head? You ever hear of a man named Winslow? Albert Winslow? No. Ex-convict. Parole. Sent up for counterfeiting. It might be. You got a picture of him? Yeah. Wait a minute. Sergeant, file on Albert Winslow. Bring it in. Albert Winslow has a daughter named Mrs. Sheila Corbett. Is that it? What deduction? By the way, Winslow answers the description of your dead man, roughly. Then let's get going. Hold your horses. Bring it here, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Thanks. Let's see it. There you are. Now, that's all, Sergeant. Okay. Kling, look. This is Albert Winslow, and Albert Winslow is the man I saw dead in that pawn shop. You sure? Look, could I make this up? I guess not. Okay, Dan, let's go to your pawn shop. See what we can redeem. <laughs> Five seventeen Slack Street. Go on. Is this the same place? Sure it is. Yes, sir. Can I do something for you? Maybe. This your shop? Oh, yes. Uh huh. Were you in here at two fifteen this afternoon? Two fifteen? Well, yes, yes, one. You're sure? Well, of course. How long have you been here? Why? About 15 years? I mean today. Holiday. Would you like my badge? Ba badge? Yeah, police. Homicide. Oh, my goodness, sir. Yeah, I... What's the matter, Dan? You'll take a look behind this counter. Huh? Well, I'm looking. What am I supposed to see? Albert Winslow dead. Where? Look, Winslow is behind this counter at 2.15 this afternoon. Excuse me, but I, I don't understand this. And neither do I. What's your name? Holiday. Shut up. Yours. Uh, Barlow. Michael Barlow. You know a man named Albert Winslow? Oh, I never heard of him. No, I, I, I'm sure I didn't. Mind if we look over your face? Oh, certainly not. But I still don't understand. I'll draw it for you, Mr. Barlow. At 2.15 this afternoon, I walked into this shop. This one? This one. There was no one here except a dead man behind the counter. 
then I was slugged. In here? That's right. But, but that's impossible. Well, I, I, I've been here all day. Come on, we'll take a look around. Wait a minute, please. What now? This, this place looks a little different from what it did earlier. It looks as though it's been changed around. Well, that's impossible, too. Dan, are you sure this is the place? Of course I am. Okay, we'll give it a fine tooth comb job. Certainly help yourselves. Be only too glad to do anything I can, although this is certainly very peculiar. Thus, we have the understatement of the week. Well, let's get it. Uh, that's my phone. Uh, may I answer it? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Well, be a minute. Hello. Who? Oh, oh, yes, yes, just a minute. Lieutenant Clean. Yeah? It's for you. Thanks. Be right with you. Hello? Yeah, go ahead, Sergeant. What? Say that again. Okay, thank you. You won't have to go over your place, Barlow. No, you won't. What are you talking about, Clean? Holiday is a Sergeant Garvin. He's very efficient. So, what does that got to do with this? Lots. I left word where I could be reached. He reached me. What are you building up to? I don't know, but it's not good for you. Yeah, what's on your mind? More to the point, what's on yours? Now, look, I don't get this. What was that call about? About Albert Winslow. Go on. You saw him dead at 2.15. I said I did. You want to change your story? Now, look, why should I? Because Albert Winslow reported to his parole officer no later and no earlier than 4.20 this afternoon. Back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's latest adventure, The Dead Man Walk. Yeah, that was it. The man I saw dead at 2.15 was alive again at 4.20. That's impossible. Kling said it was, and better than Kling, my own common sense said it was. So later that night, I went back to see Mrs. Corbett. But you went to the police. You promised you wouldn't. I'm sorry, but I had to. I... I saw your father. Dead. Dead, you think? I know that's a brutal way to put it, Mrs. Corbett, but, but the only way. And the police? There's nothing they can do or want to do. Your father reported to his parole officer. He has to do that once a month. Please. Please find him. I think I did find him. Oh, no. No, it can't be. Mrs. Corbett, I've got to ask some questions. You've got to answer them. <laughs> I'll try. Good. Now, look, your father talked to someone on the phone. He didn't mention any names? No. Not even the name Thomas? I'm sure of it. Uh, one dead end after another. Do you know the names of any of your father's... Well... Accomplices? Yes. I don't remember any names, but... I can tell you the place where they used to meet. Where he was arrested. Where was it? A house in Brenham Square. 618, I think. Now, you said your father spoke to someone on the phone and said he wouldn't, well, wouldn't give them something. But I don't know what he was talking about. And you haven't heard from him at all? No. And you're sure you'd get in touch with him? Oh, I know it. Okay, Mrs. Corbett. I'll try the lead you gave me. 618 Brennan Square. <laughs> Six eighteen Brennan Square was an old frame house that looked as though its last tenants had moved out to go to George Washington's inaugural. Its windows were boarded up, and the rusty iron fence in front bowed politely to the houses across the street. I walked up the stairs and knocked on the front door, never expecting an answer. I was about to turn away and chalk this off to exercise when. Yeah. What do you want? I'm looking for someone. Ain't nobody here. Uh, Mr. S. Thomas, perhaps? Nobody. Now beat it. Just a minute. Maybe you've got an Albert Winslow living here. What was that name again? Albert Winslow, as in Homer. I don't get it. You wouldn't. But do you know anyone by that name? Maybe you better come in. Maybe I should. Come on. Do you live here? Caretaker, that's all. Oh, I see. What you stopping for? I don't like haunted houses. This looks like one. You're nuts. 
Look, before we go any farther, maybe you'd like to tell me why you let me in when I mentioned the name of Albert Winslow. Maybe he was a friend of mine. I think I'd like a breath of fresh air. Maybe you'll be lucky to get any breath at all, chum. Oh, it's that way. This way. What's the idea? It was yours, chum. Now, come on. Get in front of me. Come on. Company, Eddie. Looking for Al. Getting crowded. Coming. I've seen you before, someplace. Oh, yeah. You came in Barlow's shop this afternoon. <laughs> you didn't stay long, did you? I took a sleeping tablet over the head. And you prescribed it, huh? Yeah. I thought maybe you were just a guy, but now you come nudging in here. Charlie. Right. Hey. He asked for Al, huh? That's right. Sit down. Charlie, see if Barlow's come to. Okay. Barlow? The pawn shop owner? That's right. We couldn't get anything out of him, so we'll try you. What do you mean? Guess. Take a look at Barlow. Oh. You gave him plenty to remember you by, didn't you? Uh-huh. Now, you keep looking at him and keep thinking how you look if you don't talk. About what? <laughs> That's a starter. Now, talk. Sure, I'd still say about what? I'll give you five minutes to tell us where the plates are. Plates? Yeah, plates. Oh. I don't know. Barlow's stubborn. You going to be that way, too? Come on, let him alone. Sure, but him and Winslow were pals. Winslow would tell him, maybe you know, too. Look, I'm trying to find Winslow, that's all. That's all, huh? <coughs> Why, you sit still. And take it. Now, come on, where are the plates? What did Winslow do with them? He hit them before he took the rap, and we want them. Counterfeit plates? Where are they? I don't know. All right, Charlie, go ahead. Go ahead and make him talk. <laughs> That's no use, Eddie. He won't spill. Get rid of him, then. No. Oh, either he or Barlow knows where Winslow's plates are. Barlow. Barlow doesn't know, and neither do I. I think he's telling the truth, Eddie. Go through his pockets. Okay. Identification cards. Name's Dan Holliday. Do your reading some other time. What else is it? Look. Eddie, look. 517 Slack Street, S. Thomas, 945. That's the pawn shop, Barlow's place. Yeah. What's the rest of it mean? I don't know. You. What's this mean? And if I tell you I don't know, I'll... I'll get battered around like a cue ball again. Why, you... Cut it out, Eddie. Well, he knows. Look, he went to Barlow's place this afternoon. If he knew where the plates were, he wouldn't be here, would he? So? They've got to be at Barlow's shop. Yeah, maybe you're right. Okay, tie him up, both of them. And Mr. Holiday, if we come back without the plates, you walk out without your head. They did a good job of tying Barlow and me to the chairs. Then when they were gone, I talked with Barlow. 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 Are you all right? Yeah, yeah I think so. What happened? Who were those men? They, they knew Albert Winslow years ago. He engraved counterfeit plates. What happened in your shop? I was in the shop early this afternoon. I hadn't seen Albert since he was released. Then he came into my shop. First, I didn't recognize him. He spoke to me. You remember me, don't you, Barlow? I, uh... I seem to. <laughs> Take a good look. Al! Al Winslow! <laughs> How are you? Fine, fine, but do uh, you? Parole. Oh, I see. It's all right, Barlow. I'm going straight. Well, of course, of course. Here, here, sit down. Back in the shop. Wait a minute. I want to take a look around. You know, what are you looking for, Al? <laughs> Things didn't change much around here, did they? Well, what do you mean? Nothing. Look, Barlow. I want to go straight, so there's something i got to tell you, I. Mm -hmm. What's the matter? Oh, oh, customers. I'll be back in a minute. No, not customers. Good night. Hello, Al. Eddie. Uh, this is Charlie. You remember Charlie? Sure. All right. Sit down, Barlow. Take it easy. Hey, what is this? Sit down, Barlow. Do what he says. That's right. Okay, Al, where are they? I told you on the phone. You can't have them. I'm going straight. I'm going to turn them over to the government. Sure. Beautiful place like those. 
Not much, you honor. Where are they? No. I won't tell you. Don't be a sap. We'll take them and get out. When I be picked up again, the feds know my work. I'll have a great chance. I'm on parole. Please. Let me alone. Just, just let me alone. Sure, sure. When we got the plates. They in here? No. Barlow, what do you say? You don't know anything. Come on, Al. Where are they? Look, I got to report to my parole officer this afternoon. If I don't, they'll come after me. And you? I'll cut it out. I... <laughs> hey, Charlie, tell me. Oh, Eddie. Why, you idiot, you mutton head. You killed him. I'll call the police. Get Winslow behind the counter. Now, come on. Eddie, there's somebody coming in. Barlow, get out of sight. Charlie, get Winslow behind the counter. Now, duck back of that screen. Come on. Hello. Hello. Anybody here? That was you, Mr. Hollandy. Eddie hit you and you saw Winslow's body. Mm Mm-hmm. That's where I came in. But later when I went back with Lieutenant Kling, what about that? But I had to do what I did. They they were upstairs. My wife was there. They they, they threatened to, to... I see. But Winslow reported to his parole officer that afternoon, after he was dead. It was a telephone call they made from my shop. Charlie pretended to be Winslow. He told the officer he'd report in person in an hour. Then he hid Winslow's body in the basement. It's there now. Oh, nice, clever people. Now, what about those plates? Do you know where they are? No. But Winslow frequently came to see me. He, he was often in the Barlow. shop alone and... Follow. I've got it. I know where those plates are. Uh, where? Come on, let's get out of here first. Yeah, but, but how? Look, there's a drink glass on that table. I'll scram my chair over there and knock the glass on the floor to break it. Well, but I, I... Hold it. Here I go. Okay, Barlow. Escape over. Overturn your chair and get a piece of glass. Cut these ropes on my hand. I've got a date with a boy named Eddie. And he who slaps last, slaps best. <laughs> Better wait outside the shop, Holiday. Oh, no, Kling, I'm too fond of Eddie. A lump on my head and a well across my face. Please, don't shoot him. No, take it easy. Kelly, Michael, take it back. Go ahead. You ready, Dan? Yeah, let's go. Come on, Come on! Kling, let it go! Why, you... You! Hello, Eddie. Uh. Dan, you need any help? Ah, uh, just pick him up and stir him in my direction. Stand up, boys. All cleaned up. Eddie disappointed me. Yeah, me too. He didn't hit you once. All right, out you go. Kelly, take pretty boy here and slap some jewelry on him. And, uh, what are you looking at, Holiday? Me? <laughs> Why, I'm looking at Mr. S. Thomas. Huh? I thought his name was Eddie. I'm not looking at him, Clink. I told you I was looking at Mr. S. Thomas and 945 mean? Mr. S. Thomas, Susie, was a clock. One of the famous old Seth Thomas clocks. It was the only one in the shop whose hand stood at 945. Yeah, and? Well, Winslow put his counterfeit plates on the pendulum arm, and that's where they were when we got them. You mean they looked like a pendulum weight? Exactly. <laughs> it was very clever. But, gee, what if somebody had bought the clock? Well, that was a chance he took, but no one did. And that's that. Hmm. There's one more thing that puzzles me. One? Yeah. Suppose Eddie and Charlie got the plates and made counterfeit money from them. So? Would they have to declare it for income tax? Income? Oh, good night, Susie. 
next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville, with this week's original story by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. Part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker, and that of Lieutenant Kling by Edmund McDonald. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. Box 13 is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, care of the Star Times. If $50,000 is of any interest to you, come to see me. If it's adventure you want, this is it. Because... I want you to kill me. At present, my address is 756 South Marvin Boulevard. Please come alone. And don't tell anyone. My address is 756 South Marvin Boulevard. Please come alone. And don't tell anyone about this letter. Simon Andrews. The letter was dated two days before I received it. And this was one time I wished sleet or snow or winds or anything had delayed the swift courier on his route. Back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's latest adventure, Killer at Large. But this was written two days ago, Mr. Holliday. I know it, Susie. A- and you were out of town, so I couldn't get in touch with you. Well, it wouldn't have made any difference. I couldn't have made it back in time anyway. Gee, you're not going to follow up this letter, are you? It's obviously the work of a handle. A what? You know, uh, one of those persons who writes letters and things. Oh, a crank. Oh, but you're not going. I sure am, Susie. Oh, no. You wouldn't kill him. Oh, of course not. But I do want to know why Mr. Andrews wants himself killed. And I'm going to try and talk him out of it. The fact that I hadn't received the letter for two days had me worried. A lot of things can happen in two days. So I went to the address of Mr. Simon Andrews. It was night. There wasn't a light in the big house. I walked up the front stairs, punched the doorbell, and heard it ring inside. Want somebody in there, bud? Huh? Where did you come from? Never mind where I came from. The point is, where do you think you're going? I was going inside, if the door opens. Step back away from that door. With your hands up. What's the idea? It's not an idea, bud. It's a reality. Awful real. Go on. Step away and keep your hands up. After you. Thank you. Straight ahead. Go on. I'd still like to know what the score is. About ten to zero. And you're carrying the short end. Keep going. And stop at that door to the right. Get away from it. Corley, what's this? This is something that I picked up on the front steps, Mr. Andrews. Bring him over here. Was it you who rang the bell? That's my usual way of getting into houses. Who are you? What do you want? You're Simon Andrews? Maybe I am. Maybe I'm not. I said, who are you? My name is Holiday. Dan Holiday. Well, that means nothing. What'll I do with him, Mr. Andrews? Wait a minute, Orling. Holiday, what did you want here? I came here to kill you. Hey. Watch him, Torling. Oh. At your own request, Mr. Andrews. Look, keep your hands away from your pockets. Wait a minute. Let's see what you got in there. Go ahead. No gun. No knife. I don't understand. That makes three of us. A nice, cozy group. (laughs) Here, I was going to give you this letter. I think you wrote it. Yes. 
I wrote this. And you... You're box 13. Yes, I am. It's all right, Tolling. Leave us alone. Huh? You sure it's all yes, right? Yes, yes. Go on. Go back to your post. Oh, sure. I'll be right outside the window. Now, Mr. Andrews, what gives? Uh, I'm sorry, Holiday, but I'm afraid. Afraid of what? Of being killed. For a man who wanted to be killed, you're doing a lot of unnecessary work. Why didn't you come when you got the letter? I was out of town for a couple of days. Oh, I... Please, sit, sit, sit down. Would you like a drink? No, no thanks. I'll have one. Do you mind? <laughs> Go right ahead. It's your house. When I wrote that letter, I, I wanted to be killed. Why? Maybe I'm crazy. I don't know. But uh, I was sick of living. Just sick of it. Can you understand that? Not yet. I like to see flowers and bees and birds. <laughs> You're younger than I. Anyway, I... It was a kind of a morbid thrill, thinking that someone was actually going to kill me. Did you really think I'd do it? I didn't know. I took the chance. <laughs> well, don't worry. My only reason for coming here tonight was to see what prompted this letter. And to talk you out of it, if possible. I wish you'd come two days ago. Why? I, I want to live now. I've, I've met someone, and I want to live. Well, go right ahead. I have already paid someone to kill me. You... You what? You're crazy. Not now. I was. You can't be serious. I am. I tell you, someone is going to kill me. Someone I paid $25,000 to do it. I don't know who, I don't know when or where, but he's going to kill me. You're a fool. Go to the police. I can't. Your life depends on it. I know, but I can't go. If I do, there'll be notoriety. I wouldn't have cared before, but I can't let that happen now. You know, I've met some strange people through my ad in the Star Times. But if you want the trophy, there'll be no argument. Put it on your mantle. Don't joke. I'm not. You've got yourself into this. Now get out. Maybe... Maybe you can help. Sure, maybe you can. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Look, I'll pay you whatever you want. I can afford it. Oh, sure, if you can afford $25,000 to get yourself killed, you can pay more to stay alive. That's it. But not to me. Look, Andrews, all you have to do is call off the deal. Let the killer keep the money, but call it off. Don't you think I've thought of that? Then what's the matter? You didn't read this newspaper, did you? No, why? Look at the headline. Benny Franklin Slain. Big shot of gambling syndicate killed in underworld slang. <laughs> so, who cries about this? Franklin was the man to whom I paid the money. I paid him to find someone to kill me. Well, well, well. You really locked the door on yourself, didn't you? Do something. Oh, huh? just like that. Franklin was the only man who knew about our, our deal. I paid him in cash. What do you think I could do? Anything. Find the man who's going to kill me. I'll pay whatever you say. Look, Andrews, it isn't a question of money. It's a question of looking through the well-known haystack for the equally well-known needle. I wouldn't know where to start. Take my advice and take a chance on going to the police. Hire private detectives, anything. I can't, I can't. Please, Holiday, help me. Good heavens, you'd give help to a dog if it needed it. I I'm grasping at straws. I'm afraid to leave the house. I hire Torling as a bodyguard. But sooner or later, the man who's out to kill me will get to me. Please, Holiday, please. All right, Mr. Andrews. But if at any time I find things getting a little hot, I'll go to the police myself. That's the only way I'll make the deal. All right. All right, anything. Now, you paid Franklin. Franklin evidently knew someone who would be willing to pull a trigger or use a knife. But you have no idea who. None. Hmm. Then we've got to find a starting point. And the starting point is Benny Franklin. He's dead, man. He's dead. Very. But he must have left a family. Of course. The paper says something about his mother. I'll try to see her tomorrow morning. Tomorrow? Why not tonight? Because the police will be questioning her, watching her house. You'll have to wait until tomorrow. Then I'll see her. Well, I didn't like the setup. Andrews was a fool and obviously a psychopathic case. But he was in trouble. So the next morning, I saw Franklin's mother can't tell anybody anything else. I told all I knew. To the police? Yes. Yes, to the police. A hundred times. My... My boy's gone. What good is all this? I'm not the police, Mrs. Frank. Then why do you want to know about Benny? Maybe I'm a friend of his. I don't know you. I never saw you before. Look, Benny once did me a favor. Call me a friend of his for that. I don't know your name. It's Holiday, Dan Holiday. Where did Benny know you? Well, let's not talk about that. What I want to know is, what did you tell the police? Everything I could. And what was that? What do you expect me to tell you? I don't know. Maybe who his friends were or weren't? He was killed. He was killed by somebody who hated him. There was a man 
Name's Scott. Scott? Did you ever see him? No. I told the police. Benny saw him often. He always went out to meet him. Why? I don't know. Was there anyone else? No one I knew. Benny never brought his friends here. No, I guess he wouldn't. Now, Mrs. Franklin, did your son recently come into, well, a pretty good sum of money? Money? <laughs> he always had plenty of money. I never took any of it. I wouldn't touch any of it. No, of course not. But what would he tell you if he came in to, say, $25,000? No, he wouldn't tell me. Why are you asking that? I have my reasons, Mrs. Franklin. Maybe if we knew he had the money and if we could find out if he gave it to anyone, we might be able to learn who killed him. Don't you want to see his murder, Cliff? I don't know. He was your son? Yes. My son. I... I was ashamed of him for what he was, but I loved him. Yes, I know. But think, Mrs. Franklin. Did he have that much money recently? No. No, I don't think he did. You're sure of that? When he had money, he spent it all at once. Then if he'd had as much as $25,000 recently, he'd, he'd have put on quite a show, huh? Yes. Yes, yes. But what good is this? I don't know yet. And you can't tell me anything more about this, Scott. Well, Benny went to meet him the night he was killed. All right, Mrs. Franklin, it's all for now. And thank you. What are you going to do? Look for a man named Scott who has suddenly come into $25,000. That was all. Look for a man named Scott who had a lot of money. A killer would make himself hard to catch. Well, the starting place was one of Benny Franklin's favorite places. Then another. Then another. Then finally in the bar of a little cocktail lounge. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Quite a bit, I hope. Huh? What'd you say? Look, uh, my name's Holiday. I'm a writer, and I thought perhaps you could help me out. Oh, you want me to write something for you? Oh, no, no. But I'm interested in Benny Franklin's case. Oh, uh, that's so. Yeah, he, uh, he came here quite a lot, didn't he? Well, lots of people do. Mm-hmm. But Franklin came here more than lots of people. Maybe. Can you tell me anything about him? Mr. Holiday... There's something like five newspapers in this city. Pick up any one of them and read all about Benny Franklin. That's not the kind of stuff I want. Well, that's the only kind of stuff you get. Even for this? You could buy a lot of newspapers for that 50. But not a lot of information. What makes you think I can give you any? This 50. What you want to know? Anything you can tell me. Well, I heard that Benny Franklin wasn't the big boy in the gambling outfit. Oh, you sure? That's what I hear. Also, if there was a lot of talk around that Benny was getting too big. I see. But I'm not interested in that part of the story. What do you mean? I want to know about a man named Scott. Don't know him. You never heard of him, huh? I... No. Who is he? Where is he? I don't know. I don't know nothing about that. Scott's a trigger man, isn't he? A killer. Uh... Oh. <laughs> Does that make you hysterical? Well, yeah. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> But I'll tell you something, Mr. Holliday. Go ahead. You've got $75 to fill up. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, you're looking for a guy named Scott. That's right. But you ain't going to find him, ever. What? I'll tell you. And that's all I'll tell you. And then you leave here, Mr. Holliday. All right, go ahead. You ain't going to find a guy named Scott because there just ain't a guy named Scott. <laughs> And now, back to Killer at Large, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. So, there wasn't anyone named Scott. I didn't believe the bartender in that cocktail lounge. I didn't believe him because Franklin's mother had told me Scott saw a lot of Benny. But maybe Mrs. Franklin could be mistaken. I went home and thought it over. The more I thought, the less sense it made. According to the bartender, I was looking for a man who didn't exist. According to Simon Andrews, I was looking for a man who was going to kill him. Later that night, I decided to pay Mr. Andrews a visit. 
I was leaving my apartment building when... Don't turn around. Just keep walking, Holiday. What? Just keep walking, I said. What's the idea? Turn in the alleyway. Go on. It's good enough. Now face the wall of the building with your hands up. Way up. How's this for size? Shut up and stay shut up. You got no gun. Everybody seems surprised at that. Maybe I should carry a few guns to keep people happy. It could be healthier for you. Now, why were you asking for Scott? How do you know I was? I got friends. Lieutenant Barr? Could be. Come on, Holiday. Why were you asking about Scott? I have an uncontrollable curiosity about men having that name. I collect them. I don't want to have to do that again, Holiday, and I want good answers. That's the kind I don't have. Now, maybe you'll tell me who you are. I could be Scott. Yeah, I had that idea when you asked me to go for a walk with you. Who sent you to that cocktail lounge? No one. I said I want good answers. I gave you one. No one sent me to that bar. You just happened to go in and ask about Scott. That's practically it. Who told you about him in the first place? Franklin's mother. You're a liar. All right, I'm a liar. Who might argue with a gun? Turn around. Well? Hand a minute. I want to get a good look at your face. Do I look any better by matchlight? i never seen you before. I wish you never had. Who got you in town? Who did what? Come on, come on. You ain't one of the mob. You're new. Oh, I'm getting old. You ain't got a gun. What's your pitch? You know, I think we're going at this the wrong way. We're asking each other questions. Suppose we just settle down to a couple of true confessions. Where are you from? Why? I don't know what this pitch is, but... Who sent you out to get me? Get you? Yeah, you came in to put the finger on me. And I didn't come in here alone. Look behind you. What? Look. All right, stand still. Oh, don't. Please don't. My, my, what a big difference a gun makes, depending on who holds it. Now, who are you? My name is Nicky. Last name, Scott? No. Would you like to be caressed with your own gun? No, no, please. Please, tell Scott I won't do it anymore. Please, give me a break this time. I'll get out of town. I'll do anything, but let me go. Did you say I should tell Scott? Sure. I was just going to put the bite on him once, just enough to set me up, and then I was going to blow town. Honest, tell him that. Turn around. Face the wall with your hands up. Sure. Now, let's see what trinkets you're loaded with. It's just a letter. Uh-huh. What are you going to do now? Well, since you invited me for a walk and I didn't really want to go, I think I'd better turn you over to the police. Oh, no, you won't. Stop, come back here. What's the matter? Nothing, man, nothing at all. Just a friendly game of tag. What? And I'm it. My charming vis-a-vis disappeared into the night and left me holding the bag. And the bag in this case was a letter. At first, I didn't pay any attention to it. Later, I looked at the address on it, thinking it would clear up some of this puzzle for me. And did it? <laughs> Everything got worse. So I decided to go and see Mr. Simon Andrews. Back again, Mr. Holliday? Well, Mr. Tolling, still the faithful watchdog? Let's go in. Go ahead. Where's Andrews? Same place he was last night. This way. Holiday's back, Mr. Andrews. Holiday, come in. Come in. Torling, get back to your post. Yes, sir. Well, Holiday. Well, Mr. Andrews. For heaven's sake, man, don't just stand there. What happened? Where were you? Did you learn anything? Which question do you want answered first? Stop it. What are you trying to do? No, I'm sorry. Mr. Andrews, what do you know about a man named Scott? 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 Name means nothing. Nothing at all? No. I think Scott is the man we're looking for. The same Scott who might have killed Benny Franklin. Scott killed Franklin? But, but why? Could be for your $25,000. I don't understand. Put it this way. You went to Franklin, hired a killer. Franklin got in touch with the invisible Mr. Scott. Maybe Franklin tried to hold out on Scott, and being a man of very, very short temper, Mr. Scott erased Franklin. Did you find him? 
I don't know. What do you know? Just a minute, Andrews. I'm in this game on a rain check. Don't shout at me or I'll go back to the bench. Uh, I'm sorry, Holiday, but you did learn something. Do you know a man about 30, medium height, dark hair and eyes, small mustache, little scar over his right eye? No. No, I don't. Well, he knows you. Because he had a letter for you. Here. What? What's this? Like I said, it's a letter. But what's in it? I don't like to be trite about this, but you could open it, you know. Oh, of course. Well? Look. Read it. You got until midnight tomorrow. Midnight tomorrow? The letter's not signed. It doesn't have to be, Holiday. It, it, it's from the killer. Why should he send you a letter? Torturing me. That could be. Why didn't you turn that... That Nicky over to the police. Why didn't you do something? What's your suggestion, Andrews? You put yourself in this hole, now climb out of it. I'm pulling out. Oh, no, 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 please. You're the only man who knows who's after me. Please, Holiday. Money's no object. Just find that man. How? You saw him. Only once. Yes, but you know what he looks like. Look, let's turn this whole thing over to the police. Let them find him. I can't. I told you before, I can't. Holiday, make one more try. Just one more. And spend the rest of my life without my head? Well, take, take toiling with you. And what about you? Oh... I didn't think of that. Mr. Andrews, you didn't think of a lot of things. One of them was how stupid can you be? I know, but will you help? On one condition. What's that? You paid $25,000 to have yourself killed. Probably because you couldn't take your own life. You wanted a thrill. Okay, you got it. You paid $25,000 for it. Now I'll pay $50,000. What? They got a check for $50,000 payable to any charity I name. I... That's the only condition? The only one under which I'll try to find the man. All right. I'll do it. I'll write it immediately. Good. Oh, and Mr. Andrews. What? The check had better be honored, or I won't go through with this. I swear I'll honor it. Take it with you. Here. Deposit it first thing in the morning. Okay. Now, what are you going to do? To find Mr. Scott. Find Mr. Scott. Oh, it sounded so easy. So I did the only thing I could. I went back to the little cocktail lounge and the same bartender. Yes, sir. What can I... Oh. You. Hello. Well, what do you want now? I'm looking for Nicky. Nicky? Yeah, Nicky. You know him? I don't know nobody named Nicky. You didn't know a man named Scott either. I don't. We'll pass that. But I want to find Nicky. Well, even if I knew a Nicky, why should I tell you anything? Because Nicky is due to get killed. Uh, Killed? That's it. I don't believe you, mister. You've got to. A man named Scott is after Nicky. I want to warn him. There ain't nobody named Scott. Nobody you care to admit you know. But there is a Scott and he's after Nicky. You... You on the level? Yes, I am. Okay. You'll find Nicky where he lives. 654 South Rogers. Oh, one more thing. Is Nicky mixed up in that gambling syndicate? I answered your question. The only one I'm going to answer. Now you get out of here. Get out before the roof falls in on me. Well, I was playing a hunch and playing it all the way through. I went to the address the bartender gave me. Walked up the stairs and came to a door that had Nicky's name on it. I started to knock. The door was open just a little. I pushed it all the way open and went in. I stood in the dark for a moment and walked toward a window. I stumbled over something on the floor. I lighted a match. Nicky. Nicky. He's real dead, Holiday. Real dead. Tolling. Mm-hmm. Tolling. Scott. Mm, have it your own way. You know, I thought you were never going to get here. What are you doing here? Where's Andrews? Give me that check he gave you. You killed Nicky. Good guess, Holiday. Hand me that check. Okay, here. Thanks. Now, Mr. Holiday, you're going to be very sorry you came here. Am I? (laughs) Tolling. Tolling. Thank you, Mr. Holiday. Andrews. Quite a gathering, isn't it? Nicky, Torling, you? Good evening, Mr. Scott. Oh, you guessed, eh? Now I figured it out. 
Well, I'm sorry. I haven't got time to listen to it. My shot must have attracted attention. Three men killed. You do all right. Franklin for trying to take over the gambling syndicate. Nicky for trying to blackmail you because he knew you killed Franklin. And Torling because I didn't trust him. I sent him here to kill Nicky. But I thought the check you had from me would prove too much for his loyalty. I must go now, Holiday. Thanks for finding Nicky for me. I had no idea who was blackmailing me. So you used me for our patsy, cooked up that story. Certainly. One of my boys would have been recognized. But you are a stranger. Understand? And I've got news for you, Mr. Scott. The police will be looking for Andrews. You. The higher up in the gambling ring. The man who kept out of sight. <laughs> looking for me? That's right. Because you slipped. Listen. You see, I made a phone call to the police. That's why they're coming. Not because anyone heard your shot, but because I called them. Bluff. Oh, no. When I went to see you with that letter, I only described Nicky. I never mentioned his name, but you did. You said Nicky. You... You... Look out, he's got a gun. Look out for him. You... You got your $25,000 worth, Mr. Andrews. Holiday, you certainly were smart to figure that out. Hmm. Ever play poker, Susie? Is it like gin rummy? No, not quite. But if you've ever played, you'll know how good it feels to draw to an inside straight and make it. I don't get it. Well, Susie, the police are not coming for Andrews. They're out on a call to stop a fight. Huh? Hmm. Sure, I didn't think of that Nicky routine until I was talking with Andrews. But you said you called the police. Oh, uh, I say a lot of things. Susie, a man has to say a lot of things when he's looking at his own tombstone. <gasps> Do you mean to tell me that awful man actually brought your tombstone along? And I... What? <laughs> Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd again stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville, and this week's original story was written by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. Part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker, and production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. Box 13 is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd and his latest Paramount picture. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures... Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, care of the Star Times. I've read your advertisement asking for adventure. I think this will be it. I'm asking you to solve an impossible situation, but one that must be solved. Next Wednesday, drive out on Route 36 at exactly noon. You'll come to a five-mile speedometer check. Maintain a speed of 72 miles an hour over the distance. You will be passed by a 1938 car going 100 miles per hour. The car will sound its horn. When you hear it, pull over to the side. Stop. When you hear it, pull over to the side and stop. The letter had no signature, but it sounded intriguing. And it became even more so as time went on. That is, what little time there was. <laughs> Now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Speed to Burn. A hundred miles an hour? Mr. Holliday, that's dangerous. Yes, it is, Susie. That's what makes this letter so interesting. I'd like to see a 1938 model to a hundred. Why? Isn't it possible? Possible, yes, but not probable. Why not? 
Susie, in the course of time, things wear out. Even a car has to give up sometimes. Oh, the letter isn't signed. And that's another thing that tells me to take this on. An unsigned letter, a 1938 car doing a hundred per, and an impossible situation that has to be solved. Now, I ask you, Susie, wouldn't that make anyone pick up his ears? At exactly noon that Wednesday, I turned to the Highway 36, a long, level stretch of concrete that rimmed out in front of my car, just asking to be burned up. I looked at my speedometer. The needle hung at 60. Up ahead, I saw the first sign on the road shoulder. The sign read, Start Speedometer Check Here. I stepped on the accelerator and watched the needle pass 60 and move to 65. 68, then 70. Just as the nose of my car pushed over the start of the check run. In my rear view mirror, the road in the back was clear. No cars, no traffic at all. I hit 72 miles per hour and stayed there. The road slipped by underneath. The scenery on the side was a flashing blur of color. Then I looked in my rear view mirror again. And suddenly there it was. A car that ate up the distance between us as though we were attached by some invisible elastic that pulled us together. And then before I knew it... It was passing. I pulled up and stopped. Ahead, the car that passed me slowed down and it also stopped. Then turned around and came back toward me. Hello there. Hello. You're, you're Box 13? That's right. And you're the only jet plane pilot I know with no license. Thank you for coming. Not at all. I enjoyed every second of it. Hey, what do you feed that car of yours? May I get in your car? Oh, please do. Thank you. I've taken a big chance in doing this, Mr. Dan Holliday. My name is Nancy. Nancy Peters. That is a 1938 model you're driving. <laughs> and from the looks of it, it's only a six-cylinder job. Yes, but I haven't much time. I'll have to talk fast. Oh, all oh, right, go ahead. I want you to help my brother. Is he the impossible situation you mentioned in your letter? Yes. He has a prison record. And now he's mixed up in something you can't get away from. Will you help? Oh, now, just a minute, Miss Peters. Your car may do 100 without batting a carburetor, but I work a little slower. Before I do any helping, I'd like to know the three W's. Who, what, and where. Well, I told you. It's my brother. Mm, that answers the who part. Now, how about what and where? Stolen cars. That's for what? One like yours? That has something to do with it. Mm hmm. Go ahead. Tom's mixed up in a stolen car syndicate. Syndicate? <laughs> it's a business now, huh? Bigger than anyone realizes. Oh, why doesn't he get it? He can't. It's watched night and day. Sometimes I am, too. He didn't know what he was getting into. Till it was too late. All right, I'll buy that for now. But it'll take more explanation. Look, let's go somewhere else and talk. I just wanted to know if you'd be interested. Well, that car of yours intrigues me. Where do you want to go? Follow me. If you promise not to do any stunt flying, I'll be right in back of you. More coffee, Miss Peters? No, thanks. Are you interested, Mr. Holliday? Yes. All right. The syndicate looks like a legitimate business, but it's not. It's tied up with stolen car rackets in every city in the country. In which case, it's an item for the police or better for the FBI. I suggest you go to them. I can't do that. My brother would be sent back to prison. Well, then let him quit. One man tried it. He was killed. How do you know? Tom told me. Mr. Holliday, I don't know who's at the head of the syndicate. I don't know anything about it, but you can find out and help Tom. And how do I do this? Will you do it? Well, I don't know, Miss Peters. I... Tell me, how did your brother get into this racket? He's a mechanic. He started to work at the Acme filling station, and it wasn't long before he was offered a job as a mechanic in a big garage in town. Before he knew it, he was in the racket and afraid to go to the police. Did he try? Once. And he saw he was followed. He didn't try again. Not after the other man was killed. What can I do? Get a job at the Acme filling station. It was from there that Tom went to the syndicate. Now, look, Miss Peters, your brother's a mechanic. I'm not. I know just about enough to repair minor injuries. That's all. That's enough. They need men. The syndicate's getting bigger. And you want me to increase the organization by one, namely Dan Holliday. I'll pay you $1,000 if you do. Oh, no, I don't want any money. This Acme filling station, where is it? 
12902 Braddock Road. Mm-hmm. All right, I'll see what I can do, but no promises. Meanwhile, how do I get in touch with you? Well, here. Here's my name, address, and telephone number. Okay, Miss Peters. But like I said, no promises. I'd just like to nose around first and see what trouble I can get into. I left Nancy Peters and drove back to the city, got into some old clothes, and took a bus out to Braddock Road. The Acme filling station did business on a three-way corner. From what I could see, it was a good business. I watched for a while until I spotted a man I thought was the boss. I waited until business cooled off a little and walked over to him. Hello. Do something for you? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, depends on how badly you need help here. Help? You looking for a job? Yeah, yes I am. I saw you standing on the opposite corner looking over here. Thought maybe you was planning a holdup. <laughs> no, thanks. That's getting money the hard way. But I saw you hopping around here and figured you could use some help. I don't know. Know anything about cars? Oh, a little. Enough to do minor repairs? Sure. Let me see your hands. Hold them out. Huh? Just hold them out. <laughs> you ain't done much hard work in your life, have you? Oh, not recently, no. <laughs> well, don't think I can use you, bud. But I need a job. Try right someplace else. Okay, okay. I was just asking. What's the matter? Got a phone here. I... I want to make a call. Hmm? Inside, why? I, I just want to make a call, that's all. Okay, inside, I told you. It was a hunch and I played it. The car that drove up was a police car and I pretended to be afraid of it. I waited inside until the car drove out. Then the boss came in. Make your call okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. You're to make that call all of a sudden, didn't you? I, uh, I just thought of it. Oh, sure. Oh, I'll see you later. Wait a minute. Sit down. What? What for? Maybe we can talk. Wait a second. What's the idea of closing the door? Mm, we can talk better. Why'd you do a fade when you saw that police car? I, uh, I didn't see any police car. <laughs> Quit kidding, bub. You saw it coming and pulled that phony call rig to you. You hot? Look, all I did was ask you for a job. Thanks for your time and so long. <laughs> now, take it easy. Take it easy. Sit down again. What's your name? Make it Holiday, Dan Holiday. <laughs> that sounds phony enough. You want a job? A minute ago, you were tired about that. Now you loosen up. Why? I like to help people. Uh huh. Got a kind face. <laughs> you want a job or not? Oh, what? Oh, handling the pumps, working on the grease rack, lubrication, wash rack, maybe doing some repair work now and then. How about it? Sounds like a full time job. That's what you want, isn't it? Yeah, it's exactly what I want. Yeah, pick up some coveralls in the lockers out back. You start as of now. So I went to work. And I learned about cars. I rented a room near the station at night that books on automotive repairs. And I waited. Waited for the next move, which came one morning just after I'd reported for work. Holiday. Hey, Dan. Yeah? Come inside a minute, will you? Right away. Pull the door shut. What's the trouble? No trouble at all. You know, you're getting to be a pretty good mechanic. <laughs> well, I learned fast. Uh, there's not quite enough work around here for a good mechanic. I thought maybe you'd like to make more dough. Do I get a raise? Not from me. But I can send you to somebody who needs mechanics. Needs them bad. Thanks. Who's the guy and where is he? You go to 714 South Elm to the Southern Auto Works. And here, give him this card. So, you're the guy Marty sends along, huh? That's right. He gave me this card to give him. Yeah. Okay. My name is Mike. Follow me. Sure. Kind of busy in here, aren't you? We keep going. In this way. I can see why Marty says you need mechanics. Yeah, he can always use a good one. People crack up their cars and do a million things. Yeah, go in this door. Good luck, fella. Have a chair, Holiday. Well, thank you. So you're a mechanic. Well, that's what Marty says. And you live at 678 Bender Avenue and you do a lot of reading at night. <laughs> I know a lot about you, Dan, more than you think I do. Like what? Like the fact that you're a little shy of cops? I'm not afraid of them. I didn't say that. I said shy. Say like a guy who's just put in a little time would be. 
Now, don't be afraid, Dan. There's nothing to be afraid of. Look, I took the job at Marty's place because I needed it. But I don't have to be needled by you or anybody else. Maybe I did a stretch. And again, maybe I didn't. It's got nothing to do with the job. So long, Mr. Swanson. Stay right where you are. It's your idea. No idea, Dan. I'm just in need of good mechanics. Marty tells me you're pretty good. Not top-notch, but good enough. Okay, you want a job here? Doing what? Automotive repairs. What else? That's what I ask. What else? <laughs> my, my, you're suspicious. Look, you can take the job or not as you like. Pay you 75 a week on a percentage basis for anything over that in time and work. I'd look like a chump if I turned that down. That's right. So I guess you're in, huh? Like you say, Mr. Swanson, I'm in. <laughs> back to Speed to Burn, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Like I said, I was in. But in what? It looked like a legitimate business. The big garage had a roaring trade that seemed on the level. Mike, the man who took me to Swanson's office, stuck close to me, so I had no chance to snoop around. And one day, I was called into Swanson's office. Well, Dan, everything all right? As far as I know, everything's fine. Why? Got any objections to working at night? No, not at all. As long as the pay is time and a half. <laughs> it's better than that. It's double. Special job? Yeah, you might call it that. How good are you at keeping your mouth closed? Well, I'm not the talkative kind. I suppose you know you've had a tail on you ever since you've worked here. No. No, I didn't know. What's the idea there? Well, you're an ex-con. I thought that was gone by the boards, forgotten. It is, it is. But it's a funny thing. I've had a check made on you, and I can't find a record of any Dan Holiday serving time any place. Got anything to say? Nothing, except maybe you looked under the wrong name. Yeah, yeah, that's what I figured. <laughs> anyway, you've been watched, and so far you're clean. Look, Mr. Swanson, you got me in here to talk about overtime work. Then you switched to my record. What's your pitch? Come around tonight at 10 o'clock, the back way. Just suppose I say no. Mike's a big guy. Maybe he could persuade you. Oh, I see. In other words, now that I'm in, I'm really in. In what, Dan? Maybe you can answer that better than I can. Maybe I can. Be here tonight at 10, the back entrance. Mike will see that you get here. Until then, so long, Dan. Well, it was a tight spot. I couldn't tell whether Swanson knew anything or not. I had made a move to contact Nancy Peters or her brother, Tom. But that night, I was to be at the garage at 10 o'clock. At 9.30, Mike came to get me, and 20 minutes later, took me down in an elevator, down into the cellar below the big garage. And what I saw made me blink my eyes. Brother, this was a racket on a big scale. <laughs> Put your eyes back in your head, Dan. You ain't seen a half of it yet. And what is this? The part of the garage nobody sees but them as has business here. Take a good look. Must be 50 cars in here. Uh-huh. And all hot. Stolen? They ain't present. If you give them an hour in here, their owners wouldn't know them from a bicycle. Come on, we'll see Swanson. Come on. Okay, Dan, come on in. Mike, see that things are running all right. Sure. See you later, Dan. Well, how do you like it, Dan? I don't know what I'm supposed to like, but it's big. And you're in it. What if I don't want to be? Oh, and you're a chump. Big pay, no social security, or withholding tax, and no questions. Look, I don't want to serve any more time. You won't. We take care of our boys. Now, look, I need another mechanic badly. There are enough hot cars floating in here in the next two weeks to make yourself a pile of dough. Yeah, but Mr. Swanson... Holiday, you haven't got a choice. Either take the job or you'll never work again. Any place, any time. I guess you're calling the terms, Mr. Swanson. Take it easy. You'll be safe. Until there's a leak. There's no leaks here. We're big enough to have our own police force to watch the men who work for us, understand? Yeah, I think I do. Okay, Mr. Swanson, you've got yourself another boy. And from then on, I was watched closer than all the golden Fort Knox. It was over a week later that I finally made contact with Tom Peters. 
Mike took me to him because Tom was to break me in on a new job. Mike wants you to work on the jalapas, huh? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. I'm Tom Peters. I know you're Dan Holliday. Yeah. What do I do? Well, we got ten hot cars rolling in tonight. They got to be pulled apart for shipping out tomorrow. Well, it's a little fast, isn't it? Oh, that's nothing. One night we put out eighteen. Come here. See this paint? Yeah. Special stuff, huh? That's right. Washes off with caustic soda. Plain water won't touch it. Only caustic soda. You spray a coat of this stuff on the car. And then what? What about the license plates? Ah, uh, you kidding? Look here. Over 500 license plates from different states. With a new paint job, different plates, even different tires, you wouldn't be able to recognize your own car if you sat in it. Huh. I see. Pretty tight organization, isn't it? Brother, you don't know how tight. Make a bad move in your material for a hearse. Well, you're to work on the manufacturer's numbers. Serial numbers of the motors, huh? Uh-uh. Manufacturer's numbers. Never in the same place twice. Sometimes it's in the carburetor, sometimes in the block. Any one of a dozen different places. I see. And you tear down the engine, get rid of the number, and there's no chance left for positive identification of the car. Right. Okay, start tearing this baby down. It's got to roll out on the street by midnight. Let's go to work. And I worked. And all the while I did, I knew I was being watched. And I think I was even followed when I went home. For three nights we kept at it. There wasn't a chance to break loose. Then on the fourth night, Tom Peters came over to me. Shake loose from that job, Dan. We got a special to do. Special? Okay, what is it? Look here. Are you kidding? It's got to be a hot car. No, it's not. What's it look like? Like a broken down model of ten years ago. Hmm. Who wants a crate like this? Yeah, wait a minute. Now, take a look under that hood. Look at that power plant. Uh huh. The engine's from a British tank. There's enough power under that hood to make this baby climb right up the side of a building. I don't get it. Why put that motor in this old job? Look underneath. The springs. The springs upside down. Sure. For a low center of gravity. And the body of the crate's lined with armor plate. And it's got bulletproof glass throughout. What are these things inside? Oh. Extra gas tanks. Uh huh. This is a getaway car. Special built. Parked this in front of a bank and no cop would take a second look at it. But no other car made can get near it for speed or power. Now that's real, real neat. Well, looks like the boys think of everything, don't they? Uh, they don't miss. You know, I'll bet anyone could take a 1938 car and pop it up with one of these motors. Sure, why not? You don't make no difference. Even a girl could drive one. Sure, why? One her brother put together for before he got into this racket. Girl? 1938? What'd you say that for? Take it easy, Tom. What are you driving at? Nancy, your sister. What about her? She got me in here to get you out. Oh, look, she's crazy. You're crazy. This is a tight box. You want to get out? Cut it out, Dan. You're asking for trouble. Look, together we can break this racket. Look, there's not a chance. I... Hold it. Here comes Mike. Hey, what are you guys gabbing for? Just looking over this job, Mike. It's pretty sweet. Yeah. Well, get it in shape. Some of the boys want it for a heist job tonight. You've got an hour to work it over. Heist job? Yeah. They're knocking over a bank. Mm. Okay, help me, Tom, and I'll help you when we get out of this. Listen, don't you think I'd have made a break before now? They got me going and coming. And I'll do it. They're watching me every minute. That's the chance I have to take. Where's your lunch pail? Lunch pail? Have you gone nuts? Just give it to me. You, uh, you drink coffee, don't you? Sure. With cream and sugar. You happy now? Tom, that makes me very happy. <laughs> Later that night, when I was through working, I left the garage. I tried to phone Nancy Peters three times, but she was out. The last time, I left a message for her to meet me in the lobby of the movie. I went there hoping I'd shaken my shadow off my trail. Fortunately, she got my message. And I told her to call the FBI to give them the address of the garage, 714 South Elm, and to make it fast because there was no time to lose. Then I walked out of the lobby and into the street. I looked back. Nancy Peters was going toward a phone booth in the theater lobby. I was about to walk to my room when... Enjoy the picture, Holiday? Mike. Yeah, Mike. Funny about you. You bought a ticket, walked in, talked with that dame, came right out again. I, uh, remember I'd seen the movie before. Sure. Who was the dame? What are you talking about? The dame. Who was she? What did you say to her? Look, Mike, that's my personal business. And it's mine, too. You went to a phone booth inside. Can I help it if some girl wants to use a phone? Yeah, I figure you can. Now, come on. We're going to Swanson. All right, Dan. 
man. Who was the girl? What'd you say? I never saw her before in my life. Just a chance acquaintance, huh? You could call it that. You're lying. All right, you know everything. Not quite, but I... Wait a minute. Suppose your name is Dan Holliday. Suppose it is. I got an idea. Sit still while I look through the phone book. Honey, I never thought of this before. Let's see. Holly, Holly. Holiday Dan. Well, you're in the phone book. There's only one Dan Holiday. That makes me unique among the holidays. What does it make you? Not a sucker, Holiday. Sit still, make a move, and I'll make a nice round hole in your head with this. Now we'll see. Dan Holiday, please. Mr. Holiday isn't in. Oh? Is he out of town, do you know? Who's calling? An old friend, Mr. Swanson. Oh, well, Mr. Swanson, Mr. Holiday's been gone for almost two weeks. Is that so? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. You've been gone two weeks, Holiday. It just about ties in with the time you've been here. Okay, Swanson, so I'm in the phone book and you found out I'm not at my apartment. What does that prove? That's what I'm going to find out. And if I... There's a race coming our way. The tip-off boys just flashed the rest. All right. Move the hot cars out back. Get all you can. Notify all branches we're shipping a load tonight. Tell the drivers to take the ones that aren't ready and run them in the river. Holiday, you're going with me. Get going. That, that dirty thing do the job? Yeah, come on. Getaway car in shape? Yeah, it's all set. Now, Holiday, you're going to see why we're never caught. What's wrong, Mr. Swanson? We have a stoolie with us, Peters. Stoolie? But... That's right, Peters. A stoolie. Clear out. There's a raid coming. Mike, warm up the car. Sure. Okay. Nothing to worry about. In, Holiday, get in. Okay, you're the boss. Let's go, Mike, up the ramp. Right. There they are. <laughs> Play with them, Mike. Let Holiday see how good we really are. What? You heard me. I'm almost catch up to it. And Holiday, don't duck when you hear shooting. They can't touch us in this. Besides, I want to save you for myself. They're right in our daylight, boss. Uh huh. <laughs> they might as well be using pea shooters. No, oh, show them what we can do, Mike. Get away. Holiday, they're almost standing still. Okay, Mike, head for the state line. What's the matter? You said this car was in shape. Get going, get going, you idiot. Run on a curb, we'll make a run for it. Pull in, Mike, pull in. Mike, Mike, help me. You dirty rat, you. Mr. Holiday? Oh, sure, Susie. Just some minor cuts and bruises. What happened? Well, Mr. Swanson took his eyes off me for a second. That was enough. I grabbed his gun. Cheapers. Oh, what happened to the car? Susie, put enough sugar in the gas tank of any car and it'll give up and die real soon. You see, it clogs the feed line. Oh. I took the sugar from Tom's lunch pail. Now, that was real smart. But how did you know you were going to be in the car? <laughs> well, I didn't. I plan to wreck the bank job. But as they say in books, sometimes things work out differently. And for the best. Mm. What about Tom Peters? Uh, he's all right. He was roped in. Fear made him stay. Hey, Susie, how about some coffee? Oh, sure. Right here. Cream? Uh-uh. Thanks. Sugar? Lots of it, Susie. Lots of it. I just love sugar. <laughs> Listen in again next week when, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville, with this week's story written by Albert Wagner from an original story by Bernard Fine. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager, and the part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Vern Carstensen is in charge of production. This is a made production from Hollywood. 
Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Care of Star Times. I have something that may intrigue your sense of adventure. I myself cannot follow it up because I am blind. However, if you will come to the Braille Room at the Public Library tomorrow at 11 in the morning, you may be able to find something. At 11 in the morning, you may be able to find something of interest. I think someone is in desperate danger and needs help. I'd like to know what you think. William Michaels. <laughs> well, the letter did intrigue me. And as I found out later, Mr. Michaels did have something. And now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, House of Darkness. How did Mr. Michaels knew about Box 13, Mr. Holliday? I wonder about that, too, Susie. He says he's blind. Gee, this is really one letter I'd follow up if I were you. You would? What? Well, wouldn't you? Wouldn't I if I were you? Yeah. No. I mean, you know what I mean, don't you? Not now. I had an inkling before, but that's all gone. <laughs> Never mind, though. What time is it? A uh, quarter till 11. Well, that gives me 15 minutes to get to the public library and also get a ticket for speeding if I want to get there on time. But maybe it'll be worth it. Well, I didn't get the ticket, and exactly 15 minutes later, I walked into the Braille room at the library. There were only two people in the room, a man and a woman. The woman was busily running her sensitive fingers over a book, but the man was facing the door with a tense, expectant expression on his face. I walked over to him and sat down. He turned his face toward me, and then... Box 13? That's right. You're William Michael? Yes. Yes, that's right. I didn't know whether you'd come or not. As a matter of fact, I have to wish you hadn't. Your letter mentioned adventure. I never turned that down. What have you got, Mr. Michaels? This. This book? Yes, it's in Braille, as, as you can see. Yes, I know that, but what about it? Let me read you a passage from, from page 80. Listen closely. Go ahead. And the terror of the night is hidden in the dark corners of my mind. And the shapes and phantoms that live in fancy are become real. Is that all? Yes, that's all on the page. All that was originally on the page. But listen to this. Help me. 1217 Granger Avenue. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that's on the page? Yes. Someone... Someone who knows how to read and write Braille has... He used a pin or a needle to put this message on the bottom. Let me see that page. Uh huh. The characters are faint, but someone has done what you said. What do you make of it? I don't know. Now, before we go any further, how did you come to write the box thirteen? Well, I, I have a friend who reads the newspaper to me. He saw your ad in the Star Times. Adventure wanted will go any place, do anything. Write box thirteen, and. Being a romantic sort of fellow, he... Well, he read it to me. Oh, I see. We sat and conjectured a lot of things. What you might get into through that ad. Oh, I managed to get into quite a lot of trouble, Mr. Michaels. But let's go back to this Braille message. Help me, 1217 Granger Avenue. When did you discover it? Well, uh, yesterday morning. Quite by accident. I, I almost ran my fingers past it. I thought the characters were imperfections in the paper, you see. That was at first. Mm hmm. Run your fingers over it again, will you? Yes. I did. Why? They're still sharp enough for you to read the characters. Yes, that, that's true. Therefore, they haven't had time to be pressed down, make them illegible, so to speak. And what does that mean? That they were made quite recently. Yes. Yes, of course. 
Oh, that's clever. No, it's just common sense. Do you think I, I should have taken this to the police? I don't know. It may be a joke, a prank. Yes, I, I thought of that. Let's find out, shall we? Are you going to that address? Oh, no, not yet. Not until I find out the name of the person who had this book out of the library. How can you learn that? <laughs> you see, every library book has a checkout card in the pocket on the inside of the front cover. Yes. Now, the checkout card has the number of the borrower's card on it. And the borrower's card has the name and address of the person. <laughs> now, let's go to the main desk, return this book, and see what the checkout card says. <laughs> And that we did. We waited until the book was returned to the Braille room. Then we looked at it again. Well, does it tell you anything? The checkout card, I mean. Let me see your library card. Oh, yes. There. Mm-hmm. Your card number is 9E4839. Now, that's the last card number written on this checkout slip. Then the one before mine must be the card number of the person who had the book out before me. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Uh, for the borrower's names ahead of yours... One of them has to belong to the person who put that message in the book. Copy them down, and maybe we can find out whose card it is. Uh-huh. Come on. Where to? The main desk again. Do you think it's it's some sort of joke? If it is, it's in bad taste. But coming at the end of that dismal paragraph you read me... Do you think that means anything? Your guess is as good as mine. Here we are. Oh, oh I beg your pardon, miss. Yes, sir. May I help you? I think you can. Here's a list of four card numbers. I'd like to know to whom the cards belong. Oh, I don't think I can give you that information, sir. Yeah. Against regulation? Well, yes. Well, my name is Dan Holliday. I think you have several of my books here in the library. Oh, of course. I've seen your picture on the jacket. Oh, now, don't hold that against me, please. Oh, I won't. But you wanted some names? Uh, yes. You see, I'm doing a little research, and, well, it's for a story. Well, I guess in your case it'll be all right. May I have the numbers? Oh, yes, here you are. I'll be back in a moment. I I didn't know you were a writer. In fact, I didn't even know your name. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now you know. Dan Holliday. Then this should be just your meet, Mr. Holliday. It all depends. If one of the card numbers checks with the address of the message, then maybe we've got something. I I almost hope it does. And then again, I... Oh, here she comes. Hold it. Here you are, Mr. Holliday. I hope you won't mention this because it is against regulations. I've already forgotten it. Are you writing a story about this? I don't know yet. Well, thank you very much. Not at all, Mr. Holliday. Well, what are the names? There are four of them, Mr. Michaels. And the last one on the list is Mrs. Martha Corbett, 1217 Granger Avenue. <laughs> Half hour later, Michaels and I sat in my car a few houses down from 1217 Granger Avenue. Maybe the whole thing was a joke. Then again, maybe it wasn't. Michael sat silently for a couple of minutes and then... Do you... Do you see anyone, Mr. Holliday? No, not a soul. What kind of place is it? Big, dark. Not at all the type of house associated with sweetness and light. Uh -huh. But then maybe I'm making mysteries out of nothing. You're, you're not going in? With what? Could I ask to see Mrs. Martha Corbett? Why not, if she needs help? We don't know that, Michael, do we? Why, why did you stop talking? Isn't that a car? Yes. Yes, it is. It's got in front of the house. Who is it? I don't know. But it's a doctor's car and he's getting out. Doctor? Uh-huh. Which means nothing at all. Doctor's illegal. What's he doing? He's gone into the house. I... Michael, I've got an idea. What is it? I'm going to make a phone call and find out something. A phone call? To whom? To the automobile club and find out who belongs to that license number in the doctor's car. Then later, I'll visit the doctor. Well, I found out who the doctor was. I dropped Michael to the library and told him I'd meet him there later. It took me ten minutes to convince the doctor's receptionist that I had to see him. Then in his office... My nurse tells me you insisted upon seeing me, Mr. Uh... Mr. The name is Holiday. Dan Holiday. Oh, very well, Mr. Holiday. Now, what seems to be the trouble? I uh, I have a headache. Headache? <laughs> Good heavens, man. My nurse seemed to think it was some fatal disease. Well, it's a bad headache. Um, who sent you to me, Mr. Holiday? One of your patients, Dr. Fulsey. Oh, really? And may I ask which one? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, I'll give you a couple of tablets to relieve you. But the cause of the headache is something we'll have to look into. Here you are. Thank you. A uh, glass of water. 
The patient who sent me was Mrs. Martha Corbett. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I must have knocked the glass out of your hand. Although I didn't touch it. Did I? I'm sorry. It was clumsy of me. No harm done. So Mrs. Corbett sent you to me, huh? Yes, she recommended you very highly. Is that so? When did you last see her? Well, not recently. Just what are you trying to pull, Mr. Holliday? Paul, I don't understand. Evidently not. Because I don't think you even know Mrs. Corbett. No? What makes you think that? She hasn't seen anyone for six months. Not a soul. Except you. I'm her physician. So you are. Dr. Folsey, what's wrong with Mrs. Corbett? Until you tell me what you're trying to do, I refuse to answer your questions. Suppose I told you she asked for help. You're lying. Maybe you are, too. I... <clears throat> Mr. Holliday, I... I want to show you something. I have no idea what business this is of yours, but since you seem to think it is, I don't mind showing you these. Here, look at these papers. These... These are commitment papers for Mrs. Martha Carter. Exactly. Seven years ago, she was confined to a sanatorium. I see. And now... And now, this. Who's the phone call to? The police, Mr. Holliday. Care to stay around for it? Put it down, Doctor. You win. Now... I'll give you just one minute to get out of my office. If you're not gone in that time, I'll complete that call. All right, Doctor. I'm sorry to have bothered you. I won't do it again. That's right. You won't. And you left his office, Mr. Holliday? What else could I do? I poked in there on a flimsy excuse. He tried to call the police. Mr. Holliday, please believe me, I'm blind myself, and I... What do you mean, Michaels? I know what she thinks, how she thinks... I don't know what you're driving at. A person who is blind develops almost a psychic sense. Call it an extra sense if you want, but he does have it. I'm sure that Mrs. Corbett needs help. Now, look, all we have is that message in the library book. I told you Dr. Falsey showed me her commitment papers. But he didn't put through the call to the police. He... Oh, I see what you mean. A bluff. Yes, it could have been. Yeah, it could have been. I wonder if a person with nothing to conceal, with nothing to be afraid of, would have gone through with that call. Well, put yourself in his place. Would you? I think I would have. Maybe you're right, Michaels. Then what are you going to do? Well, I've gone this far. I may as well go all the way. Yes? Where? All the way into that house on Granger Avenue. <laughs> Now back to House of Darkness, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Land as Dan Holliday. Well, maybe it was a wild goose chase with no chance of bagging any game at the end. But it was worth a try. If Dr. Fosey was bluffing, then he put on a good act. If he wasn't, I had to play it straight anyway. So later that same afternoon, I walked up the stairs to the front door of 1217 Granger Avenue. I rang the bell and waited. Yes? Oh, how do you do? My name is Holliday. Yes, what do you want? I'm the inspector from the power company. I have to look over the wiring and fixtures in your house. No? <laughs> if it's convenient, yes. Well, it really isn't at the moment. It'll only take a few minutes. I know it's a nuisance, but it has to be done. How long will you be? How many rooms have you got? Only six that we use. Oh. Then it'll be about a half hour. Well... All right, come in. If you have something to do, I can make the rounds myself. I'll go with you. I'll show you the rooms we use. All right. Please lead the way. The library is here. Hmm. One ceiling fixture. Two wall fixtures. Any lamp outlets on the baseboards? Two. Right here. Uh-huh. Well, they look okay. Ceiling picture seems all right. Ever have any trouble with shorts, blown fuses? No, none at all. Everything in the house is in perfect working order. Oh, that's good. Makes my job easier. All right, Mr... Mr... The name is Whitley, and... Didn't you know that? I, um... I cover about a dozen houses a day. Names don't mean a thing to me. Only fixtures. Oh. Well, come this way. The dining room is just off the library. Next to that is the kitchen. Then one of the bedrooms, and the baths are off to the right of the bedroom. 
There are several small panels. We went through one room after another. They have no lights in them. Then we went upstairs and Whitley led the way along a hallway that started at the head of the stairs and ran to a window at the far end. There were only two rooms off the hallway. We stopped at the first one. This room is merely a storage room. Would you care to see in? Oh, yes, I would. That is, if you don't mind. Not at all. Oh, just an empty room. Just an empty room. As you can see, the ceiling fixture has only one bulb in it. Well, it seems to work all right. And that's all. What about that room down there? We never use it. What's in it? Nothing at all, beyond a few odds and ends of old furniture. Mind if I look at it? It's locked. Huh. Don't you have a key for it? No, the key was lost. I'm having another one made. Perhaps if you come again... It's an inside room, isn't it? No windows, I mean. Does that make any difference? I assure you, the room is never used. The lighting fixtures were sealed up some years ago. Oh, I see. Now, if that's all, and if you don't mind, I have some other things to do. And What's that? This is an old house. The water pipes are defective. This way, Mr. Holliday. Oh, certainly. I have your phone. Why, yes, downstairs. I'd like to use it if you don't mind. All right, if you'll follow me. <laughs> led the way back downstairs. I knew I had to stay in that house if I was to find out what or who was in that locked room. I had an idea and I hoped it worked. But if it didn't, well, I'd never get another chance to get back into the house. Then downstairs. There's the phone. Help yourself. Oh, thank you. I hope I haven't inconvenienced you, Mr. Whitley. But these things have to be done, you know. Of course. Hello. Hello, Michaels. This is Holiday. Holiday. I've just made my inspection of 1217 Granger Avenue. Everything looks okay. I called to find out if there's anything else to do in this neighborhood. What? Uh Uh-huh. Oh? Oh, hang on. I'll find out. Mr. Whitley? Yes? I wonder if you would mind looking out of the front window and see if any linemen are working the street. I... Uh, all right. I'll be back in a moment. Michaels, listen closely. Wait ten minutes after I hang up. Then call this number. Gramercy 8342. A man named Whitley will answer. Say you're a Dr. Fulsey. You've got to see him immediately. Give him, give him a phony address. Say you're calling from a phone booth. That's so Whitley doesn't have to check the call bank. Sound excited? Nervous. Then hang up with no explanations. Have you got it? Yes, yes, I've got it. Good. Sure, Michaels, I'll go right over there right now. Oh, just a second. There are no linemen working outside at all. Oh, oh thank you. They haven't got here yet, Michaels. Yeah. See you later. So long. No, if you're quite finished. Yes, I'm quite finished. Thank you. But they saw me to the door. I went to my car and pretended to drive away. But I parked around the corner and walked back toward the house. I hid in the doorway until I saw Whitley leave the house. He was in a hurry, so I knew Michael's fake call had reached him. It was evening and almost dark. I circled the house and tried all the windows until I found one leading into the basement that I could force. <laughs> Brother, I was breaking the law, but I had to. I went upstairs to the room Whitley hadn't let me see. I knocked. What do you want? Please go away. Leave me alone. Mrs. Leave Corbett. Me alone. Mrs. Corbett, I've come to help you. I found your message in the library book. You thank him. Come on in. I... I thought the door was locked. No. Where are you? Come closer. I'm right here. Who... Who are you? I don't mind that now. What's going on here? Please, get me out of here. You must. The door wasn't locked. You could have gotten out. I'm blind. I'm afraid. I, I tried to get out before, but someone's always there. Well, there's no one in the house now. Whitley's gone. Gone? For good? No, he'll come back. Who is he? Why are you kept in here? He's my nephew. They want me to send the will. He's grown up and then they'll kill me. No, no, they won't. Day after day, I put messages in books they brought me from the library. First I wrote them, but they found them. Then I put the message in Braille. I know all that. You said something about a will. Yes. If I sign it, they'll kill me, and I I can't stand it much longer. I'll have to sign it, and then they'll kill me. As soon as I sign it, they'll kill me. Mrs. Corbett. I saw Dr. Folsey. I saw commitment papers he had. It's not true. He forged them. Forged them for my nephew. Don't you see? If I ever got out, they'd have those papers to prove that I... I... Yes. Yes, I see. 
How long have you been here? A year. Please, you've got to get me out. Look, Mrs. Corbett, I broke the law by getting in here. If it happens, you're not telling the truth. I'm in a bad spot. They could prosecute me. You've got to believe me. Please. Maybe I do. All right, I'll take the chance. <laughs> I'm going to you to You're coming back. Something must have gone wrong. You can't get out of here. There aren't any windows. Listen, now you've got to help me. I'll get in that closet. Don't give any sign that you know I'm here. Hurry, hurry. They mustn't find you. That's up to you. <laughs> I got into the closet and waited. Then I heard... Well, Aunt Martha, I was a little worried about you. Whitley, we've got to get her out of here. Don't worry, Fosey, we will. You had to fall for that big inspector, Dad. Shut up. Aunt Martha, we'll give you one more chance. Sign the will now and nothing will happen to you. If you don't, we'll... No, I won't sign it now. What does she mean, now? I... I don't know. Aunt Martha, what did you mean? Nothing, nothing. She did, Whitley. Yeah, and that fake call from you. Aunt Martha, is someone here? No, there's no one. Please let me alone. Fosey, go to the closet. Open the door. Me? Don't worry. If someone's in there, we can take care of them. Go on. Quickly, it's him, the man who came to see me. Well, well, the inspector himself. Come on out. All right. And what do you think you'll do with that gun? What do you think? Fosey. What? Call your office. Arrange for an ambulance to come here. Well, what are you going to do? What we have to do. Look, no killings, please. Shut up. Ask how you found out about the fake call from our Dr. Folsom. I called his office when he wasn't where he was supposed to be. Well, Fosey, go on. Please, Whitley, no killing. You're in this up to your neck. You'll do as I say. Oh, sure. Do what he says, Dr. Folsey. Throw away a lifetime of helping others. Isn't that what a doctor does? You shut up. All right, I will. Whitley, there's some other way. I don't think so. No, there's no other way, Dr. Folsey. Just do what he says. Forget that you once took an oath, an oath that all doctors take. It's easy to forget, isn't it? You'll stop talking now, Holiday, or I'll see that you do. <laughs> One way or the other, I'll get it. So why shouldn't I talk now? Go ahead, doctor. Call the ambulance. Take Mrs. Corbett and me out of here. Go ahead. Posey, go on. They left the house. Whitley had a gun in my back. Mrs. Corbett had been drugged and was put on a stretcher. The ambulance waved in front. I looked around. The street was almost deserted except for one man walking slowly toward the house. Then I heard it. The tapping of a cane. The lone man coming closer. It was Michaels. He stopped. Holiday, get in the ambulance. Go on. Hurtley, for the last time, don't try this. Hurtley, we've got to hurry. Go on, Holiday. What are you staring at? That man? No. He's blind, isn't he? Holiday, that man, do you know him? No, I don't. I think you do, and you make one sound, one move to let him know what's going on, he goes with us, too. I said I don't know him. I don't believe you. And remember what I said, one move and he goes along. If you want that to happen, do as you please. Yeah, that's better. Remember what I said. Let him get past. Ah! I'm sorry. I stumbled. It's all right. Hurt? No, no, no. I caught myself against the, the side of his car. All right. It frightened me. I, I seem to have dropped my cane. Here you are. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, that's being a good boy, Holiday. You would have killed him too, wouldn't you? Yes. <laughs> you saved his life, Holiday. Now get in. And we'll all take a little ride. Well, it looked hopeless. This was going to be a great ride. Our only hope was Michael's, but how could he help? He was blind. But he must have read my mind because he laughed. <laughs> you were very smart, Holiday, but you seem to have outsmarted yourself. Yeah, it looks that way, doesn't it? But do you really think you're going to get away with this? Why not? Your only hope is a blind man. Whitley, what's that? Posey, what's that? Police cars. All right, don't get excited. They can't be after us. Whitley, they are after us. Don't put your head. Looks like something slipped up, doesn't it, Whitley? <laughs> You're whistling in the dark. Look, they're signaling us to stop. Huh? Go on. Get going. Out, run. 
It's no use. We can't do it. There's a traffic signal ahead. I'll have him go through. No, they'll shoot. I'll let this. It's your fault. I'll get you. I'll kill you. you oh, no, you I'll don't. Kill you. Oh. Looks like this is your last ride, Whitley. Olsey, tell the guy to stop this ambulance. Yes, Mr. Holliday. I don't know how Michaels did it, Whitley. But I'm very glad he did. How'd you ever do it, Mr. Michaels? <laughs> With these. Just his hands and his fingers, Susie. I don't get it. Sure, Michaels. Oh. All right. Now, look, Susie. Here's a coin with a date on it. Yeah? Date is 1935. You... Oh, you felt those numbers with your fingers? <laughs> That's right, Susie. And it was simple for him to run his fingers over the license plates of the ambulance. <laughs> when I stumbled, I, I dropped my cane... I ran my hands over the car. I knew it wasn't a regular automobile. And I felt the license plate. Gee, uh, and then you went to police. That's right. And that, Susie, is what you call using your head and fingers. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Listen in again next week when, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville. And this week's original story was written by Sam Walters. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager, and the part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Vern Carstensen is in charge of production. Box 13 is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Care of Star Times. If you're interested in preventing a murder, come to 327 North Greeley Street in Edgemont. It should take you only three hours by train to get here. But you must come at exactly 3.30, or it may be too late. Huh. The whole letter was typed. Even the signature at the bottom, Pat Kennedy. I didn't know if Pat Kennedy was a man or a woman. But as it turned out, it didn't matter. Even though I got there before 3.30. <laughs> Now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Double Trouble. How long will you be gone this time, Mr. Holliday? Oh, it's a little hard to tell, Susie. I think it depends on Pat Kennedy, whoever he or she is. I don't like letters that have only typed signatures at the bottom. Why not? Well, it, it, it always makes me think that someone else wrote it. And that's exactly what makes me think this may be very interesting. You mean, you agree with me? Absolutely. But you're still going to Edgemont. That's right, Susie. <laughs> I'll never learn, will I? Someday you'll get into trouble. What makes you think I haven't already? Well, don't put the light in the window for me, Susie. I'll try to find my way around in the dark. So long. Well, whoever wrote that letter was right train left me on Edgemont Station platform exactly three hours after I left Susie. And a taxi left me in front of 327 Greeley Street at 3.20, ten minutes before deadline. It was an apartment house. I walked into the lobby. A not-too-interested clerk looked up as I walked over to him. Yeah? Is there a Pat Kennedy living here? Uh-huh. Miss Pat Kennedy. Why? I'd like to see her. Apartment 1B, straight down the hall. Um, aren't you going to ring her up first? No phone in her place. But be sure you knock first. Oh, sure, sure. That's one of my good habits. 1B, you said, huh? Yeah, uh, one, one B, I said. Thank you. Sure, honey. I got to apartment 1B. I knocked. 
Then I tried the door. It was open and I walked in. Miss Kennedy. Pat Kennedy. I walked into the apartment a little farther. The clock on a table ticked away. Its hands at 323. There was a window open in the room and I walked to it. The window faced a court. I turned away from it, walked into the bedroom, and I stopped. Miss Kennedy. Miss Kennedy. Don't move, bud. Huh? Get away from her. You better send for a doctor. Just stay right where you are. Doctor? It's a little late for that. She's dead. Yeah, I thought so. Oh. Oh, you did. And who are you? I think I'll ask the questions. Stand right there. Now, look, this girl's been killed. I'm going for the... His fist hit me right on the button when I got there, looking down at me. Where then was another man. The newcomer blinked once or twice, and then... The next time you try to make a break for it, fellow, make sure you don't try an end run past an ex pug. That makes you think he's ex. Come on, get up. What's this all about? Got any idea who we are? No. My name is Johnston. Lieutenant Johnston, homicide. Who called the police? Yeah, that's what I'd like to know. Cassidy? Yeah, Lieutenant? Bring that clerk in here. Yes, yeah, sir, right away. So you're the police? Uh-huh. And you're Dan Holliday, visiting Edgemont. How do you know who I am? Yeah, your wallet, identification. Oh, thanks. Okay, start talking. Who did this? Are you kidding? Hardly. Take a look at her, and then ask that again, and then ask that again. I'm sorry, but I don't know anything about it. You no? Know? Cassidy walked in on you while you were bending over. So what? That doesn't mean anything. Well, maybe not, but Here's I'll... the clerk, Lieutenant. Okay. Ever see this man before? You, I'm talking to you. Me? That's right. Sure, I seen him. He came in maybe ten minutes ago and asked for Miss Kennedy. Is that right, Holiday? Yeah, that's right. Uh-huh. Cassidy? Uh, yes, sir. What time did you walk in on this? Oh, maybe, uh, 3.25. That's right, too. You, uh, clerk, what's your name? Marvin. Marvin Redmond. Anyone else come to see Miss Kennedy today? Uh, no, sir, nobody. Just this man. You sure? Yes. Did anybody get by you at the desk? Oh, no, I see everybody who comes in. Uh-huh. Well, Holiday? What do you mean, well? You were the only one here. Now, wait a minute. I don't know any more about this than you do. I came in here and found her like that. Why? Why what? Why did you come to see her? She asked me to. Old friend? I didn't even know her. <laughs> you want to say that again? Uh, what I meant was I didn't know who she was. Wait a minute. There's a letter in my wallet. Letter? Yeah, I... It wasn't here. What kind of a letter are you talking about? It's a letter from Miss Kennedy asking me to help her. She was afraid of being killed. She had a reason. So you got a letter from her? That's right. Someone took the letter. Where did you find my wallet? On the floor. Why? The person who killed her also took that letter out of my wallet. <laughs> Look, you tried to get past Cassidy. He thought you were making a break for it and slugged you. And then he called headquarters. You weren't alone for even ten seconds. Meaning no one could have taken that letter? Right. Oh, no, that, that's wrong. I, I mean, I... I... Huh? What were you going to say, Redmond? Oh, that... There's no phone in here. Mr. Cassidy had to come to the desk to make a call. Cassidy, did you? Well, well, sure, but this guy was out cold. He couldn't get away, so I thought it... So you thought it was all right to take a walk down the hall? You idiot. You should have called for the clerk and got him to make the call. But, Lieutenant, yeah, I thought... but. Well, Lieutenant... John... Shut up. You're going to headquarters. On what charge? Just one, but it's a good one. Suspicion of murder. So that's your story, huh, Holiday? You're a good Samaritan. You help people. That's it. Call Lieutenant Kling. I gave you the number. And I'll give you some news. This happens to be Edgemont, different city. I'm the lieutenant here. Kling, can identify me? Verify my story? I'll do all the police work necessary on this case. Sure, sure you will. Cassidy, one of your men, pulls a prize boner. He walks out of a room where there's a murdered girl. He leaves me there alone. So what? That's exactly what you're thinking. So what? Cover for him. Use me as a goat. You've got a sucker. Is that it? Play him for all his work. I'll play you for all your work. You were the only one to see that Kennedy girl today. Well, that makes me a killer. That makes you the best suspect I've ever seen. What's my motive for killing? I'll find one. Oh, you will? I will. 
So you really believed I killed her? I do. Mm-hmm. You want to charge me with murder? Or just book me on suspicion? I... You're a pretty smart boy, aren't you? Just smart enough to know that you don't have enough evidence to charge me. And while we're on the subject of intelligence, how come your man Cassidy was Johnny on the spot? You'd like to know, which it... it might help. No, we were tipped. Someone called headquarters, said there'd be a murder at that address, and I sent Cassidy. Uh-huh. So the letter I got from her is gone. Somebody tips the police, and you still refuse to believe it might have been a frame. With me doing the laughing cavalier insider. I'll tell you everything when I've got everything. Meanwhile, you'll cover for Cassidy so your detective division doesn't get a lash. Shut up. Yes? Lieutenant? Who'd you expect, Sherlock? Lieutenant, uh, is it all right to talk? Can you? Is, uh, is Holiday going to be charged? Uh, what do you got, Cassidy? Why do you ask that? Because there's an attorney here with a writ of habeas corpus. What? What did you say? Well, there's a lawyer here. Shut up! Well, got friends in town, Holiday? If so, they're very welcome. And you said you were a stranger, Nedgeman. I still say it. Uh-huh. Yet a perfect stranger comes along and springs you on a writ. Is that so? And he knows there'll have to be a bail post. Brother, that's hospitality. Well, Lieutenant, is there a formal charge or do I walk out of that door? Well, get out. Well, thank you. But I'm not finished with you. Don't try to leave town or you'll be picked up for jumping bail. Don't worry. I'm just as much interested in this as you are. Holiday, mark my words, I believe you're guilty. And so help me, as sure as I'm a foot high, I'll get evidence to prove it. Even if you have to frame me to clear that great brain. Meaning Cassidy. Yeah. I'll get you. And when I do, it'll be for keeps. Well, Lieutenant Johnson was burned. He knew his department was in for a roasting if Cassidy's mistake got out. Meanwhile, I looked very funny as a goat. <laughs> and I didn't even know who had had me released. The lawyer brought the writ and put my bail up, wouldn't say a word. He left me, and it was dark when I walked out on the street. I couldn't leave Edgemont, and I didn't want to. Not yet. I got into a cab knowing I'd be followed by one of Johnson's men. and went to a hotel and registered. I was just sitting down to think when... Yes, who is it? Is that Mr. Holliday? Yes, who are you? Please, I must see you. Please let me in. Oh, no, thanks. Not until I know who and what you are. Look, I will slide something under the door. You look at it, then you decide that you should let me in or not. All right? Go ahead. Did it come through? Yeah. You are satisfied, Mr. Holliday? This... This is a receipt for my bail bond. Yes. I'm the one who got you out. Please, I can come in now. You're Philip Duval. Yes, yes. Now, please to let me in before it is too late. Okay, come on in quickly. <sighs> Mr. Holliday, you know that you are followed here. Sure, Johnson's watching every move I make. Yes. Why'd you bail me out? What do you know about Pat Kennedy? I knew her ten years ago, maybe. We were dancing partners. Wait a minute. Were you followed up here? Oh, no, no. I am sure that I was not. How do you know? Because the police do not know me. How do you know I was here? I was watching Pat's room. Yes, go on. Then I waited outside the police station. I see you come out. I see the detective follow you. I make sure I am not followed. Then I come here. Uh Uh-huh. And then what? I come to this hotel and take a room. I looked at the register. I see your name. Then I wait... And then come here. Mr. Duvall, you seem to know quite a bit about how to evade tacklers and slip away from enemies. Because I want to know who killed her. How is she to you? We we are in love once. Then she leaves me. I do not see her for a long time. I find out she is here, and I come. And kill her. No, 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 please. Please, would I do all this for you if I kill her? Why, why? Maybe I'll find an answer. What do you want with me now? I want... I want to give you this. This is a letter addressed to Box 13. Yes, yes, you will please to read it. Box 13. By accident, I saw your ad in the Star Times. I must have your help because I cannot go to the police. Please come to me as soon as you can. You see, she is afraid. The one time I see her, she tells me she is afraid. Of what? Of whom? I do not know. 
How did you get hold of this letter? She gave it to me to mail. I, I laugh at her. I think she is being foolish. But now... So you didn't mail it? No, no. Yet, I did receive a letter with a type signature. A letter that anyone could have written. Yes, yes. Okay, Mr. Duvall. Sit down and do a lot of talking. Oh, no, not here. You will please come to my address later tonight. Why? Because, because although I am not sure, I think I know who killed her. And unless you want to be arrested for her murder, I think you better come to see me. And now back to Double Trouble, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, I had to take Duvall at his word. What that word was, I didn't know. Maybe he did kill Pat Kennedy. Maybe he didn't. Anyway, I had to see him. I slipped out of the hotel knowing that one of Johnson's men was trailing me. I had to find some way to get rid of him. There was a war surplus store open down the street. I went in. Yes, sir. Can I help you? Yes, I think so. Got any coveralls? Oh, sure. Stacks of them. What size? 44. <laughs> any place I can try them on? Yes, the small room in the back. I'll get you a pair of the coveralls. Uh, it's all right. I'll look for them myself. I'd like to take them out. All right. They're all on the racks there. How much are they? Three ninety-five. <laughs> okay, here you are. Thank you. Even change. Just take your pick. Yeah, thanks. I stepped behind one of the racks. The plainclothesman trailing me was waiting outside. I picked one of the coveralls from the rack and slipped into the back room. Pulled the coveralls over my clothes and climbed out of the room through a window. <laughs> wasn't a great disguise, but it was better than having the police look for a man wearing a light gray suit. Twenty minutes later, I rang the bell at the ball's place. Yes? Is Mr. Duvall here? Philip? Yes, Philip Duvall. No, he's not here. Uh, will you come in, please? Oh, thank you. I'm worried for him. He said he would be home an hour ago, but uh, he's not come. No phone call to you? No. Uh, who are you, please? A friend of his. My name is Holiday. Holiday? Then, then you are the man he went to see. Tonight? We. Oui. You mean he called and said he was going to see me? No, he went earlier. Uh -huh. And he hasn't come back yet? No. Oh, I'm so worried. Do, do you know Pat Kennedy? Yes, I know her. I read that she is dead, and I am glad. Glad? Why? Philip loved her. She did not love him. She left him. Yes, I know all that. Philip did not know Miss Kennedy was here until he happened to see her. Did he mention that she was afraid of something? Yes, he told me. But I ask him, I beg him not to see her because she's not good. She's not good at all. Do you know of what she was afraid? No. Only that Philip told me that she could not go to the police, that the police would not be able to help. I wonder why not. I do not know. I know nothing except that I want my son to forget her. Because if he does not, she will bring bad things, she will. That's your phone. It's probably your son. Yes, yes it is, Philip. <laughs> Would you tell him I'm here, please, and hurry? Yes? Uh, yes, this is Mrs. Duval. No, no, I'm his mother. What? No. What? No. What's the matter? No. No. No, please. Give me the receiver. Oh, no. Hello. Mrs. Duvall can't talk. I... No. What? My... Oh, goodbye. <laughs> Mrs. Duvall, I'm terribly sorry. They do not mean what they say. They do not mean... My son cannot be dead. I'm, I'm afraid it's true. That was the police. What do you want? I thought you was in jail. They let me out. Marvin, how long did Miss Kennedy live here? I... 
You got no right. Come to... on, come on. I'm not going to hurt you. I just want some questions answered. I don't know nothing about it. I think you do. Who came to see Miss Kennedy when she was alive? Listen, I don't want no trouble. You got it. Answer me. Did anyone come to see Miss Kennedy often? Yeah, but I, I didn't know who he was. Not until. Until today, huh? That's right. I didn't know. But that don't make no difference. It makes a lot of difference now. Thanks, Mark. You've helped me a lot. You ain't gonna get me in no trouble. No, no trouble at all for anyone except me. I want to go into Miss Kennedy's apartment. You can't go in there. I think I can. Come on, Marvin, let me in. You, you said there wasn't gonna be no trouble. Marvin, you'll get up off of that chair and let me in Miss Kennedy's apartment or I'll... Okay, okay. But you're making me do it. If the police ask, you're making me do it. That's right. Come on. Come on, then. That's the boy. Straight ahead. Go ahead in, Marvin. I gotta get back to the desk. Sure, and call the police? I don't think so, Marvin. You're staying right here. What are you looking for? A typewriter. You see any? She didn't have none. How do you know? I never heard her using one. Mm -hmm. Look around if you see one, yo. I gotta get back to the desk. Just a minute. In a minute. There ain't no typewriter in here. Uh huh. I didn't think there would be. Well, then what's the idea? A good one. Okay, Marvin, I'm sorry to do this, but I'm going to have to put you out of action for a little while. Until I can get into action. Well, what are you going to do? You ain't going to hit me or nothing like oh, that. Oh, no, don't worry. You're just going to be tied up. It'll be uncomfortable. But I'll tell you something, Marvin. What? You won't be half as uncomfortable as I was, and still could be. So, Miss Kennedy didn't have a typewriter. And the letter Duvall had shown me proved that she wrote a letter to me by hand. So, it was a frame to get me for her murder. And I had a pretty good idea who put it around me. Approving it was another matter. I took off the coveralls I was still wearing, hopped a cab, and went back to police headquarters. And when I walked in... Hey, it's you. Hello, Cassidy. Where did you come from? Never mind that now. Is Lieutenant Johnson in? No, he ain't. No, I don't wait. Do you mind? What do you want to see him about? The murder of Miss Pat Kennedy and the murder of Philip Duvall. What are you talking about? I'll tell the lieutenant all about it. Uh -huh. Maybe you better tell me, Holiday. I'm saving it. Mind if I wait in Johnson's office? How about waiting in my office? Hmm. No, thanks. I like to be alone and do some thinking. What about? Lots of things. But this is getting us nowhere. I'm going into Johnson's office. I told you we ain't in. I know you told me, and I told you I'd wait for him. Okay. Okay, go ahead in and wait. Well, thanks, Cassidy. I'll tell him you're in there. And don't try to get out once you're in. Don't worry, I'll stay put this time. So far, so good. I took a quick look around Johnson's office. There was a typewriter, and I tried it. The type looked the same as the typing on the letter I'd received. The one supposed to have come from Pat Kennedy. Then, as I was looking around... Are you looking for something, Holiday? Ah, oh, come in, Lieutenant. You just love to stick your head in bad places, don't you? Look, Johnson. You would like to know who killed Pat Kennedy, wouldn't you? I know. Maybe you do. And maybe you'd also like to know who killed Philip Duvall, because he knew of what Pat Kennedy was afraid. He was afraid? Of what? Not of what, Johnson? Of whom? What have you got, Holiday? Look, the killer murdered her after he sent me that letter. He killed her just before I was due to show up there. Go on. But the letter was missing from my wallet. If there was a letter? There was, and it was written on this. What are you talking about? You're crazy. I don't think so. From all I found out, Miss Kennedy wasn't too nice. Maybe, maybe she was keeping company with someone who got tired of her. Someone who couldn't afford to let it be known that he knew her. Yeah, who is this he you're talking about? The same man who took the letter from my wallet. The same man who watched me go into that apartment building and then called the police and tipped you to the murder. There was only one man alone with you. That's right. Cassidy? Could be. Now, wait a minute. You wait. I'll sit here on your desk and talk. Hey, go ahead. Now, he waits until I get to the apartment. This man who's afraid the girl will spill the beans about the two of them. Previously, he'd threatened her if she talked. But she was afraid to go to the police. Only because the police couldn't help her. 
Meaning that the man who threatened her... Was on the force. <laughs> oh, it's funny, huh? Yeah, you're doing a lot of talking, but you haven't said anything yet. All right, I'll start now. That was only the build-up. Wait till I get through. I'm waiting. So Cassidy kills her, frames me, tips the police. Sure. Only he was here when I sent him out to follow up the tip. How could he kill her and get back in that short time? Because the call came from here. Look, all you have to do to get an outside line on one of these phones is to push up this lever. You get a dial tone. You dial police, put in a fake call, and sit back and wait to be sent out on it. Yeah. But there's only one more thing wrong, Holiday. Name it. You got there early. I know I did. I... What? I said you got there early. Yeah, I got there early. Not at 3.30, as the letter asked, but at 3.20. Now, how could you know that unless you read the original letter? Don't move, Halliday. I won't, because I'm not finished. The man who killed Miss Kennedy and Duvall was you. You got Duvall's name and address from the copy of the bail receipt. You had access to it. You knew where to find him. What are you going to do with all this wonderful information? Give it to the police. I'm the police. I'm in charge of this case. Mm-hmm. And if I start to walk out of that door... You'll be killed while escaping. And if I sit right here on your desk, how will you explain a lot of things that will have to come out if I'm brought to trial? Yeah, that's true, too, isn't it? I guess the only thing to do is kill you. And turn around. I have to make this look good. You were running away from me. I shot you. Turn around, Holiday. If you don't, I'll do it for you. Now, get up. Okay. I'm up. Turn around. Start walking toward that window. Okay, I'm... I'm walking. That's it. Far enough. Now, Holiday. Down, Holiday. Yeah, Cassidy. Drop that gun, Lieutenant. You Cassidy. stupid fool. Thank you, Cassidy. Thanks very much. Yeah. Say. Say, you're a pretty smart guy. A pretty smart guy to do what you did. But, but Mr. Holliday, it was a policeman that did the murder? Don't let that throw you, Susie. You see, there's a bad apple in every barrel, no matter what the barrel is. Don't let that change your opinion of the thousands of policemen doing a wonderful job all over the country. Of course. Mr. Holliday, how did it happen that Mr. Cassidy came in just at the right time? Because I was sitting on Johnson's desk. I don't get it. <laughs> well, you see, there was an inner office communication box on his desk. I kept most of the levers pressed down. I, uh, I sat on them. Somebody had to hear that conversation between me and Johnson. And I figured someone would come in. If they hadn't have... Well, Edgemont is a nice city, but not one I'd like to be buried in. You sat on the levers through the whole conversation. Uh-huh. Gee, that's your using your head, Mr. Holliday. It's your... Huh? Oh, good night, Susie. Listen in again next week when Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Fox 13. Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Hello. Hello, operator. Operator. Operator, I want to send a telegram immediately to Box 13, care of the Star Times. Come to room 507, Hotel Belvedere. Please waste no time because this is a matter of life and death, perhaps for dozens of people. I am Dr. matter of life and death, perhaps for dozens of people. I am Dr. Theodore Miller. Dr. Miller's telegram reached me at my apartment, special messenger from the Star Times. It was special, all right. Extra special trouble. And now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, The Biter Betton. Dr. 
Captain Miller's telegram reached me at 5.15 in the afternoon. At 5.32, I was on the fifth floor of the Hotel Belvedere. At 5.33, I spotted the room number, 507. Then I heard... Well, what was it? I walked to room 507 and the sound became louder. I knocked at the door. Yes? Who is it, please? Box 13. Oh, good, good. Thank you. Please do come in. Thank you for coming. Thank you. You're welcome, but for what? Oh, I will explain. Uh, excuse me a moment. Oh, certainly. Oh, it's no use. Oh, you're so right, Dr. Miller. Music like that does seem a little out of place. You're joking. I think you're the joker, Dr. Miller. Uh, no, no. Please forgive me, but I am desperate. Why don't you settle down and explain your telegram and this, this weird little concert? I'm Dr. Theodore Miller. Yes, I know that. I'm Dan Holliday. Mr. Holliday, do you know what a herpetologist is? Yes, I know what it is. A snake expert. Exactly. So? Mr. Holliday... Some place in this hotel, perhaps on this very floor, there is a dangerous snake loose. Are you kidding? No, no. I, I'd better explain. Yes, you'd better. I'm in town to address the medical society on the use of snake serums in the treatment of hemophilia. I brought a king cobra along. It has escaped. H here in this room? I don't know where it is. Dr. Miller, thank you for the telegram and the music. <laughs> I'm going. Uh, wait, please. You're either a liar or you're crazy. No, no, no. Look. Look here. My credentials. The, the hotel manager will verify them. You yourself can check. You will see that I am who I say I am. That doesn't stop you from being insane. I know how all this sounds, but please believe me, we must find that cobra. I can understand your concern. But you've got to understand my position, which is one I don't like. If you want adventure, this is it. Granted, You but... still think this is a joke? Yes. 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 Wait a moment. Hello. Will you have Mr. Larkin come to my room? Oh, oh this is uh, Dr. Miller, 507. Thank you. Larkin? Who's he? The hotel manager. Look, Mr. Holliday, I swear to you that I'm telling the truth. Somehow, in some way, the cobra escaped. But look, here is the case in which I usually keep it. You can see for yourself that the catch is loose. I'm beginning to believe you. You must. It might be in this room? I don't think so. I've trained the snake. What? Yes. When it hears the little pipe I play, it can't, because I always feed it immediately after the music. Oh, but this time it hasn't come back. No, I... We come in. Ah, Mr. Larkin. Have you found it? No, I have not. Uh, Mr. Larkin, this is Mr. Holiday. He is the man from Box 13. How do you do? How are you? Terrible. Mr. Holliday, I beg you to help us. But how? I don't know anything about snakes. When Dr. Miller told me what had happened... Well, you should have gone to the police. If we had, they would have evacuated the hotel. I can't afford that. Business isn't too good. And besides, Dr. Miller assured me he could entice the snake back with no trouble. So far, he hasn't. Now, wait a minute. You're risking the lives of guests in this hotel. That's a little more important than the hotel itself. I know, I know. But what guests we have on this floor are not in their room. And I'm sure the cobra hasn't gone far. Then you think he's on this floor? I'm positive. Then for heaven's sake, find it. Who suggested sending for me? I did. I saw your ad. It was just a thought. And it's one you can get out of your mind right now. The police ought to be told. But the publicity! You'll have to risk it. Mr. Holliday, I don't want to lose that snake. Well, you have already. I'm sure we can get him back. For five or six hours, he'll be somnolent. He ate just before we learned he was gone. Did you find out he was gone? No, the cleaning maid did. Yes, that's right. She saw the empty case. Do you mean to tell me you allowed Dr. Miller to bring that snake into this hotel? I didn't know he had it. Oh, that is so. I, I've taken the cobra with me before. I don't mention it because it is difficult to find the hotel. I can well imagine. Mr. Holliday, will you help us? How? Oh. I... I don't know. Dr. Miller. Yes? You're sure there's no danger for about five hours? I'm positive. All right, let's go to work. Oh, thank you, Mr. Holliday. I have the help looking on the other floors. I'll be back in a few moments. <laughs> Mr. Holliday, you're very gracious. Mm-hmm. Now, you be gracious and tell me the truth, Dr. Miller. Truth? What do you mean? I don't believe that snake just got away. You think I'm lying? Yes. Yeah. Go on.
I believe someone deliberately freed the snake. But why? So it would strike me. Kill me. Mm hmm I was wondering why an experienced man like you are would be careless with a dangerous thing like a king cobra. It's hardly likely you'd forget about a catch on the case. You're right. And Mr. Holliday, I'm afraid. Who freed the cobra? I don't know. I think you do. I don't know. I swear it. I just don't know. All right. Meanwhile, the thing's loose. But what are you going to do? I'll help you look for it. But if we don't find the snake in one hour, I'll go to the police. <laughs> Well, I should have gone to the police right away, but there was something that told me not to. Anyway, we hunted. No snake. So I put in the call of the police and went back to my office. There was something bothering me, but I, I didn't know what it was. But I took the trouble to do a little research with Susie's help. Here's what you're looking for, Mr. Holliday. Uh, this article right here. What does it say? I'll read it to you. Uh, Miller, Theodore E. Noted her... Her... her pathologist? Famous for investigations into use and value of snake serum in various diseases. Hmm. Let me see. Hmm. That's Miller. Did you think it wouldn't be? I wasn't sure, but that's his picture. That's the man at the Belvedere Hotel. Want me to read some more? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, Dr. Miller has been associated for the last seven years with Dr. Roy A. Cunningham. Together, they Cunningham, have... huh? Does that name mean something? No, it just makes me wonder where Cunningham is now. But Why? Well, I said he was in town to address a medical convention. He said nothing about a Cunningham. I just wondered why not. Oh, here's something about Cunningham. Should I read it? Hey, yeah, might as well. Dr. Cunningham lost the third finger of his left hand as a result of snake bite. The finger had to be amputated. Do I have to read any more? No, that's enough, Susie. Okay. What are you thinking about? I don't know, Susie. There's something bothering me. But I can't put my finger on it. You'll think of it. Oh, I'll get it. Hello? Mr. Holiday, please. This is the police department. Oh, yes. Just a minute. It's for you. Who is it? Police. Oh, okay. Hello? Holiday, I thought you might like to hear something. Oh, sure. What? About a half hour ago, you reported that snake business at the Belvedere Hotel. That's right. What's happened? They find the snake? Uh-huh. I wish they had. Well, what's happened? What's the matter? Something strange happened at the Moulton Hotel, two blocks away from the Belvedere. Now, wait a minute. You're not going to tell me they found the snake down there. No, but earlier this afternoon, a man staggered into the lobby. Before he had a chance to say anything, he keeled over. He died. What's all this got to do with me? I'm coming to that. Okay, okay, but when? Right now. You reported the snake business at the Belvedere. That's point number one. And just a little while ago, the medical examiner finished his autopsy of the dead man at the Moulton. Follow me? Well, I'm trying my best. Okay. Would you like me to read you the report? Yes, go ahead. The man's death was caused by a powerful poison which acted directly on the nervous system. Did you say poison? Yeah. It's from a proglyphus snake. What, what kind? In plain English, the snake that has fixed poison things, like a king cobra. Are you sure? I'm reading a report. Who was the man who was killed? We don't know yet. Any identifying characteristics? What did you ask that? Stop playing games, did he or didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he did. What were they? He was missing the middle finger of his left hand. Why? Just what I thought. What do you mean? Look, check and see if a Dr. Cunningham is registered at the Molten. If he is, I think you'll find that he's your dead man. Okay, Holiday, and since you know so much... How'd you like to drop around and tell us how that snake got two blocks from where he was lost without being seen? All right, I'll drop around later. But I don't know any more about it than you do. Gee, Mr. Holliday, you look kind of upset. Yes, I am. The man you just read about, Dr. Cunningham, died today from a bite from a cobra. <gasps> but I wonder how. Well, you said the snake was loose. Yeah, but that cobra had to go two blocks. It would have been seen. And even if he did make it, he'd have to be a pretty smart cobra to pick out Cunningham. Oh, you mean you think there's some connection between Dr. Miller and Dr. Cunningham? There's got to be. Both men are in town. Miller admits he had a cobra, then he reports its loss. Now, why were Cunningham and Miller staying at different hotels if they were working together? And what? And what? 
And, Susie, I just happened to think of what was bothering me. And now, back to The Biter Bitten, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Land as Dan Holliday. Sure, I happened to think what it was that bothered me. But it didn't tie in with anything. At least, not right then. So my first stop was police headquarters for a chat with the medical examiner. Yes, it's correct, Mr. Holliday. The autopsy on Dr. Cunningham showed that his death was caused by venom. Possibly that of a cobra. Uh-huh. But no trace of the cobra itself. Uh, the Moulton Hotel's been searched. I have interns from the city hospital standing by with anti-venoms. Anti-venoms? Yes, yes. They're made from the venom itself. Often efficient in the treatment of snake bite. I see. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Uh, where are you going now? I thought I'd go back to the Belvedere Hotel. Uh-huh. Be careful. I don't want to go through another autopsy. Doctor, I'll do my best to keep from being the next subject. Oh, by the way, this Dr. Cunningham. Know anything about him? No, not much. His specialty doesn't interest me. But I know he was a famous herpetologist. Or for Dr. Miller? I believe so. They developed a serum for the treatment of hemophilia. Miller said he was to address a medical convention here. You know anything about that? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, Cunningham was to speak, too. Oh. What about it? Well, I made some inquiries when I discovered the dead man was Cunningham. It seems he was about to present the medical profession with the results of his research. Present? You mean give them away? Yes, why? Would those discoveries be worth anything? Well, if they're what I think they are, there's a fortune in them. I see. Well, thank you, Doctor. If anyone here wants me, I'll be at the Belvedere Hotel. All right. And uh, remember what I said. That cobra is dangerous. And sometimes the anti-venoms can't be administered in time. Well, maybe I should have told the police my idea, but I, I wasn't sure. I had to make sure because I had a hunch I was dealing with a very, very clever man. I went back to the Belvedere Hotel and spoke to Larkin, the manager. I don't know what to do, Mr. Holliday. There are police all over the hotel. The guests know there's something wrong. Oh, this will ruin the hotel. Maybe not, Mr. Larkin. Maybe we can prove there's no cobra loose in here. What? But, Dr. Miller, the death at the other hotel and... Yes, the death at the Moulton Hotel. But I've got a couple of ideas. Now, listen. Could Miller have left the hotel without anyone seeing him? Why, yes, of course. All right, let's, let's say he did. What does that mean? Look, Miller's telegram to me was delivered at 5.15 today. The medical examiner placed Cunningham's death at some time before 5. No later. The Moulton Hotel is only two blocks from here. Get it? No. Unless you're implying that Dr. Miller had something to do with Dr. Cunningham's death. Maybe I am. There was a motive. Cunningham was going to announce the results of the discoveries and give them away. Those discoveries were worth a fortune. It's just possible that Dr. Miller isn't quite the idealist Cunningham was. He murdered him? I don't know. In Cunningham's room at the moat, the police found two snakes. Cobras. Oh, well then one of them did him. Maybe, but I don't think so. Cunningham knew how to handle snakes. Also, he would have had had a venom ready. Now, doesn't it strike you as peculiar that a man like Cunningham would rush down into the lot? Panic? Mm -hmm. No, that wouldn't hold water. All his life he'd handle snakes. If one bit him, he'd move quietly, get the anti-venom, and use it. Not rush around in a panic. But what you're suggesting is that Miller deliberately... But it'll be hard to prove. We've got to go to the police. With what? My story? No, I've got a better idea. Well, what is it? You have a pass key to Miller's room, haven't you? Yes, of course. Why, you phone him. Get him out of there on any pretext. Why? Please do it. You want this cleared up, don't you? Well, yes, yes, of course. But but what'll I tell him? Get him into the basement. Tell him that one of your employees has seen the snake. That'll hold him down there, at least, until you and I are through in his room. His... his room? Mm-hmm. I've got an idea we'll find something very interesting. The ruse worked. While Miller went into the basement on a wild snake chase, Lark and I searched through his room. What are we supposed to be looking for, Mr. Holliday? I'm not sure I... Oh, look. A case of anti venom Miller has one. Cunningham would have been sure to have one. 
Well, now that you've found it, we'd better get out of here before he comes back. Not yet. Let's see what's in that closet. Oh, please hurry. Well? Well, well, well. Maybe I found something I've been looking for. Hmm, this leather bag. Well, what's in it? Well, it's rather heavy. And there are holes in the bottom. Now, why would a bag have holes in the bottom? Holes? Three guesses. But take only one. That's all you need. The cobra. Yeah. Larkin, take a pillowcase from the bed. Quickly. What are you going to do? Hurry up, get that pillowcase. Here. Here you are. Now what? We're going to dump the snake from the bag into this pillowcase. You... You're crazy. It'll bite us. No, no, it won't. It has to coil the strike. It won't be able to in the bottom of this case. Now, hold the pillowcase by the edge. With the mouth as wide open as you can get it. You're a fool. You're risking our lives. They go on strike. Now, get ready. Please, be careful. I'll do my best. I'm here too, remember? Are right, ready? I'll open the catch of the leather bag. Now, here we go. It, it was a snake. Hold that pillowcase as far away from your body as you can. What do we do with this? Is there a linen closet close by? Yes. In the corridor, outside. Okay, tie it on the top of that pillowcase and put it in the linen closet. And lock the door. Yes. Yes, of course. I want your employees not to go near that closet. Mr. Holliday. What now? It's Dr. Miller coming back. I won't be able to get to the linen closet without being seen. Get back in here. Close the door. He has the house detective with him. Well, well, things couldn't be working out any better than they are. Mr. Holliday, I... I'm still holding this. Toss it under the bed, fast. Under the bed? Don't repeat everything I say. Just do it. Straighten the bed while I put this leather bag back in the closet. Go on. If I ever get out of this alive, I'll personally search all baggage coming into this hotel in the future. There. Okay. Now we're all set. Sit down, Mr. Larkin. Pretend as though we're just waiting here for a minute. I don't feel like sitting down. Then stand, but try to look as though nothing's happened. You asked the impossible, but I... Wait a minute. Tear that extension cord loose in the baseboard. Hand me that staple that held it. You're crazy. All right, get out of the way. What are you going to do with that U tack? Put it right here on the chair. Points outward, just about the height of Dr. Miller's ankles. There. That'll hold it, I hope. Oh, Mr. Holliday. Oh. Any luck down the basement? No. Some hysterical maid thought she saw the snake, but uh, it was not. Well, but we must think. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. The house detective here says there is no other way but to get everyone out of the hotel. We can't do that. I'm trying not to. Dr. Miller, did you hear of Dr. Cunningham's death this afternoon? Yes. Yes, I did. I would have gone to him, but I cannot leave here. Strange that a man of Cunningham's experience should have been so careless. Bitten by one of his own cobras. It's the chance we take. But he rushed down into the lobby. Doesn't he carry anti-venom with him? Yes, of course. Well, then why didn't he use it? I I don't know. He died at approximately 5 o'clock, just 15 minutes before your wife's me. Yes, that's probably so. We're wasting time here. We should be looking for the cobra. Yes, I suppose we should be. But to get back to Dr. Cunningham, suppose now... Now, I'm saying suppose... Someone went to him. Someone who knew him. Suppose that someone took a cobra there and allowed it to strike Cunningham. Who would do a thing like that? Oh, someone who hated him because of what he was going to do. Throw away a fortune for the sake of humanity. You're crazy. Maybe. But it would be natural for the police to assume that Cunningham was bitten by one of his own snakes. (laughs) Not by yours. You know that mine is gone. Sure, to make it look as though it escaped here. You sent the wire to me, so I'd be your alibi. Also, Larkin here was part of your alibi. (laughs) This is fantastic. I admit that. But it's fantastic enough to be true. You took the snake to Cunningham. When his back was turned, you allowed it to strike him. But first you took his hat of venom. This is preposterous. I say the cobra you've been looking for is right here in this room. Get out of here. You're a madman. That description fits you better than it does me. Where are you going? We looked everywhere but in this room. This closet. Keep out of there. What's this leather bag? Keep away from that. Why, it's just a bag and... Don't open it. Why not? It's empty. Look. Empty. You're a liar. No. No, I'm not. Look for yourself. The 
Look over. Don't you understand? It really is loose. Sit down, Dr. Miller. Sit down. You fool, what did you do with that snake? What snake? There was a cobra in there. Oh, oh. Trying to kill me, Doctor? You told us it had escaped. You even helped us look for it. No, would you please believe me? There was a cobra in there. No, no, I don't believe you. And I said, sit down. <laughs> What's the matter? It was under this chair. It struck. Look, the marks on my leg. Thanks. Holiday, please, hand me the edge of it. The case on the dresser. Did you hand it to Cunningham? You fool, I'll die. Cunningham's dead. Please, the case. I'll do it myself. All I want, just a minute. Please, please, hand me the case. What about Cunningham? Yes, yes, I killed him, the fool. You hear that, Larkin? Yes, I heard it. Good. The case, please, please, the case. You won't need it, Miller. If you look down at the leg of the chair, you'll see I backed you into this. Tack. Uh-huh. Just a you tack. You know, Mello, you worked up a pretty good crime. But when you sent for me, you set me thinking. You should have been more careful with your story. Look! Under the bed! The snake! It's loose! Larkin, don't move. Well, Mr. Holiday, it looks as though we're all hoist by our own petard. You. Pass detective. Get your gun out. If you move quickly, that cobra will strike. What will we do? <laughs> I'm the only one used to handling snakes. Would anyone else care to try it? Larkin. Look. Right at your elbow on the dresser. What? A little pipe. The one Miller plays. Pick it up. Do it slowly. Slowly. I can't move. You've got to. <laughs> the cobra is moving toward you. I can do as I say. Take that pipe. Reach for it slowly. Go ahead. Now. Now what do I do? Play it. I don't know how. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Larkin. You've got to, Larkin. Distract the snake's attention so the house detective can get his gun. Go on. You'll have to do better than that. <laughs> I can't. I... I don't have any breath. Stand still. Try it again. That's it, Larkin. Keep it up. Stop crawling. Miller, stand still. Good boy, Larkin. You've got him coming toward you. Keep it up. Keep it up. Go on. Ah. You. Get your gun. <sighs> well, that seems to be that. And Dr. Miller, suppose you and I and the house detective take a little walk. And I'll tell you the first mistake you made. The one that made your whole story seem just a little false. Uh-huh. So he told you something that set you to thinking... Oh, what was it, Mr. Holliday? Well, it wasn't much, but it started the ball rolling. Well, please tell me. Hmm. Okay, Susie. He sent the wire to me. Begged me to help him find the snake because time was precious. Now, when I got to him, he said the snake would be quiet for at least five or six hours. So, what was the big rush to get me there? Oh. Hmm. Good night, Susie. <laughs> Listen in again next week when Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Dear Mr. Holliday, I do not address you as Box 13 because, having seen your advertisement, I was intrigued and found out who you are. You write mystery stories. I am a professor of criminology at the university. I think I have something of enormous interest to both of us. The perfect crime. I am going to commit it. Won't you be my audience? If it pleases you, come to my room. Dr. John Dobbs. 
At first, I wasn't sure whether the letter was on the level or not. Then when I saw Dr. Dobbs, I was sure it was. And he did commit the perfect crime. Almost. Dr. John Dobbs. I, I never heard of him, Mr. Holliday. Oh, here, read this. Who's who in American education? Uh-huh. Our Dr. Dobbs is quite a personage. Dobbs. John H., professor of criminology and abnormal psychology. Author of over 15 volumes on crime and the criminal. That's enough, Susie. And now Dr. Dobbs says he's going to commit the perfect crime. Is there such a thing? Susie, any unsolved crime is perfect. Oh, maybe he's just kidding. He, he's a professor. He wouldn't do anything like that. That's exactly what I'm going to find out. At least I'll have an interesting evening. Dr. Dobbs was waiting for me when I got to his rooms. He was a harmless, pleasant-looking man of about, oh, 65. He smiled shyly as he greeted me. Hi. I'm so glad you came, Mr. Holliday. How long can you stay? All evening. My time is yours. Wonderful. <laughs> oh, you think I'm a little crazy, don't you? Well, aren't we all? Oh, I suppose so. But let's discuss the perfect crime. Now, what is a perfect crime? One that isn't solved. Uh, yes, yes, of course. But nine times out of ten, the crime isn't planned. I'm speaking about a planned murder, perfectly executed and perfectly hidden. Dr. Dobbs, you're a great man in your field. Therefore, you should know that no one ever gets away with it. Oh, why not? Because there's always some clue, some minute trace that leads directly to the murder. Oh, true. But suppose there were no clues, none at all. Ah, but you're leaving out an important factor. And that is? The body. It's hard to get rid of a body. Oh. Dr. Crippen was trapped. Trapped because police found the body of his wife in the basement. Yes. But suppose a body could be destroyed altogether. Well, it's never been done. With today's scientific police laboratories, even the tiniest clue can be built up enough to convince a jury. Yes, that's very true. But uh, suppose the body of the murdered person were never found. It always has been. Oh, granted. But suppose it were not. There'd be absolutely no proof of murder. Ah, my point exactly. Now, just a minute. First, you have to find a victim. One who isn't even remotely connected with you. Then you have to kill him. Yes, go on. Then, having found your victim and killed him, you have to get rid of his body altogether. Those are the conditions, yes. So, after those conditions were fulfilled, you'd have to escape detection and final punishment. And your argument is that with those conditions, the perfect murder would have been committed. Yes. Suppose I told you I can do it. <laughs> you're asking me to believe the impossible. First, you're a famous man. It's hardly likely you'd risk everything you've worked for just to satisfy an insane whim. Now go on. Secondly, I... <laughs> I don't believe you're serious. But I am. Mr. Holliday, I'm a very sick man. My doctor gives me three months to live. Oh, I'm very sorry. Oh, it's no matter. Perhaps he's wrong. No, I know he's right. Then what does it have to do with what we're talking about? Ooh, perhaps nothing, except... I'm very tired. I, I've spent a lifetime with books and study and students. I'm a crusty old bachelor. I suppose now I want some excitement. <laughs> Even my name is prosaic. John Dobbs. Dr. Dobbs, I still don't think you're serious. Maybe you're kidding me for some reason I haven't been able to see or even guess that. No, I... I think I refuse to believe you. Ah. <laughs> well, what are you laughing at? At what you said. I don't understand. You refuse to believe me. That's right. Is that funny? Yes. Because you see, Mr. Holliday, the fact that you refuse to believe me is part of my plan. It makes me even more certain that I can commit the perfect murder and win. Well, I stayed with Dr. Dobbs until after three in the morning. We talked. He had a marvelous knowledge of crime, and I left him with a great admiration of his intellect. Then three days went by. I heard nothing from him until one day at the office. Hello? Mr. Holliday, please. Dr. Dobbs calling. Oh, oh, just a minute. Mr. Holliday, Dr. Dobbs calling. Oh, okay, thanks. Hello. Mr. Holliday, how are you? I'm fine, and you? Oh, pretty well. Uh, you remember our conversation the other night? Uh, I certainly do. Uh, Would you care to be in on the start of my plan? Now, look, I refuse to take you seriously. Ah, <laughs> that's wonderful. But uh, are you free this afternoon and evening? Oh, yes, why? I want you to fly to Chicago with me. What? Will you? I have the tickets on the plane. You're my guest. But 
Why to Chicago? I'll tell you why when we're off the plane. Will you go with me? Mm, yes. Yes, I think I will. Uh, do you like to fly, Mr. Holliday? Oh, I love it. Do you? Oh, yes. It gives me a great sense of exhilaration. I'm untouchable up here. Why are we going to Chicago, Dr. Dobbs? Here. Read this newspaper account of a murder. Police are at loss for clues in the Caroline Standish murder case. All these have come to dead ends, and why do you want me to read this, Doctor? Because I'm going to Chicago to confess to the crime. You're what? I'm going to confess that I killed Caroline Standish. Oh, I don't believe that. We'll be in Chicago in uh, exactly one hour and 20 minutes. Half an hour after we step off this plane, you and I will be at police headquarters. And then you will see. But you couldn't have killed this woman. Oh, oh yes, I could have. She was killed the day before yesterday. That was Sunday. Sunday's a holiday. It's not too long a plane trip from our city to Chicago. And Caroline Standish is a complete stranger to me. And being a complete stranger, she satisfies the first condition of the victim. That he should not even remotely be connected with her. Exactly. Now settle back, Mr. Holliday. We'll be in Chicago very soon. All right, now let me get this straight, Dr. Dobbs. You say you killed Carolyn Standish. Yes, I killed her, Lieutenant. And you? You say your name is Holliday. That's right. Mm hmm. Well, Dr. Dobbs, we've checked on you since you first came in here an hour ago. We've got quite a bit on you. Your books, for one thing. I've enjoyed those. Now, suppose you tell us how you killed Carolyn Standish. It's very simple. I shot her. Oh? What kind of a gun? A thirty-eight caliber. Well, that was in the newspaper. I know. Uh, Mr. Holliday, what do you know about this? Oh, nothing, except that Dr. Dobbs asked me to come here with him. I see. Well, you can both go home. Thank you, Lieutenant. It's not very often that a murderer is sent home scot-free. Why are you letting him go, Lieutenant? Look, Carolyn Standish was killed with a thirty-eight. Yes. But two hours ago, we found the killer. He had the gun in his possession. Oh. <laughs> then I am free to go. As fast as you can get out the door. Oh, thank you. Come along, Mr. Holliday. I'm afraid the lieutenant has his killer. And it doesn't seem to be me. So, we'll go back home. And then? I'll get in touch with you again. <laughs> Holiday, this is Dr. Dobbs. Oh, you. Oh, you don't sound pleased to hear from me. Where are we going this time? <laughs> so you guessed that? Eh? Yes. Guessed what? That I'm going to Philadelphia to confess to a murder there. You're going to do what? The same thing I did in Chicago. Uh, will you come along? Oh, no, 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 thank you. Very well, very well. But I suggest you keep reading the newspaper. You may see some very startling developments. Goodbye. <laughs> I'm leaving for Boston this evening to confess another crime. Holiday, I don't suppose you'd care to go to Hartford with me. It's San Francisco this time, Mr. Holiday. I would like your company. Well, it went that way for two solid months. Dr. Dobbs confessed every murder that hit the newspapers and every confession was laughed at. His name gradually became as well known to the police departments of the country as those of the public enemies number one through twenty. Then he came to see me at my apartment. Well, Mr. Holliday, what do you think now? Look, Mr. Dobbs, I don't know what you're doing, but please, why don't you cut it out? Oh, are you feeling sorry for me? Look, every one of these newspapers has your name in it. Hmm. You made a laughing stock of yourself. Oh, does that concern you? Yes, it does. I admire you. I've read your books and I've talked with you. Why are you so intent on breaking up a brilliant career? Because I intend to go through with what we discussed that first night in my rooms. I don't know whether you're trying to make a fool of me or not, Dr. Dobbs. But I'd rather you didn't count me in on your little escapades. Ah, uh, it's no fun committing a perfect crime without an audience. What? I need you, Dan. You're very intelligent. You could appreciate what I'm going to do. Look, Doctor, forget all this and go back to the university. Say you, say you did it as an experiment. Oh, well, I've already been given a vacation from the university. 
What do you mean? The publicity was bad for the school. The president suggested that perhaps I'd been working too hard and uh, needed a rest. Well, you brought it on yourself. Oh, yes, I know. Now, I want you to do me a favor. What do you want? There's a small city about 300 miles from here. Go there with me. So you can put in another phony confession? No, no, no. So I can point out my real victim to you. Say that again. I want to show you my victim, the man I am going to kill, the man whose body will never be found, and the crime to which I am going to confess, this time legitimately. I... I don't believe you. Please, now, go to the town with me. (laughs) I'm now supposed to be a little uh, cracked. (laughs) Humor me. And if I do? Well, we'll have a little mental chess game, you and I. I'll give you the opening gambit, murder. From then on, it will be your job to checkmate me. Agreed? All right, Dr. Dobbs. I'll go with you. But this will be the last time. Understand? Yes, I understand. This will be the last time. Well, I went with Dr. Dobbs to the small city. He took me to a restaurant. He seemed to be looking for someone when suddenly... Look, Dan... There he is. Who? The man I'm going to kill. The one who just came in? Yes. Look at him. Describe him to me. I want you to be able to recognize him any place under any conditions. What, what for? Please, please. Just do as I ask. Well, I, I see a man about your build. Yes. A little younger, perhaps. Yes. Nondescript. Ah, his name is Alexander Ferris, and he's a buyer for one of the department stores here. How do you know all this? I looked all over for a victim, and then one day I saw him in our city. I followed him, found out he lives here. Hmm. Oh, he doesn't even know he's going to die. Dobbs has cut out this nonsense. But it's not. Ferris is a bachelor. He lives in a boarding house. Once a month, he takes a trip to our city to buy for the store here. Go on, you're not finished. No, I'm not. I was going to add that Mr. Ferris is going to make one more trip to our city. And that one will be his last. Tell me one more thing. Why did you pick him? Because he seems the logical one. He he does things by routine. He stays at the same hotel in our city. He takes the same train there and back home here. Oh, I hate monotony. Uh Uh-huh. Now, suppose I should walk over to Mr. Ferris and tell him that a madman is going to kill him. (laughs) Go on, try it. (laughs) You know what he'd do. Uh, Yes, I think I do. He'd look at me as though I were the madman. Then he'd call for the police and I'd be stuck in a nice cell until the police decided I was harmed. Exactly. All right, Dan. We're finished here. You've seen the victim. Now we'll go back home and I'll let you know when the game begins. Hello? Uh, Mr. Holliday, please. Oh, just a second. Mr. Holliday, it's that man again. Dobbs? Uh Uh-huh. Okay, give me the phone. Here. Hello? Look, Doctor, let's call off this race. I'm getting tired of it. Mr. Holliday, Alexander Ferris leaves his town this afternoon. He will arrive here at 7.30 this evening on the Lakeshore Limited. He will go to the Barrett Hotel. He will never leave there alive. Goodbye. Hello. Hello, Dobbs. Hello. What do you say this time? Same thing, still hopping on the perfect crime. Do you think he means it? I... He's got me over a barrel. I don't want to believe him. Sometimes I don't, but... But what? That there's something earnest about him when he talks about it. Well, I can't take a chance. I'm going to keep my eyes on Alexander Ferris. I decided to warn Ferris, so that evening I met the Lakeshore Limited. I tried to get to him, but before I could, he hurried into a taxi. I grabbed the first empty cab I could find and went to the Barrett Hotel. Ferris had already registered and was disappearing into an elevator. I ran across the lobby, but the elevator door closed and Ferris was gone. I got his room number, 708. Took an elevator. We were just passing the fifth floor when... Those were shots. And they came from the seventh floor. I missed my guess. I didn't miss it because on the seventh floor... All right. All right. Back to your rooms. Go on, everybody. Go on. You too. You're the house detective? Yeah, who are you? My name's Dan Holliday. Did those shots come from this room? Yes, they did. Dobbs. Hello, Dan. What's happened? Look, I'll take care of this. Of course, but the shots came from that room. I know because my room is next door. You 
You're next door? Uh, yes. Since I left the university, I've been living here. Uh, the house detective will verify that. Uh, sure. But that's got nothing to do with this. Hadn't you better get inside the room and see what's happened? This is my job. But since you stuck your nose in, stay right with me. Have you got a pass key? Yeah. Hmm. You can still smell the powder from the shots. Yeah. And where's the guy that came in here? Look in the bath. Close that door. Now, you two stay right there. I'm going to give this place a look-see. Something fishy here. So your curiosity got the better of you, eh, Dad? You're next door, huh? Yes, convenient, isn't it? First, first. He's dead. You shot him, I suppose. I killed him, yes. I saw him get on the elevator and come up here. All right, you saw that. What then? Where is he? I don't get this. There ain't a sign of the guy any place. But there's his hat, top coat, and valise on the bed. Which proves he came in here. The bellboy will verify it if he came in here. All right, let's ask the bellboy. I'm running this until the police get here. Well, by all means, call the police. Dr. Dobbs, would you mind if your room was searched? I was going to suggest it myself. There ain't no fire escape. Nobody fell out the window. And nobody's here. Oh, please, uh, let's look in my room. Uh, then you can question the other guests on this floor. Okay. Come on, you two. Out of this room. Uh, well, Dan, what do you think now? I don't know. Maybe I've stopped thinking. Well, the case was a sensational one. Two shots fired, no body, and no Alexander Ferris. Two days later, Dr. Dobbs visited me in my apartment. Well, Dan, have you made any headway? I'm not trying. Oh, yes, you are. It intrigues you, doesn't it? It's a hoax. The whole thing is a hoax. Not the whole thing, Dan. I give you my word of honor that I killed Ferris. Will you tell the police that? I already have. I confessed. You what? But they laughed at me. You see, I'm known now as a crank. I confess to all murders. Where is Ferris's body, Holiday? How did I get it out of the room? You, you didn't. You couldn't have. The other guests rushed to the doors after the shots. The only stairways are at the ends of the corridor. You couldn't have carried his body without being seen. Correct. And the bellboy verifies the fact that Ferris entered his room next to mine. And yours was empty. So, what have you got? Dobbs, I... I don't believe you killed Ferris. All right, then where is he? I don't know. So, I fulfilled two of the conditions we talked about our first night. Remember what they were? Yes, the victim had to be a stranger to you and the body had to disappear. And the third condition, I escaped detection and punishment. Dan... Why don't you tell the police about me? What you know, what I've told you. Ah, they wouldn't believe me. <laughs> no, they wouldn't. <laughs> but, Dan, I swear to you that I killed Ferris. If you figure out how I did it, I'll admit it and take my punishment. I am not the police. No, no, you're not. But you know more about this than they do. I, I, I swear to you again, Dan, you have the whole solution in your head. All you have to do is put together the pieces of the puzzle. It's really very simple. <laughs> Well, goodbye, Dan. Mr. Holliday? Mr. Holliday? Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, Susie. I, I was daydreaming. About Dr. Dobbs? Yeah, as usual, about Dr. Dobbs. Gee, I think it's some kind of a joke. There just isn't anybody. that They've been looking for almost a week now. That's what bothers me. Ferris is missing. He left his hometown, took the train, came here. I saw him, Susie. I saw him then. No, oh, Ferris. And the police won't believe Dr. Dobbs. Or me. Kling thinks I'm in the same class as Dobbs. I know. Oh, well, thanks. There's got to be an answer, though. No one, not even an admitted genius such as Dobbs, could kill a man and do away with his body. But there isn't a trace. Look. Dobbs had about 15 seconds to kill Ferris and then hide the body. He... Yes? What were you going to say? I'm not sure. Dobbs said I had the whole solution in my head. Susie, ever see a magic act? Magic act? Oh, you mean a magician? Sleight of hand? That's right. Sleight of hand. Illusions. Now you see it, now you don't. Watch the little lady disappear from under your very eyes. Keep your eye on the magician and miss how the trick is done. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not sure I do, but I've got an idea. Susie, we're going to send a telegram. Where to? To Alexander Ferris's hometown, to the chief of police. But that's been done. You know that. Sure, sure I do. 
But the other telegrams were about and concerning Ferris. Well, what's what's yours going to be? About a perfect stranger. Well, I was shooting in the dark that I hit. The answer I received to my telegram made me sure I had the solution to Dr. Dobbs' illusion. Smart police work in Ferris's hometown proved it. So that night, I went to see Dobbs. It's nice of you to come to see me, Dan. I was wondering if you'd forgotten me. Everyone else seems to have done so. No, you're not forgotten, Dr. Dobbs. Quite the contrary. Oh? How do you mean that? Just the way I said it. May I sit down? Certainly, please do. Thanks. May I offer you a drink? Oh, no, thank you. Mind if I have one? Please do. Uh, you've, uh, come to see me for a very special reason, haven't you? Yes, I have. Uh, read this telegram. It's from the police in Ferris's hometown. Huh? Hmm. Did you guess or did they? I did. <laughs> oh, I'm glad. Glad you were my audience. <laughs> it was fun playing to you. Yes, you were the magician. I was the kid in the audience with his mouth open and his mind closed. Magician? <laughs> Not quite. Oh, yes. Like the trick where the magician shows the audience a nice big red ball. He gets them used to seeing it. He conditions them to its size, its shape. Then he covers the ball with a handkerchief. Makes a mystic pass and the ball is gone. Go on. What then? Ah, but the ball never disappears. It never goes under the handkerchief. All the audience sees is a similar shape outlined under the silk. Yes, I'm very happy I chose you as my audience. I'm not. I don't like to be the one to catch you. Well, why not? I took the risk. Harris never came to the city. You got off the Lakeshore Limited that night. And what else, Dan? You called me and told me Ferris would come here. That day, in his hometown, you pointed him out. You made me take a good look at him. About your height and build. I even mentioned that, I think. Yes, you did. Uh, go on. Before he left, you came here. You intercepted him. Killed him. In his own hometown. You took his top coat, hat, and police. Then you dressed him in entirely different clothes. Took his body to the freight yards. That telegram from the police there verifies that an unidentified man was found dead. Yes, unidentified because the police weren't anxious to identify that body. But they did this afternoon. Dental work proves the man to be Ferris. Hmm. You see, Dobbs, there's always a clue. Always. There is no perfect crime. But just a moment. There were three conditions to the action of committing a perfect murder. Now, I fulfill two. Now, the third. I must escape detection and punishment. How is anyone going to prove what you've just said? By your admissions, Dobbs. The police are in the next room and outside in the hall. They've heard every word. Oh. Uh, there are still a few things to clean up, but uh, there isn't time, is there? I still have to escape punishment. I'm sorry, but you can't. Okay, boys, come on in. Well, well. The police. But Dan, I still say I fulfilled the last condition to escape punishment. It's a good thing you didn't take the drink I offered you. I... I knew as soon as you came in that... that you had me. I... Dan... Explain how I did it. It's no fun doing something clever if, if no one appreciates it. Dobbs. Dr. Dobbs. So long, Dan. Don't forget to explain the rest. It's been a wonderful chess game. Now, checkmate. <laughs> Mr. Ferris in the hotel. I told you. He didn't, Susie. He killed Ferris in the man's own hometown. You see, I thought I'd followed Ferris to the hotel from the station, but I had followed Dobbs. And then? Very simple. Dobbs had reserved a room next to Ferris's. Then, disguised as Ferris, he went into the room Ferris had reserved. Dobbs took off the top coat, hat, put the valise on the bed, fired two shots, blanks, then slipped quickly into his own room. Do you see? Oh, sure. Leaving the other room empty. Right. So everyone was looking in the wrong place for Ferris. Everyone assumed he had really come to this city. Like the old trick with the ball, Susie. You think you see it, but you don't. So you look in the wrong place. Gee, he was really smart, wasn't he? Susie, just remember this. 
No matter how smart you are, there's always somebody who'll trip you up. Everyone makes mistakes. But Dr. Dobbs didn't. Oh, yes, he did. He made the same mistake I did. He looked in the wrong place. Well, what do you mean? You see, I had to trap him into a confession. He assumed that dental work would identify Ferris's body. But the man found in the freight yards had perfect teeth and no dental work. Good night, Susie. <laughs> Listen in again next week when Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. the Star Times. Dear Box 13, please come as quick as you can because I think there's something wrong. Nobody will listen to me because they think I don't know what I'm talking about. But I know there's something wrong and I think it's bad. My name is Marty Kennedy and I live at 203 Webster Street in Collingwood. Come to the address and walk past with the next to <laughs> Come to the address and walk past Whistling Yankee Doodle so I will know you. <laughs> sure, it was only a letter from a kid. But that kid knew what he was talking about. And now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Archimedes and the Romans. Day. There are lots of other letters. Are you going to pay any attention to this one? From Artie Kennedy? Yeah, I think so, Susan. But it'll be a wild goose chase. You'll go all the way to Collingwood and then find out there's nothing wrong. Which might be a welcome change for me. Hmm. Yes, I think I'll go, Susie. After all, there might be something in this. But, Mr. Holliday, look at the handwriting. It, it belongs to a kid. So? So, it'll be a wild goose chase. Okay. Charge it off as a little vacation. Besides, sometimes kids have problems, Susie. Big ones. So maybe I ought to give Marty Kennedy a hand. So long, Susie. Collingwood was an easy 250-mile drive. It was a little town that sat at the foot of the mountain range. It was early afternoon when I got there and found 203 Webster Street. I left my car at the corner and walked past the address. Thirteen? Mm-hmm. Audie Kennedy? Yeah. Look, keep going down the street and I'll meet you around the corner. Don't let on like we know each other, huh? Gotcha, Marty. See you around the corner. The toe-headed kid made it look like good old cloak and dagger stuff. He trailed me to the corner of the street and once we were out of sight of his home... This is okay. Nobody can see us now. Okay, Marty. What's on your mind? You got some... I... I... Got something that'll show me who you are? I think I can arrange that. Here. Here's your letter to me. Okay. You, a private eye? No, I'm not a private detective. Y you a, a policeman, then? No, I'm afraid not. I'm, uh, I'm a writer. Oh. Doesn't that sound romantic enough to you? Romantic? I mean, isn't it mysterious enough? Yeah, I guess so. But we gotta go someplace where we can talk. We don't want to be overheard. Oh, certainly not. Where do you suggest we go? Well, I guess the rest of the kids ate in the clubhouse. We can go there. Clubhouse? What kind? Just a shack we built. Can you climb a tree? Uh, do I have to? Well, the shack's in a tree, but nobody will hear us there. Okay, Marty, lead the way and I'll go climb a tree. Hey, you did pretty good. It ain't easy to climb this tree. Just don't ask me to hang by a tail, that's all. Now that we're sitting on top of the world, what do we talk about? You don't think I'm serious, do you? Oh, definitely. Incidentally, my name's Dan Holliday. Okay, Mr. Holliday. You make it, Dan. As long as we're up a tree together, we've got to be friends. 
Yeah. Well, I want to know what's happened to Ted. Hmm? Who's Ted? Well, here. Look out this here window. See where I'm pointing? Yeah, it's toward the mountains. Mm-hmm. Well, see that shiny dome on the top of the biggest peak? Yeah. What about it? That's the Williams Observatory. They look at stars up there. They're astronomers. Oh, yes, yes. I, I've heard about it. Well, what of it? Ted's the assistant up there. He helps Professor Irving. All right. And then what? Every week, Ted comes down for groceries and things. And when he does, he gives me a lesson. Lesson? In what? Astronomy. I like it. Oh, that's a good deal. But your friend Ted didn't show up this week. Is that what worries you? How do you know? Oh, I put two and two together. Oh. Well, when he can't make it, he signals me. And how does he do that? Well, see that tower sticking up on the peak? Mm-hmm, I see it. He flashes me by mirror, but so far this week he didn't. Well, maybe he's been busy. That's what Mom and Pop said, but I didn't think you'd say it. Oh, I'm sorry, Marty. Okay, let's go at it from a different angle. Suppose he isn't busy. In that case, what would keep him from coming down, or at least flashing you the signal? Well, I don't know. I wanted to go up, but Mom and Pop wouldn't let me. And then I saw your ad in the paper, and so I wrote to you. In other words, you want me to take a run up to the observatory and find out what's wrong? Is that it? That's it. You, uh, you couldn't have asked someone else? I mean, a forest stranger. Someone who goes up there. Gee, no. No, that wouldn't have been mysterious enough, would it? You making fun of me? Oh, no, no, not at all, Marty. Now, what's your friend's full name? Ted what? Ted Whitman. And are he and Professor Irving the only men up there? Uh-huh. All right, Marty, I'll tell you what. I'll take a run up there and see what's what. Be sure and let me know, will you? Absolutely. And, uh... You won't say a word to anybody? This is just between us, huh? Just the two of us. Promise? On my honor. Well, because if Mom and Pop knew I'd bothered anybody, I'd get the Deccans. Oh, in that case, Mom's the word. Okay, Marty, let's get out of this tree before a high wind comes up. I left Marty Kennedy and drove toward the hills. High on the tallest peak, the silver dome of the observatory turned to crimson in the sunset. I laughed at myself at what I was doing, but I kept going until I reached the summit. An iron gate blocked the way to the narrow connecting road that led to the observatory itself. I got out to open it when... Sorry, mister. No visitors allowed. Oh. Hello there. Hello. Don't open the gate. Leave it closed. I'm sorry. I didn't know anyone was around. Did you lose your way? No. As a matter of fact, I intended to come here. Oh, why? I'm looking for someone. Yeah, who? Ted Whitman. What do you want with him? I wanted to see him. All right, I'm Ted Whitman. Oh, okay, then I guess we can talk here. What about? A friend of yours. Who? A kid named Marty Kennedy. Oh, sure, Marty. How is he? Oh, he's fine. But he's a little worried about you. Oh, I'm okay. There's nothing wrong. Thanks, anyway. He wondered why you didn't signal him when you didn't get down this week. Signal? Oh, I, uh, I didn't have time. I, uh, I see. Was that all you came up to tell me? Yeah. Yeah, that's all. Okay. It's pretty dark on the road at night. If you don't know the turns, you can get into trouble. So if you leave now, you can make it back down in time. Oh, thanks. Any message for Marty? Uh, tell him that, uh... Tell him I'll see him next week. All right. Well, is there anything else, mister? No, I guess that's all. Sorry to bother you. Uh, that's Okay. Careful turning your car around. It's pretty steep right there. Yeah, I notice. Well, so long. So long. Who was that? Nobody. I thought I heard steps. You didn't. Now look, mister, it's getting dark. You better turn around. Who's that? Who is it? It's somebody that's seen me, Professor. You better get back to the cottage. Please, please, we've got to... Shut up. What's the matter up here? Nothing. I told you to turn your car around. Get back down the mountain. No, please, don't go. Don't, don't. Hey, what's the idea of hitting that old man? Okay, you asked for it, mister. Now, come on in with your hands in the air. What's the idea? Come on in. Mister, you had your chance to get out of this. Now it's too late. Do all astronomers carry guns? He, he's not... Shut up. All right, you, whoever you are, help the old guy up. The two of you walk in front of me. Come on. Uh, you heard badly, Professor. Uh, no, no. But he is. He? Who? Shut up. Hey, wait a minute. You, uh, what's your name? Holiday. Okay. Get back to your car and lift the hood. 
Go on. Hey, got some distributor cap. Hurry it up. Throw it over here in the front. Now come back in. Pick up that big boulder on your way. That one. This one? Yeah, that one. Don't think of anything to do with it except what I tell you. I know what I'd like to do with it. Yeah, but you won't try because I'll get both of you. Now smash that distributor. Why not just take my car keys? Because lots of people carry extra sets. Smash that distributor. That suit you? Yeah. Now, like I said, both of you walk in front of me to the cottage. And one bad move and I'll put a bullet right in the back of your head. We walked to the cottage. Professor Irving hung on my arm. He tried to tell me something. But each time he started to whip and shut him up. Then we got to the cottage and stepped inside. Billy. Billy. Yeah, what do you want? Hey, who's that? Company. Who is he? What's he want up here? I thought you said nobody well, come quit up. quit yapping. The holidays sit on you too, Professor. Take it easy, Professor. That's it. Please, let me phone for a doctor. Please. Sure, when I'm ready. Look, this ain't good. Why'd this guy come up here? He's looking for Whitman. And if he's looking for him, somebody else is liable to do the same thing. You take it easy. Holiday, why did you come looking for Whitman? So you're not Ted Whitman. That's right. Now answer my question. I told you a friend of his was worried about him. Asked me to see if he was all right. You see, Frank, I told you. I told you. Will you stop blabbering? We've got to get out of here, Frank. We just got... Shut up. One more peep out of you and I'll lock you up in that iron dome outside. I'm scared. I'm scared. Now talk, Holiday. How many other people besides you know about this? Look, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean by this? Anybody else looking for Whitman? I wouldn't know. You know, maybe you'll talk better after a little persuasion. I wouldn't try anything, Frank. Talk, talk, I said. Tell him, Mr. Holliday. Tell him or he'll kill you. He will. He's letting Ted die. Ted mm. needs a doctor. He's shot. Will you be quiet. Okay, Holiday. Talk. <laughs> I had to talk. I told Frank about the letter from Marty Kennedy. He knew I was telling the truth and he seemed satisfied. But I still didn't know what the game was or who Frank was or what he was doing there. Then, later that evening... Billy? What? Turn on the radio. It's just time for the news. Oh, you know what it's going to say. Turn it on. I don't like it up here. For the last time, will you please get a doctor for Ted? He'll die. I did the best I could, but he needs a doctor. Too bad, isn't it? Let me see. Maybe I can do something for him. You can't let a man die in cold blood. Quiet. Tonight, the daring single-handed jewelry store robbery holds the spotlight. The clerk who resisted the robber died this morning. The car in which the killer escaped was found abandoned about five miles north of Collingwood, and... And now you know, don't you, Holiday? Yeah. Now I know. <laughs> it's funny, huh? Yeah, it is. How do you think you're going to get away from here? In Billy's car... She met me after the job I pulled. My car's abandoned. I stay up here where no one will take a looking for me. And after the roads are cleared? After the police think you've left the state, what then? What I said, I get away. Clean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what about us? What do you think? Want me to tell you? Well, go ahead. You'll have to kill us too, won't you? You've already got one murder on your slate. A couple of more won't make any difference. Not as long as you can save your own dirty hide. You talk big and brave, but it doesn't worry me. Now I'll tell you something, Holiday. Yeah, what else? You hit the nail right on the head. I gotta kill you and the professor because I don't want anybody left to tip the cops when I leave here. And Holiday, just as soon as the radio tells us the roads are clear, that's when you get it. <laughs> Archimedes and the Roman, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Land and Dan Holliday. Frank meant what he said. 
He'd kill us when he felt it was safe for him to leave. He watched Professor Irving and me every minute. Finally, I talked him into letting me take a look at that witness. Professor Irving was with me. Is he going to die? He's in bad shape. The wound needs cleaning and redressing. More than anything else, he needs a hospital and a doctor's care. Is there anything we can do? Listen, Marty Kennedy. You know him? Yes. He told me Ted signaled him from the observatory here. How is it, Tom? With a mirror, Morse code. Look, Marty will be watching for a signal. But you can't get up there to signal. That that beast won't let you. Yes, I know. Someone even tried to do it. But it's the only way. No one ever comes up here. No visitors? No, this is just an observation station. Our work is routine, photographic spectral analysis. Nothing to interest the casual visitor. Doesn't anyone in town think of anything when you don't get in? No, no. We often lose contact for several weeks at a time. But how about supplies? We got them last week. They'll think nothing of it if we don't show up for another five or six days. That's great, just great. But you said you, you weren't going to make an attempt to signal. That's right. If Marty doesn't hear from me, maybe he'll talk. Maybe someone will be interested enough to come up here. I see. That might work. Yes, that might work. It might work, Professor. Well, I asked you a question. Let him alone. He's an old man. Let him alone. What are you two whispering about? Come on, spill it. Nothing. We were talking about Ted. You're a liar. What did he mean when he said it might work? Nothing. (laughs) Okay, you want me to let him alone, don't you, Holiday? What are you going to do? Work on him a little bit. Oh! Why, you filthy... Now, Holiday, will you tell me, or do I get it out of the old man? Let him alone. I'll tell you. Once again, I had to tell the truth. Frank would have recognized the lie. It was a trap rat, and his instinct made him sharp. The next morning, he made me go to the sun tower and signal. And what I was to say, he had written down. And he had a book of Morse code handy. I didn't have a chance to trick him. L-I-D-A-Y-H-E-R-E. I've been busy holiday here. Good. Now we'll see if the kid answers. Look, why don't you give the professor a break? Time up, do anything, but don't kill him. I take no chances with anybody. Well, take me with you, but give the old man a break. You both get it. I take no chances. I'm looking at the electric chair right in his face, and I don't like it. Hey, hey, look, the kid's flashing back. Take it down when I give it to you. Dot, 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 dot. Dot. Dot, dash, dot, dot. Dot, dash, dot, dot. Dash, dash, dash. Dash. Dash, dot, dash, dash. That's, uh, that's a Y, and that's the last letter. Okay, let's see what we got. Hello, Ted and Mr. Holiday. This is Marty. Glad to know you were all right. I'll be here again tomorrow waiting to talk to you, Marty. Hey, this is perfect. Frank, what good is it? We're sitting up here while the cops are looking for us. I'm using brains, Billy. As long as the kid thinks everything is all right up here, he won't worry. He'll talk. He'll say he heard from Whitman, see? Very clever, Frank. Congratulations. Thank you. Now, more than ever, no one's going to look up here. You're going to signal every day until I get ready to leave. See, Holiday, all it takes is brains. Yes, that's all. You know, Frank, you remind me of someone. Yeah, who? A Roman soldier. Hmm? He's nuts, Frank. No, no, no. I want to hear what he's going to say. Go on, Holiday. Maybe you don't know the story, but I'm sure Professor Irving does. About Archimedes and the Roman. Yes, I know it. Okay, Holiday. Tell us the story. All right. Archimedes was a Greek, a great scientist and a mathematician. He lived in Syracuse, on the island of Sicily. In the year 212 B.C., the Romans besieged the city and sacked it. What kind of a story is this? Very much like the one we're going through now. Go ahead, finish it, Holiday. Okay. Well, the invading Romans looted the city, and one of them, looking for spoils, entered a garden. There he saw an old man sitting alone, drawing circles in the sand with a stick. The Romans spoke to the old man, Archimedes. But the old man thought of nothing but his circles and his silence. The Roman ran him through with his sword. So, what of it? Well, no one remembers the soldier's name, but Archimedes has never been forgotten. What are you trying to do? Give me the willy? No, he's trying to scare me, but he doesn't. You're still going through it, huh? You're going to kill a man who lives for nothing but science. I take no chances. He hasn't harmed you or anyone else. I won't beg him for my life, Mr. Holliday. It wouldn't do you any good. 
getting your own, both of you. Maybe tomorrow will be the day we put a tag on the story. But it wasn't. Radio reports by short wave said the police were still looking in that area. I was forced to signal Marty that everything was all right. Then, two days later... This is the day, Halliday. It's too bad the old guy's name is an Archimedes. You still don't want to give him a break, huh? Stop yapping about it. It's Ted's worse. We've got to do something. You won't have to worry about it anymore, Archimedes. Oh, I see. I'm sorry, Professor Irving. Maybe if I hadn't have come up here, you wouldn't have... It would have been the same, Holiday. Billy? Billy? Yeah? What's the matter? Get the things packed. We're pulling out tonight. Honest? Yeah, honest. But, uh, is it all right? I mean, the cops, they're off the trail? Yeah, yeah, I picked their calls up on the short wave. Everything is just ducky, baby. Brother, I'll be glad to get out of this place. <laughs> Maybe it's doing these guys a favor. what they have up here, anyway? A whole life. A whole life deep in the immensity of space. Dan, I'm sorry you have to be in on this. Me, I'm an old man, so... It's all right, Professor. <laughs> here we are. Four little people in the limitless well of the universe. Four tiny lives. It does seem odd, doesn't it? All the billions upon billions of miles out there, and and we're just a speck. Oh, for crying out loud, that talk is me the creeps. Frank, make him shut up. Yes, yeah, shut up. Oh, scared a little, Frank? Tonight, when you leave here, look up into the sky. Just remember how tiny you really are. Swallowed up in the immense stretches that are so huge that a billion miles is only... only a speck. Uh, <laughs> the Roman soldier, huh? Yeah, that's right. What about Ted Whitman? He'll die anyway. You shouldn't have gotten in my way when I first came up here. Just push anybody out of the way, kill him if you have to. I take no chances. I use my head. Oh, stop arguing with him, Frank. I'm getting nervous. We ought to get out of here right now. We'll get out tonight when it's dark. Okay, Holiday, let's go to the tower and signal that kid. Why should I? You're going to kill us anyway. Why should I give you a break? If I don't signal, Marty will get suspicious. You'll signal. Can you make... Yeah, I can. Go ahead, beat me, then I'll be in great shape to signal. Look, either you do it or all Archimedes here takes it for you. Do it, Dan. But if we're going to die, why give this rat a break? For Marty's sake. For Marty's sake? Yes, I don't want the boy to miss what's going to happen tonight. What are you talking about? Be careful, Frank. Don't let him trick you. I'll use my brains. Now, what are you talking about? You, Archimedes. What do you mean, Professor? Ted. Ted taught Marty astronomy. The boy has a wonderful natural inclination for it. There are too few of us like Marty. I want him to see the comet tonight. He won't look for it if I don't tell him, if you don't signal him about it. Well, how do you like that? Something you wouldn't understand, Frank. Okay, so I don't understand it. Who wants to? All right. Write down what you want me to signal. Professor, I'll do it. Thank you. It'll be sure. How do you like that? He's going to get killed and he wants to tell the kid about a comet. You know, I'd die much happier if I had just one good crack at you. Yeah, sure you would. <laughs> I'll stick my chin out and let you take a punch at it. <laughs> Here's the message. Thanks. Let me see that. Come on, hand it over. Sure. Read it. Yeah. Anything wrong with it? Just tells the kid to look for a comet. Don't send it, Frank. There's something wrong. I run this show. You think these two can pull a fast one on me? There's no code in this. I look. No, there's no code. Frank, sometimes the first letter of each word spells another word. I know, I know. I looked. Can you make anything out of L-F-H-C-T? No, I guess not. Okay. Come on, Holiday. Let's go. I signal Marty. He answered. I prayed that the kid would understand. Then we went back to the cottage. The afternoon passed, and it was early evening, and in the cottage. It's about time we went, ain't it, Frank? No, not quite. The sun's not all the way down yet. But the longer we stay, the worse it's going to be. Will you stop yapping? We've been here all day. Nothing's happened. That's right. Nothing's happened. I wonder if Marty's looking for the comet. I guess he is. I bet there ain't no comet. But you're wrong. There are over 900 comets recorded, and five or ten more are discovered every year. Save it, Archimedes. You're not teaching a class now. And you, Billy, take it easy. It's been over seven hours since we flashed the message. All the same, we better go. Yeah, yeah, the sun's down now. It'll be dark enough. Okay, Holiday, Archimedes, on your feet. 
the last time. Take me along with you. Tie the professor up, but don't kill him. I take no chances. On your feet, both of you. Don't you try that again, or you'll go out the hard way, little by little. Now move. Get in the next room and face the wall. Right in the back, huh? Sure, unless you want to see what you're getting. Okay. Hey, what's that? Sounded like a car. Douse the lights fast. Something unforeseen, Frank? Frank, who is it? Don't worry. Can't be anybody that knows anything, even if it Frank, is. I can see by moonlight. They're rangers. They've got guns. And they can use them. There's a kid with them. Marty Kennedy. That kid. Okay, he asked for it. I take no chances. Don't shoot that kid. Shut up. <laughs> Drop it. Drop the gun. Well, Frank, this time our committee's wins. You dirty rat. I've been waiting to do that for two days. Gee, gee, Mr. Holiday, Professor, where's Ted? He'll be all right, Marty, as soon as we can get him to a doctor. But you, you're a smart boy. I thought you'd guess it, Marty. Well, gee, I... I knew something was wrong, but it took me a long time to make anybody else believe it. Oh, shucks, I knew Ted or anybody else up here wouldn't send me such a silly message. going to be all right, Mr. Holliday? Sure, he'll be all right. But what was the message that made Marty think something was wrong? To watch for a comet that night? Well, if there are over 900 comets and five or ten new ones discovered every year, what was silly about it? This was a particular comet, Susie, a very particular one. Well, gee, tell me, what was it? Remember the first letters of each word, L-F-H-C-T? Look for Halley's Comet tonight. Well... Halley's Comet has a big orbit. It takes 75 years for it to get around. And it isn't due until 1985. Good night, Susie. Listen in again next week when, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville, with this week's original story by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. And the part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Vern Carstensen is in charge of production. This is a May